Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you in through the squeaking door. We're having a party tonight for two of my favorite corpses. I call them Romeo and Juliet. They're newly dead, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, she's the daughter of a famous society murderer, and he's the pride of the East Side Morgue. Oh, they're so happy together in their mausoleum built for two. And you should see the bridal casket. Shame it... on you, Mr. Host, making fun of such a tragedy. But, Mary, it was a touching ceremony. Of course, I stood up for the groom. Naturally, the poor fellow couldn't stand up for himself. <laughs> oh, please. It's an occasion for tears, not for laughter. That's right, Mary. Why, when the bride appeared wearing her grandmother's shroud, everyone had to be cheered up with Lipton tea. Now, that's enough. I will not have Lipton's mentioned at a time like that. Lipton tea is for people who know how to enjoy life. These are the folks who really appreciate Lipton's famous brisk flavor. Yes, that word brisk, B-R-I-S-K, makes a big difference when you're sitting down to a cup of hot tea. Brisk means that Lipton tea tastes fresh and full-bodied, never flat or wishy-washy. I wish you'd try Lipton's, folks, even if you're not a regular tea drinker, because you just don't know how good tea can be till you know how good Lipton's is. Well, Mary, let's tee off into tonight's story. Hmm? It's called The Shadow of Death. And it's an original radio play by that boogie-woogie man, Robert Sloan. Yes, and our star tonight is Richard Widmark, who plays the role of Howard. All set? Then turn off the lights and let in the shadow of death. On a lonely dirt road that borders the village cemetery, a single car slows to a stop and parks in the moonless night. Inside it, a man leans back in his seat and reaches for the hand of the girl he loved. Howard. Yes, dear? Why did you stop here? The cemetery is right over there. Oh, I didn't notice. You drove here last night, too. Did I? Yes. <laughs> well, you're not frightened, are you? Tonight I am. You've been so strange, so far away, I... I feel as if I hardly know you. Darling, you mustn't feel that way. What's the matter, Howard? There's something on your mind. I'm going away, Marie. Oh, no. And I'm not coming back. Howard, why? Well, I don't really know if I can explain it. It seems so incredible, and... And yet I know it must be true. What? Something I've discovered about myself. Something strange and frightening, Marie. Wherever I go... I seem to cast a shadow. A shadow of death. I... I don't understand. No, I didn't either at first. I thought it was just a strange coincidence. But it isn't. It's me. I bring death wherever I go. Oh, Howard, you don't really believe that. Well, how can I believe anything else? Haven't you noticed what happens to every living thing I have around me? No. I can't keep a pet of any kind, a cat or a dog. Even a plant dies when I have it in the house. Oh, darling, that's just your imagination. You've been working too hard. You need a rest. No, I'm going away, Marie. I don't want any harm to come to you. No, please. Nothing's going to happen to me. This is just... What's the matter? Oh, nothing. I... I was just looking at the flowers in my corsage. Good heavens. They're dead. You don't believe me either, do you, Doctor? Well, let's not put it on that basis, Howard. After all, I've been trained to look for the physical causes of death, not the supernatural. Then what do you think I should do? Frankly, I'd like you to spend a few weeks away from these surroundings. Go up to the sanitarium I told you about. They'll take good care of you up there. All right, Doctor. I'll make arrangements to go tomorrow. But I know it won't do any good. You'll be surprised, Howard. Two or three weeks from now, you look back on this as a... 
Yes. That's strange. Those goldfish in my aquarium. They're all dead. Tell me the truth, Howard. Are you comfortable here in the sanitarium? They, they don't believe me. They don't believe that people die when I dream about them. People die? Yes, you... didn't you know that? Every time I have a dream about someone, it, it's a sign of death. And the next morning when I wake up, I look in the obituary column and I see the name of the person I dreamt about. Well, Howard, what have they done to you here? Nothing, only they don't believe me. The, the, the dreams, I mean. I had to prove it to them this morning. And it made me feel very bad. What made you feel bad? The dream I had last night. I killed a man, Marie. What? I killed him in my dream. Oh. He was a good friend of mine, too. He lived right across the hall. Oh, Howard, please. You've got to get hold of yourself. But I'm afraid, Marie. I don't want to dream anymore. Oh, darling, I can't bear to see you this way. What way? I'll get you out of here. I promise, Howard. I'll get you out of here today. But, Marie, there isn't a chance of getting him out. You may have to stay in this institution for months. Oh, no. Dr. Gerard, can't you see what's happening to him? He's losing his mind. Well, I know he's taking a turn for the worse. That's all the more reason for keeping him here. It might be dangerous to discharge him now. Then why don't you do something to help him? We're doing everything we can. It's not easy. He persists in thinking he has this strange power of death. Nobody is able to convince him he's wrong. What about the man across the hall? Howard said they were good friends. That's another thing. They were good friends. But unfortunately... That man died this morning. Come in. Ah, good morning, Howard. How do you feel today? Oh, much better, doctor. Much better. No bad spells last night? No curious moods? No, I feel fine. Almost well enough to go home. Let me look at your eyes. You will let me go home again, won't you, Doctor? Yes, Howard, of course, of course. You, uh, haven't had any of those dreams lately, have you? No, no, not for a long time. Are you sure? Well, I, uh, I did have one last night. You dreamt that someone was dead? Yes, I did, but, but, but I, I, I know it's not true. It can't be true. Whom did you dream about, Marie? No, Doctor. I dreamt about you. That's why I know I'm wrong. You're a lie, doctor. Don't you understand? You've proven it to easy, me. Easy, easy now, Howard. Tell me about your dream. Well, I, I dreamt I was going home. And all the people I'd killed in my dreams were alive again. Yes, go on. Well, somehow or other, I could see my house from this window. And everything was just as it was a long time ago. The flowers were growing, the dog was in the yard. The one that was run over? Yes, everything was well again. And I was well, too. That's why I wanted to go home. But you and Marie's mother didn't want me to. She was in the dream, Marie's mother? Yes, I, I don't know how she happened to be there, but she was. That's all right, Howard. Go on. Well, I started to leave, Doctor, but she held me back. She held my arms like this. And then you jumped up to ring the bell for help. But before you reached it, I was on top of you like this. Oh, I had my fingers around your throat. Oh, and I was squeezing it so hard. Oh. I could feel your windpipe bending back oh, until yeah. you couldn't breathe anymore. Oh, God. Let go. That's what you said last night. Oh, my God. Uh, you wanted me to let go. Uh, I held uh, on until your face turned as blue as it is now. It was almost black before I let you go. But first, first I made sure you were dead. And then I dropped the body. You see, Doctor, my dreams do come true. <laughs> well, have you had any good dreams lately? Howard has. And you know, his dreams don't need interpretation. 
No, they need cremation. <laughs> Say, it's a lucky thing that guy works on the night shift. It'd be awful if he had daydreams, too. <laughs> Good gracious, yes. His dreams not only walk, they commit murder. <laughs> Mary, I was about to say that. Please leave the jokes to me. How would you like it if I talked about tea? Mm -hmm. Well, for goodness sake, I listened to the story, too. And I must say, I'm glad I'm not his, um, dream girl. <laughs> that does it. Friends, let me tell you about Lipton tea. All right, you win. <laughs> but it's only because I have something important to say about Lipton's. Folks, did you know that Lipton's is the largest selling brand in the whole world? Yes, and the reason for that is Lipton's well-known brisk flavor. You know, that word brisk is the tea expert's word for tangy, full-bodied tea, for Lipton tea. Ah, uh, Lipton's is always fresh and spirited, never flat or, or wishy-washy. That's why lots of people drink it not just at mealtimes, but whenever they're taking it easy for a minute during the day. So, folks, try Lipton's and get acquainted with that brisk flavor. Well... Let's get back to our dream man and find out what he does in his waking moments. When we left him last, he had just done a little manual work on Dr. Gerard's windpipe. And now, as the good doctor lies comfortably on the sanitarium floor, Howard is in the process of going through his pocket. Well, I'll have to have the keys to your car, doctor. I'll need them to get back home. I hope you won't mind if I hide you under this bed may take them a little bit longer to find the body if I do. Yes, who is it? Dr. Frisbee, Howard. May I come in? Well, yes. Yes, I, I'll open the door. What is it, Doctor? Well, I was looking for Dr. Gerard. I thought he was in here. Oh, yes, yes, he, he was a moment ago. I, I, I think he went down the hall. Uh, no, I just came from there. I guess he went back to his office. Oh, yes, I guess he did. How are you making out, Howard? Fine, fine, Doctor, fine, fine. You seem a little nervous. Your hands are shaking. Oh, well, I... You see, you've dropped your key. I'll get them. It's all right, Howard. I wasn't going to take them away from you. But I am wondering how you happen to have any keys in your possession. Well, they're... Uh, they're, they're not really mine. Well, whose are they, Dr. Gerard's? Uh, yes, yes, he, he left them here. I, I mean... You he... mean, uh... You stole them from him. No. Oh, come, Howard. You can't expect me to believe Dr. Gerard would give you any keys. Now, you'd better let me have them so I can give them back. But I, I Let didn't... me have them, Howard. Thank you. You won't tell him I took them, will you? No, Howard, I won't tell. But uh, please don't take them again. I'll go anyway. I'll get out onto the road and I'll get a hitch, yes, sir. I'll get away. I've got to speak to Marie. Going down, mister? I guess not. I guess I'm... A... Oh, oh, here comes another one. Hey, stop! Give me a ride, will you? Give me a ride, please, mister? Oh, he's stopping. Hey, hey, wait for me, will you, mister? I'm coming. I'll be right there. Oh, gee, thanks, mister. You going into town? Yes, Howard, but you're not. Dr. Frisbee. Yes, I've been watching you ever since you took those keys. I thought you'd try something like this. Well, I, I had to, doctor. I understand. You better get in the car, Howard, so we can talk this thing over. All right. You know, it's silly to run away from our place up there. If you really want to go home, all you have to do is ask. I did ask. When? This morning. Oh, wait a minute. Don't start the car. Why not? There's a truck coming. In back. Where? Oh, Howard, let go of me, Howard! I've got to have this car, Doctor. When I finished with it, I'll return it to you. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Walker. Who's this? Howard. You remember me, don't you? Howard, where are you? In a telephone booth around the corner. You're not in the sanitarium? No, I've been discharged. Dr. Gerard said I could go. You mean you're well again? Yes, I'm completely cured. 
Oh. Oh, I see. You don't sound very happy about it, Mother. Where's Marie? She's, uh, she's out on a date. When will she be back? Well, I, I don't know, Howard. She, she didn't say. I've got to see her again, Mrs. Walker. I've got to see her once more before I die. Before you die? Yes, I haven't much longer to live. Now, where is she? Well, I... Uh, I, I think she said she was going to movies. You're lying. I'm not, Howard. I, I, I just can't be sure. But if you go to the theater, you, you might find her there. You don't want me to see her, do you? Uh, no, not until I've spoken to Dr. Gerard. Why? Don't you believe me? Don't you believe I'm well again? No, Dr. Gerard... Never mind what he said. Mrs. Walker, you mustn't dislike me. I'm very fond of you. You... You are, Howard? Yes. I've been thinking a lot about you lately. While I was in the sanitarium. Last night, I even had a dream about you. Keep bringing that number, operator. I've, I've got to locate Dr. Gerard. Why the hurry, Mrs. Walker? Howard, how did you get in here? Through the back door. Put that phone down, please. But I... Put it down, I said. Yes, yes. You lied to me about Marie being at the movies, Mrs. Walker. I, I didn't mean to, Howard. I I told you I wasn't sure she was there. Where is she? This time I've got to know. Howard, how dare you? Take your hands off me. I'm not in a gentle mood, Mrs. Walker. I'm fighting against time. You, you've done something wrong, Howard. You've escaped from the sanitarium. No, I've done more than that, Mrs. Walker. I've killed a man. Howard. Two men, three men. I, I can't remember how many it was, but... There's going to be one more. Oh, do you wouldn't kill me, would you? Wouldn't I? What have you done to deserve your life? Uh, there, Let it ring. But, but that may be my call. Your call is coming now, Mrs. Walker. Howard, please. Put down that knife. Will you tell me where Marie is? I told you, I don't know. I don't know. And I'll wait for her. Right here. Howard, you can't. No, no, you can't. Oh! Yes, I can, Mrs. Walker. Hello? Hello, this is Dr. Frisbee Sanitarium calling. Is Mrs. Walker there? I'm sorry. You have the wrong number. Marie, darling. Why, Howard. Howard, what are you doing here? I've been waiting for you to come home, darling. Aren't you glad to see me? Oh, yes, of course I am. It was such a surprise I couldn't catch my breath for a minute. Where's Mother? Upstairs. Why? Oh, I just wanted to know. You had no other reason? No. Howard, why are you staring at me? I'm not really staring. I'm just looking at you, darling. It's been such a long time since I've seen you. I'd almost forgotten what you were like. Well, uh, let's go inside. No, if you don't mind, darling, I'd rather go for a ride. You're... You're all right, aren't you, Howard? I, I mean, you're, you're completely well now. Oh, can't you see I am? Uh, yes, but I... I yes. Yeah. Then let's not wait any longer, darling. Come on, we'll go for a ride. late, Howard. Don't you think we ought to go back? No, not yet, Marie. You just keep driving. These few moments we have together, maybe I'll... Marie, why are you stopping here? Uh, we're low on gas, dear. I, I don't want to get stuck on the highway. Oh. Yes, ma'am. Will it be? Uh, uh, you better fill her up. All right. And uh, have you got a telephone here? Yes, ma'am. Right inside. Uh, thank you. Wait a minute, Marie. What do you want with a telephone? Oh, I was going to call my mother. She'll be worried about me. Oh, no, she won't. She knows you're with me. Besides, uh, she went out for a little while. Well, maybe she's back by now. It won't hurt to call, will it? No, I guess it won't. I'll be right back, Howard. Well, hurry, darling. I want to be with you as much as I can. Yes, I won't be a minute. Number? 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 Number?
number, please? Operator, quick, get me the police. This is an emergency. Yes, ma'am, right away. Headquarters, Sergeant Dunn speaking. Sergeant, listen carefully. I won't have time to repeat it. The murderer of Dr. John Gerard is right here in a filling station on Route 6 at the Hadley intersection. What shall I do? I can't keep him here. Does he know you're on to him? No. No, he doesn't know I read the story in a newspaper just before I got home. He was waiting there for me, and I haven't been able to get to a phone since. Well, don't take any chances. He's a homicidal maniac. Don't even try to stall him if he wants to leave. No. Just stay where you are, and we'll be over there in four minutes. Oh, no, no, that's no good. He won't let me stay here. He'll take me with him. Marie. Oh, he's calling for me now. Marie. Uh, just a moment, Howard. What can I do, Sergeant? What can I do? Well, give me the description of the car, quick. It, it's a dark blue sedan. License number 468J3. We've been going east on Route 6. Oh, I can't talk anymore. He's coming. Marie, for heaven's sake, what kept you so long? Oh, I had a hard time getting the number. There was something wrong with the lines. But you were talking to somebody. Yes, I, I was speaking to Mother. You were speaking to your mother? Yes. She told me not to stay out too late. You're lying, Marie. No, I'm not, Howard. I talked to her. You talked to the police. That's why you lied to no. me. No. You did. Your mother's dead. Howard. I know, because I killed her. Howard. Be quiet. Get back into the car. You're coming with no. me. No, no, Howard. You're hurting my arm. Get back in the car. Hey, you leave her alone. Keep out of this, you fool. Leave her alone. I told you to keep out of this. Oh, I know. Hey, put down that wrench. Now put it down. Oh, oh, oh. oh, how could you? Never mind. Get into the car. Howard, why are you stopping here? Don't you know where we are, Marie? This is the cemetery. Where we stopped before. Yes. I like it here. It's so quiet and peaceful among the dead. Let's walk through the ground. Howard, please. Why not, Marie? We're among friends. So many of our loved ones are buried here. It's nice to be near them. Come on, Marie. All right, Howard. You know, darling, we haven't much more time together. The shadow of death has fallen across our path. You said something like that before, but you never told me why. I'm being selfish, Marie. I know I have to die, and I want you to come with me. Why do you have to die, Howard? Because I... I haven't been true to myself, darling. I haven't been true to this power I have power of death? Yes. I've helped it along sometimes. Like that dream I had about my friend in the sanitarium. Like the flowers in my garden. Like those fish and Dr. Gerard's. You killed them? Yes. I knew they were going to die. But I shouldn't have helped them. That's why I'm being punished. But Howard, why are you punishing me? I don't want to die alone, Marie. We've been away from each other so much, darling. I I want us to be together from now on. But... Don't be afraid, darling. I'll be gentle, Marie. So gentle. But you're making a mistake, Howard. No. You are. You've forgotten what you've done. You can't kill me, darling. Why not? My good heavens, Howard, don't you remember? Don't you remember that day at the sanitarium? You said you dreamt about me. No. No, I couldn't have. Yes, you did. Didn't they tell you what happened? No. Your dream. Your dream, it was true. That's why you can't kill me now. Marie, you... You mean... Yes, Howard. I'm dead. I can't believe it. Oh, you must believe it. I... Here, here. Look at this tombstone. My grave is right here. No. Read what it says. Read the name on it. It's your name, Marie. Your name. Marie Walker. Yes. Then you... Then you really are dead. I told you I was, Howard. The shadow of death passed over me. Then let it pass over me. Hey, got him, Sam. Got him the first shot. 
Keep out of the way, miss. He may not be dead yet. No, I... I'm sure he's dead. Well, you certainly had a close call. Took us all this time to locate your car. Finally spotted it on the road. You all right? Yes, sir. I'm all right. The name of my grandmother's tombstone saved me. How's that? Oh, it it doesn't matter. Say, that's funny. What? This guy was shot through the shoulder. My bullet wounds weren't serious enough to kill him. What do you mean? Well, I know it sounds crazy, but my shots didn't kill him. He was dead before I hit him. What a shame. Wasting two perfectly good bullets on a guy that was dead all the time. Well, at least they won't have to go far to bury him. Here's one villain who died practically in the middle of his own plot. (laughs) Isn't it funny how many of our stories seem to take place in cemeteries? You know, Mary, I think you ought to open up a concession in the cemetery. And you know what you could sell. Hmm? Don't say it. Don't you dare. You know very well that the place to buy Lipton tea is and always will be your neighborhood grocery store. And, folks, that reminds me. You'll find it wiser to buy Lipton's in the larger, more economical size packages. That way you not only save money, but you also make sure that you won't run short on a beverage that's really a household necessity. Brisk-flavored Lipton tea. Before I put the skeletons back in their closets, I'd like to give you a parting word of advice. A body should never be left alone at the morgue at night. After all, it might become slab happy. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum Mystery novel is The Whistling Legs by Roman McDougald. Yes, and let me tell you about next week's Inner Sanctum story. Directed by Hyman Brown... And brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup. You know, usually our stories are about people who live six feet under the ground. But for next week, we've dug a lot deeper. In fact, it takes place in China. (laughs) And as a special added attraction, we've unearthed a new kind of character for you. Unearthed is right. This guy's been dead for 20 centuries. (laughs) And now it's time to close the squeaking door, so... Good night. Pleasant dreams. Ladies, if your child comes home from school for lunch, you want to give him a quick but appetizing meal. And that's why you should serve Lipton's noodle soup. You see, Lipton's takes no time to prepare, and yet it has a fresh-cooked, old-fashioned, chickeny flavor, and is just swimming with tender golden egg noodles. Your children will love Lipton's grand homemade taste. So don't forget to serve Lipton's noodle soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ionized Yeast presents Lights Out, Everybody. Yes. Lights Out brings you stories of the supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly. So if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly, but sincerely, to turn off your radio now. This is Arch Obler. Dreams are part of all of our lives, and tonight we bring you the story of a woman's strange dream. But first, Frank Martin for just a moment. Frankly now, friends... 
Is that you saying you're so thin and weak and frazzled out you can't do your work or enjoy your fun? Well, cheer up. Maybe all you need is more vitamin B and iron. And ironized yeast gives you vitamin B and iron. Yes, both vital substances in pleasant-to-take tablet form. They've helped thousands of people who, only because they needed more of these substances, were weary and worn out. Help them so amazingly that today these folks tell how fine they feel, how thanks to good pounds gained they look like a million, really enjoy life today. Yes, that's Ironized Yeast Tablets. Make a note of that name right now. And now? Lights out. Everybody. Claire! Uh, oh, uh, Claire. Yes, Charles? What time is it? Eight. Well, you, you haven't been asleep. No. Not at all? No. Oh, that's terrible. Claire, Claire, we've got to do something about it. Clark, why don't you take some pills or something? No. But you've got to sleep. Claire, look here. Tell the truth. How long is it since you've slept? Really slept. What's the difference? Tell me. Three nights. No. You asked me. I had no idea. I, I thought you slept but didn't sleep soundly, but three nights. You'd better get up. It's late. Oh, never mind me. We've got to do something about this. You, Claire. Claire, what's wrong? Wrong? The reason. The reason you can't sleep there. Must be some sort of a reason. I just don't sleep. All right. That settles it. What? You're going to a doctor today. Yes, this morning. No. What do you mean, no? No wonder you've been looking so ill. Charles, I don't want it's to. It's settled. You're going to a doctor right away. Wait a minute. Look at me. You're not hiding anything from me. What is there to hide? I just can't sleep. Heart action, lungs, everything quite normal. Of course, you're in rather a nervous state, but that's quite understandable. If, as you say, you haven't slept for that length of time. I haven't. Of course, I believe you. Please, won't you sit down? Thank you. What's troubling you, Mrs. Collins? Troubling? Yes. Nothing at all. If you're quite through, I think I'm going home. I have to... No, please, sit down. I'm warning you, Mrs. Collins, to go without sleep for as protracted a period of time as you have is most dangerous, physically and mentally. For your own sake, you must let me help you. What can I do? Have confidence in me. Now, your husband tells me you refuse to take any sort of soporific, sleeping powder. Is that true? Yes. Follows then that you don't want to fall asleep. Is that true? Well, Mrs. Collins, I said it before and I say it again in complete sincerity. For your own sake, you must answer me. It's true, isn't it, that you don't want to fall asleep? Yes. Why? I don't dare. Why? Because I'll dream. And you don't want to dream? No. Why not? All right, then. Tell me this. How often have you had this dream? Two times. I see. What is this recurring dream about, Mrs. Collins? I can't tell you. Why not? I just can't. My dear woman, don't you realize I'm not just prying for the sake of simply prying? I'm trying to help you. And the way to help you is for you to help yourself by bringing this thing out into the open. You've got to tell me about it. A dream generally has a basis in reality. If we talk about it, perhaps we can find the underlying cause of the dream and so eliminate it. Don't hesitate to tell me. You know, I'm a physician. Everything you tell me is in confidence. Supposing we start. You go to sleep, close your eyes, you dream. What do you dream? I dream. I dream. No, I can't tell you. Mrs. Collins, where are you? Well, I'll be... Would you hang a towel on the doorknob? Yes. You gotta get out now. 
I hope they don't ration hot water in this part of the country. Uh, there. I have to miss my good night tub. My morale will go lower than, than Hitler's conscience. Carl's on the knob. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks, dear. I found one on the shelf. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, nothing like a tub to make a man sleep. Uh, Claire. Oh, yeah. Where's that robe? I'm sure going to find out. If I'm oh, Claire. Claire, uh, the doctor. What, Charles? The doctor. I was so busy all day, and then you didn't... Uh, well, well, what happened? What did he say? He said I was all right. But, well, was that all? Didn't he say what was the cause? No. Well, what in the... He didn't seem to know. It, it, it's crazy. I mean, when I when I got to the office, your sleeplessness was all I could think of. And then C.L. started to have one of his desk-banging fits, and then New York started in on the teletype, and I... Well, I just forgot all about it. He, uh... The doctor, he did prescribe something for you, didn't he? Yes. Oh, of course. Pills are what you need. You just got yourself into an insomnia state of mind, but once sleeping pills breaks you of it, why, you'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I guess I'm tired. Ooh. Yeah. So what do you say we, we turn out the light and both of us go to sleep, huh? All right. Wait a minute. You take them, whatever the doctor gave you? Yes. Fine. Well, off of the line, huh? You will be all right, isn't you? I'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> sure you will. Pills will start to work in a few minutes. You'll be all right. Sleep. Wonderful thing, sleep. <sighs> Wonderful thing. Sleep. Wonderful sleep. He's right. Wonderful. No, mustn't think about that. Mustn't think about anything but staying awake. Wonderful. No, isn't wonderful. Horrible. Horrible sleep. I won't sleep. I'm so tired. If I could close my eyes. Just in minute. Just a second. I wouldn't sleep. Rest. Just rest. No. I'd fall asleep and then got to stay awake. Got to stay awake. Just close my eyes for a second. Just a second. Could sleep. Won't sleep. Dream. I am asleep. Dreaming. Walking. Where am I walking? Street. So long. Empty. Where am I walking? Running. Why should I run? Where am I running? I've got to stop running and walk. But I can't stop. I can't. <gasps> house. What is this house? No. I won't go up there. I won't. I won't. But I... I am. I won't. I won't. But I... I am. Going in. Who's in here? Hello, Claire. Where's my father? You again. Where's my father? You again. Where's my father? The same dream. Where's my father? Don't say that. Where's my father? Stop saying that. Where's my father? No. Where's stop my father? Saying that. Where's Close my your father? mouth. Stop Where's saying my that. Stop. Where's All right, I'll make you father? stop. Where's my father? Drink this. <laughs> Drink. Just like the other time. Drink. Drink. That stopped you. Jim. Jim, me. Jim. Oh. 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 Dream. Just 
a dream. Running in my dream. Just a dream. Wait. Ah! Where are you going? Oh, no. Don't touch me. Put me down. Don't swing me around. I can't stand it. I'm getting dizzy. Around and round and round. Faster and faster and faster. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Why am I screaming? Just a dream. I'll stop screaming. So dark. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Tunnel. Someone following me. Something. No! I know what it is. I know. They won't get me. Never get me. Run, run, run. Never catch me. Never, never. Oh, can't go any farther. End of tunnel. River. Can't go. It's so dark. And it's still coming for me. No, you won't get me. Won't get me. Swim. I can swim. Swim in the dark. Away from. What am I swimming in? Can't see what. Oh, swimming in... Oh, no. I remember now. It's a dream. Oh, this is just a dream. Just a dream. Just a dream. You can wake up out of a dream. I will wake up. I've got to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Ah! There. Ah! There. Stop screaming. Ah! There, wake up. Wake up. You're having a nightmare. There, you're having a nightmare. Wake up. <sighs> Let's pause here on KRLD. To find out more about old-time radio, old-time video, and the pleasures of listening to audiobooks, visit the Audiobook Club website, www.audiobookclub.com, where you can get four audiobooks for just one penny. MediaBay.com Now back to Lights Out on KRLD. Acting this way isn't going to help her, Mr. Collins. I'll grant you that it's serious not sleeping for six days, but I'm positive she'll be sensible now and tell me what it's all about. But the way she lies there, Doctor, her, her eyes... I told you, stop thinking about it. You ask me to help her, and I'll help her. Now go make yourself some coffee while I go in and talk to her. But I... All right, Doctor. And stop worrying. Morning, Mrs. Collins. Mind if I talk to you? I understand you had a bad time of it. Well, I can understand you don't feel much like talking. Suppose I pull up a chair. Sit down. Do the talking myself. What do you want? Something very simple. The truth. Truth? Yes, if not for your sake, for your husband's. Oh, what do you mean? I want to find out the source of your dreams. If you don't tell me, the consequences may be disastrous. The human organism simply can't endure without the proper rest. Mrs. Collins, I beg of you. Tell me. You must. I... I... Yes? I must sleep. Of course. If I tell you, you swear you won't tell him? You have my word as a physician. I... I've been married to Charles for two years. Yes? I was never married before, but I'm his second wife. I know. He had a child by that first wife. I... I didn't like that child. He was always a reminder that Charles loved someone before me. I didn't like that. Well, go on, Mrs. Collins. <laughs> now, now, Mrs. Collins, please. Go on and tell me. No, no, you shouldn't do that. Mrs. Collins, there's only one answer to this. You must take a sedative and get some rest. A few hours of sound sleep and everything will straighten itself out. I'm sure of that. Now, you will take a sedative, won't you? Yes. Yes, I will. Fine. 
You'd better take some right now while I'm here. Water. Here you are. Drink this. Come now, drink. Leave it. I will. Promise? Yes. Here's the sedative. Take two now, and if that doesn't do it, take two more in, say, half an hour. I'll leave you more than enough. All right. Now, you will take it. Yes. It's the only sensible thing to do. I'll drop in and see you this afternoon. I know that after you've slept, you'll feel more like talking. Yes. Now, sleep well. Goodbye. Goodbye. Sleep well. Sleep well. Sedative. Yes. Sleep well. Must sleep, must. But if I sleep... <laughs> I've got to sleep. Got to. Don't care what happened. Got to sleep. Water. Where? He left the glass. Yes. Pills. How many? I don't know. I don't know. Put them in. Drink. Drink it all. We'll sleep. We'll sleep. What is it? Doesn't work. No. Doctor said I will sleep. Close my eyes. Don't care. We'll sleep. We'll sleep. We'll sleep. We'll scream. We'll. I'm asleep. Screaming again. Walking. Where am I walking? Scream. The long. Empty. Where am I walking? Running. Why should I run? Where am I running? I've got to stop running and walk. But I can't stop. I can't. House. What is this house? No. I won't go up there. I won't. I won't. Not again. But I... I am. I... I don't want to. But I am. I won't. I won't go in. But I... I am. Going in. Who's in here? Hello, Claire. (gasps) Where's my father? You, again. Where's my father? You, again. Where's my father? The same dream. Where's my father? Don't say that. Where's my father? Stop saying this. Where's my father? No, stop saying that. Close your mouth. Stop saying that. Where's my father? All right, I'll make you stop. Drink this. I'll drink. Just like the other time. Drink. Drink. There. That stopped you. Didn't it? Didn't it? (gasps) Dead. Jimmy, you're dead. I did kill you. That's the way it was. I did kill you. There. I said it. I did kill you. I had to. Every time I looked at you, it was the infernal first wife of his I saw. You understand? I had to kill you. Gone. Jimmy, gone. That never happened before. Never happened before in my dream. Dream. Just a dream. Why do I run? It's just a dream. Wait. Where are you going? No. Don't touch me. Put me down. Don't swing me around. I can't stand it. I'm getting dizzy. Around and around and around. Faster and faster and faster. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Don't let me go. Why am I screaming? It's just a dream. I'll stop screaming. So dark. Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Tunnel. Someone following me. Something. No. After me again. Again. It won't get me. Never get me. Run, run, run. Never catch me. Never. Never. Turn. 
go any farther. End of tunnel. River. Can't go. So dark. And it's still coming for me. No, you won't get me. Don't get me. Swim. I can swim. Swim in the dark. Away from... What am I swimming in? Can't see what... Oh. Swimming in... Oh. No. I remember now. It's a dream. Oh, this is just a dream. Just a dream. Just a dream. You can wake up out of a dream. I will wake up. Why can't I wake up? It's just a dream. A dream. Always at this moment I've been able to wake up. It's coming through the water after me. I've got to wake up. I've got to wake up. I... I can't swim in this. I can't. Got to wake up. Why can't I wake up? Dream, just a dream. Always woke up before. Why can't I wake up out of this dream? What if I could never wake up out of this dream? The pills. The doctor's pills. I took all of them. He said only two. But I remember. I didn't think I... I took all of them. I'm not dreaming. I'll never wake up out of this dream. I'm dead. Ah, Mr. Obler, trapped in a dream, huh? Why not? You know, Frank, there are some people that say that for all we know, all of us are in a dream. <laughs> did you ever see a dream walking? Well, I did. Oh, seriously. <laughs> Doesn't everything exist only through your senses? What you see exists, what you hear exists, what you smell exists. But the existence of things in a dream is just as real. Is it possible that right at this moment you're dreaming? Well, time out till I pinch myself. Out? No. I'm awake enough to want to know what's happening next week. Well, next week. It's a really exciting story. But supposing you tell me first, Frank, what you've got to say and I'll follow you. Well, I'll just take a moment for another very important point about ironized yeast. Folks... If vitamin B and iron shortage is what's keeping you miserably thin and weak and jittery, for your own sake, get ironized yeast tablets right away. They cost but a few pennies a day, and you don't risk even those few pennies. For ironized yeast is sold on a money-back basis. That's right. If you don't quickly begin to eat and sleep better, to gain new pounds to feel much stronger and peppier, the cost of the first bottle will be Refunded to you in full by Ironized Yeast, Box IY, Broadway, New Jersey. But remember, there's only one Ironized Yeast. You'll know it by the big letters IY on the package and on each tablet. Now, what were you saying about next week's story, Mr. Obler? Well, before I tell you that, uh, there's something of vital importance to you and me I'd like to talk about. I mean, to all of you out there. It's inflation. Yes, that's a terror as much as a nightmare. The fight against inflation involves every man, woman, and child. This is a front on which, in the words of President Roosevelt, everyone in the United States will be privileged to remain in action throughout the war. Now, what causes the present danger of inflation? Our factories are working at top speed, but they're turning out equipment needed to win the war. Not goods for you. More to spend, less to buy. This is the danger point. This can be the beginning of disastrous inflation if we start bidding against each other for the limited amount of goods on hand. If each of us tries to get a hold of everything he can, we force prices up. Savings, insurance policies are wiped out. Now, our government has taken steps to control the rising cost of living, and you, well, you ought to know about those details. These include provisions for keeping prices stable and for distributing goods fairly through rationing. As part of the same anti-inflation program, wages and farm prices have been stabilized. And excess profits are being taxed. We can beat inflation if all of us understand these measures are our protection to ourselves, and work to make them effective. We shall lose out to inflation if each group and individual acts on the principle of, he got something, I'm going to get something too. Now, beating inflation means buying only what we need, putting aside for the future every other extra dollar. And now about next week's play. It's a story about a man who did exactly this. He took out a match, 
He lit it. And he looked into the flame, and as he did so, he thought to himself, Why, that little dancing thing in the flame is alive. For life, he knew, was anything that moved by itself and fed another matter. And that definition certainly applied to the flame. So he lit another match, and then... But that's next week. Yes, tune in next Tuesday again for Arch Obler's eerie story, The Flame. And if you need more vitamin B and iron, be sure to try ironized yeast. The one and only ironized yeast. With the big letters IY on the package and on each tablet. It is later than you think. Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. Well, Barbie, the novel we're trying out for Mystery House tonight, uh, Murder Hires a Hall. I've read it and I like it. Well, I do too. But we'll see how it plays. The whole point of having our publishing staff act out these stories. Yeah, I know, but I'd take a chance on this one without even trying it out. I disagree, Mr. Glenn. I don't think there's any point in taking chances on anything in this day and age. Yeah, Tom, but this story... Well, I'm not talking about stories particularly. There's no need to guess on anything when you can get authentic, reliable information. Uh Uh-huh, I bet this is leading up to something. Of course it is, Mr. Glenn. Listen. Okay, places, everybody. Murder hires a hall. Tonight's story takes place shortly after the close of the Second World War. It opens in the office of Robert Lawson, candidate for governor. Across the desk from Lawson sits Jasper Jade, known throughout the state as the boss. For the last time, Jade, the answer is no. N-O, no. Now, look, Lawson, I'm a reasonable man. I wouldn't be here talking to you if I were. You mean you wouldn't be here if you didn't think you could buy me off? Oh, now, look here, Lawson. That's not the way I like to hear young politicians talking In the first place, Jade, I'm not a politician in the sense you and your gang use the term. I'm a... Yes, yes, of course, Lawson. You're one of our honored war veterans. You did a great job in the war. There's every reason for you to expect to collect a reward now. Jade, I'm about to lose my temper. I'm a war veteran, yes, but I'm not running for governor to collect any reward. I'm sticking my neck out to clean up some very dirty politics. A mess which you alone are responsible for. Oh, come now, Lawson, look here. You don't like it when it's said out loud, do you? Well, I'm saying it out loud, and I'm going to keep on saying it as loud as possible before the greatest number of voters. I admire your courage, young man, but I'm beginning to doubt your sanity. Are you sure the War Department gave you a clean bill of health? Getting scared, Jade? (laughs) Oh, don't make me laugh. How do you think I got where I am now? And where are you now? The boss. Boss Jade. Dictator of the most corrupt political machine in the state's history. Do you think I want my name linked with anyone with your reputation? Apparently, you want to be elected. Don't worry about that. I'll be elected. Ah, but not without my support, you won't. Your support? The only purpose that would serve would be to whitewash you in the eyes of people who believe in me. You're being very foolish, Lawson. I grant you I don't have an organization, Jade, but I do have the backing of thousands of people who would send you to prison if they knew as much about you as I do. Uh Yeah. Careful, Lawson. Remember, I still control the courts. I know exactly what you control. And I give you my word right now, the first move I'll make as governor will be to clean out your mob, and you'll be number one to go to trial. Now, look, I'll make the offer once more... I'll endorse you publicly and ensure your election, if you play ball. Now, go ahead with your reform platform. We can make it look good. I need some new blood in my organization, and if you have the backing of people that I've never been able to reach, why, all right. 
We could uh, make a good team, Lawson. You mean you think I'd make a good stooge? Well, of course, I'd have to make most of the decisions. After all, my organization... Your is... organization. Well, I wouldn't join your organization if it meant staying out of politics for the rest of my life. That's your last word. It's been my last word for the past half hour. Now, get out of here, Jade. Take your hand off my sleeve, young man. I'll leave here when I see fit. You forget, Jade, this is my office. Why, you... This is my office, Jade, and I'm telling you to leave it. Hmm. Your office, is it? Well, I'll see that you never have another one. Maybe the voters will have something to say about that. Yeah? Well, perhaps we won't give the voters the chance to show their sentiments about you. Are you threatening me, Jade? I'm warning you. Get out of here. Get out of here before I lose my temper. Well, hello, Mr. Jay. What a place to bump into you. Goodbye. Karen, I'm uh, sorry you had to see this. This what? This intimate little farewell? <laughs> okay, you have your jokes. I'm sorry I have to be more serious about things like... I'm not laughing, Bob. I'm more serious than you are. I've got to persuade no, you to... now, Karen, Karen, please don't start that again. Nothing can persuade me to give up this campaign. But do you know what it means, Bob? It's suicide. Or maybe something worse. I've started it and I've got to finish it. That's all. No, that isn't all. What about me? Don't you... Karen, you know I care more about you than anything else in the world. But, darling, I swore I'd break the yoke boss Jade holds over the voters and I'm going to do it. You mean that's more important than I am? Karen, of course it isn't more important than you. You're everything I want, but... But you want to be governor more. No, no, of course not. But look, Karen, when I came back from the war, I was determined that I was going to see that people at home got some of the things so many soldiers died for. I don't really care about being governor, but I'm going to see that Boss Jade is thrown out of this state, and if I have to be governor to do it, I'll be governor. Oh, stop that Galahad stuff. Galahad stuff. Karen, what's got into you? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Bob. I didn't mean that. But, Father... What about your father? He's going to have to pull out on you. He's been my strongest backer. His newspaper is the one way I've had of reaching the voters. His support has meant everything. Yes, and if he continues to support you, he'll lose everything. But how? Even if I lose the election, he'll Winning still... or losing the election has nothing to do with it. You forget that Jade controls the only paper mill from which Dad has been able to buy newsprint. Well, there must be a way. There isn't any way. You know what the paper mill situation is. And without paper, Dad will have to quit publishing. Bob, you've got to give up. You've got to quit this useless fight against Boss Jade. It isn't useless. I'm going to beat Boss Jade if it's the last thing I do. Well, you can't do it alone. Well, I've certainly counted on your father's support, but... If I have to do it alone, without any newspaper backing me, I'm still going to do it. And what about me? What do you mean, Karen? Unless you announce your withdrawal right now, you and I are finished. But why? Karen, I can understand your father being forced to pull out. He has to think of his newspaper and all the people dependent upon it. But you, you and I, we belong together, fighting the same battle. Don't you understand? I can't stand by and see my father ruined. But he won't be ruined if he withdraws his support. Unless you either accept the support of the Jade machine or withdraw completely from the election, Jade will expose Dad and break him completely. Expose your dad? Why... Dad what? has spent his life as a crusading editor. When he hired a business manager, he didn't watch him closely. Now he finds that his business manager is one of Jade's men. And he's been so unscrupulous that Dad's paper and Dad will be completely ruined if certain facts are ever brought to light. But that's not possible. That's what I thought. But I saw the evidence. Jade's paper has it all set in type. Dad's picture and a complete set of facts that will force him out of business and make it absolutely impossible to defend himself. Oh, that's preposterous. We'll take it to court. Oh, you know that won't do any good. Jade controls the courts. But, Karen, that's just one more reason for me to run Jade out of business. You haven't a chance without Dad's support. But I can't give up now. You can, Bob. You must. If you love me. You know I love you. That's why I have to make this fight, regardless of the consequences. You couldn't respect me if I turned out to be a quitter. I couldn't respect a man who brought about the ruin of my father. Well, I'm afraid your father will have to look out for himself. But what about me? 
Don't I count for anything? Karen, you know what you mean to me. If you really mean that, you'll sign this statement. But this is a statement to the public saying I'm giving up the fight. Oh, darling, can't you see? It's the only thing to do. No, Karen. This is one thing I can't do for you. All right, Bob. If that's the way you feel about it. Wait a minute. What's that you've got in your bag? Oh, I... Well, I didn't want you to see that. A gun? But why? I'm sorry, Bob. I tried to keep this from you. There are people who would go to any lengths to keep you from being governor, Bob. You mean they threatened your life? But you don't have anything to do with my political life. No, but everybody knows that you and I are going to be married. They figure threatening me is a way to get at you. Don't you worry, darling. Nothing's going to happen. But I do worry, Bob. Please, sign the statement now. Please, darling. Let's both get out of this while we can. And admit defeat? Uh Uh-uh. I'm scheduled to speak before a packed house tonight, and I'm going to blow the roof off. Oh, Bob, for me, please, sign that statement. Nothing doing, sweetheart. This is a fight to the finish. It's either Boss Jade or me. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, we're here tonight to hear from our next governor, Robert Lawson. Yes, we're here to listen to him as he gives you the facts about the worst cheating the people of this community have ever been subjected to. The facts, ladies and gentlemen, not a story, but facts. Our boss, Jay, this How did you get backstage, Walker? Never mind that. I hear you're going to shoot the works tonight. That's right. It'll make a great story for that newspaper of yours, if you print it, which you won't. That's right, Lawson. I work for Jade. I've been with this newspaper for years, and so far I've done a pretty good job of keeping the opposition in line. Oh, you admit you aren't bound by the great code of newspaper ethics, huh? Ethics? (laughs) I'm too much of a realist. Enough of a realist to give you one more chance to call off this speech. Call it off? With 3,000 people out in front? With a statewide radio hookup? You can quote me as saying that I will definitely not call off this speech. I'll be on that stage in three minutes. Maybe. But let me fill you in on the situation first. The orders are that you are not to be permitted to finish your speech. It's too late now to stop me. Is it? You think you've got 3,000 friends out there? (laughs) I've had rotten tomatoes thrown at me before. This time there won't be any tomatoes. That audience has been well sprinkled with ammunition. And I don't mean tomatoes. Jade wouldn't dare. The gun will be found in the hand of some dope who really believes you're trying to take away his bread and butter. Even Jade wouldn't frame an innocent man that way. Don't be so naive, Lawson. I know you've got enough evidence to throw the book at Jade. Only that book is going to hit a lot of people, including yours truly. Talking won't help you. I'm... Now look, Lawson. In five seconds, you'll be walking out on that stage. But if you say one word of what you've promised to say, it'll be the last word you've ever said. Thanks for the entertaining conversation. That's my cue. Bob! Bob, wait a minute! Bob! Ladies and gentlemen, without preliminaries... I want to come directly to the subject, which is the principal reason you're all here tonight. I propose to tell you about one Boss Jade. Jasper Jade. Dictator of... Hey, the girl, grab her, somebody, she did it. Wait, did... this isn't my gun. <laughs> Somebody took a well-timed shot, just in time to stop Robert Lawson from saying too much about his political enemy, Boss Jade. And it looks as if that somebody was trying to lay the blame on Karen Lindsay, Lawson's girlfriend. But let's see what the second act has to say about that. In the meantime...
And now, the second act of Murder Hires a Hall. The scene is backstage in the auditorium where Robert Lawson began the political speech, which was interrupted by a bullet. Police Lieutenant Murphy has arrived. But I didn't do it. I know I didn't. Look, Miss Lindsay, tell me what happened. It'll be much easier for everybody. But, Lieutenant Murphy, I know I didn't. No, no, there's no use denying it. You came here with a gun. You were found right after the shooting with this in your hand. The gun that shot Lawson. But that isn't my gun. What do you mean, it isn't your gun? Mine was a little pearl-handled revolver. I carried in my purse. That's a laugh. What do you think you are, a sleight-of-hand artist? Walker, be a little careful. We'd want to draw any attention. Uh, None of that now, Mr. Jade. Look, Miss Lindsay, the bullet that hit Lawson came from this gun. The gun you were holding. But it isn't my gun. I never saw it before. Where did it come from, then? I don't know. All I know is that I came here trying to find Bob. The stage was full of people, and I was jostled. I had my own gun in my head. What did she have a gun for? I brought the gun because... because I'd heard things. I knew Bob's life was in danger, and I wanted to have the gun to protect himself. I tried to attract his attention You still haven't explained the other gun. I don't know. I remember passing Mr. Jade, and then Walker got in my way. I was so confused, I was only thinking of getting to Bob... Someone must have changed guns with me. That isn't easy to believe, Miss Lindsay. You don't have any reason to believe that this gun isn't yours. Well, of course it isn't mine. Bob would know. He knew I carried a pearl-handled revolver. Well, suppose we call the hospital. Chances are Lawson may be able to talk now. Uh, Operator, this is a police call. Get me to the hospital in a hurry. Yeah. Hey, look, uh, this is Lieutenant Murphy. Is Lawson conscious? Okay. Uh, Ask him to describe the gun that Miss Lindsay carried in her purse. Yeah, yeah, in her purse. Uh, Call me right back. Uh, Look, Murphy, I know you got a routine to go through, but you practically got this thing pinned on the Lindsay girl. You can't hold me here. I got to get this story to the paper. Walker, quiet, remember? Uh, Remember what, Mr. Jade? I don't like your tone, Murphy. I was just cautioning Walker that it's our duty to be cooperative. Oh. Well, nobody leaves here until I say so. Murphy speaking. Yeah? He what? He says it was a pearl hand... Ah. Okay. Yeah, 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 thanks. I told you, that isn't my gun. Maybe not, Miss Lindsay. But where is the pearl handle gat? What'd you do with it? Well, it must have... Someone must have exchanged guns with me in all that confusion. Maybe. You say you saw Mr. J. Now, look here, Murphy. Now, you admit you were backstage. Well, of course I was backstage. I was late. I didn't arrive until, well, until just before you got here. Walker was here when the shot was fired. He can tell you that I hadn't arrived yet. What about the audience? You got 3,000 suspects out there. But we don't have a motive for any of them. And we do have motives for all three of you. I resent that, Murphy. I'll have you thrown off the force. Exactly. That might be your motive, Mr. Jade. Lawson was a threat to your power to dictate to the police department. You might easily have tried to kill him. Why, Joe, you're a man in my position, stupid boy. It's ridiculous. Oh, that's a nice point. You wouldn't stop to murder, but you might have hired someone. Someone like Walker. Now, wait a minute, Murphy. Supposing Miss Lindsay's right. Maybe somebody did swap guns with her. Hey, you, Walker, you bumped into her. <laughs> you think you can scare me? Where's the other gun? I haven't got it. I know you haven't got it. I've got it. What? What? Where did you find it? In Walker's top coat pocket. Here it is. Pearl handle and all. Why, you... I never... Well, Walker... I told you to be careful, Walker. This is a frame-up. I never touched that gun. It begins to look as if the frame-up was on Miss Lindsay. You and Jane... Now, wait. This has gone far enough. I won't stay here and listen to such accusations. You know where to reach me. Now, just a minute, Jade. You're defying the law. That's impossible. I am the law. Get him back here. If anybody's being framed, it's me. Jade planned to murder Lawson. Lieutenant, you can't let him get away. Look, Murphy, I didn't do it. Jade had a guy planted in the audience. Forget it, Walker. Mr. Jade won't get very far this time. Well, Lawson, about time you opened your eyes. Jade... Who let you in here? 
Isn't this... Yes, this is the hospital, all right. Get out of here, Jade. I... I'll deal with you later. Peter, no, Lawson, don't get excited. I know this is a little abrupt, but it uh, struck me that you might be in a better mood as a result of this fracas. Here, take a look at this. What... What is it? Go ahead, take a look at it. You recognize it. It's a statement of withdrawal. The fact that you've been, uh, well, wounded gives you a fine excuse for eliminating yourself from the election. Very interesting. Go ahead. Sign it. That bullet hole in your shoulder, you can give up the campaign gracefully. Even your most rabid supporters don't expect you to go on getting shot. Aren't you forgetting something? No. Well, what? Don't you usually take care of people under these circumstances? What are you getting at? A little gift. Settlement. Oh, yes, the settlement. What? I said it, the settlement. <laughs> well, Lawson, I see that you're a practical politician after all. I did you an injustice. I thought your crusade was really on the level. Don't bother me with flattery. How much? Well, I guess we can come to terms. Uh, let's say uh, the same uh, as the last payment you made on my case. What's that? Uh, oh, yes, you... Uh, well, sure, sure, Lawson. It's worth that much to me. That'll make it nice for both of you, won't it? That makes everything perfect. Uh, give me a little time for the shoulder to heal. I don't want to give you a wobbly signature. That's fair enough. <laughs> and you surprised me, Lawson, but you took a load off of my shoulders. Well, I'll run along now. Oh, no, you don't. What? Still got some business to attend to, Jade. Murphy, you showed up just in time. Where's Karen? Pulled a faint just we got to the hospital. They got her lying down in one of the other rooms. Listen, Jade, you can't hang this on me. You fried your own soul when you ran out of Murphy. That'll take a lot of fixing. Are you see here, Walker? I may have to get a new political reporter. After that skipper in front of the witnesses, you're going to need a lot of new things, including a good lawyer. Murphy, get Karen in here. There are some things I want her to know. Okay. Walker, you know where she is. Murphy, I think we have everything just about cleared up. Uh, Lawson seems to think the shooting was one of those unavoidable things that politicians face. <laughs> it, uh... Might be silly to prefer charges, hmm, Lawson? I didn't say that, Jade. What's that? What have you got up your sleeve, Mr. Lawson? Here she is. Oh, Bob. Oh, skip it, Karen. Uh, what's the matter, Bob? Another thing, Karen. Nothing that your friend Jade can't explain. What do you mean? Jade has just admitted the whole story. What? You mean he told you about giving now me... Now, you look here, Lawson. You can't prove a thing. Hey, somebody around here better start letting me in on this. What are you talking about, Mr. Lawson? I might have told most of this on the radio tonight, but the real clincher was the admission that Jade just made to me before you came in. Lawson, one more word Sit from down, you. Jade. Don't forget, I got you covered. Jade has been trying to get me to withdraw from the election for a long time. But I didn't get really suspicious until the other day when Karen came in with a statement she wanted me to sign. An agreement to get out of the campaign. You mean she didn't want to be engaged to a future governor? She told me a wild story about the pressure Jade was putting on her father's newspaper. And I might have believed her if I hadn't noticed that the statement had been drawn up by Smith and Reynolds. The law firm for the... That's right, the dummy law firm set up for Jade and used by nobody but Jade. Then I began checking. You mean you found out about what was happening while you were overseas? Well, I did find out that Karen had seen a lot of Jade while I was in service. But the important thing I found was a canceled check. Signed by Jade and made out to Karen. A check for $50,000. The rest was a matter of talking to Jade, and he all but admitted tonight that he had paid Karen to keep me out of the race for governor. I should have known you'd find out. But Jade kept after the me. The shooting was the girl's idea, I swear it. Maybe so, but it wasn't exclusive. What do you mean, Walker? Jade had a gunman planted in the balcony, right next to the fire exit. But the girl beat him to it. Jade made me do it. He told me I could make it look as if Walker had fired the shot. What do you mean? The girl's gun was found in Walker's coat pocket. Jade invented that story I told you about the guns. He gave me the second revolver, told me to hide my own in Walker's pocket. Jade wanted to get rid of Walker. I told you it was a frame-up. Jade's been giving me the heat because... Because of me, Walker? He figured I was getting soft, that I knew too much. You're fired, Walker. You'll never work on another paper as long as I... As long as you what? Uh... Well, Miss Lindsay, looks like you picked the wrong man when you teamed up with Jade. Come along, both of you. I'm sorry about this, Lawson. Don't worry about it. I've learned my lesson. Next time I hire a hall, I'll know enough to look out for murder.
Suspense brings you an all-star cast of Hollywood's finest radio players in 100 in the Dark. But first, wherever hospitality is a gracious art and entertaining is the last word in luxury, the first name in wines is C-R-E-S-T-A B-L-A-N-C-A Cresta Blanca Cresta Blanca Yes, that's Cresta Blanca Wines, a symbol of perfect taste, of gracious living. To pay your guests a sincere compliment, distinguish your holiday dining by serving a fine Cresta Blanca California Burgundy or Sauterne. When you pour these proud Cresta Blanca Wines from the finest of the vines, you enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you... Radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, for your enjoyment. Tonight, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, presents 100 in the Dark, a study in suspense. Produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. Yes! (laughs) Oh, that was a fine meal. Me for the club any time. Yeah. We can all sit here, Quinny. Oh, yes. You just drop that chair for Mr. Peters. Hey, you are, Mr. Peters. Thank you. You all know Peters? This is Mr. Steingart. How do you do, Peters? Well, I know and you. Mr. DeGalia. I believe we've met. Yes, Oh, you right. know each other. Mm-hmm. And the one who just drew up your chair, Mr. Rankin. Oh, all right. Thanks for the chair. <laughs> well, I guess we're all acquainted. Uh, now, to get back to our table discussion, Quinny. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, how about some coffee? All of us, huh? No. It's all right. All right. right. Oh, yeah. oh, John. John. Well, now, Steingall, as I said, there are only a half dozen stories in the world. Now, what is more to the point, there's every... Yes, sir? Uh... Oh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, coffee, John. Anything else, anybody? No. Uh, no. That's no. Well, right. John. Yes, sir. Now, let me see. Where was I? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Human relations are, are so simple and yet so fundamental that they can be eternally played upon, redressed and reinterpreted in every language, in every age. They remain inexhaustible in the possibility of variations. Well, that's true, of course, yes. Well, that's very possible. Well, now, you take the eternal triangle, two men and a woman, or two women and a man. Its variations extend into the thousands. That right, Rankin? Well, in a way. In a way, yes, yes. Oh, oh, good job, yes, yes. Just sit them right down there, please. Uh, I'm afraid we can't see eye to eye, Quinny. Oh, no? I believe there are situations, original situations, that are independent of your human emotions that exist just because they are situations, accidental and nothing else. As for instance? Well, I I, I can cite an ordinary one that happens to come to my mind. Yeah. Now, in a a group of five men, such as we are here, a theft takes place. One man is the thief. Which one? Well, now, I should yeah, say... Yeah, but now, now, I'd like to know what emotion that interprets. And yet it certainly is an original theme. It's at the bottom of a whole literature. Oh, not the same no, thing at all. I could answer oh, that the situation you give can be traced back to the commonest of human emotions. Curiosity. Uh, yeah, I think mm. what he has you there, Rankin. <laughs> Why, the whole art of a detective story consists in the statement of the problem. 
Why, anyone can do it. I can do it. Steingall can do it. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> Rankin, I believe even I you can do it. it. Very generous of you. The solution doesn't count. It's usually banal. It should be prohibited. What interests us is, can we guess it? Yes, I suppose that's true. Every crime expresses itself in the terms of the picture puzzle that you feed to your six-year-old. It's only the variation that's interesting. Well, the well-known instance of the visitor at the club and the rare coin, for example. Of course, you, you all know that one. No, no, no I don't. I think so. Oh, well, it's, it's very well known. Seems a distinguished visitor is brought into a club. A dozen men say, present, dinner, long table, you know. Mm. Conversation finally veers round to curiosities and relics. One of the members then takes from his pocket what he announces is one of the rarest coins in existence. Uh -huh. Passes it around the table. Well, the coin travels back and forth. Everyone examines it. And the conversation goes to another topic. Oh, say the influence of the automobile on civilian life or some such <laughs> intellectual <laughs> club topic, you know. Oh, I hope we're more well, all at once, <laughs> the owner calls for his coin. And it's nowhere to be found. Ah, right? yes. Everyone looks at everyone else. First, they suspect a joke. That's well, then serious. it becomes serious. The <laughs> coin is immensely valuable now, mind you. Who has taken it? <clears throat> the owner's a gentleman. He does the correct idiotic thing, of course, and laughs. Says he knows someone's playing a practical joke on him, that the coin will be returned tomorrow. Mm. Mm. Well, the others refuse to leave the situation, so. One man proposes they all submit to a search. Everyone gives his consent till it comes to the stranger. <coughs> uh, I refuse to allow my person to be searched, says he. Very firm, very proud, very English. You know. <laughs> and I refuse to give the reason for my action. Well, well, there's another silence. The men eye him and then glance at one another. What's to be done? Nothing. There is etiquette. That, that magnificent inflated balloon. <laughs> <laughs> the visitor evidently has the coin, but he is their guest and etiquette protects him. It's a nice situation, eh? Mm. Uh, the table's cleared. A waiter removes a dish of fruit. And there, under the ledge of the plate, where it had been pushed, is the coin. Mm. Well, that's oh. not the way I heard it. Banal explanation. Uh, yes, of uh, course, of course, of course. Solutions always should be. Well, at once, everyone is profuse with apologies. Whereupon, the visitor rises and says, Now, gentlemen, I can give you the reason for my refusal to be searched. There are only two known specimens of the coin in existence, and the second happens to be here in my vest pocket. <laughs> of course, the, the story is well invented, but the turn to it's very nice. It's very nice indeed. Yes, well, I knew that story. The ending, though, it's, it's too obvious to be invented. The visitor should have had on him not another coin, but uh, something absolutely different, something to... Well, uh, destructive, say, of a woman's reputation. Uh, and a great tragedy should have been threatened by the casual misplacing of the coin. Uh, Don't you think so? Yes, well, of course, the same story told in a dozen different ways. Oh, it's happened a hundred times. It must be continually happening. I... I, uh, know uh, one extraordinary instance. In fact, the uh, most extraordinary instance of this sort I've ever heard. Why, Peter, you rascal. <laughs> I see you've quietly been letting us dress the stage oh, for you. Oh, <laughs> it's uh, not a story that will please everybody. Oh, uh, why not? Because you'll all want to know what no one can ever know. Oh, has no conclusion, then? Uh, yes and no. As far as it concerns a woman, however, quite the most remarkable woman I've ever met, the story is complete. Aha, mm. it concerns a woman. A woman. And a crime. Mm. A crime of thievery, such as we've been discussing. A huh? crime of thievery, yes. Quite a story. I think, uh... Yes, I have just time before I catch my train to tell it to you. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you 100 in the Dark. Roma Wines presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, selected for better taste from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. Next week, Americans everywhere will celebrate Thanksgiving, and in millions of homes, families and friends will give a toast of thankfulness with better-tasting Roma California wines. That's because Roma wines are America's favorite wines for festive occasions as well as everyday enjoyment. So glorify the flavor of your turkey with gold and hue delicate Roma Sautern. Or enjoy robust, full-bodied Roma Burgundy, the perfect flavor mate of your favorite roast. 
No matter what you're planning for Thanksgiving dinner, there's a fine Roma wine to make every morsel a taste delight. Remember, because Roma wines taste better, more Americans enjoy Roma, that's R-O-M-A, Roma wines than any other wines. And now, Roma Wines bring us back to the Artists and Writers Club, where five club members regaling themselves over after-dinner coffee are settling down to hear a story told by a guest, a certain Mr. Peters. His is a narrative well calculated to keep his listeners in... Suspense! Uh, before I start, I wonder, would you ask the, uh, uh, John, I believe is his oh, name? Oh, John, yes, yes. John. Uh, John, John, come here. Yes, gentlemen. Uh, John, I have a train to catch. Would you be good enough to get me out of here in exactly, uh, 15 minutes? In 15 minutes, sir. Thank uh, you. Well, you, uh, have our attention, Peters. It concerns a woman. Uh, do I know the woman? Possibly. Uh... Probably, I should say, but no more than anybody else. Ah, oh, an actress. Uh, what well, she's been in the past, I oh, know. Uh, promoter, I suppose, would better describe her. A very feminine woman, and yet, as you shall see, with an unusual, instantaneous, masculine power of decision. Oh, Peters, you're destroying a story. <laughs> Your preface will bring an anticlimax. Well, you shall be the judge. Of course, it should be particularly interesting to you, because I believe most of you are acquainted with the people involved. Mm. The names are, of course, dis- disguises. Oh, yes. <laughs> Mrs., uh, well, uh, Mrs. Rita Kildare inhabited a charming bachelor girl studio, very elegant of the duplex pattern, in one of the buildings just off Central Park West. She, uh, knew pretty nearly everybody in that indescribable society in New York that's drawn from all levels that imposes but one condition for membership, and that is to be amusing. <laughs> that's a good phrase, that, Peter. <laughs> she, uh, had a certain amount of money. She knew a certain number of men in Wall Street affairs, and her studio was furnished with taste and... Even distinction. She was of any age. She might have suffered everything or nothing at all. In this mingled society, her invitations were eagerly sought, her dinners were spontaneous, and the discussions, though gay and usually daring, were invariably under the control of wit and good taste. On the Sunday night of this adventure, she had, according to her invariable custom, sent away her Filipino butler and invited to an informal chafing dish supper seven of her more congenial friends. At 7 o'clock, having finished dressing, she put in order her bedroom, which formed a sort of free passage between the studio and a small dining room with the kitchen beyond. Then, going into the studio, she struck a match and was about to light the candlesticks, which illuminated the room. When the bell rang and a Mr. Flanders, a broker, compact, nervously alive, well-groomed, was waiting as she opened the door. You're early. On the contrary, dear lady, you are late. Well, in any case, hello, and come on inside. <laughs> Here, let me let me take your things. Uh, thank you. I'm the first, I suppose. Well, of course. And since you are, you can be a very good boy and help me light these candles. Delighted. Who's to be here tonight? Oh, the, the Inners Jacksons. Oh, I thought they were separated. Not yet. <laughs> How interesting. Only you, dear lady, would dream of serving us a couple on the verge. It is interesting, isn't it? Assuredly. Where did you know Jackson? Oh, through the Warings. Jackson's a rather, uh, well, doubtful person, isn't he? Mm, let's call him a very sharp lawyer. Oh, they tell me, though, he's been gambling pretty much, in deep. And how about yourself? For oh, me? <laughs> I'm a bachelor, and if I lose my shirt, it makes no difference. Is that possible? <laughs> Probably even. Who else is coming? Well, uh, Maud Lyle, you know her. Mm, I don't think so. Oh, you do, too? You met her here some time ago, a journalist. Oh, yes, yes, I'd forgotten. And uh, Mr. Harris, a clubman, is coming. And the Stanley Cheevers. Stanley Cheevers? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Are we going to gamble? Well, don't tell me you object. <laughs> Certainly not. Only the Cheevers, they play quite a game. Well united, and they have an unusual streak of good luck. Uh, by the way, it's Jackson, isn't it, who is so attractive to Mrs. Cheevers? Quite right. Oh, what a charming party. <laughs> and where does Maud Lyle come in? Oh, don't joke. She's in a desperate way. Mm. And young Harris? Oh, he, he's, to, he's to make the salad and cream the chicken. Mm, I see. I see the whole party. I, of course, am to add the element of respectability. Of what? <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> yes, that's better. No one, of course, knows who's coming. No one, of course. The uh, 
Stanley Cheevers entered, a short, fat man with a vacant, fat face and a slow-moving eye, and his wife, voluble, nervous, overdressed, and pretty. Uh, Mr., uh, yes, Mr. Harris came with uh, Maud Lyle, a woman, straight, dark, Indian, with great masses of somber hair, thick, quick lips, and eyes that rolled away from the person who was talking to her. The Enos Jacksons were late and still agitated as they entered. His forehead had not quite banished the scowl, nor her eyes the scorn. He was of the type that never lost his temper, but caused others to lose theirs. Mrs. Jackson seemed fastened to her husband by an invisible leash. He looked at her curiously and wondered what such a nature would do in a crisis with a lurking sense of a woman who carried with her her own impending tragedy. As soon as the company had been completed and the incongruity of the selection had been perceived, a smile of malicious anticipation ran the rounds, which the hostess cut short. <laughs> well, now, now that everyone is here, this is the order of the night. Now you can quarrel all you want. You can whisper all the gossip you can think of about one about the other. But, but everyone is to be amusing. And also, also everyone is to help with the dinner. Nothing formal and nothing serious. We may all be bankrupt tomorrow, divorced, or dead. <laughs> but tonight, tonight we will be gay. That's the invariable rule of this house. <laughs> all right? <laughs> and as for me, me for the cooking apron. Harris, Harris, please, you go to the kitchen and bring in the order. Right, you are. May I be of any help? Oh, thank you, Maud, darling. Of course, Mrs. Cheever. Yes, dear. You might come along, too. Oh, you can be Oh, darling, Maud, yes. please tie me up in that, will you? Oh, yes. There you are. Fine. Now, to get these rings off, soap and water always seems to do it. So... Ooh, there we are. Your rings are so beautiful. You like them? Oh, thank you so much. They're very nice. There's only one there that's very valuable, the sapphire. It's beautiful. Let me see. Oh, it must be very valuable. Mm, it cost 10000 six years ago. It's been my talisman ever since. For the moment, however, I am cook. Well, are you going to leave the rings out like that? Well, of course, <laughs> really. Temptation. Oh. <laughs> now, I am the cook. Maud Lyle, you are the scullery maid. Harris is the chef, and we're under his orders. Mrs. Cheevers. <laughs> Did you ever peel onions? Good heavens, no. <laughs> well, there are no onions to peel. All you'll have to do is help set the table. <laughs> Under their hostess's gay guidance, the seven guests began to circulate busily through the rooms, laying the table, grouping the chairs, arranging the flowers, and preparing the material for the chafing dishes. Mrs. Kildare, in the kitchen, ransacked the icebox and with her own hands shredded the chicken and did the cream. Flanders! Flanders! Now, you carry this in carefully, mind you. I'll guard it with my life. Good boy. Oh, Cheevers, stop watching your wife and put that salad bowl on the table. (laughs) Everything ready, Harris? All set. All right. Everyone now. Everyone sit down. I'll be right in. Just a minute. She went into her bedroom, took off her apron, and hung it in the closet. Then, going to her dressing table, she drew the hat pin around which were her rings from the pin cushion and carelessly slipped them on her fingers. All at once, she frowned and looked quickly at her hand. Only two rings were there. The third ring, the sapphire, was missing. Stupid. She returned to her dressing table. Immediately, she stopped. She remembered quite clearly putting the hat pin through the three rings. She made no attempt to search further, but remained without moving, her fingers slowly drumming on the table, her head to one side, her lips drawn in a little between her teeth, listening with a frown to the babble from the outer room. Who had taken the ring? Each of her guests had had a dozen opportunities in the course of the time that she'd been busy in the kitchen. Too much time before the mirror, dear lady. Mm, well, it's not Flanders. Then she reconsidered. Well, why not, though? He's clever. Who oh, no. knows? Oh, I've got to think. To gain time, she walked back slowly to the kitchen, her head bowed in thought, her thumb between her teeth. She ran over the characters of her guests and their situations as she knew them. Strangely enough, at each, her mind stopped upon some reason that might explain a sudden temptation. Oh, well, I'll find out nothing this way. What's not the important thing to be just knowing about? The important thing is to get that ring back. 
And slowly, deliberately, she began to walk back and forth, her clenched hand beating the deliberate, rhythmic measure of her journey. Five minutes later, as Harris, installed as chef over the chafing dish, was giving directions, spoon in the air, Mrs. Kildare came into the room like a lengthening shadow. Her entrance had been made with scarcely a perceptible sound, and yet each guest was aware of it at the same moment with a little nervous start. Oh, 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 heavens, dear lady, you came in on us like a Greek tragedy. What is it you have for us, a surprise? I have... I have something to say. Well... Mr. Enos Jackson? Uh, yes, Mrs. Kildare. Kindly do as I ask you. Certainly. Go to the door. Go to the door? Please. Yes? Lock it. Lock it and bring me the key. Well, we're going to the game. <laughs> All right, here you are. Thank you. Now, now the bedroom door. Would you do the same, please? Of course. Oh, it's a new, a new game. I'll have it. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Mm. Mr. Cheever. Yes? Would you blow out all the candles except the candelabrum on the table? Blow out all the candles? Except the candelabrum. Oh, for goodness sakes, Mrs. Kildare, what is it? I'm getting terribly worked up, really. Maud Lyle. Yes? Put the candelabrum on this table. Here. Oh, no. No, wait a minute, please. Mr. Jackson. Yes? First, clear off the table. I, wa I want nothing else. Oh. But Mrs. Kildare... That's it. Now, now put down the candelabrum. All right. Well, I don't... That's the last candle. All right. Now listen. My sapphire ring has just been stolen. Oh, you're joking. Oh, you what do you mean? No, the ring has been taken within the last 20 minutes. I'm not going to mince words. The ring has been taken and the thief is among you. Oh, that's, that's stolen? But Mrs. Kildare, is it possible? Absolutely, Mrs. Cheever. There's not the slightest doubt. Three of you were in my bedroom when I placed my rings in the pincushion. Each of you has passed through there a dozen times since. My sapphire ring is gone, and one of you has taken it. Well, I... I, I that's quite true. I was in the room when she took them off. The sapphire ring was on top. Now, listen. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to stand on ceremony. I'm going to have that ring now, back. Now, my dear lady... Listen to me. I'm going to have that ring back, and until I do... Not a soul shall leave this room. I don't care who's taken it. All I want is my ring. Now, I'm going to make it possible for whoever took it to be stopped without possibility of detection. The doors are locked and they'll stay locked. I am going to blow out the remaining candles in the candelabra. And I am going to count to 100. Slowly. You'll be in absolute darkness. No one will know or see what is done. But if at the end of that time the ring is not here on this table... I shall telephone the police and have every one in this room searched. Am I quite clear? Everyone take his place about the table, please. That's it. I will do very nicely. Now I... I will blow out the candles and count 100. No more, no less. Remember, either I get that ring or everyone in this room will be searched. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight, twenty nine, thirty, thirty one, thirty two, thirty three, thirty four. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, Seventy-nine, eighty, eighty-one, eighty-two, eighty-three, eighty-four, eighty-five, eighty-six, eighty-seven, eighty-eight, eighty-nine, ninety, ninety-one, ninety-two, ninety-three, ninety-four, ninety
Well, uh, well, now that that's over, I, we can have a very gay little supper. <laughs> Harris, will you help me light these candles, please? <laughs> And uh, there you are, gentlemen. Well, I say, Peters, old boy, that's not all. Absolutely. You mean the story ends there? The story ends there. But who took the ring? <laughs> what? It was never found out? Never. No clue? None. I'm not sure I like the story. <laughs> well, it's no story at all. Permit me, it is a story, and it is complete. In fact, I consider it unique. Because it has none of the banalities of a solution. It leaves the problem even more confused than at the start. Yeah, well, I don't see... Oh, of course when... you don't, my dear Rankin. You do not see that any solution would be commonplace. Whereas no solution leaves a true intellectual problem. How so? Well, now, observe. <coughs> now, each person present might have taken the ring. There was Flanders, a broker, just come a cropper. Uh, Maud Lyle, a woman on the ragged side of life in desperate means. Either Mr. and Mrs. Cheever, suspected of being card shops. By the way, a very good touch, that, too, Peters. Mm. Mr. Ennis Jackson, a shop lawyer, or his wife, about to be divorced. Even Harris, concerning whom, very cleverly, Peters has said absolutely nothing to make him quite the most suspicious of all. There are, therefore, seven solutions, all possible and all logical. But beyond this is left a great intellectual problem. How so? Well... Was it a feminine or a masculine action to restore the ring when threatened with a search? Knowing that Mrs. Kildare's clever expedient of throwing the room into darkness made detection impossible. Was it a woman who lacked the necessary courage to continue? Or was it a man who repented his first impulse? Is a man or is a woman the greater natural criminal? That's simple, Quinny. A woman took it, of course. Oh, on the contrary, it was a man. For the second action was more difficult than the first. Oh, man, certainly. The restoration of the ring was a logical decision. Yeah. Well, I recognize most of those characters, Peters. Mrs. Kildare, of course, is all of you say of her. An extraordinary woman. The story is quite characteristic of her. Flanders, I'm not so sure of, but I think I know him, too. I'm positive I do. Did it really happen? Exactly as I've told it. And the only one I don't recognize is Harris. Your humble servant. What? You, Peters, you were there. I was there. Pardon me, gentlemen. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. What is it, John? What is it? Mr. Peters, sir, your train. You told me to remind you, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I didn't know it was so late. Well, you gentlemen, pardon me? Oh, certainly, sir. Yes, of course. Yes. yes. Well, nice to have met you all. Uh, hmm. Hmm, curious chap. Extraordinary. Now, uh, I wonder. I wonder if we're wondering the same thing, gentlemen. Suspense. So closes 100 in the dark. Peters was played by Howard Duff, and the other club members were Joseph Kearns, Frank Albertson, John McIntyre, Dick Ryan, and Horace Willard. Teresa Marshall was Rita Kildare, and at her party were Jeanette Nolan, Wally Mayer, Mary Jane Croft, Jerry Hausner, and Grace Gillern. Tonight's study in Suspense, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. If you could see how Roma California wines are grown, you'd understand why they are America's favorite wines. First, you'd see how Roma selects and presses only the choicest grapes. Then how Roma master vintners, with ancient skills and unmatched winemaking resources, guide this luscious grape goodness unhurriedly to tempting perfection. Finally, these better-tasting Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines to await later selection for your enjoyment from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This is Truman Bradley with a suggestion for making your Thanksgiving dinner even more enjoyable. Top off the meal with glasses of fruity Roma port. Roma port is a truly distinguished entertainment wine. Ruby red, full-bodied, 
clear as a bell. Be sure to ask for Roma. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Thank you. Tonight's suspense radio play was adapted by Jack Fink from a short story by Owen Johnson. Suspense. (laughs) Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Mystery Theater. G. Marshall. There's a very fine line between life and death. So fine, it prompted one writer to tell us that in the midst of life, we are in the midst of death. And in the story that follows, we'll see that where there's love and a will to survive, survive we must. We are going on a journey into the macabre. Come with me to a breathtaking cavern in southern Arizona. Roger Markle, professor of geology, is leading a party of his students on a rock hunting expedition. They're deep below the surface of the earth in this little known cavern, chipping at specimens of sparkling stone. Hold that light a little higher, Joe. Okay. That's better. Now, can everyone see clearly? Yes, sir. Uh, This is a splendid example of pyrite. You'll remember that this is also known as fool's gold because of its yellow color. It's used primarily... Wait. Listen. Good Lord, it's a cave in. Everybody out. Run to the Our mystery drama, Someday I'll Find You, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by Bob Juran and stars Betsy Palmer. From a cavern in southern Arizona, we go now to a fashionable apartment in Chicago, the home of Professor Roger Markle. Anne Markle, the professor's wife, is in her dressing room getting ready for the opera. Her sister Madge is at the living room bar, mixing a batch of cocktails. Olive or lemon peel, Anne? Olive. Since when did you take up martinis? Oh, about two years ago. Has it been that long since I've seen you? Mm -hmm. Not since Mother's funeral. Oh, that's right. Oh, I wish you'd visit us more often, Madge. Hey, will you zip me up? Sure. You know you're always welcome, and Roger is so fond of you. Oh, honey, you know how it is. We all get into our little ruts. Well, you've just got to stay on a few days after Roger gets back. He's dying to see you. Well, that can be arranged. I've nothing to rush home for. He's due back Sunday. What's he doing this time? Well, he has a group of students exploring some cave in Arizona. Oh. And he wants to write a book about it. There's your martini, oh, thanks, dear. thanks, dear. I'm sure it'll be a good one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the book, I mean. Oh. <laughs> well, in his position, he has to publish. It's expected. Well, all the more reason to be proud of him. And I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we'd better call the taxi oh. if we want to make dinner before the... Oh. No, I'll get it, dear. I'll get it. You finish oh. your drink. All right, dear. But it, it might be the valet. I had two of Roger's suits sent out. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Markle? Uh, no, no, no. I'm her sister. Uh, is she at home, please? Yes, she is. Uh, what is it? Detective Holmes, ma'am. I'd, uh, I'd like to see Mrs. Markle. The police? Yes. Who oh, is it, Madge? Who's out there? Uh, come in. What's the matter, Matt? I don't know, Anne. This gentleman is from the police. Of the heat. Mrs. Uh, Markle? Yes? I'm Detective Holmes, 31st Precinct. Oh. Uh, would you both sit down, please? Well, what is this? It's about your husband, Mrs. Markle. Uh, Professor Roger Markle of the University. Ro- Roger, what is it? What's happened? Well, we've had word from the state police in Arizona. He uh, was exploring a cave yes. there. Yes. 
there was a cave-in early today, and Mr. Markle hasn't been found. Oh, dear God. No, I don't quite understand. You you, you say that Roger was in a cave-in? Yes, three of the students who were with him escaped. They say Professor Markle got them to safety, but before he himself could get out, the whole wall of the cavern collapsed. Oh, no. No. Well, that's the story we get from Arizona. Of course, we'll want to question the students more fully when they get home. Uh, They're being flown in tonight. But my husband, R- R- Roger's still out there. Uh, we're, we're not sure of anything yet, Mrs. Markle. They say he must have been buried in the collapse. There was no oh. sign of him. They tell us the crews are digging, no, but... Uh, I've got to go to him. I, I, I'll have to fly out tonight. And, dear, there's nothing we can do. No, I don't expect to do anything, but I have to be with him. I, I, I just have to be there. Mrs. Markle, the best thing you can do is stay right here. We'll keep you informed regularly the minute we hear anything. Keep me informed? My husband is dying under tons of earth and you expect me to sit here waiting to be informed? Oh, all right, Anne. We'll go. We'll fly out tonight. I think we really have to go, Sergeant. If they find him alive, she ought to be there. That's up to you, ma'am. <laughs> Why are they giving up? Why? Anne, dear, there's no use digging anymore. They've hit solid rock. And Roger's been under there for more than 48 hours. There's, there's just no hope. They can't get to No, we came all this way and they've, they've given up. Darling, they did all they could. The least they could do is give me his body to bury. Oh. Anne. Oh. Anne, dear, let me take you home with me. No. No, I want to get back to Chicago. There's so many things that I have to take care of. All right, dear, we'll go back. <laughs> I'll stay with you until you're settled. More coffee, Anne? No, thank you. No. Dinner was lovely. Anne, I've, uh... I've got to bring this up sometime. I know, I know. You you want to be getting home. Well, it's been more than a month now. You know I'd stay as long as you need me, but I've got to get back to Texas for a while. I'll even come back here in a few weeks if you want. No. No, Madge, I've I've got to start adjusting. It's it's time you did go home. Oh, my dear. You know you've been wonderful, and I, I, I just couldn't have gotten through this without you. But you do have your own life, and I've got to start remaking mine. I think the sooner you try, the the better you'll be. <laughs> Somehow, I, I don't feel like a widow. I feel as though any minute I'm going to hear Roger's key in the door. I know, Anne, I know. When Ed died, I used to hear, or thought I heard, mm. him coming in the back door. <laughs> Once, I even thought he was in the shower. Oh. Darling, we just don't change overnight. It takes a long time getting used to. But you buried it. You had a funeral. I know. But it, you know, it's, it's just impossible to believe death like this. I, I have to take the word of someone that I, I don't even know that my husband is dead. I, yes. Yes, I suppose that's, that's even harder to accept. I just don't have any choice. Well, I'll uh, try to get a flight out Sunday. Darling, you've got to promise me one thing. Oh, anything, ma'am. That you'll come visit me. I promise. Maybe in the fall, all right? Definitely in the fall. I'll hold you to it. And I'll call you every Sunday. Oh, yes. Yes, we must keep in touch. And much more often than we have been. But but now, don't you worry about me, Madge. I, I do have lots of friends here at the university, and I'm... I'll be all right. In time. Hello. Anne? How are you? Oh, about the same, Madge. Well, when I called last week, you seemed more cheerful. Oh, you know how it is. Day to day. Well, I'm holding you to our bargain. A visit in the fall. It's the first of October. Yes. Roger's birthday. When can I expect you? Our Texas hospitality is ready and waiting. Oh, I hadn't thought about it, Madge, but... How about a week from today? Yes, I I think I could fly out on the 8th. Oh, I was hoping you'd say that. I'm dying to see you. Oh, and I want to see you, too. I'm so anxious to talk with you. That's what sisters are for. 
I'll expect you a week from today. And you're looking wonderful. <sighs> I wish I felt it. Listen, one week under our Texas skies and you'll be a different woman. Oh, I'm a different woman, all right. How, uh, how was the plane trip? I hardly notice. Oh, that's the way it is with these jets. They're so smooth, you'd hardly know you're flying. <laughs> Olive, right? Um... You're still drinking martinis, aren't you? Well, I haven't had a drink since the accident. Well, it's time you did. Oh, here's to, uh... What? <laughs> There's not much to drink to anymore. I'm sorry. I should have realized... There's nothing worse than phony cheerfulness when you're ripped apart inside. But I thought you'd be a little better by this time. Oh, I didn't mean it that way, Madge. I, I... was doing it for myself, I guess. And I, uh, I... I don't know what to say. Well, I thought time would help. I'm not over it. I'll never get over it. I'm so glad you came anyway. It shows you're not wrapping yourself into a cocoon. Well, I haven't had the time to do that. The university wants me to go back to teaching. Well, that's a marvelous idea. Oh, they're just being nice. But I might take them up on it. When Roger was alive, he was my life. But now I have to do something. Well, for the next two weeks, you have nothing to do but relax. Oh, I wish I could relax. If I ever get over this terrible nagging feeling. It takes time, dear. Roger's death was a shock to you. That's what nags me. I've had the feeling that Roger is not dead. It gets stronger. Anne, don't torture yourself with that. I know you and Roger were very close. It's natural that at a time like this you'd feel a certain spiritual bond. Oh, no, it's more than that, Madge. This is a certainty I have that Roger is alive. I don't think he died in that cave-in. And sometimes we want to believe so strongly... So that we get carried away. No, no, no. This, this time I... All right, Anne. Maybe I'm wrong. If it helps you to believe this way, that's best. If it makes getting up in the morning easier... Oh, it does. But the nights... Oh, those nights. Finish your martini. And I'll tell you what we're going to do tonight. We're going to El Vadro. Across the border. It's a typical Mexican border town, but loads of fun. Even on a Monday night. Oh. You just can't be unhappy with all that Latin well, music, the color, the lights. I don't know if I'm up to that, man. Well, I know you don't want phony cheerfulness, but try a little gaiety, huh? Just for me. Well, all right. And um, maybe I'll take another martini. <laughs> I'm feeling looser already. What did I tell you? <laughs> it is exciting. <laughs> hey, how about a fresh taco? Delicious. Oh, somehow they're better from the street vendors. Mm. Yeah, I would like to buy a silver piece. Oh. I love Mexican silver jewelry. I know the perfect shop. It's on a side street. Ah, they sell all sorts of stuff. But their silver counter is the best in town. Great. Come on. I spend almost every other weekend down here. Oh, I love it. It place. is garish, though, Mad, don't you think? Of course. <laughs> That's what makes it delightful. Uh, Mad. Yes? Look. In the front of that shop. The pictures. What about them? I, I, I've got to have a closer look. And what's the hurry? What is it? Look, look at this painting, Madge. Oh, yes. You see it, too. Well... And no, no, really, it's a good likeness. But, but even to the little mole on his neck. Oh. Madge, this is a painting of Roger. An exact likeness. And, and look at the date below the artist's name. August of this year. Yes, I see. That was three months after the accident. <laughs> it really be a portrait of Anne Markle's late husband, Roger? It's not easy to have your portrait painted three months after you're presumed dead. Unless, of course, you aren't dead. 
Madge seems to think it's just a likeness, that it's not really Roger Markle in the painting. But try to convince Anne of that. You'll see how impossible that is when I return shortly with Act Two. The long arm of coincidence seems to be injecting itself into Anne Markle's life. In a small Mexican border town, she has found a portrait of her husband, presumably painted three months after he was buried under tons of earth and rock in an Arizona cave-in. Surely it's coincidence that some artist painted the portrait. But I wonder, perhaps the artist had a model for his painting. Anne has never accepted the fact of her husband's death. It is Roger. There's no doubt. The face, the expression in the eyes, it's it's Roger. Can you make out the artist's name? I see there's an initial E. C-R-E-N... Crenshaw. E. Crenshaw. Signora is interested in the painting. Very much. It, It happens to be a portrait of my husband. Ah, Senora will surely want to buy it. Oh, yes, I'll buy it. But I, I, I must know where you got it. Why, from the artist. I represent him here. I receive his work on... Oh, you call... I, it's a big American word. C- consignment. See, si, that is what he calls it. Uh-huh. I display them here and get 20% of the selling price. Well, well, where can I find this artist, this E. Crenshaw? Signora is interested in buying the portrait. I'm more interested in finding the artist. Would fifty dollars be satisfactory? A hundred, if you'll take me to the painter. I I, I must talk to him. Sold for one hundred dollars. Right. American, of course. Yes. The painter lives just outside the town in the flats. Yes. And now, can you give me his address? Oh, Signora, there are no addresses in the flats. Oh. Uh... Just ask anyone for the Americano. Americano. Or look for the greenhouse at the end of the row. Oh. He's the only one that's painted. Excuse me, Senora. I will wrap the painting. And you're only going to hurt yourself even more. The man who posed for this can't be Roger. I'll know when I talk to this E. Crenshaw. I'll be able to tell by his answers whether it was Roger or not, but I... I already know it is. You're not thinking of going there tonight. Why not? Well, there aren't any street lights out there. Practically no streets. The flats are nothing but tar paper sheds. Well, will you take me there first thing in the morning? Please, Madge. No wonder there aren't any addresses. There aren't any streets. Well, that's what I told you last night. The flats are a sore point with the village Um, government. Well, why should this Crenshaw want to live out here? Well, it doesn't cost anything. Oh, there's the greenhouse. Well... Certainly different from the rest. <laughs> the artist's touch, no doubt. Yes. That's bigger than the others, too. Ah, and there's your artist. Looks like he's expecting us. Oh, but how would he know? Well, I imagine the grapevine is very well developed down here. Mm. Oh, he's waving. Well, at least he seems friendly enough. <laughs> Good morning. Fine day, isn't it? Yes, yes. M- Mr. Crenshaw? Yeah, that's me. Welcome to my humble villa. You were expecting this. I heard a charming American woman was interested in one of my paintings. Bought one, in fact. May we talk? It's very important to me. Certainly. This way, ladies. Thank I have you. fresh coffee Thank on. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm Anne Markle, and this is my sister Madge Connors. Oh, how do you do? Doubly charmed. It's not much of a villa, but I like it. After you, ladies. Oh, wow. What a pad. <laughs> What do the natives think of it? (laughs) They think I'm crazy. (laughs) Sit down. Well, I would like to get right to the point, Mr. Crenshaw. This painting of yours... Yes, I like that one. It's one of the best likenesses I've done. Well, I'm convinced that the man in your painting is my husband. Oh? You painted this last August. Now, how did you meet him? Did, Did he tell you his name? No, as a matter of fact, he didn't seem to know his name. What? What? I met him in a bar one night, the Cantina Flora. He was sitting there staring into a beer. I started sketching him, and we got to talking. You don't mind? Uh, no. You've got a sensitive face. Musician? No. What's your business? Uh, I don't know. I I mean, uh, 
Lots of things. I, I, I'm not really sure. Head a little to the left, please. Mm. No, thanks. I'm uh, Ed Crenshaw. Jose, two more beers, please. Don't want to tell me your name? Well, it doesn't matter. We all go through life anonymously anyway. Well, I'm, uh... I'm not sure. I, I can't uh, remember exactly. Something wrong? No. I, I don't think so. Why? Well, you don't seem to... Now, nah, forget it. We all have our reasons. Question period over. <laughs> I'm, uh... Trying to, to get to Acapulco. Uh, you've got a long way to go. Yes, I, I know. I'm uh, trying to find a girl. A girl. I knew there was a lovely girl. And uh, I, I can't quite remember her face. Her name was uh, Anne. Oh, running after instead of away from? No, no. I uh, seem to have run out of money. Head just a little higher, please. Mm hmm. Well, I'll give you ten bucks for posing. I can probably get you a ride to Acapulco tomorrow. For free. I know the comings and goings of everybody in town. Well, that'd be fine. Well, that just about does it. Want to see it? Uh, see what? Here. Well, that, uh... That looks like someone I know. Oh, I'll fill in the colors later. Uh, listen, um... Uh, you, you stay here a minute. Uh, have another beer. I want to make a phone call about that ride. Okay? Okay. I went to the phone to call the police. This this guy needed help. He wasn't drunk. He was dazed. He, he, he didn't know who he was. I figured the police might have something about a guy missing. Mm -hmm. And? I called him and then went back to the bar. He was gone. Pat. Roger's alive. He's been here. He's alive and dazed, and we've got to find him. Now, do you believe me? Yes, I do. Mr. Crenshaw, how was this man dressed? Mm, well, work clothes, sort of. Come to think of it, I, I remember noticing how his face didn't seem to go with the clothes. No, my, my husband is a college professor, Mr. Crenshaw, and a, a geologist. Oh, of course. He was in those clothes because six months ago he was digging geological specimens in an Arizona cave, and and there was a cave in. Oh. And he was reported dead. I've been a widow for six months, but I never believed it. No, he escaped from that cave-in, and he is trying to find me. What? We spent our honeymoon in Acapulco 25 years ago, and I'm the girl he's trying to find. I'm Anne. I know this sounds outrageous, Mr. Crenshaw, but I, I believe she's right. Professor Markle is obviously suffering from some sort of amnesia. Can we notify the police between here and Acapulco to, to look for him? Yes, but it's been, what, all, almost two months since he was here. A, a long time. Madge, I want to go. Mr. Crenshaw, you've been so kind. May I offer you no, some money? No, 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 no money at a time like this. But promise to let me know what happens. Oh, I promise. I do promise. Come on, Madge. I'm going to the police. And th and then I'm flying to Acapulco. To the hotel where we spent our honeymoon. Good morning, my dear. I have a reservation. Mrs. Ann Markle. Oh, uh, one moment, please. Yes, Mrs. Markle. Room 511. Uh, will you sign the registry, please? Of course. <clears throat> May I ask how long you've been on the desk here? Four years, madam. Oh. Oh, would you look at this painting, please? Tell me if this man has checked in here in the last month or two. Uh, I would not want to get involved, madam. Uh, you would have to see the manager for that. No, please. Uh, this is a painting of my husband. And I have a very strong reason to believe that he may have come here in the past six to eight weeks. Uh, you see, my husband is suffering from amnesia. Yes. Oh. This gentleman was here about uh, three, uh, no, no, four weeks ago. Oh. I remember him oh, well. You do? Yes, he left without paying his bill. But I'll take care of it. I'll pay it. But, but tell me, when did he leave? Did he say where he was going? No, madam. I remember I was on the desk when he came in. I had just come on duty. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'd, I'd like a room, please. A certain particular room. Oh, we are fairly well booked, sir. Which uh, room did you wish? Well, it uh, it faces the water, and uh, 
There's a, there's a little balcony, a balcony with uh, with flowers. We have two hundred rooms like that. Oh, well, let me think. Uh, uh, five something. Five 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 eleven. Yes, five eleven. Uh, let me take a look. Hmm. You are in love. Yes, five eleven is available. Uh, would you sign the register, please? Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, is there something wrong, sir? Uh, no, no, no. Just. I'm just trying to think. Uh, oh. There. I'm uh, meeting my wife. I uh, expect she'll be along shortly. Yes, sir, Mr. Smith. Uh, Smith? Did you signed the register, Mr. Smith. I did? Well, yes, sir. Well, how very curious. I wonder why I did that. Well, sir. My, my, my name is... Uh, May, may I have the key, please? Yes, sir. I'm going to our room, and you tell Mrs. Uh, my, my, my wife I've already gone up. I saw him around the hotel for a day or two, and then he vanished. Room 511 was our honeymoon suite 25 years ago. Look, may I see the registry, please, of the, of the day that he registered? Oh, yes, madam. Uh, Let's see, September 20th, 15th, 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 15th. yes. Here it is. That is the gentleman's signature. John Smith. Yes. That, that is my husband's handwriting. He used the room, but never checked out. In fact, uh, uh, one moment. In the safe here, I have something uh, one of the maids turned in. Uh, would this have belonged to uh, your husband? <gasps> I gave him this ring on our 10th wedding anniversary. And this Mr. Smith was actually your husband? There is no doubt of it now. How was he dressed? Oh, I, I, I don't really remember, madam. Well, was he in, like, work boots, you know, and, and the clothes? That... No, 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 no. If he had been, I, I would have hesitated to accommodate him. He was wearing an inexpensive suit, I believe, oh. uh, and he had only a small suitcase. Yes, he, mu he must have bought the clothes in Il Vadro. If uh, madame would uh, care to consider the bill. Oh, oh of course, and add it to mine. I'll, I'll be here for a while. I'm going to try and have the Acapulco police search for him. They will be quite cooperative, madame. Uh, but this was four weeks ago. Do you think he has reason to stay in Acapulco? I don't know. He's suffering from some sort of memory loss, and all I can do is look for him. Just as he seems to be looking for me. Hello? Mrs. Margot? Yes. This is Manuel, uh, on the desk downstairs. Oh, we uh, talked yesterday about your husband. Yes. Something occurred to me last night. Uh, the day before he, uh, well, uh, disappeared, uh, he came to the desk asking for his wife. Uh, no name, just uh, my wife. Yes. And he said he wanted to find her because they had to be leaving for Los Angeles. What? He said his uh, graduate classes were starting and he had to get back. Of course. That's where he'd go next. Uh, Manuel, is it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Would you have my bill made up right away? I I'm flying out as soon as I can get a reservation. Oh, and would you have the operator place a call to Mrs. Madge Connors, C-O-N-N-E-R-S, and that's Laredo, Texas. The area code is 512-768-3112. Madge, I'm on my way to Los Angeles. What? I have one more lead to trace. A little apartment Roger and I had in Westwood when he was studying for his master's at UCLA. Well, what brought that up? Roger was here in Acapulco, Madge. Are you sure? I have Roger's ring. The one I gave him. What? They found it under the bed in the room he had. And the clerk remembered him. He says Roger told him that he had to get back to Los Angeles for graduate classes. And that's exactly where we went when we came back from our honeymoon. Anne, I think it's time you went to the newspapers. You know, you can't skip all over the country. No, no, I don't want that kind of publicity. Not for Roger. But the papers can describe his condition. Someone knowing the story might see him and then... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll consider it after I've been to Los Angeles. Do you want me to meet you there? No, thanks, Madge. I'll go alone. And, and I'll call you, honey, from L.A. tomorrow. All right, dear. I'll sit by the phone. And pray, Madge. Oh, pray for me. On a wing and...
again a prayer, Anne Markle goes to Los Angeles for one more trace of her missing husband. It appears that Professor Roger Markle, stunned from the cave-in he escaped in Arizona, is wandering through his past life trying to find his wife, Anne. And Anne is frantically trying to follow his trail and, with luck, to intercept him. We'll pick up the trail that leads to a surprising outcome when I return shortly with Act Three. In these days of modern jet transportation, one can go anywhere in a matter of hours. The jet plane is indeed a magic carpet that can eliminate the distance between lovers and bring them together. Now Anne Markle rides such a magic carpet, settling gently on the runway at Los Angeles, closing the distance between her and her husband, whom she sure is in this city, looking for her. A cab ride to a Westwood hotel, a restless night, and next morning we join Anne in front of a neat white garden apartment. Yes? You're the superintendent. That's right. But we haven't got any vacancies, ma'am. No, no, no. It's not that. I'm looking for someone. Yeah? Have you by any chance seen this man in this painting recently? <laughs> Last week. Last week? Yeah. Caught him trying to get into apartment 2A. Our apartment. What was that? The, the man was my husband. We lived in apartment 2A 25 years ago. 25 years ago? Yes. Yeah, maybe that explains it. He raised a hell of a fuss. Oh, he's suffering from amnesia. What what happened? People in 2B called. Said some guy was hammering on the door to the apartment next door. I look out the window across the pool. Sure enough, this guy is on the balcony in front of 2A, banging on the door. I hightail it over. And... Anne, open this door. Hey, what's going on here? What you want? I want to get into my apartment. Anne, are you in there? This isn't your apartment. The Murphys live here. I took this place a month ago, just before my honeymoon. Look, Mac, if you want trouble, I know how to hand it out. Now, scram. Who are you to tell me to get out? I'm getting Mr. Foster. Uh, Mr. who? The super. Now, you're the one who'd better scram. I'm the super. The devil you are. I never saw you before. Now, look, buddy. Let's go quietly, and I won't call the police. Now, Otherwise, why doesn't she answer? Anne! Okay, let's go. Come on. Anne, why don't you answer? Anne! Anne! Anne. He called my name. It was you he was looking for? Oh, yes. And he called my name. That means he knows who I am. Maybe he even knows who he is by now. What, what happened then? Where, where did he go? I ushered him out to the street and didn't see him again. A and this was a week ago? A week yesterday. If he's like you say he is, the police might have picked him up. Why don't you try them? Oh, if only they have. Sure hope you find him soon. Fellow running around like that could get into trouble. <laughs> Madge, it's Anne. Anne, what's the news? Roger's on his way home to Chicago. I'm flying out immediately. What? Will you come and stay with me? I I need you now, Madge. Well, of course. I'll leave tonight. But how do you know he's going home? He got a ride. He might even be there looking for me. And I, Look, I'm going to tell you all about it when I see you. And I even hounded the airlines trying to see if Roger might have flown out of Los Angeles during the week. And nothing, right? Now, mm. come on. Stop the cat and mouse and tell me how you know Roger's in Chicago. I was having lunch in a little coffee shop in the valley. Yes. A truck stop, really. And I'd been walking and showing Roger's painting. I, I guess people thought I was a crazy woman. Well, it was a little erratic. But I put the painting down on the counter. Mm. And when I ordered a chicken sandwich, the counter clerk looked at the painting... And told me Roger had been there. Oh. He was positive. Because, as he put it, the guy was trying to get a ride to Chicago. Well, he told me one of the truck drivers offered Roger a ride, and they left together. Oh, Anne. Now, this was six days ago. All the time I was chasing around Los Angeles, Roger was on his way home. Oh. Well, I, I almost expected him to open the door for me when I got in this afternoon. He wasn't there, of course, but now at last... We're in the same city together. 
Oh, Roger's coming home. How about a movie tonight? No. No, I want to go to Kelsey's. Again? We've been there three nights in a row. Matt, I feel so sure that Roger might turn up there. We spent so many happy evenings there when we first came to Chicago. Honey, we've got the police and all the newspapers on the lookout. Why don't we just sit tight? I can't, Madge. I have to keep doing something to, to keep from going crazy. Okay. Kelsey's it is. But I think that bartender is starting to wonder about us. Pretty sure at least that Roger's in Chicago or on his way. Yes. Just a matter of time. Why not try to relax? I'm closer to him than I've been yet. I can't relax. I it just might be any minute, even here. I, I feel that I'm doing something. Putting myself in this path perhaps only, but in his condition anything might happen to him. I I almost feel that I ought to be on the street match. But let's look at the window. Look. What? It's Roger. He's there on the sidewalk. He's looking right in at me. Roger? Good Lord. Excuse me, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I'm in a ter- 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 terrible hurry. Excuse me. Ro- Roger. Roger? Roger? Anne, where is he? I don't know. I saw Roger at the window. I, I, I thought he saw me. He, he looked right at me, but he's gone. Oh, I've got to find him. He can't be far. Anne, Wait. When it is too late, Anne! Oh, thank heavens for you, Lieutenant Holmes. Well, I heard the call come over the radio. <laughs> Curious. I knew immediately it had something to do with this Professor Markle. I'm frantic about Anne. Where could she go? Well, she could have turned down any of these side streets. Oh, she's so upset she'd take any chance to find her husband. Mrs. Connors, do you think Professor Markle is alive? Why, of course. I mean, Mrs. Markle isn't imagining this, wanting to hope... I thought it might be like that at first, Lieutenant, but I was with her when she found the painting and when she talked with the artist. And then Professor Markle did turn up in Acapulco and in Los Angeles. And you saw him tonight? Well, Anne saw him first. My my back was to the window, but when I turned, I saw someone moving away. Well, if he's alive in this city, we'll find him. Tonight, Mrs. Markle, too. No, he, he just couldn't have gone this far so fast. He didn't recognize me. He, he looked as though he, he didn't even see me. Maybe I'd better go back. He couldn't have come this far. Oh, Roger. Roger, where are you? Anne, over here. Madge, is that you? Oh, thank God we found you. I called the police. I'm with Lieutenant Holmes. Come, get in. Oh, Madge. I've lost him. I've sent out an alert on the whole area, Mrs. Markle. We'll find him. Get in. We'll keep on cruising. I just didn't know which way to turn. I took a chance and went left, but he he must have gone the other way. We'll cruise back. Keep your eyes open. It's harder to recognize someone at night. Patch. There, look. Huh? That man at the end of the block. Where? I... I think... Yes. Oh, stop, Lieutenant. Please stop. He's walking toward us. That, that's Roger's walk. It is Roger. See him? He's in the light of the street lamp now. Anne. Roger, over here, Roger. Oh, he doesn't hear me. Anne, wait. Roger. Roger. Anne, stop. Look out. Get out. Anne. Oh, God. Car 51 to headquarters. Ambulance to Elman Springs. Ambulance. Come on. Stand back, everybody. Please, please. Stand back, everybody. I can't look. I can't look. Is she... Is she... I don't know. I don't know. Oh, why did she run like that? It wasn't Roger. There wasn't anyone there on the street. And And there you are. Oh, Roger, at last. Oh, I've been looking everywhere for you, darling. I know, dearest. Oh, I knew you were alive all the time. I kept looking. I kept following you. I never gave up. You were following me? Yes. Well, I was looking for you. 
I, I couldn't find you at the honeymoon suite, and then in Los Angeles, our old apartment. I remember? Think, yes. Uh, well, I you think. you weren't there either, and I was confused. I kept trying to think where would Anne go next, and then I knew. Yes, yes, we left Los Angeles when I got the teaching job in Chicago. And that's just what I did. When I learned you were on your way to Acapulco, I just knew you were looking for me in the old, the old places. <laughs> I, I, I tried to think where you'd go next. Yes, two minds with a single thought. Because we've been one since the day we were married. Yes. Oh, Anne, I knew, I knew that someday I'd find you. Come, Roger. Oh, let's go home. Home? Mm-hmm. To our apartment. Well, that isn't home for us anymore, Anne. Roger, dear. I know you've suffered a terrible shock, but we'll, we'll work it out together. You'll be fine. It'll take time, but trust me. You don't understand, do you, Anne? Oh, I do, darling. And I'm going to help you. No. No, I should have realized. It's too soon. But what's too soon? You'll understand in time. What is it, Roger? What are you trying to say? I didn't realize the truth until I saw you. And now I know. And you'll know soon, too, my darling. Roger, I trust you. If you say so, then that's enough for me. Come in. It's time for us to go. To be together, always. And that's all I want, Roger. Is to be together, always. Hey, don't look so worried. Let me tell you the trouble I had realizing just what was happening. I'm sorry, Mrs. Connors. There's no pulse. Oh, dear God. Mrs. Markle is dead. Love has a way of fulfilling itself. Across eternity, Anne and Roger Markle find each other. And Madge, earthbound and mourning for her sister, cannot know the joy Roger and Anne are sharing. She will bury her sister's body without the slightest inkling of Anne and Roger's present happiness. For they love one another and have found one another. And what more could either of them ask? I'll be back shortly. If you have not yet prepared your will, please listen carefully. Without a will, the laws of the state and not you will determine who receives your property and in what amounts. Who manages the affairs of your estate? Your choice as guardian of your minor children may never be known. Your loved ones could face unnecessary legal costs and needless court delays. Now, for only $12.95, you can make your own will quickly and safely with the American Will Kit. You'll receive simple fill-in-the-blank will forms with easy-to-follow directions. The forms were prepared by lawyers to be valid in all 50 states. Order now, and you'll also receive, free of charge, our easy-reading personal protection guide, giving you important tips and special information that can save you money. Now is the time to take advantage of this special mail order opportunity. To order, call toll-free 1-800-542-1212. Only $12.95 plus shipping. That's 1-800-542-1212. Money back if not satisfied. Call now, 1-800-542-1212. The rent bill, the car payment, Betty's braces. I wish I was made of money. I wish I could fall asleep. Sandman, help me to sleep. Mr. Sandman. It's me, but not with sand. These days, for occasional sleeplessness, I have Compose Sleep Aid. Compose helps you fall asleep faster, sooner than without it. I'm sleepier already. Sleep well. Compose. Use only as directed. C-O-M-P-O-Z. Recommended by the Sandman. Some people chase rainbows. Others chase butterflies. We're all pursuing something in life. A hope, a dream, a mate, even happiness. And when the object of our pursuit is love, no barrier is too great to overcome. For love is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. The monarch butterfly of all human needs and emotions. And in our story just concluded, it was a force that transcended even death. 
Our cast included Betsy Palmer, Joan Shea, Larry Haynes, Gil Mack, and Robert Maxwell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Here on the Family Game Show, we've asked our contestant parents how often their children exercise. Parents, what's your answer? One hour a day. What do you say, kids? Almost never, except for ten minutes of recess at school. <laughs> No idea. Don't feel bad. Most parents overestimate the amount of exercise their kids get. They often think their kids get all the exercise they need at school. Now, Don, what's the winning answer? How much exercise should kids get? Well, Bob, it's one to two hours of vigorous exercise a day. You know, daily exercise is a must for all of us, especially young people. One to two hours each day will keep young people fit and healthy, more alert for school, better able to handle stress, off the streets, out of trouble. You can win big. Make sure daily exercise is a part of your family game. Remember, fitness is feeling great. A message from the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WWJ News Radio 95. I'm Earl Dickinson. And in the next few minutes, we will have complete details on these stories of police chase in Detroit ends in the arrest of a man wanted for murder. A classic Tucker automobile auctions for a record price. Communication workers at Michigan Bell give the okay to a new contract over there. These stories coming up along with sports at... Uh, 115, and you know by now the Toronto Blue Jays have gotten back into this playoff series with the Oakland A's. Weather Command predicts partly cloudy and cool this morning, a low in the upper 30s, very chilly. Saturday, later today, partly cloudy, windy, cool, a high only about 52 degrees. Look ahead to Sunday, partly sunny, another chilly day, maybe an afternoon sprinkle. A high pushing that 50 degree mark. All news, all the time. News Radio 95, WWJ, Detroit. CBS News. I'm Jim Shenevy. Some low-income elderly folks can sleep a little easier. The Senate has refused to repeal catastrophic health coverage. The upper chamber instead voted to preserve some benefits of the plan. Neanderthal man. Operator? Are you there, Operator? She's probably gone out for a spot of tea. Or a date with one of the music hall boys. <laughs> you people be quiet. Isn't she pretty when she's excited, Hayes? Oh, quiet, quiet. Operator. Operator. Why would anyone be so anxious to call one's sister anyway? I can't for the life of me imagine. Will you two please go take a walk or something? <laughs> Operator, are you there? You could write your sister a letter, you know, instead of trying to call her long distance. I'd probably get in touch with her sooner. Are you there, operator? Oh, I had her on the line just a moment ago. Now, if it were her young man she were calling, I'd know why she's so very anxious. I say, old man, it so happens I am the lady's young man. Oh. Well, I'll have nothing to do with either of you if you don't stop teasing me. My dear girl, do you really want to get that call through to your sister? Oh, no, I'm just standing here jiggling this receiver for the exercise. Ajax says it's good for the arm muscles. 
Operator, will you please answer? Here, old girl. Let me have a try. Reggie, go away. Don't bother me. Permit me, milady, to assist you. No, Reggie. One side now, one side. Reggie, this call's important. Just why I'm so anxious to help you. Now, look here, operator. We've been trying... Huh? What's that? Oh, operator. Yes, into a telephone transmitter, but if... I... I say, now, look here, my girl, if you oh, want... give me that receiver. Oh, but, Mandy... Are you there, operator? Yes. I wish to place a call. We were disconnected. This is Amanda Loveland. Yes. At Lookout Point. That's right. The artist called me. I wish to speak to Miss Grace Loveland, number 12, Garrett Street, London. Yes, that's right. How soon can you get through to London, please? Very well. Will you call me back? Thank you. There, you see? The damsels always come running when a gentleman calls. Oh, Reggie, save your humor for some other time, will you? I say. Something wrong, old girl? Uh, I don't know. Why do you use that tone, darling? Well, look here, Amanda. Nothing wrong with your sister, is there? No, it, it's not that. But something's wrong. I can tell by the way you've been acting. Yes, you were certainly never in such a hurry to call Grace before. I, uh... I'm anxious to know where she was today. Where she was? Yes. She was supposed to be attending a tea party in London, but... Well, I've reason to think she wasn't there. Well, so suppose she wasn't. Why should that upset you? Perhaps if, if I tell you, you'll understand. Yes. Something's wrong. I certainly want to know about it. Yes, Amanda, by all means, tell us what's troubling you. Yes. Yes, I must tell somebody. Reggie, will you please close the door? Well, certainly, darling. Now, Amanda, sit here. No. No, I'd rather not sit down. Say, you are upset. Yes. I had the strangest experience this afternoon. You did? Where? In Nano Canyon. So that's where you were today. No wonder we couldn't find you. Reg and I wanted uh, you to go up to the falls with us. I went into the canyon to paint. Well, we gathered you were off somewhere working. I noticed your equipment wasn't around any place. You've been there, haven't you, in the canyon? Oh, not I. I've been planning to go there, though. Oh, I've been a couple of times. Why didn't you tell me you were going into Nano? I've gone along. There's only one way into the canyon from this end, you know. Yes, near Flagstone Point. It's 12 miles to the other end. Well, I arrived at Flagstone Point about noon. So I climbed down the path and picked out a shady spot in the canyon to eat the lunch I'd taken along. Yes? After that, I looked around a while and... Then picked out a scene near the entrance to the canyon. To paint? Of course, to paint haze. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, dear. It was a perfect scene. The light was just right, so I spent most of the afternoon there until the light began to fade. Did you finish the sketching? Yes. Filled in a great deal of the color. It was really going to be quite good. What do you mean, going to be? I'll never finish it. Why, dear? Because... I never want to go back there again. Well, what on earth happened? Oh, why doesn't that operator get that call through to London? Amanda, tell us what happened in the canyon. Yes, for heaven's sake, the suspense. What happened was like a nightmare. Darling. Yes, like a nightmare. Just as I was getting ready to pack up my things, I heard a noise behind me. A low rumbling noise. And when I looked around, I saw that a side of the canyon was caving in. My word, landslide? Yes. The whole side of the canyon was falling away, making a terrific noise about it. Left a sheer vertical cliff there, where it had been sloping before. Yes? Right where the only path down into the canyon had been. You mean you were trapped there in the canyon? I certainly was. With night coming on. And you know the stories they tell around here about Nanor Canyon. Yes, they say the place is simply oozing with ghosts at night. Oh, No, right. really, Reggie. The place does have a, a reputation. Oh, I've heard the stories, but you don't want to believe everything you hear, you know. Well, how on earth did you get out of the canyon, Amanda? I had a beastly time of it. Did you get out before dark? I certainly did not. As soon as I saw that the path was cut off from the land side, I... I started walking along the side of the canyon, trying to find a way up. But there are no others. Didn't I find that out? I, I walked and walked, and all the time it was growing darker and darker, and finally the sun went down, and a ghostly gloom settled over the canyon. I began to walk faster, but I couldn't find any place that looked like a way up. A 
can't walk for miles. No way out of here. The air is so dark. All I can do is keep walking. Oh! Oh, What's that? Some some night birds. Yes, yes, that's all. Such a weird sound. I've never heard anything like it before. Kevin, it's gone. That's strange. That bird was the only noise I've heard in this place. No other night noises at all. <gasps> Good heaven. What's that up there? Light. Shining on a human figure. <gasps> Am I losing my mind? It's Grace there in the light. Oh, no. Oh, no, it can't be. Uh... Grace! Grace! That is Grace, standing there in that strange glow of light. Pointing. Gesturing as they're trying to show me a path out of here. Yes. Yes, she is directing me out of the canyon. The light. I can see the way out. Grace! Grace, is that you? Is that you, Grace? The light's fading away. She's gone. There's still that strange light shining on the way out of this awful place. There actually was a path leading up out of that canyon. How else do you suppose I got back here? Amazing. That strange light continued to glow until I found the path and managed to climb up. When I looked back, it was pitch dark in the canyon again. Amanda, are you certain you didn't dream all of that? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Reggie. No, I don't think it was a dream. Well, what makes you say that? Oh, well, it must be London. Are you there? Yes? Yes, this is Amanda Loveland. Yes, ready for my call to London, thank you. Are you there, Grace? Oh, darling, this is Amanda. Oh, fine, thank you. Darling, have you been in London all day? Oh. Oh, no, nothing's wrong. Oh, no, don't worry, dear. Everything's all right. Yes. I may be coming to London soon. All right, darling. Take care of yourself. Goodbye, dear. Grace has been in London all day. Surely. There in the canyon in that strange light, I saw her as plainly as I see you now. But the voice wasn't hers. Then how are we going to account for what happened? There is... Only one way to account for it. You mean... Hey, you think you know what happened to me? I think so. You were guided out of that canyon by... by a swarf. A swarf? A swarf. It's a name commonly applied to a supernatural spirit with the power of impersonating some earthly being. Impersonating, you say? Yes, there's no explanation. Except that swarps have often been seen in these parts. Now, this... This particular spirit took the earthly shape of your sister and helped you find a way out of your temporary prison. No, oh, I don't believe such things happen, Hayes. Well, you'd certainly believe it if you'd experienced it like I did. Yes, Reggie, you're wrong. Those things do happen. Swarfs do appear in this vicinity. But that's, that's, that's weird. Well, it certainly is. See one sister appear in a place in the darkness and speak in a voice and then to learn she was actually hundreds of miles away at the time. Amanda, is this the landscape you were doing? Oh, yes. Mind if I have removed the cover and have a look? Oh, no, go right ahead. 
Just as I left off after packing up. Oh, here, hey. You better let me give you a hand. If you spoil one of Amanda's paints, you... I say, look, Amanda. Have you seen this since you left the canyon? No. No, I told you I haven't. Look at it. There, in the right-hand corner. A strange, monstrous-looking creature. Lurking in the shadows. Amanda, were you conscious of the fact you were painting that fantastic creature into the picture? No. No, I wasn't. I hadn't even noticed it. That's very strange. Yes. Isn't it? If your perspective is correct, Amanda... That creature is about eight feet tall. A huge, fiendish thing. But how did it ever become a part of my painting? Yes. How? Well, we'll find out. What do you mean, Hayes? We'll go down into the canyon and have a look. Oh, no. Not me. Oh, I... I mean tomorrow, of course. When it's daylight... Father, Amanda. We're practically there. What amazes me is that you couldn't find the way the swarf pointed out to you last night, Amanda. I'm sorry, Hayes. It doesn't seem to be there today. Oh, well, what's the difference? It didn't take us long to come in from the other end of the canyon on horseback. Yes, the only thing that annoys me is that we couldn't ride the animals all the way. Oh, well, the walking won't hurt you. Besides, we've only been afoot a few hundred yards. Oh, oh, here we are. This is the spot I was painting. I... Set up my canvas over there on that little mound. Hmm. Uh, Then according to the sketch you made, that fearful creature was lurking uh, about here. Reggie, look here. Bones. Human bones down there in that crevice. Oh, I say, those can't be human bones. Oh, no, they're much too large. I should say so. You're wrong, both of you. They are human bones. I've studied anatomy enough to recognize the clavicle... Humerus and ulna of the human arm. And the, and the femur and fibula of the leg there. Joe, Hayes is right. This was some gigantic prehistoric creature. Heaven knows how many years old. Could, could this skeleton have any connection with the ghostly figure in my painting? It could, yes. It's just possible that the spirit of this prehistoric man is himself a swarf and can take on a human shape. The spirit, I mean. Precisely. He saw Amanda sitting there on that mound, painting. He assumed a shape she couldn't make out, but one which her professional brush caught in the sketching. Then... Then he could have assumed the form of my sister. If our theory is correct, yes. That's fantastic. But... But how can we learn anything about this... This thing that was buried here in this crevice. There's one way I know of. We can consult Dr. Gustav. By Jove, you're right. Dr. Gustav's staying at the colony. Well, then let's go get him and bring him here. Yes, let's. Who knows? We may have discovered something entirely unknown to our civilization. Dr. Gustav? Yes. Your suspicions were correct, my friends. These are human bones. Can you identify them, Doctor? I most certainly can. This was a Neanderthal man. Neanderthal? Well, the Neanderthal man existed thousands of years ago. True, Miss Loveland. From 20 to 40,000 years ago. There's no mistake about it? Not the slightest. This is a fossilized remains of an ancient man. Uh, here, look. Look at these uh, peculiarly shaped molar teeth. Now, that's, that's one sign. Every bone of his body shows some distinct markings. Many of them are of simian nature. Ape-like, you mean? Exactly. Eyebrow ridges were like those of the gorilla. 
Rufus' skull was low like theirs, and yet his brain most probably surpassed the modern Europeans in size and ability. How long ago did you say he existed? The date of his culture may be put down tentatively as extending from 40,000 to 20,000 B.C. The Neanderthal man appears to have been the sole occupant of Europe during the middle of the Pleistocene period, throughout the time in which the Mousterian culture prevailed. He buried his dead with great signs of respect. He worked flint implements with great skill. He was a fine hunter. Lived in caves and rock shelters. But, Doctor, after all this time, his remains should be quite deep in the earth. I know. And he undoubtedly has been buried deeply through the centuries. But some uh, subterranean disturbance must have caused this crevice and exposed his burial place. Look. Did you men see this? What, dear? Hmm. A stone tablet. There's some sort of strange... Pictures on it. Uh, let, let me see. Let me see, please. Ah, hmm. Yes, sir. Just so. Just so. What is it, Dr. Gustav? Why, this is the final proof. This is a picture writing of the Neanderthal man. Can you decipher it? I can, indeed. And uh, now, let's see. This this portion here, my left, that's... No, that's indiscernible. But the rest of it reads... Who... Moves my bones will surely die as I have died. Mm. A curse. Well, then, <laughs> let's take his advice and leave him alone. Oh, not on your life, sir. Hmm? Why, why, this is one of the most amazing finds of the century. These bones must be removed to the museum and uh, reconstructed. But the warning on the stone tablet. Oh, nonsense, <laughs> Miss Loveland, nonsense. Do you think a curse can continue to exist through 40,000 years? 400 centuries? <laughs> oh, no. Well, Mandy, this is the museum. Ever been here before? Once, when I was a child. Uncle Reginald brought me. Mm. How long has it been since the Neanderthal man was brought here? Oh, at least six weeks. Well, Dr. Gustav said in his letter that the man had been completely reconstructed. The skeleton had been placed in a standing position in a special room. Now there's the room, see? Oh, yes, the sign over the door. The Neanderthal man. Now let's go look before we visit the doctor, shall we? Right. Hmm. Yeah, here we are. The door was open. That... What? But this room is empty. Yes. But th there's a stone base over there. Those thing might have been built up on it. Hmm. That's strange. I oh. beg your pardon. Uh, yes, what is it? I am called Vanif. Could you direct me... To Dr. Gustav's study. Oh, why, yes. It's at the end of the hall. See, his name is in black letters on that frosted door pane. Oh, yes. I thank you so very much. Pardon me for having disturbed you. Reggie. Amanda. That man, Joe, what a giant. At least eight feet tall. That bushy eyebrows and low forehead looked like an ape. And what was wrong with his neck? He held his head crooked over to one side. One shoulder humped up in a terribly grotesque position. Did you see whether or not he went into the doctor's office? Oh, no, I didn't. Reggie, if I didn't know better, I'd think that man was... Was what, dear? Oh, nothing. I know what you're thinking. That warning, Reggie. Who moves my bones will die as I have died. Amanda, look. What? There in the room, on the stone base, <gasps> the skeleton of a prehistoric man. But he wasn't there just a few moments ago. Good Lord, come on, into the doctor's office. Dr. Gustav! Dr. Gustav! Dr. Gustav! Good heavens. Oh. 
Red. What's happened to him? He's dead. Broken neck. He was sitting at his desk. Writing. Writing? He was caught on the Neanderthal man. Look. He just completed one sentence. It is my finding that the death of the Neanderthal man discovered in Manor Canyon was caused by a broken neck. of the Neanderthal. Another original tale of dark fantasy, written by Scott Bishop. Ben Morris was heard as Reggie, Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Amanda, Murillo Schofield was Hayes, Fred Wayne played Dr. Gustav, and Daryl McAllister was Banner. Next Friday night at the same time, we'll bring you another story of the fantastic and the unusual, created by Scott Bishop. Listen for Death from the Past, a strange, weird adventure laid in modern America with the flavor of the 19th century. The story of a businessman who was almost too honest and who found a method of paying a long-standing debt of honor, although 30 years in his grave. Dark Fantasy originates in the studios of WKY, Oklahoma City. Tom Paxton speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. You are alone in Paris. Unable to speak the language. Unable to cope with a gigantic conspiracy which seeks to convince you that you are mad. And you know you are the victim of a plot from which there is no escape. Escape. Produced and today written by William N. Robeson and carefully contrived to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Today, we escape to Paris at the time of the Great Paris Exposition and one of the recurring legends of the 20th century in Alexander Wolcott's version of the story of the Vanishing Lady. Another cup of tea, Bruce? No, no, thank you, my dear. I'll just light up the pipe now and have a look at the evening standard. I'd like another, please, Mother. All right, Alice. Uh, uh, uh-oh. Only one sugar, dear. We must watch our figures, you know. Oh, (laughs) what nonsense. A growing girl like Alice needs plenty of sugar. See, Mother, Daddy approves. Perhaps. But Mother is still boss. Yes, Mother. There's a dear. Mother. Yes, dear. I've been thinking... Yes, dear? I've been thinking about my grandparents. Oh. I know all about Daddy's parents. How Grandfather Stanley commanded a dreadnought at the Battle of Jutland. It was not a dreadnought, Alice. It was a heavy cruiser. Yes, heavy cruiser. (laughs) He got the VC and how Grandmother Stanley was a volunteer nurse at Western Arch when the Zeppelins came over. And I know about your father, too, and how he died in India from his wounds and how gallant he was at the Khyber Pass. But, Mother... Yes, dear. You've never, never told me anything about Grandmother Winship. Haven't I? No, and I'd like to know something. Bruce, 
The child's 16. I think it's time she knew. But, Bruce... And you'd probably feel better to get it off your chest. What, Mother? What is it? Well, my dear... I've never talked about your grandmother because... I've always half believed that someday, somehow... She'd come down our garden walk and... Oh, I know it sounds silly. And explain where she's been for the last 20 years. Why? What happened to her? I don't know, and I don't suppose I ever will. Cynthia, darling, if it's going to upset no, you... No, Bruce, you're quite right. It would be best to get it off my chest, as you put it. As you know, Alice, I was born and brought up in India. And I was about your age when my father was killed in the Khyber campaign. Mother decided to leave India for good and return to her old home in Warwickshire. However, since it was necessary for her to go to Paris to attend to some details of my father's estate, she decided we should leave the P&O boat in Marseille and proceed by train. You may imagine the timidity with which we two unescorted ladies traveled across France without the slightest knowledge of the language and without indeed assurance we could find a hotel room in Paris, though we had telegraphed for reservations for Marseille. You see, dear... The great Paris exposition had just opened and the city was jammed with visitors from all over the world. You may imagine our relief when we arrived at the Grand Hotel Universel and heard the clerk speak in quite ah, understandable Madame English. Mademoiselle Winship, welcome, welcome. Uh, you will please to sign the register air and air. You have our reservation. Oh, indeed, yes. Our most fortunate, madame, that you telegraphed. Uh, I reserve for you the last room in the house. Oh, I'm so relieved. Here, Cynthia. You may as well learn now to sign a register for yourself. Oh, yes, Mama. Where do I write? There, in that line. Oh, yes, I see. Voila. You are uh, fatigued from your journey, no? I shall have the boy show you to your rooms at once. Chasseur? Chasseur! Oui, monsieur. L'appartement 342 pour Madame et Mademoiselle Winship. Tout de suite. Um, bien, monsieur. Uh, this is your bagage, Madame? Yes, these six. Là, voilà le bagage. Cynthia. Il y a six pièces. Entendu. You'd, you'd best carry the little one with a... Medicine in it? Yes, Mama. Uh, thank you. I'll take that one. Uh, the little red one? Uh, très bien. Uh, this way, ladies. Keep your eye on that tortoise, Cynthia. I don't trust this Frenchman. Oh, Mama. I don't think he'll make off with our things. Oh, here's the lift. Troisième étage. Troisième. Oh, I do wish we could have gone straight on to Southampton. But you'd only have had to come back across the channel to see the solicitor, Mama. We really saved time this way. I suppose, I mean, I wish we hadn't come to Paris at all. Such a sinister place. Oh, Mama. Voilà, le troisième. This way, ladies, to the right. Attendez. C'est bien. 338, 343, 340. Oh, voilà. Entrez, ladies. Thank you. Oh, what a lovely big room. And look, Mama. French windows. Oh, and the park out there. And that square with the statue. Uh, the ladies did yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. Merci. Oh, thank you, those ladies. beautiful, beautiful bridges. Oh, Mama. It, it's like something out of a book. Yes, my dear. That's the trouble with Paris. It's so attractive. But underneath, it's evil. Oh, and Mama, the furniture, the gilt clock, and this lovely marble top table. Oh, Mama, everything is so, so French. I'll be very glad to be on my way to where everything's English by this time tomorrow. Now, come away from that window and help me get into something comfortable. There's a dear. Yes, Mama, of course. I don't know when I've been so tired. I, I just can't seem to catch my Mama. Mama, what's the matter? Mama, Mama, speak to me. Oh, here, I'll get you up into bed. There. Now, let me loosen your corset. Here, Mama, here are the smelling salts. Breathe deeply, darling. Mama. The telephone. I've got to get a doctor. Uh, hello, operator. Will you please send a doctor up to room number... Uh, let me see. Number 342. Pardon? Will you please send a doctor to room number 342? Je ne comprends pas. Qu'est-ce que mademoiselle A doctor, a doctor, please. Ah, oui, a doctor. Oui, mademoiselle, tout de suite. 
While I waited for the doctor, I did everything I could think of to bring my mother back to consciousness. I massaged her fingers and toes. I put wet cloths on her forehead. I waved the smelling salts under her nose. But she lay silent and white and unmoving, like one dead. Only the quick, shallow movement of her breast assured me she was not. And all the time, another anxiety possessed me. What if this doctor could not speak English? How should I tell him the circumstances of Mother's unexpected fainting? How should I understand his instructions for treatment? I'm sure it was not long. Although it seemed like an eternity before he arrived, accompanied by the manager of the hotel. And to my great relief, they both spoke English. The doctor felt Mother's pulse, took her temperature and did the usual things that doctors do. And then he turned to the tail-coated hotel manager. La jeune femme parle de français pas un mot. Vous en êtes sûr Tout à fait. Alors, je peux parler à mon aise. Monsieur, ceci, c'est une affaire très sérieuse. N'ayez pas l'air alarmé lorsque je vous mets au courant. Cette femme est atteinte de la peste. La peste Elle n'a qu'une heure à vivre. Je n'ai pas besoin de vous dire que si ceci se connaît, votre hôtel perdra tous ses clients. Ils m'ont tué par ce moment-là. While they talked in this language, I couldn't understand. I looked from one face to the other, trying to read from their expressions how serious my mother's illness was. But they were as casual as though they were ordering dinner. And finally, I could stand it no longer. Oh, you must tell me. What is the matter with her? Mademoiselle, your mother is ill, yes. Seriously ill. It is a collapse. Due, perhaps, to this strain of traveling. However, a week or two of absolute rest will work wonders. A week or two? Well, we'd, we were to go on to England tomorrow. Uh, that would be out of the question, mademoiselle. She cannot be moved for at least several days. Uh, right now, she must have complete rest. The next 24 hours will be critical. Oh, Mama. Poor Mama. Oh, no, no, mademoiselle, you must not break down, too. Uh, I need your help. We, yes, Doctor. Immediately, I need some medicine. Will you fetch it for me? Why? I must not yes. leave your mother for a moment during these critical hours. Here, I will write down this address and a little message to my wife. Your wife? Yes, yes. I have the medicine already prepared at home. It will be faster to go there for it than to a pharmacy. There are very few chemists who have the ingredient. But couldn't you telephone? Alas, uh, I have no telephone. Well, a messenger, perhaps. <laughs> Mademoiselle does not know Paris en fait. Uh, with the exposition opening, nowhere can you find a reliable messenger. They are all selling uh, souvenirs. But, uh, oh, no, Mademoiselle. You will accomplish here and more rapidly yourself. Uh, here is the address. 24 bis rue Val de Grasse. And here is the message to give to my wife. But uh, I don't know Paris at all. I'm a total stranger here. I am sure the manager here will give the uh, necessary instructions to the cabby. Indeed, I will. Now, if Mademoiselle is ready... Before I quite knew what was happening, I was seated in a rickety taxi cab outside the hotel with the doctor's message clutched in my hand. While the hotel manager gave Maintenant, valuable directions to the cabby. En plus, vous toucherez un pourbois assez grand pour remplacer cette vieille bagnole avec une belle voiture. Allez au petit pas. Prenez la, la, la piste la plus circuiteuse. Et surtout, ne soyez pas de retour en moins de deux heures. Entendu Entendu. Bon. It is arranged, mademoiselle. Jacques is one of our most trusted cabbies. He will get you to the doctor's house and back in safety. Oh, thank you so much, sir. And you will look after mother, won't you? Indeed, I will. Of that, you may be sure. When we left the hotel, we crossed a huge square with statues around it and turned into a wide avenue which led up a gentle incline, at the top of which was a huge arch. But before long, we turned off to the right into narrower streets. It must have been 20 minutes later when we turned into another wide boulevard and I saw another huge arch up ahead. Or was it the same arch? Driver! Mademoiselle! Haven't we passed that arch before? Regardez, mademoiselle. Voici l'arc de triomphe. Là-bas, la tour est Driver, I don't want a sightseeing tour. I want to go to this address directly. Don't you understand? Now, please, take me there at once. Eh uh, ben, on fait son mieux. De la patience, mademoiselle. Paris, c'est une grande ville, voyons. At last, we turned into a narrow street and pulled up before a grim grey house. The blue enamel sign on the wall read number 24 bis. I jumped out of the cab almost before it stopped, rushed up the three stone steps and pulled at the brass bell knob. Oh, hurry. Hurry, hurry, please. 
Me? Oh, oh the, the doctor sent me for some medicine. Here, read this, please. Retenez cette jeune femme aussi longtemps possible. C'est de la plus grande importance pour l'avenir de Paris et même de la France. Oh, entrez, mademoiselle. Thank you. Quand vous ne pouvez plus la faire attendre, donnez-lui une bouteille de pastilles. The doctor's wife stood there reading and rereading the note as though she didn't understand it. And until I thought I would scream. Please, please hurry. Get me the medicine. It's my mother. She may be dying. I must get back to her. Please hurry. Asseyez-vous. She pointed to a chair. Attendez. And slowly walked down the hall and closed the door behind her. I waited and waited. And I wondered. I wondered about the time the taxi had taken to get here. About that arch that looked so familiar. And I was torn by the hundred nameless anxieties that torture you when your nearest and dearest is ill. And then I heard something that froze my blood. A telephone. A telephone clearly ringing somewhere in the house. But the doctor had said he had no telephone. That was the reason I must come all this way for the medicine. Oh, no, it couldn't be in this house. It must be next door or across the street. Of course, that's where the sound was coming from. Hello? But no. It was the voice of the doctor's wife answering the phone. Oh, no. No, what monstrous plot was this? I felt my scalp crawl with terror. My brain pounded and my head felt as though it would burst. I wanted to scream, to run out of this awful house, to run all the way across Paris to the bedside of my mother. Voilà, mademoiselle. Oh, oh. thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Now, driver, please, please, in the name of your own mother, hurry back to the hotel as fast as possible, please. Ah, oui. En fait, sans mieux, mademoiselle. Roulons. But my pleading was of no use. Either it was misunderstood or ignored. We crawled across Paris, just as slowly as we had come. And I was certain I saw that same white arch three times. But at last we crossed the great square with the statues. And I knew we were close to the hotel. Oh, please, please hurry. Zut, on fait sans mieux, mademoiselle, voyons. Just beyond the great square... We turned up a narrow street which shortly entered a wide circle, in the middle of which was a tall, slender monument. The driver swung around the monument and pulled up before the entrance of the hotel, reached back and opened the door. I dropped out of the cab. And then I saw the sign over the entrance. It said, Hotel Ritz. Driver? Driver, you've taken me to the wrong hotel. I'm staying at the Grand Hotel Universal. No, mademoiselle. Je vous ai pris au Ritz. Et je vous dépose au riz. No, I, I don't understand what you're saying. Will you please take me to the Grand Hotel Universal? Oh, plus le pouvoir. C'est ici que je vous ai pris en charge et c'est ici que je vous l'ai Oh, you stupid, stupid man. Can't you understand? My mother is sick. You've taken more than two hours to get me to the doctor's house and back. Can't you understand? My mother is sick, perhaps dying. Les affaires de mademoiselle ne me regardent pas. I looked around me. A small group of passers-by had stopped and were listening curiously to the argument. And then they joined in, taking sides. Everywhere I looked were foreign faces. Strangers, enemies. And then, shouldering through the crowd, I saw a bareheaded young man in tweeds with a pipe clamped in his teeth. And before I had a chance to speak, I knew help had come. I say, having some trouble. Oh, thank heavens, you're English. Right, you are. Now what seems to be the matter? I told him as rapidly as I could. And he paid the mulish cabbie. He popped me into another cab. Five minutes later, we walked up into the lobby of the Grand Hotel Universal. The manager was behind the desk. My mother, is she all right? I beg your pardon, mademoiselle. My mother, Mrs. Winship in 342, is she all right? <laughs> there is no uh, Madame Winship in 3242. What? 342 is occupied by Monsieur Auguste Noailles, a permanent guest. But don't you remember me? I'm Cynthia Winship. Two hours ago, you put me into a taxi to go to the doctor's house for some medicine for my mother. I am afraid that Mademoiselle is mistaken. I have never seen her before in my life. Well, look here, what what is this? No, listen, I swear to you. It's just as I say. We signed the register less than three hours ago. We got in on the train from Marseille. Well, let's have a look at the register. Yes, I'll show you I'm in 342. Where is the register? It is there, mademoiselle. You may see it for yourself. See, today's date. Fourteen guests registered, but I do not see any mademoiselle or madame Winship. Do you? No. What have you done with my mother? 
Please. What have you done with my mother? I demand you answer me this minute. What I have you done? Like with you. I should not like to, to ask you to leave. Miss Winchell, please. We'll get to the bottom of this. Perhaps Mademoiselle is mistaken. Perhaps she is registered at some other hotel. No. This is the hotel. The Grand Universal. You... You were standing there when we arrived. You handed my mother the pen with which she registered. You came to the door with a doctor. You put me in a taxi. But I assure you, mademoiselle, these are fantastic. Wait a minute. Oh, what is it? Oh, that that boy there. He carried our baggage. He'll remember. Uh, garçon. Uh, oui, monsieur. Vous vous souvenez de avoir porté le bagage de madame à numéro 3, 4, 2, cet après-midi. No, monsieur. Uh, there were six pieces, don't you remember? You wanted to take them all, and I insisted on carrying a little jewel case. It was a little red one. Oh, no, mademoiselle. C'est la première fois de ma vie que je vois mademoiselle. He says he never saw you in his life before. But... This is monstrous. It, it's impossible. My mother is somewhere in this hotel. What have you done with her? What have you done with her? Feeling better now, Miss Winship? A little, thank you. Care for something else? No, thank you. Uh, another cup of tea, perhaps? Certainly. Hey, Gasson? Monsieur? Uh, un tasse de thé pour mademoiselle. Tout suite, monsieur. I don't know how to thank you, Mr... You realize I, I don't even know your name? Oh, it's Bruce. Bruce Stanley. I'm very glad to meet you, Mr. Stanley. It's a pleasure, Miss Winship. Mr. Stanley, you believe me, well, don't you? Of course you? I do, Miss We did Winship. register at that hotel. We were in room 342. Well, I can even describe the furnishings. There was a big window that went from the ceiling to the floor. Well, every hotel room in Paris has windows like that, Miss Winship. Oh, they do? Yes. Well... In this room, the draperies were plum-colored, and there was a marble-top table, black marble it was, and a gilt clock that had run down. The hands had stopped, I remember, at 20 minutes past three. Uh, the walls were covered in rose brocade, and the bedspread was a washed-out yellow. Oh, if I could only get into that room, you'd see that I'm not making this up. I'm well, I, not... I'm sure you aren't. Perhaps I can find a way to make them let you in the room. Can you? Yes. Uh, I'm with the embassy, you know, undersecretary sort of thing. I believe the British Empire has enough influence to change the mind of an obstinate Paris innkeeper. Well, then let's do it. Right away. Well, I'm afraid the might of Britain can't move that fast. It's past dinner time. But, but tomorrow we shall see. Tomorrow? But I must get into that room tonight. I... I have no money. No way to sleep. Well, we can do nothing with the people at the hotel. You saw that. We'll just have to be patient until tomorrow. I'm sure I can find a room for you tonight in a pension near the embassy. You're so very kind. How can I ever thank you, Mr. Stanley? Well, you you might begin by calling me Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Cynthia. Oh. What oh, is it? I just thought of something. The doctor. The doctor? Yes, the one the hotel manager brought in to look after Mother. I still have his address somewhere here in my purse. Yes, here it is. Now, we must go there immediately. He can tell us about Mother. Uh, let me see. 24 base Rue Val de Grau. Well, that's not far. Just over Boulevard Raspain near the Luxembourg. But how long would it take to get there by taxi? Oh, about ten minutes. But it... It took over an hour this afternoon. <laughs> So here we are. Yes, this is the place. Attendez, mon vieux. Uh, très bien, monsieur. The house is dark. Well, it's quite late. Well, I don't care. We've got to find out tonight. Yeah, Where is he? Well, there at the upstairs window. Uh, monsieur le docteur, c'est mademoiselle Winship. Elle veut vous questionner à propos de sa mère. Winship, je ne connais pas mademoiselle Winship. He says he doesn't know you. But he must. He must. It... Doctor, don't you remember this afternoon? You sent me here to your house for medicine for my mother. Je ne comprends pas l'anglais. He says he doesn't understand English. Oh, the liar. The dreadful liar. He does. He speaks perfect English. Et vous, jeune homme, je vous conseille de ne pas déranger le repos des gens comme il faut et de vous en aller avant que je n'appelle la police. Uh, I'm sorry, Cynthia. Oh, Bruce. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? If it hadn't been for Bruce, I'm certain I should have gone out of my mind. He found a room for me at a pension near the embassy, where I spent a sleepless night of anxiety, almost beyond endurance. Oh, 
Bruce called for me at half past ten the next morning and took me back to the hotel. To my surprise, the attitude of the manager had changed completely. But of course, Mademoiselle may inspect room 342. We are only too glad to convince Mademoiselle that her mother is not and never was in the Grand Hotel Universel. Why, I... I, I personally will escort you to the room. This way, please, to the ascenseur. Oh, Bruce, that terrible man. That horrible, Cynthia, horrible... Cynthia, don't let him upset you. Monsieur? Au troisième. Troisième, monsieur. Now, remember what I told you last night, Bruce. You'll see. Plum-colored draperies, black marble top table, rose walls, and a gilt clock with hands stopped at 20 minutes past three. You'll see. Yes, sir. Voila. Le troisième. This way, please. It was room 342 that you wished to see, mademoiselle? Yes, that's right. Third door to the right. Parfait. You see, Bruce? I know where it is. Yes, my dear. Here we are. Voila. Enter, please. Now, Bruce, you'll see. The yellow bedspread... Oh. Not quite the room you just described in the elevator, mademoiselle. The drapes are royal blue. No. A little dusty, I fear. Uh, I must have this room renovated. You see, there is no marble top table. No. The clock, as you notice, is running. And right on time, it seems. And no. the walls are not rose brocade, but yellow flowered no. wallpaper. Now, my dear mademoiselle, you see how thoroughly mistaken you are. No, no, no! They had tried to make me think I was mad. They succeeded. I remembered nothing until I awoke in my aunt's house in England two weeks later. Thanks to Bruce, who never left my side during those terrible days when my sanity hung in the balance. Well... That's the story, Alice. And that's why I've never been able to talk about your grandmother, Winship. Oh, Mother, how horrible. Because all these years I've clung to the foolish hope that somehow she'd come back and tell us herself what happened. You poor dear. You may as well dispel that hope forever, Cynthia. What? Since you've at last brought yourself to discuss your mother's disappearance, I think it's time you knew the true fact. Bruce. Your mother died 20 minutes after you left the hotel on that fool's errand for the doctor. Oh, no. She died of the bubonic plague. She had caught it in India before she sailed. The doctor recognized the symptoms the moment he examined her. He told the hotel manager in French in your presence. They agreed that the matter must be kept completely secret. If the news leaked out that there was a case of plague in Paris, the city would have been empty to visitors, and the exposition would have been a failure. Oh, Bruce... The conspiracy of silence began in the hotel. The bellboy was paid to claim he never saw you. The taxi driver was paid well to take you to the doctor's house by the most roundabout route. The note to the doctor's wife advised her to detain you as long as she could. The taxi driver added his own imaginative touch by returning you to the Ritz instead of the Universal. I shudder to think what might have happened if I hadn't come through the Place Vendôme just then. But you didn't know? Not then. When did you find out? Next morning. By then, the conspiracy had grown to international proportions. The embassy had been advised. If the exposition was a failure, the franc would fall and the pound sterling would be affected, that sort of thing. You know. I knew when we went back to the hotel, you would not find your plum drapes and rose-colored walls and black marble-top table. And you let me go through with that? What could I do? I was acting under orders. I knew that the hotel had completely fumigated and redecorated the room overnight. And everything was in readiness to repudiate your story. I had to let the last act of the dreadful farce play to its dreadful end. What did they do with my mother? Her body was removed from the room less than 30 minutes after you left it. It immediately burned. Why? Why didn't you tell me all this years ago? Why did you let me go on all this time? This, this is the first time you've ever mentioned your mother since then, my dear. Alice? Yes, Mother? There's a new issue of the Tetler in the library. Wouldn't you like to look at it? Not that I want... Now, dear, there's a good girl. I want to have a talk with your father. A 
Escape, produced by William N. Robeson and directed by Norman MacDonald, has brought you The Vanishing Lady by Alexander Wolcott, freely adapted for radio by Mr. Robeson. The part of Cynthia was played by Joan Banks. Bruce was played by High Everback. The hotel manager and driver by Ramsey Hill. Musical score was conceived by Cy Feuer with Eddie Dunstetter at the console. Next week... You are deathly afraid of snakes. And between you and a fortune, between you and escape, you're on the white jaws of a deadly cotton mouth. Next week, we escape with Irvin S. Cobb's famous story, Snake Doctor. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, we, when we again offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Ladies and gentlemen, the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo presents... The Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the Hall of Fantasy. Welcome to the series of radio dramas dedicated to the supernatural, the unusual, and the unknown. Come with me, my friends. We shall descend to the world of the unknown and forbidden, down to the depths where the veil of time is lifted and the supernatural reigns as king. Come with me and listen to the tale of Man Size in Marble. The Granite Furniture Company brings you the Hall of Fantasy. Listen now to Original Tales of the Imagination and some of the classics of the supernatural as we take you down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy to the mysterious realms of the unknown. These are stories of eerie and fantastic thrills brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Stores. And now for tonight's story... A radio adaptation by Bob Olson of E. Nesbitt's story, Man Size in Marble. The villagers called it a delusion. That explanation gave them some comfort. Since it will give you comfort also, I'll say no more about it, except that it's difficult to understand how hallucinations can commit murder. Ours was one of those marriages on a dime. I'd been doing a bit of painting in those days and never knew what it was to have the money I really needed. But then Laura knew this before she married me. Oh, we'll get along if we're careful. You can paint and, and I'll write articles for the magazine. Living in town will be out of the question, dear. Well, we can find some little place in the country. As long as it's picturesque and sanitary, it doesn't matter where it is. And so we spent our honeymoon lightheartedly looking for a place that was both sanitary and picturesque. The two qualities that rarely keep company in one cottage. Little rose-covered trellises would invariably hide the corruption that lurked inside. We'd looked so hard and were so confused by the eloquence of house agents that we seriously began to doubt if we could tell a house from a haystack even if we found one. But when we came out to the little village of Brenzette and thence two miles out to see the famous little church, our search was ended. For there, just two fields away, was the cottage. Picturesque it was, for it was long and low, with rooms taking off in unexpected directions. Two of the rooms were of ancient stonework, now covered with moss and ivy. It was all that remained of a huge manor that had stood here years ago. Around these rooms had risen the cottage as it stood this day quite by itself. Our nearest neighbor was a jolly Scotch doctor, McCarthy by name, whose cottage was a little distance down the lane. Our new home nestled cozily against a low hill and looked out across the marsh meadows to the sea. Yes, it was a pretty cottage. Though stripped of its roses and jasmine, it would no doubt have been hideous. The rent was absurdly cheap, and it seemed quite likely that between the two of us, 
we could keep the kettle simmering. We spent the rest of our honeymoon in second-hand shops, picking up odds and ends of oak and Chippendale until the cottage soon became very homey. Fully settled, we were so happy. And that day we looked from the latticed window onto the old-fashioned garden with its colorful splash of hollyhocks and lilies. Laura sat outlined against the window, I before my easel. What are you painting, Van? You, my dear. Me? Well, why not this lovely countryside? Mm, first my wife, then the countryside. And uh, what are you writing? A verse. About what? You. <laughs> It was a gay life, the sort that only the quite humble or the very rich could enjoy. Our fortune was added to when we found Mrs. Dorman, a tall peasant woman with a good face and figure to keep house for us. Laura was delighted with her, for Mrs. Dorman was full of stories of the past. Stories of the smugglers and highwaymen who dominated this part of England, cutting purses and throats with equal zest. Better still were her stories about the things that walked and the sights that one met of a starry night. They gave Laura a good deal of material for her articles. Old wives' tales, I called them. Three months passed quickly. We hadn't had a single quarrel. That's why it startled me when on the return from a visit to Dr. McCarthy, Laura, who had always been so happy, rushed to my arms and buried her dark little head in my shoulder and wept. Laura, what is it? It's Mrs. Dorman. Well, what about Mrs. Dorman? She's leaving us. Leaving us? Well, what on earth for? She says that she must leave before the end of the month. She says that her niece is ill. But I don't believe her because, well, her niece has always been ill. She acted so, so queerly. Well, don't cry, Laura. You know, it's a terrible shock to see you cry. I might cry a bit myself just watching you. And you'd never respect me again. Oh, but it's serious. Those people in the village are so sheepy and... Well, if Mrs. Dorman leaves us without any explanation, no one will come and take her place. I just know it. Well, then we'll share the housework. But we'll have no time to earn what we need, and oh, we've been doing so nicely now. We'll have to work all day and, and rest only when the kettle's boiling. Oh, you exaggerate, Laura. We'll have less time, but there'll still be time. However, when Mrs. Dorman comes back, I'll have a talk with her. We'll come to some sort of terms. Tell you what. Let's take a walk up to the old church. The church was large and lonely, and we enjoyed the stroll in the moonlight. The path that went through a wood and along the crest of a little hill was called the Beer Path, for the dead had been carried along this path to be buried. The churchyard was enclosed by a low wall and ceiling by several large elms whose branches stretched out as if in benediction over the dead. We entered the old church from a long, low porch and through a heavy oak door studded with iron. Inside, the arches rose up into the darkness. We strolled up to the chancel where the fine colored glass windows let in faint hues of filtered moonlight. It gave everything a substance of, of shadow, even the gray marble figures of the two knights who lay there in full plate armor with hands upheld in everlasting prayer. You know, it's a funny thing. If there is any light in this church at all, it seems to shine on these figures. Who are they? No one knows. The peasants say they were marauders, bandits, that they were the scourge of their day. Does it give you kind of a, a strange feeling to, to know they used to live where we live now? I hadn't thought much about it. Uh, has Mrs. Dorman told you the story? She doesn't know about it. She said the house was struck by a bolt of lightning. Mm, I heard it was the vengeance of heaven against their foul deeds. Funny how a pair like that would be given such an honored place in this little church. Well, the gold was good, no matter where it came from. Their heirs probably bought the honor. And those marble statues certainly aren't flattering. Yeah. From the looks on the faces, even in marble, I doubt their conversion to Christianity. The church looked very weird as the shadows cast eerie forms about. We looked again at the sleeping warriors and a feeling of awe came over us. Outside, we sat on the ancient stone seats, gazing out across the moon-misted meadows. A sense of quiet and peacefulness came over us. At such times, troubles don't exist. Well, feel better than you did, dear? Yes, Vance. Oh, let's never leave this place. It's lovely. Ah, yes. 
Wasn't it silly to get all worked up over Mrs. Dorman? It's still a terrible nuisance. Oh, granted, but if scrubbing and blacking boots is the worst of our lot, we'll manage quite well even without Mrs. Dorman. Of course we will. Uh, nevertheless, when we get back to the house, I'll have a talk to her. Uh, she should be there by now. I hope you can convince her. Uh, Mrs. Dorman, what's this I hear about your leaving? Well, I'd like to leave before the end of the month, sir. Well, aren't you happy here? Uh, maybe you'd like a raise in your wages. It's not that, sir. You and your lady have been most kind. Well, then, uh, suppose we work it out so that you can stay. No, Mr. Longin, I'd rather leave. My niece is ill. Yes, I know, but she's been ill all along. Uh, would you consider staying on for another month? No, sir. I want to leave before Thursday. But this is Monday, woman. That's rather short notice. I'll tell you what, stay on until next week. Maybe I can come back next week. But why must you go this week? Well, speak up. It's this house, sir. Uh, this house? Well, what about it? They saw that strange deeds was done here in olden times. In olden times? Oh, but this is now. What, what deeds do you mean? Well, don't worry, Mrs. Dorman. I, I'm not going to laugh at you. Well, sir, have you seen them two shipes beside the altar in the church? You mean the effigies of the knights in armor? I mean them two bodies drawn out man-size in marble. A very graphic description, Mrs. Dorman, but uh, what about the knights? In the village, they saw that on All Saints' Eve, those bodies come to life. Those marble statues? They saw that they rise up from their slabs and walk down the aisle in their marble. Then when the church clock strikes eleven, they come out into the night and walks over the grind. But how do you suppose... When that... the night has been wet, there was the marks of their feet along the beer path. Well, where do they go? Back to their home. Their home? But their home was... In this house. Well, did anyone ever see this happen? I ain't sighing. All I know is what I know. Who was living here last year? No one, sir. The lady would own the house, spent the summer here, but she always went up to London a good month before the night. And so you think you must go? Yes, sir. My niece is ill. Oh, your niece is... Oh, very well, Mrs. Dorman. Go if you think you must. But don't say anything about this to Mrs. Langham. Must you go, Mrs. Dorman? Yes, ma'am. This is Thursday. I can't stay no longer. It's going to put quite a load on us. Don't try to do too much, Mrs. Langham. If there's anything I can do next week, well, I won't mind in the least. Thank you. Oh, but... <laughs> we'll try to manage. And whatever you do... Lock the door early tomorrow night and mark the sign of the cross over it. What do you mean? Uh, that's Mrs. Dorman's little Halloween joke, dear. It's no joke. And if you ask me... Goodbye, Mrs. Dorman. Goodbye. And don't forget what I said. What did she mean, then? Nothing, dear. Mrs. Dorman is just a superstitious old biddy, that's all. I would have looked forward to Friday a much happier man if I could have believed what I had just told Laura. But Friday came the day before All Saints' Eve. The day this story ends. In fact, the day that gave this story its horrible substance. You are listening to Man Size and Marble in tonight's journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Brought to you by your friends at the Granite Furniture Company with stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo. And now back to tonight's story, Bob Olson's adaptation of Man Size in Marble. I arose early that morning and had already built a rather smoky success of a fire when Laura came down as bright as the bright morning itself. We had breakfast and went after the housework. When the brushes and pails were silent at last, we set up and pails were silent at last, we set up and pails were silent at last, and spent one of the merriest days since our wedding. That afternoon we took a long walk, completely happy, 
and Laura sweeter than ever. I decided that housework was good for her. We watched the deep flame of sunset as it slowly faded to a dull gray, and then walked back to the cottage hand in hand without a word. Once inside, we sat in the parlor and seemed to settle into a deep silence. I thought it was a happy silence, and what I asked Laura had no particular significance at the time. You seem sad, Laura. I was surprised at her answer. Yes, I, I don't think I feel quite well. I've had the shivers, and it isn't cold, is it? No, unless it's one of those nasty mists that creep up from the marsh. There is no mist, dear. Hmm, doesn't seem to be at that. Hmm, no mist. In that case, darling, you're not entitled to a chill. Sorry. Van. Mm-hmm? Do you ever have a presentiment of evil? Hmm, don't believe in them. I do. When my father died, he was away in North Scotland. But the night he died, I knew it. Oh, forgive me, Van. Come and light up the candles on the piano, and we'll play one of our duets. Hmm. Ten o'clock already. Light up your pipe if you'd like, Van. I don't mind. Yeah, I think I'll take it outside. May I come too? No, dear. You're much too tired. I shan't be long. You get to bed or you'll be ill. You're taking good care of me, darling. I have to. Can't do all this housework by myself, you know. Then give me a kiss. Mm, that will be a pleasure. Mm. Let me go with you. Uh-uh. You get some rest. Vance. Yes? We've been very happy today, haven't we? Mm, even happier than usual, sweetheart. You won't be gone long, will you? No, dear. Not long. I stepped out, leaving the door unlatched, for I expected to be back shortly. The night was magnificent. Huge masses of cloud, dark and heavy, seemed to clasp hands and reach from horizon to horizon. Through this flowing stream of clouds moved the moon, like a dolphin diving in and out of an endless succession of waves. The treetops swayed like a metronome to the gentle swing of the clouds. There was the mystic glow on the earth that comes from the blend of dew and moonlight. I drank in the serene beauty of the night. There wasn't a hint of emotion about. Not even a leaf stirred. The wind was high up, busy herding the clouds. Across the meadow, I saw the church tower standing out black against the sky. I suddenly thought of the three happy months I'd known here with Laura. And just then, the church sounded its bell. Hey, 11 o'clock. I should be getting back to the house. But first, I think I'll visit the church. I felt so happy and so very thankful. I wanted to take my gratitude to the old chapel that had heard the sorrows and the joys of its people for so many countless years. On my way, I passed our cottage and looked in the window where I saw Laura's dark little head silhouetted against the pale blue wall. She was very still. I decided not to disturb her. I turned down Beer Path. It was such a peaceful night that at first I was conscious of nothing. And then, suddenly, I became aware of a rustling sound that broke the stillness ever so gently. I stopped to listen. The sound stopped, too. I took another step and listened. The step seemed to echo my own. Well, if that's a poacher, he's a fool not to step more lightly. I left the Beer Path and took to the woods. The footsteps seemed to echo along the path I had just left. It was strange. Yes, it was strange. Ah, but then all night sounds are strange. I passed through the corpse gate and walked among the graves to the low porch of the church. The door was open. Hmm. Did I leave that open? I'd hate to have the damp get in and ruin those fine old fabrics. I went in and was halfway up the aisle when suddenly I remembered. That bell struck 11 o'clock. This is the very day, the very hour when the shapes drawn out man's size in marble begin to walk. Once I did remember, it came on me with a shiver. And I was ashamed. And so to make up for it, I walked boldly to the altar. I did that because... 
Well, because I wanted to tell Mrs. Dorman how peacefully the shapes had slept through the ghastly hour. And so with my hands nonchalantly shoved into my pockets, I passed up the aisle. In the dim gray light, the other end of the church looked more... Well, it looked larger than usual. The arches above the two tombs seemed to have grown, too. At that moment, the moon came out from behind a cloud, and in the ghostly beams of light, I... I saw the reason. They're gone! I steadied myself. It's... it's some fool's practical joke. They... they can't be gone. I, I'm not in the right place. It's, it's, it's too dark to see here clearly. Yes, that's it. I took a newspaper from my pocket and lit it with a match. It flared up brightly. The confirmation was sickening. The bodies drawn out man's size in marble had actually disappeared from the church. Suddenly I was gripped with an indefinable horror. It was an overwhelming certainty of finished calamity. I threw down the torch and dashed down the aisle, out the front door and into the night. They're gone. They're gone. Help me, someone. The bodies, they're gone. Said old Doon, man. Let go of me, you fool. The marble figures have gone from the church. They've disappeared, I tell you. Hey, they know. You've been smoking too much. Smoking and listening to old wives' tales. Oh, doctor, I've seen the bare slabs with my own eyes. They're gone, I tell you. We'll come back with me. I'm going up to the palmer's No, His loss is sick. We'll have a look into the bare slabs. Well, you can go if you like. I'm going home to Laura. Rubbish. I'll never permit it. You can't go around all your life as saying you saw a slab of marble in vitality. You can't do it, man. I'm not going back there. Then you want that you should be a coward? Coward? No, but... I, coward? I never can help you if you didn't go down with me. Oh, all right. Come on. No, here we are at the church. Come in with me. I'm coming. Oh, what have you got your ears closed for? Here. I'll strike a match. No, look there. What have you had to drink, man? I opened my eyes, and what I saw made me absolutely mad. A huge black screen dropped across my reason. For there on the cold gray slabs were the two grotesque shapes in their marble. I... I... Dr. McCarthy, I, I simply don't know what to say. It must have been the light, or, or maybe I have been working too hard. <laughs> yes, you know, I I was sure they were gone. I am quite aware of that. You'll have to do something about that brain of yours. But, but wait, look at this hand. What's wrong with it, Doctor? It's been broken. There's a finger missing. A finger? But the last time I saw it, it was perfect. Someone may have tried to remove it. That can't be right. My impression was that they were gone. Completely disappeared. That was too much tobacco and painting. Perhaps. Well, come along, Dr. McCarthy. My wife will be getting anxious. I told her I wouldn't be gone long. Well, I should be going off to the Palmers. I'd appreciate it if you'd come on to the cottage with me and... and, and drink to my better senses. Or confusion to all ghosts or something. <laughs> well, it's pretty late, no? I had to see a lot of people to Nick. So I'll... Could go to the Palmers tomorrow. Horrid, I'll come with you. I believe I needed the sensible old doctor more than the Palmer girl did. You've had an illusion, man. Nothing more than an illusion. Yes, I fancy you're right about that, doctor. But it was a most amazing one. Dr. McCarthy then went into a dissertation on ghosts and apparitions as we walked on up to the cottage. When we reached the garden path, I was a little puzzled by the bright light that was streaming out the front door. Soon I saw that it was wide open. Had Laura gone for a walk? Well, come on in, Doctor. We'll find Laura and then pour ourselves a drop of whiskey. Good. The house was ablaze with candles. Laura had not only lit the wax ones, but there must have been a dozen other sputtering, glaring tallow dips stuck all over the room in odd little places. Laura, we have company. Oh, Laura! I wonder if she went out for a walk. Uh, Laura! Lunch! Yes? Look! Where? <laughs> Laura! There in the little recess of the window I saw her. What had she been doing there? Looking for me? 
But the doctor said it before I quite dared to. Someone's been in this room. It's gonna be long here. Who? Yeah, eh? Who? Laura didn't move. Her mouth was drawn and her eyes were wide open. Very wide. She looked as if she'd heard a footstep behind her and turned to meet... What? I passed my hands over her eyes. They saw nothing. What had they seen last? The doctor moved toward her, but I pushed him aside as if I were afraid of what he'd say. And then I took her in my arms. Laura, Laura, darling, I've got you now. You're safe. I. she's safe. She's dead. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> she fell into my arms like a limp, loose-jointed doll. I was slightly mad with this horrible sense of loss. But I knew she was dead. I knew it, and nothing mattered anymore. Laura was dead, and the world was dead. And I silently prayed that I might die. What's in her hand? I don't know. I don't care. Laura's dead. But the doctor pried open her fingers. And soon something fell out of that grim clutch and dropped to the floor. We looked at it. And then at each other. For what we saw was no hallucination. It seemed to fairly shriek its defiance to reason. For there on the floor was a gray marble finger. And so runs the tale of Man Size in Marble. Remember to join us next week at the same time for another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Tonight's story was adapted from the story by E. Nesbitt entitled Man Size and Marble. Heard in tonight's program were Carl Grayson as Vance Langham, Beth Calder as Laura, Phyllis Perry as Mrs. Darman, and Archie Hugely as Dr. McCarthy. Musical background was provided by Earl Donaldson. The technical supervisor was Nephi Sorensen. This program was written by Bob Olson and produced and directed by Richard Thorne. Remember, be with us again next Sunday night on call at 8.30 p.m., when the Granite Furniture Stores in Sugar House, Murray, and Provo will take you on another journey down the corridors of the Hall of Fantasy. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour. <laughs> Unidentified body. A simple situation can become quite intriguing when fate steps in and adds the necessary twists. 
Take the case of the notorious gang who put a crime reporter on the spot because his articles were dangerous to them. Now, add this twist. The fact that the gang has never seen the reporter. And add this twist. The fact that the gangsters flee from a gunfight, carrying with them the unconscious form of a stranger, a man they do not know, a man who happens to be Jim Briggs, the newspaper reporter they would like to lay their hands on. Who am I? Who, who, who am I? Is he on the level, Fred? I think he is, Chief. If you can only teach Schmidt to keep his hand to himself. I didn't do nothing. I only... Shut up. I only... I said shut up. Watch where you're driving. And you still see the cops beating? I think we lost them, Chief. It was a close call. Too close. The town isn't safe for us. Not as long as that guy Briggs hounds us on the Daily Herald. What will we do, Al? We've got to get rid of him. It won't be so easy now. It's either him or us. Schmidt. Yeah? Take the next turn and head back to the hotel in town along Route 7. Let me tell you, Fred. This was Briggs' fault. He's got the cops worked up about us. He's got to go. But how? Where, where am I? Him. What do we do with him? The way things are, we can't risk taking him to a doctor. No, we'd better... Say, wait a minute. I think I can handle him out by myself. Better than a doctor. What do you mean? Just that with Trigger doing a disappearing act and lying low for the time being... You mean maybe this guy... Yeah, is... you get it. We can use him. Fine. Go ahead, then. He's all yours. I don't want any interference. Don't worry. I'll see that these monkeys climb up. You too, Schmidt. I didn't say it. Go ahead. Go ahead, Fred. What's the matter, fella? My head hurts. How did it happen? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I don't know anything. Who are you? Well, you know me. I'm Fred Booth. Fred Booth? I, I don't remember. Now, look, fella. I'm going to help you. Help me? Look at me. No, look right at me. It's hard to hold my head that way. It hurts. Try. All right, I will. You don't remember anything? No. Let's see about that. Where do you live? I... I don't know. What was your father's name? His name was... I... I don't know. Now, look, fella, you're in a bad way. You've lost your memory. You've got a lot of things to learn again about yourself. Yeah, I understand. I'm going to start off with your name, and then later I'll tell you all we know about you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Fred. Your name is Trigger Martin. Real name, Henry, but we've always called you Trigger. Oh. That sound familiar? Trigger. Trigger Martin. You remember now? You ever heard the name? Yes. Somehow it seems familiar. Trigger. Trigger, wake up. Huh? Oh. How are you? How's your head? Oh, it's... It's better, friend. You've been sleeping since we got here about three hours ago. Here? Where's here? Oh, oh, I remember the hotel. That's right, the Crescent Hotel. The Crescent Hotel. What else do you remember? Well, everything that you told me. Anything else come back to you? Oh. Are you sure? Yeah, that's all. Now, what did I teach you? My name is Trigger Martin. You're Fred Booth. Go on. Chief is Al Drake. I was driving with uh, George Smith. Now, how about the little fella? He's called Petey. Um, Fred. Yes, Trigger. What, what do we do? We? Yeah, I mean, you're the, the, the brains, aren't you? Well, yes, I'm the guy who figures things out for Al. And Schmidt? Well, Schmidt's good at safe cracking and some of the heavy work. Oh. Petey used to be a dip, a pickpocket. He's got light fingers. Nervous, but good to have around sometimes. Oh, what a, what about me? The rest of us have pulled some pretty rough stuff, Trigger, but we've all kept our hands clean of your line. Uh-huh. What is my line? It's murder, Trigger. Murder. How's he getting along, Fred? Trigger. Okay. Your treatment? Well, what's wrong with it? Risky. Nah, he'll be all right. He'd better. We'll need him, but soon. I told him just now that he was a killer. Yeah? Any questions? No, he just wants to learn all about himself. Great. Uh, would you be liking your rooms clean now, Mr. Drake? Sure, any time, Mrs. Calder, but since when do you open doors without knocking? Well, if you're not up at this time of day, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, it's not that, Mrs. Calder, but sometimes we have business conferences and can't be disturbed. Oh, business, is it? Well, I've got a couple of dollars put away I'd like to invest. Uh, Mrs. C., you're a great kidder. And why should I be kidding? I'd like to live in style like you and Mr. Booth and the other gentlemen. Finance is hard work, Mrs. Calder. You'd better stick to cleaning. And that's just...
just what I'll be doing if you gents will let me. And I'll start in this inside room and... Uh, uh, m- Mrs. Caller, I, uh, I don't think you'd better go in there. Not for a couple of days. No? One of our associates is in there sleeping. Mr. Schmidt? No, a new associate. He, uh, he was hurt a little. In a hunting accident. He's got to have rest. Ah, oh, you. I'm thinking you'd just like to be living in a dirty room. Well... I'll be back later then. I think you'd better. And remember, don't go in there. I'll not be forgetting, Mr. Drake. Chief, we ought to get out of town. Really hide out. They can't pin anything on us yet. Besides, I like to live nice. I like to live. What's eating you? You don't have a murder rap against you? So what? Trigger's the only guy in this mob who ever had the chair to worry about. And now... Al, calm down. Al. You saying something about me, Chief? Uh, Trigger, you ought to be taking it easy in your own room. I tried, but every time I lay down, my head started. Something hurting you, Trigger? Not exactly hurting. What then? This business. What you told me before about my... my killing people... I don't like it. What's the matter, Trigger? You going soft? Maybe I am. You know what happens to pals of mine that goes soft? No. No, I don't. Nothing much. Nothing much that you'd care to hear about, and we don't even notify their families. I don't know if that make much difference to me. I can't even remember my family. You can't remember lots of things, but they happen, so what? So I want to quit. Trigger, I want to quit, do you hear? I don't know what I did before or how I felt before, but I know I couldn't go around knocking off guys just because you put the finger on them. Not now. Maybe the sock on the head softened me or made me yellow or reformed me or whatever else you want to call it, but I just couldn't kill a guy, and I know it. Not now. There's something inside tells me. What are you going to do about it, Trigger? There's nothing to prevent me from walking out of here. Why, you dirty double... Take it easy, Al. Well, look, Trigger. How many guys have you knocked off? I don't know. I can't remember can't remember anything except what you told me. Now, listen to me. And listen carefully. I know of six. Me? Six murders? Yeah. And I don't know how many before you started working for Al. I heard you'd done plenty. Sure. Sure, you can walk out of here if you want to, but it won't do you no good. I don't get it. Six murders. Right, they go. Every cop in the country's got orders to drag you in, dead or alive. And with your rap as a cop killer, they're going to shoot first. Now, you want to walk... Or do you want to play ball? Well, I'll stay. I have to stay. Petey, will you stop jumping from one chair to another? I can't help it, Trigger. It makes me nervous to stay in one place. Well, then get out of here. I can't. I would do sick like that. You're not doing me any good. Why don't you get out? I'd... Uh... Hi, Chief. Well, Trigger, I see you've quieted down. Not so independent like you were a couple of hours ago. Well, I'm okay now, I suppose. Petey, you can take a few minutes off. I'll stay with, uh, with Trigger. Thanks, Chief. Now, are you going to work for me, or do you want to be plugged by a cop? I said I was staying. Make sure you mean it. I've got a little job for you. Oh? Huh? Who is it? There's a little squirt of a reporter on the Daily Herald in this town, and he's out to cause trouble. What's he done? Shut his mouth off about me. Every day for the last week in his paper, he knows too much. What's his name? Jim Briggs. Where can I... Where can I contact him? I don't know where he lives or what he looks like. Hogan, my outside man, is trying to get some dope on him before you go to work. All right. Okay. See you later. Pete. Hey. Yeah, Chief. Fred, Schmidt, and me are going out on some business. You stay and keep Trigger company. Sure, Chief. So long. So long. Pete, how long have I been working for Al? Three years, about. Why? It's funny me not remembering. Who'd I work for before? I don't know. You never told me. Do I have any friends, you know, outside the mine? I don't know. You didn't talk much. How about family? I guess you got some. Where do they live? I don't know. Did you ever see me with a girl or, or anything? Why are you asking all these questions? Come on, Petey, tell I don't know nothing, I tell you. I don't understand, Petey. Can't you tell me anything about myself? Will you quit pestering me? Petey, did I ever serve time? Yeah, yeah, what? I think you did. What prison? Stop it, stop it, will you? Don't ask me no more questions. I only asked you what... I can't stand it, I can't stand it. I just shut up. Questions, questions, questions. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. Petey. What's the matter with that guy? Yeah, come in. Excuse me, sir. Uh, you mind if I do a bit of dusting? No, not at all. Come on in. Well, Mr. Drake told me not to disturb you, but the dirty room kind of gets you down when you have to stay in it, don't it? Yeah, it does. Ooh! That's a nasty knock you've got on your head. It's nothing. I just 
bumped into a door. Oh? Well, if you'd like, I'll send Dr. Reisner up. He's the hotel doctor. Very good he is. Oh, it'll get better by itself. Well, just as you say, sir. Well, I'll be on my way now. Just a look in a promise, but I'll do a third job tomorrow. Thanks. Oh, just pick up that piece of paper near the door, will you? This one? Yeah. You want it? Yes, please. Petey dropped it. I'll give it to him. Thanks. Yes, sir. Here? Yeah? Goodbye. So long. Petey. Tell Al everything's set for Trigger's burial. You supply a body. Kogan. So they're going to get rid of me. Well, we'll see about that. Trigger! Hey, Trigger! Huh? Do you happen to see me drop a little piece of paper? Piece of paper? Yeah. When I went outside. No, Petey. No. No, I didn't. Our story is about a mine, a mine from which all memory has been erased. Its owner was brought to the headquarters of Al Drake's notorious gang in the Crescent Hotel. There, his history was taught him by Fred Booth, brains of the gang. There he was told that he was Trigger Martin, Trigger Martin who had killed many men. Even though he felt he could not go on with his murderous career, he knew he was bound to it by his past. But then he intercepted a message that indicated he was to be killed. Everything set for Trigger's burial. You supply body. Why do they want to kill me? The cops, I can understand, but me, their own pal. I've got to get out of here. I've got to escape. I've got to... Trigger. What do you want? Snap out of it. I wasn't doing anything, Schmidt. You're sitting there thinking I don't like it. Well, what do you want me to do? Talk. Talk? I don't feel like talking. Petey says you drove him nuts with your talking. Now you're quiet like a boneyard. Come on, talk. All right, I'll talk. Do I have any family, Schmidt? I didn't say for you to ask questions. That's all I've got on my mind. Well, keep me yourself, then. You don't like staying here with me, do you? Uh, I'll tell me, though. You said you shouldn't be left alone. I'll be all right. I won't try to get away. I didn't ask you that. Oh, go ahead, Smith. I'll be okay. I'll play some of the records. I don't want to get into no trouble with that. You won't. Go on. Go on. Take a little time off. Thanks. Thanks, Trigger. I'll see you. Uh, pick a good loud record. Stardust, St. Louis Blue. Darktown, Strutter's Ball. Look at this. Personal recording studios, boardwalk, Atlantic City. Regards to Al and all the gang from Gloria and Trigger. This I gotta hear. Gloria. We're having a great time here, and we just thought we'd send you like regards from the boardwalk. Come on, Trigger, say something. It won't hurt you, you know. Say hello. Say anything. Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? Say hello. Say anything. Well, I just want to send our regards, Al. I mean, me and Gloria. How long do I have to talk, Gloria? I'm not Trigger, then. I'm not. But who am I? Do they know who I am? Why are they trying to tell me I'm Trigger Martin? He's asleep now, Chief. Petey's standing outside the door. Fred? Yeah? I don't like it. Why not? It's too smart. It won't work. Oh, what's worrying you? Someone's going to miss him. That means trouble. Maybe he don't know anybody in town. That chance. Get him out of here tomorrow. Kill him. Not me. I don't like murder. Look, Chief, the guy is sold completely on the idea that he's Trigger. Gives me the will he's here. Trigger waiting to be buried and this guy thinking he's him? Oh, stop acting like Petey. 
Look, the guy gets in our way when we're doing a job. Schmidt knocks him out with his clumsy mitts. We can't leave him around. None of us wants to bump him off unless we have to. Then I come to the rescue. We should have left him there. If I'd known he lost his memory then, I would have. But this way, he's going to bump off Briggs, and we'll be in the clear. It's a perfect setup. You hope. Sure it is. I'll figure it out for yourself. I don't know, Fred. I only wish I knew who he was. <laughs> Mm-hmm. How you feeling? Oh, much better today, Fred. Your head all right? Oh, sure. Al told me he had a job for me. Yeah. I think I could do it today. You better do it today. That's what I came to talk to you about. Al said the guy's name is Jim Briggs. That's right. And if you know what's good for you, Trigger, you're going to get him. But fast. Look what he says in today's paper. The most flagrant flatterer of the law in this gang of hoodlums is a vicious gunman who goes by the name of Trigger Martin. Of all the members of this organized crime syndicate, he should be the easiest to convict, for it is rumored that he is responsible for at least six cold-blooded murders. How about some action, Mr. Police Commissioner? What do you think about that, Trigger? Let me see that. What do you want to say it for? I read you the part about you. I want to see it. Okay, here, punish yourself. The most flagrant flutter of the law in this gang of hoodlums is a vicious gunman by the name of Trigger Martin. And how do you like that? That guy's going to see that you burn unless he gets shut up. Hey, what's eating you? Fred, did I ever see this article before? No, you couldn't have. Just come out today. For a second, I thought... you got no time to think, Trigger. The only thing that'll do you any good now is to get a hold of that Briggs and... Yeah, yeah. You're right, Fred. Briggs... He's my man. Listen, Al, I've been waiting three hours. I can't stand it. I gotta get into action. Take it easy, Trigger. Let me track the guy down. That's Petey's job. Yeah, as soon as he's got the dope, I'll give the ghost sign. But, Al, I'm a dead duck if I don't nail Briggs and soon. Yeah, you will be. But we can't afford to make any mistakes. That's what I've been telling him, Chief. But he got all worked up about those newspaper articles. Save it, Trigger, until... Well, that must be Petey. Open up, Schmidt. Okay, Fred. Well, Petey. Any luck? I just get a line on this guy, Briggs. Go ahead. Uh, don't rush me, Chief. Makes me nervous. Come on. The Herald got him in from Chicago to do this job on us. He's new to town. That's why we don't know him. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Where does he live? He's got his office set up and his room's in the same place. Sends his stuff to the Herald over the phone. Petey, where does he live? Gee, Chief, didn't I tell you? 41 McDougal Alley in the basement. One of them garden apartments. Did you get that, Trigger? Sure. 41 McDougal Alley in the basement. Okay, that's right. And here's your gun. Now get going. Uh, McDougal Alley. 47. 45. 43. Ah, uh, 41. Basement. Careful. Maybe a trap. Don't forget they've been lying all along. Careful. Careful. Door. Door to his apartment. Maybe he'll help me if he doesn't shoot me first. I'll try the door. It's not locked. It's dark. I'll let a match. Jump up, Regan! Okay, Carter. Let me go! No, you don't! Let me try to... Let go of me! Watch him, he's got a gun. I see. Good work. Right on the head. He's out. Well, that'll take care of him for a while. It was a close call. Close as I've had since I joined the force. Yeah. That gun ain't no toy. He's coming around. Better snap the cuffs on him. Right. Wonder what his angle is on the case. I'll question him. Hey, come on. Come on, snap out of it. Wake up, uh, you. My head. Come on, come on, come on out of it. What? 
Say, who are you? What are you doing here? That's just what we were going to ask you. Well, this is my apartment. My name is Briggs, Jim Briggs. Jim Briggs disappeared three days ago. We're working on the case. If you're Jim Briggs, maybe you can tell us where you've been. Half the police force has been looking for Briggs. I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. All I know is that I'm Jim Briggs and this is my apartment. Yeah? Do you usually come into your apartment with a gun in your hand? I, I don't know. All I remember is... I, I remember watching a gun battle. You sure you weren't in it? And then... Yeah, I remember now. A little. I, I was in a hotel somewhere in town with some men named Drake and Booth and Schmidt and, and Petey. They tried her. That's Al Drake's mom. Yeah. And this guy is one of them. He must be that Trigger Martin character. You know, we never got pictures of any of them. No, I'm Jim Briggs, I tell you. Look, give me a chance. I think I can lead you to their hideout. Please. I think I remember where it is. <laughs> Okay, Fred, this was your idea. He'll come back, Al. I got that guy completely bamboozled. Now listen, Chief. I don't want to stay here and be trapped. They'll get us. They'll get us for sure. Pity, shut up. What I tell you, he's back. Okay, open up, Schmidt. Well, Chicken, did you do it? You told me to kill him, didn't you? Stop the dramatics. Of course I told you. Well, I did it. I found the guy in his apartment. I was working at a desk. He looked up and... I gave it to him. Let's have your gun, Trigger. My gun? What for? Come on, hand it over. I, I threw it away. I don't believe you. Smith, grab him. Okay. No, you don't, Smith. Put up your hands. All of you. Now, Trigger, no point in getting jumpy. How long do you think you'll get away with Cut it? Cut it. You know I'm not Trigger, and I know. Whoever you are and whatever your game is, no one person doesn't stand a chance against four. You won't get out of here alive. I think I will. Petey, open that door. Yeah, Quick. yeah, right away. Come on in, Carter. All right, you guys. Bundle these hoodlums into the wagon. Did you get what you wanted, Carter? Perfect. Direct evidence tying Drake to an attempted murder. We've been trying to get that for years. Great work, Mr. Briggs. Briggs, booze, you idiot. We had the guy all the time. Sure you had me. I didn't know it, and you didn't know it. Hey, that'll make a swell feature story. The case of the unidentified body written by the corpse itself. <laughs> Shadows and stillness. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Something that so threatened you, so horrified you, that it stopped your heart for a moment? If you never have, count yourself lucky. But don't count on your luck too much. After all, who's to say that terror may never touch you, huh? Consider Helen and Jim Crane. They never thought it would ever touch them. Blood. Jim, there's... Blood all over. And the axe. Did you see the axe? Come on, let's get out of here. The blizzard. We can't. We stay. can't stay here either. There must have been a terrible fight in that kitchen, and I'm not waiting for the winner to come back. 
You don't suppose... Oh. What? The murderer? The murderer the police are looking for. The man who slaughtered the Grant family. They said he was holed up somewhere on the mountain. <gasps> this cabin, maybe. You don't think... All I think is that we'd better get out of here. drama, Blizzard of Terror, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Lois Smith. Dare you join me now in a blizzard of terror? Not so fast, not so quick to answer yes. Are your nerves in shape for what lies ahead? Have you promised yourself a good night's sleep? A promise you want to keep? In simple brief, are you who now listen to my voice ready to cope with terror? Very well. You made the choice, not I. Come along, then. Well, come on. coalition with Russia in the foreseeable future. That's the world news. Now I have a special bulletin from the big Indian sheriff's office. Jim, turn the radio sheriff off. Ed Ralston warns all motorists to stay off the road on Thunder Mountain. Not only because of the blizzard, but also because the man sought for the brutal murder of the Grant family is believed to be hiding out somewhere on Jim, the mountain. please, shut it off. All of them with a kitchen carving knife. The Grant family... Mr. Crane. You're welcome, Mrs. Crane. We don't need to be told again and again that we're in a blizzard on Thunder Mountain. We know we are, thanks to you. I'm sorry. It's okay, Skip it. Maybe it is my fault. Jim! Oh. Oh. oh, that's a close one. Oh. You know, I can't see the road. All I can see is snow. What's that? What's what? There, just ahead. Back under the trees. A, a cabin? So... We better stop. Oh, no, no way. Jim. We're just managing to make it up this grade now. If we stop, we'll never get started If again. we keep going, we're sure to get stuck. Those snowdrifts out there are getting worse. Yeah, I know, We'd but... be safer in that cabin. We could freeze to death. Jim, please, for once, listen to reason. Okay, okay, you win. You always do. Don't stop here. The cabin's over there. If we drive in there, we will get stuck. You really are going to have to get new glasses. Can't you see the road? Oh, oh yeah. Tire tracks. Snowed over, but tracks. Those tire tracks, they mean somebody's there. Yes! Look, look! Smoke's coming out of the chimney. Ah, oh, now, are you glad we turned in? A swooning with delight. You're angry because I was right. When are you wrong? When are you ever wrong? Oh, you are something. You, you are. You are really something. Why do we quarrel like this, fly at each other every time? Well, maybe if you weren't so darned independent. Forget it. Forget it. Okay, come on. Like to just oh, watch Jim, it. under the circumstances. If you won't, I will. Hello? Anyone here? Hello? There must be somebody here. There's a fire smoldering in the fireplace. Here, look, there's a pipe in this ashtray. The tray is full of pipe ashes. Yeah. Oh, here's a coffee cup, half full. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a book open on the table. Huh. Jung's Psychology of the Unconscious. Whoever owns this place must be a brain. Hello? Anyone here? Hello? Helen, Helen, don't do that. You've got no right to go nosing around. Bedroom. Nobody in it. Uh, must be the kitchen behind that door. H Helen. He yes. Let's just sit down and just wait for whoever owns this place to come back, huh? I just want... You've got no right, Helen. 
Now, the owner of this place must be the kind of person who wouldn't like people nosing around. Oh, now, I'm really. Telling. Just look at it. This isn't just a cabin. It's a, it's a kind of lodge. Here, that wall lined with books. There, a, a high fi Stacks of records, all classical. And those paintings on the walls. Helen, please. I want a cup of coffee, and if this door leads to the kitchen... She just won't listen. Just won't ever listen. Well, what are you standing there for? Now that you've opened the door, go on in. Oh. Good Lord. What is it? Oh. Jim. Oh, Jim. Helen, what is it? The what? kitchen. Oh. The kitchen. Here. Helen, here, here. You better sit down. You look like you're going to faint. Now, you just sit there. I'll have a look. Now, we better get out of here. My God, oh, Jim. Blood, blood all over. A- and the axe. Did you see the axe? Yeah, that's the first thing I saw. Come on. Richard, we can't... We can't go. stay here. There must have been some hell of a fight in that kitchen, and I'm not waiting for the winner to come back. Oh, you don't suppose... Oh. What? The murderer. The, the murderer they're looking for, that man who slaughtered the Grant family. They said he was holed up. Somewhere on the mountain. Helen, I don't know, and we're not going to hang around to find out. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Oh. Oh. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, we, we, uh, I, I'm uh, Jim Crane. This is my, my wife, Helen. We, uh, we got caught in a blizzard, and, and we saw your cabin, and, uh, and, and we just, uh, we just came in. We, we, we were over at Big Mountain for a skiing weekend, and, uh, we, we started back too late, thanks to my husband. Oh, yeah, I guess it was my fault. You see, I don't ski. My wife does, but I don't. And, uh, well, I, I got into this poker game, and I was winning, and I uh, couldn't quit when I was ahead. You know how it is? You don't have to make any excuses to me, friend. Maybe to her, but not to me. Well, I, I was I was just explaining. Like ice in here. Better get that fire going again. Uh, you, you needn't bother on our account. I'm not. Well, what I meant was we were just leaving. Not in that blizzard you're not, Mrs. Crane. It, it's Miss Morgan, if you don't mind. I thought you said she's your wife. Well, she, uh, she keeps her maiden name. You kidding? No, uh... If you marry a doll and give her your name and she won't use it? <laughs> What's the matter, Mrs., uh, excuse me, Miss Morgan, you said, eh? <laughs> What's the matter, your husband's name isn't good enough for you? It isn't that. Then what is it? I uh, prefer to keep my own name, that's all. A lot of women do these days. Yeah, they call it women's lib. Women's what? Lib. For liberation. You know, they keep their names, their independence, their jobs, everything. Everything, eh? (laughs) That's too bad. You were my wife, doll. You wouldn't keep your name or your job or uh, anything. Uh, What do you do besides letting her get away with all this? Uh, Engineer. I'm an engineer. You drive a train? Oh, no, 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 no. Not that kind of engineer. Hydraulic engineer. Water power. Oh. Cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. I don't smoke. You? I don't smoke either. And I thought you... Huh? Nothing. You thought I was? Well, I... I noticed the pipe in the ashtray, so... Oh. Oh, well, uh... Yes, yes, I, uh... I do smoke a pipe now and then. Uh... Cigarettes, too. You, uh... You haven't told us your name. Jake. Jake what? Jake's enough. We need more wood. <laughs> I'll get it. Oh, let's get out of here. No, we can't. Well, we've got to. He doesn't own this place. He doesn't live here. And from the looks of him, oh, good Lord, what a bruiser. He, he could be the murderer the sheriff's looking for. The blood on his clothes. It's all over his heart. Helen, we can't be sure it's blood. What else could it be? And, and what about the cigarettes? There's not one cigarette in that ashtray. There's nothing but pipe ashes. Yeah, that's true, all right. And he's stupid. I mean, totally uninformed. He couldn't be the man who reads these books, listens to that music. He never heard of women's lib. He thought you drove a train. Helen. Helen, we can't leave. We could die out there. We can die in here. And I have a feeling we will if we don't get... That'll hold us for a while. There's enough wood in the shed to keep us warm through the night. 
as though with a little lady like this to keep you warm, you wouldn't have to worry too much, would you? Well, don't look so upset, Jimmy boy, would you? I wouldn't. But then I'd see to that. Not a bad idea, come to think of it. <laughs> How about a drink, sweetie, or uh, don't you do that either? I could use a drink, yes. You, Jim? Oh, uh, thanks, yes. Uh, what do you do, Jake? Right now, nothing. Well, I mean when you do something. Let's see, we got uh, scotch, bourbon, vodka. What'll it be? Helen? Scotch. Huh? I said scotch. No, uh, please? Uh, excuse me, uh, please. Jimmy boy? Uh, the same, uh, please. One thing you gotta say for men, they got better manners than women. Well, come on, come on, pull up to the fire here. Let's all get, uh, cozy. Is that okay with you, Helen? It'll certainly be warmer by the fire. That isn't what I said. I know what you said. What did I say? Uh, here you are. Thank you. Showing better manners. Good. Thanks. Yes, better. Easy chair, warm fire, drink. That's much better. Uh, right, nice, uh, nice place you've got here. Sorry. Uh, you must do a lot of reading, all those books. I read some, yes. Mm -hmm. I see you like classical music, too. Hmm. Who are your favorites? Composers, I mean. Oh, uh... Beethoven, maybe? Yes, yes, I, I like Beethoven. Oh, me too. I'm especially fond of his Tenth Symphony. Oh, yes. Yes, I I go for that, too. Well, I don't know about you two, but I'm getting hungry. Could use some supper. How about it? Yeah, I could eat. You, sweetie? Oh, I suppose. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Good. But first, we'll have to clean up the kitchen. It's a real bloody mess out there, and I mean bloody. What do you mean you mean Bloody. Just that, there's blood all over. All over me, too. See? Oh. Yeah, yeah. How, uh... What, what, what happened? I didn't want to kill him. I had to. I surprised him out there in the kitchen, and... He came for me. It was an axe, and it was the handiest thing, and I... Used that. I sank it into his skull. Deep. I couldn't help thinking of... The Grant family. The Grant? Yes, you haven't heard about that. Whole family down in the valley. Slaughtered. Blood all over. I got there in the kitchen. Well, we better get to it. You mean me? There's a lot to clean up. I can't do it by myself. Jim will help you. No. You will. I, I, I'd rather not. I didn't ask you whether you'd rather or wouldn't. I'm telling you. I'll give you two minutes to get out in this kitchen with me and get to work. There is no Beethoven tent. Oh, Jim, what have we got ourselves into? Helen, better humor. <sighs> go on now. You better go on out into that kitchen. I, I, I'm scared. I, I just can't be in that kitchen. Not, not alone with, with him. Oh. You saw the way he looks at me. The thing he says. Oh, don't worry. I'll, I'll protect you. You. Well, how about it, dollface? Are you coming? Yes. Yes. I'm coming. Helen and Jim feel the first stirrings of terror. But worse, much worse, lies ahead for them. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Suppose now that you, not Jim and Helen Crane, but you had sought shelter from the blizzard in that forsaken mountain cabin. You had met this strange and quite obviously murderous man who calls himself Jake. Suppose you, not Helen, are helping him against your will 
to clean up the shambles in the kitchen. The bloody shambles. <sighs> well, that's it, I guess. The axe needs to be washed. There's blood all over it. Well, go on, wash it. I, I, I can't touch it. The knot is liberated. Uh, wasn't that the word, as you thought? I don't see what that's got to do with it. I kind of got the impression you felt you could do anything a man could do. <laughs> All right, I'll wash the axe. You start making supper. Well, what are you standing there for? Get busy. I don't know where anything is. Lots of canned stuff in that closet, and there's a can over on the wall. Think you know how to use it? I'll try. It's funky, aren't you? Funky. You know there was a killing in this kitchen this afternoon, and I was the one used this act. You know that, but you got the nerve to stand up to me. Maybe too much nerve. There's beans and spaghetti stew, and that's about it. What do you want? You decide. I figured you're good at deciding things. And that's what's wrong between you and your hubby. How do you know there's something wrong? No sweat. Five minutes with the two of you and anybody could see you're too pushy. And him, he's... He's too much the other way. Yep, like I said, you're too spunky. Somebody ought to take a little of it out of you. And get your hands off me. Oh, come on now. Don't let me go. Mm. Oh, stop it. Stop. Stop it. Hey, what's going on there? Oh. What's going on? Well, you might say I was, uh... Starting to do what you should do, Jimmy boy. Well, don't try that again. You do. And you won't do any more than you're doing right now. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Jim. Jim, please. It's all right now. No harm done. I'm, 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 I'm not hurt or anything. What's the big deal, Jimmy boy? Little kiss between friends. What's to get psyched up about? Come on, Jim. As you and me have a friendly drink while Helen gets supper ready. No, I don't want to. Come on. You uh, know how to use that can opener, sweetie? I'll manage. That's my girl. Yeah, scotch, right? Yeah. Oh, I see you tried to use a phone. <laughs> Don't look so surprised. You put it back the wrong way around. The phone's dead. I could have told you that. The wires are down, I guess. No. I cut the wires. You, you cut... Well, you drink, Jimmy boy. Cheers. Oh, and by the way, in case you've got any other ideas about getting help, those guns over the fireplace aren't loaded. And neither is that revolver on your mantle. Jake. Yeah? I'll, uh, I'll make a deal with you. What gives you the idea that you're in any position to make a deal? I'm not, I'm not, but you've got aces back to back, I know that, but I'm still in the game, Jake. You're a good poker player. You're bluffing, but I'd never be able to tell it in your face. Are you going to listen? All ears. Let us go, Helen and me. Let us go, and we won't say a thing, not a thing, to anybody. About what? What? You know. I don't know. Look, I don't want to spell it out. You got no choice. I hold aces back to back, like you said. All right. We, we, uh... My, my wife and I, we have a pretty good idea who you are. You you know that, or I wouldn't be telling you. Uh-huh. So, uh, what you're thinking, once these two leave here, they'll contact the sheriff and give them a lead on me. Well, all I want to say is, just give us a break and we won't, we won't say a word to anybody. Thanks. I appreciate that. And in return, you just let us go. Who's holding you? Well, you know what I mean. We, we, we can't go now, not with that blizzard out there. I mean... Tomorrow or the next day. Whenever the plow comes through and clears the road. And... I mean, I want you to let us live. What for? Answer me that, Jimmy boy. What for? Well, that's a crazy question. Yeah? Let me tell you something. Tell me. You in love with your wife? You can't answer that, huh? She in love with you. Can't answer that either, huh? Can you? How long you been married? You can answer that. Three years. 
What happened, Jimmy? What happened between the time three years ago you two couldn't wait to get married, I'll bet, and now when you can't wait to get divorced? You are thinking about divorce, aren't you? Well, we... Uh, we don't get along, that's for sure, but... For what? You're at each other's throats day in and day out, right? Nothing but fights, arguments, frustrations on both sides. From the minute you get up till you go to bed, right? Am I right? Yeah, you're right. And you want to live? For what? Well, you keep hoping things will change. They won't. Unless you make them change. And very few ever do. They keep hoping right into the grave. Hoping. Like the Grants. Why, uh... Why did you kill the Grants? They killed themselves. They were dead long before they were put out of their misery. Like you and her. I'll make a deal with you, Jimmy. I'm listening. You give me a good reason why you should go on living. That's a deal. Well, we want to. No. You just don't want to die. <laughs> Bad meal, sweetie. You're real talented with a can opener. Thank you. Yeah. Storm's getting worse. Yeah, we're really snowed in now. Drifts above the windowsills. Better build this fire up, and then I guess we'll hit the sack. Yeah, where do you want to sleep, sweetie? Come on, now. You shouldn't have any trouble making up your mind. Oh, I haven't. I'll sleep with my husband, as usual. As usual? What kind of a crack is that? Now, now, cool it, Jimmy boy. Well, I won't have my wife in front of it. I don't care how big you are, Jake, or how tough or cold-blooded. I won't oh, have you Oh, Jim, in now stop it. This is no time for gallantry. You're no match for him. He'd kill you. Besides, you took me the wrong way. All I meant was... Well, come on, now, be honest. How long has it been since you two did sleep together as husband and wife? That's no business of yours. <laughs> long time, huh? Well, the minute I laid eyes on you, the way you acted toward each other, looked at each other, the way you talked, anybody could see you hated each other. We, we don't hate each other. You love each other? You see, that's what I mean. You two. You don't hate, you don't love. You don't nothing. And you ask me... That's a naughty way to live. So how about it, sweetie? How about what? There's a nice big double bed in that bedroom, and it's going to be a cold night. And me, I sure appreciate it. I warn you, Jake. Oh, Jim. I'll sleep out here on the couch. Come here, sweetie. What? Oh. Let old Jake see if he can change your oh, mind. Oh, hey, hey, now. Get what your are you hands doing? off oh, her. Oh, 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 you dirty... Jim! Why, you little creep. Hit me, would you? Oh. 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 Oh.
I knew that without being told. Those guns were the first thing I went for when you two were in the kitchen. But if they're unloaded... Well, I nosed around. I couldn't find any ammunition for the guns on the wall, but... I found these in that drawer. Do they fit? Looks as if they ought to. We'll find out. They do. They fit. Yeah, thank heaven. What do we do now? We'll wait till morning. But we're safe now, Helen. Safe. Thanks to you, darling. You know, you haven't called me that in... I don't know when. Uh, oh, uh, I, oh, Jim. There's something I forgot to mention. I kind of figure you must have found the bullet for that revolver in the desk drawer. You did, didn't you? What of it? Uh, don't bother loading that gun. It doesn't work. The trigger's broken. Nice. Helpless once again. Jim and Helen can only stare at each other as fear touches them with icy fingers. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Terror's icy fingers grip Helen and Jim Crane as they face all but certain death at the hands of Jake. Curious, though, isn't it? Even strange that their fear, shared in common, brings them closer to each other than ever before in the three years of their marriage. Strange. Curious. Jim. Oh, I didn't know you were awake. I've hardly slept. I'm sorry. I, uh, I've done the best I could with this fire through the night to keep the room warm. I know, I know. I watched you get up out of that chair again and again. Thank you, Jim. What? You did it mostly for me. For my comfort. Thank you. Nonsense, I, uh... I need a little warmth, too, you know. You don't get much, do you? From me. Could be I don't rate much. I think you do. Then why do you withhold it? I only just found out. Found out? It wasn't the cold that kept me awake through the night. It was thinking. About Jake. Oh. And us. Yeah, well, we'll manage a way out of this. I don't know how, but we will. I wasn't thinking about that. I was thinking about something he said last night. He said, we don't hate each other. We don't love. We don't nothing. And then he said, you ask me, that's a nutty way to live. It is, isn't it? If what he said was true about us, but it isn't. It is. Not for me. I did a lot of thinking, too. I, uh... I love you, Helen. I always have. It's just that... Yes? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It seems I can't reach you anymore. Something happened to us along the way, and I can't figure out what it is. I think I can. Tell me. I think maybe it's it's just the times we live in. I I mean, oh well. Take women's lib. I don't see anything wrong with women's lib. The fact is, I I'm all for it if if it doesn't go too far. It did with me. I think. Oh, I don't know. I I, I do. I wanted to be. I I still want to be my own person, myself, me. The last thing I wanted was to be dependent on anyone, and I guess, especially on you. But last night, oh, Jim, I was scared. And when you fought for me, when you, well, you just went for him like a raging animal, Jim, and you did it for me. I know you wouldn't have done it for yourself or maybe for anyone, but you did it for me. Oh, Jim, I, I, I needed you. I really did need you. Well, maybe the truth is... The simple truth is that we need each other. I, I don't mean just you and me, but everybody. I mean, we're all in the same boat, aren't we? Same world. We are dependent on each other, so... Why do we fight it? I'm not fighting it anymore. I made up my mind to that during the night. Jim, hmm? I 
love you. You are a wonderful husband. O- only I just never gave you the chance to be. Oh, Helen, sweetheart. Oh, I do love you. Oh, Jim, I do. Oh, I do. Oh, dearest. Well, well, well. Oh. Look what's going on oh. here. When did you two scrappers become lovebirds? <laughs> never mind, never mind. That fire needs building up. Get some wood, Jim. It's uh, back in the shed. Okay. So, you think you've fallen in love with your husband all over again, eh? You were listening. You overheard. I laughed myself sick. I don't see anything funny about it. You wouldn't. You believe it. So does he. Fact is, the two of you in the same boat, and no, you better row together or else. Or else what? <laughs> You'll find out, sweetie. What will you take to let us go? Kind of putting the cart before the horse, aren't you? Go where? The blizzard has stopped. But those drifts out there must be six, eight feet high. They must plow that road. They have to keep it open. A plow is sure to come through, if not today, tomorrow. Could be. Well, then. Well, then what? Don't kill us. Let us go. Why should I? I'll give you anything you want. I'll do anything you want. How do you know what I want? What makes you so sure you can supply it? You've made that plain enough. Jake, I I, I beg you, let us live. At least, let Jim live. And I'll do anything. Anything. What happened? Oh, I was bringing an armful of wood and I stepped on a log. Oh, I twisted my ankle. Here, let me give you a hand. Just lean on me. Now, take it easy. Jim, Jim, dear. Easy now, easy. Yes, sit right there. Get that shoe off. Let him get it off himself. He's no cripple. You get out in the kitchen and scare up some breakfast. You heard me. Oh, the pain. See if you can stand on it. Stand? Try it. Oh, Oh, I, I can't. I'm helpless. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Real helpless. Hey, you make a good cup of coffee, though. Thank you. I'll get another cold compress for your ankle, Jim. He's all right. I said... I said he's okay. Let him worry about his ankle. You and me have some unfinished business. What is this? Helen, what is this? It, it's the only way. What only way? What are you talking about? Jim, I made a deal with him. A deal? I said I'd, I'd do anything if he'd let us go. Are you out of your mind? He's going to kill us. Now you know that. Now you're crazy. He'll get what he wants and then he'll kill us. No. Yes. No, because I'm going to kill him with his... All I want is, is to get close enough to him. No, no, and then no, I... no, you can't do that. It isn't in you to do that. It's got to be. There isn't any other way. What's keeping you? I, I'm coming. And leave the night, doll. <laughs> These petitions are awful thin. You ought to know that by now. Put the knife down, I said. Stay where you are, Helen. She made a deal. And she's gone through with it. Over my dead body. No, you fool. Over your life, buddy. Over my life? He said he'd spare you. Spare me? He said us. She lied. She made the bargain to save you. Helen. Helen, you, you, you I would... I love you. I love you, Jim. I told you that. I love you. And I love you, Helen, a lot too much to let you go through with anything like this. What'd you figure you can do about it, huh? You can't even stand that on that bad ankle, you can't. Oh, yes, I... Ah, uh, 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 Jimmy uh, boy, not you. Now, Dal. No, no. I can't. I, I can't go through with it. Oh, yes, you can. Leave her alone. Leave her alone. Oh, please, I can't. I stop can't. it, Jimmy. I stop it. Oh. Oh. Jim. You. How did you? I don't know. Oh. I don't know, Helen. I... I somehow grabbed the poker and, and, and made it across the floor and hit him with it. I, I don't know how I did it. Oh, I've got to sit down and get off this. Oh, here, here. Oh, lean uh, on me. All right, now. Easy, easy. Yeah, thanks. Oh. Better have a look at him, Helen, see if he's breathing. I... 
I may have killed him. He's breathing. His head's bleeding. Where you hit him. I get something to tie him up with. See if there's some rope around. Oh, and snap it up. Oh. He's, he's coming to Oh, yes. Oh. It's the phone. He said he cut the wires. He couldn't have. It was a bluff. Hello? Sheriff? It's the sheriff in Big Indian. Who? Professor Moran. Uh, no. Th- there is a man here. I... I'm afraid he's hurt. Um, oh. Me? My name's Helen Crane. My husband and I got caught in last night's blizzard, and, and we managed to get to this cabin, and we found... Well, there was blood all over the kitchen, and an axe. Helen, look out. Jake, oh. it, 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 it's all right. Oh, all right. The poker. Helen, the poker. Hit him again. No. No, you've got it all wrong. All wrong. Helen, hit him. Sheriff. Give me that phone. Oh. Hello. Hello, hello, Ed. Yes, it, yes, it's Jake. You know, it, it's okay. Every, everything's okay. No, 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 not, I'm not worried at all. I knew you'd check as soon as they, as they get the service back on. Huh? Oh. Oh, man. Bobcat. Yeah, Bobcat. Surprised him in the kitchen. Killed him with the wood axe. Handiest thing. Yeah, I guess so. Prowling for food, sure. Oh. Well, a nice young couple. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm very much alive. I'll explain when I see you. The plow. When? Good. No, 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 we're okay. Plenty of wood, plenty of food. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. So long. You... Professor Moran? Yes. Why... I don't get it. We thought you were the killer they're looking for. Yes, I know. Why didn't you tell us who you were? Why, why didn't you explain about the blood in the kitchen? Well, more important, why did you act the way you did? You acted the part of the killer. Yes. Why did I act the part? Well, you were guinea pigs, I'm afraid. Guinea pigs? Yes, I'm head of the Department of Psychology at City University. I sized you two up the minute I saw you. Your marriage was headed for the rocks, and like most couples, you didn't know it. No, I... Uh, I guess we didn't. Like any other young marriage in this day and age, you'd lost contact with each other. We're going separate ways. Well, I set out to bring you back together, and... As I said before, people in the same boat have to pull together. All I did was put you both in the same boat by making you face a common danger. A danger that never existed. Well, I'm hanged. You carried things pretty far, Professor Moran. Uh, too far, my dear, much too far. <sighs> uh, you'll find aspirin in the medicine cabinet. Uh, bring me a couple, would you? Mm. On second thought, bring the bottle. And so terror turns to surprise and relief. Pretty shrewd fellow, Professor Moran, wouldn't you say? I mean... Realizing that Jim and Helen were headed for divorce, that took keen insight into human nature. But then, he was, after all, a trained psychologist. I'll be back in just a moment. Marriage is two people in the same boat. A cliché, of course. But the very core of every cliché is truth. All is not gold that glitters. A stitch in time saves nine, and so on. I couldn't help thinking that all humanity is in the same boat. And what an infinitely better and happier world it would be if we all learned to pull together. Our cast included Lois Smith, Larry Haynes, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Aurora Toyota is still the fastest growing Toyota dealership in the greater Seattle area because they take the... 
the Mummers, in the little theater of the air. Now, the hermit. Turn them out. Ah, have you heard the story, the blackness of terror? Eh? Then listen while the hermit tells you the story. <laughs> It was one week ago today that Paul and I received a telegram about Papa. And since that hour, my life, my thoughts, my feelings have been deeply altered. I have learned the results of the blackness of terror, the hideousness of sin, and the horror of madness. On Wednesday last, about 10 p.m., a telegram was delivered to me. Who on earth can be sending me a wire? Who else but your father? But Papa always calls. Well, before you open it, we're not going to Blue Acres this weekend. We haven't had one weekend to ourselves since we were married. Oh. Oh, Paul, it is Papa. I knew it. No, you don't understand. Here. Your father's seriously ill. Suggest you come at once. Dr. Lorry. Papa. Papa. Oh, now take it easy, Marlene. He's never been ill a day in his life. Your father's getting along in years, darling. You can't expect him not to have some bad days. But Dr. Lorry says seriously ill. And he's usually terribly conservative. We must start at once. Oh, please understand me. I love my husband, Paul, very much. But up until the time I married, I had never left my father's side. We'd been inseparable. Ever since that dreadful morning... When as a little girl of eight years, my papa had taken me on his lap. And after kissing me tenderly and brushing the curls back from my forehead, he had said... Little doll, your papa has something very sad to tell you. But you must be very brave, my darling. Your mother has left us. She has written this note to inform us. To Terence and Marlene. Life here at Blue Acres has grown intolerable for me. You're a little child, Marlene, and therefore I cannot explain some things to you. But Terence will know why I'm leaving. My little girl, try to think kindly of your mother. I would take you with me if I could, but that is impossible just now. Your father is a wealthy man, and he can give you fine things. I know at Blue Acres you will grow up to be a lady of whom I shall always be proud. And a daughter whom I will love forever. Do not cry, my little doll. Had your mother loved you, she would never have left you. From this day forward, there will be no mention of her name in this house. To us, she is dead. It was some years later that I learned that my beautiful mother had left Papa and me and had run away with Philip Court, a chap the town people said was a worthless dauber in paint. Nothing was ever heard of my mother or him after they left the wake. Nor did my father, Terence Lane, ever mention her name. He devoted his life to me. I had private tutors that came to Blue Acres to instruct me, the very best. Papa imported a master of the piano to teach me. We remained aloof from the world. The only woman in the household beside myself was Mrs. Eaton. Father always did the cleaning of the house, for Blue Acres is filled with priceless treasures. And when I would laugh at him dusting, he would always remark, Can't let her clumsy fingers touch this vase. It's worth a thousand dollars if it's worth a penny. The years moved on, and I lived in a world of my father's creation. 
until this last summer when I was 21 years old. One glorious summer night when the moon made golden patterns on the terraced lawns of Blue Acres and the waters of the colored fountains centered in the ground shot a million rainbow lights into the night. When the French doors of the music room were opened wide to let the cool night air enter in. I sat at the piano playing the works of one of my favorite composers, Debussy. fond of Debussy, and as soon as I began playing, he got up from his chair and went to his study. But the haunting melancholy of Debussy suited me. It was a background to my dreaming, and the somehow lonely feeling of my heart that was growing stronger as the years wore on, with only Papa for my companion. I went on playing. Suddenly, I was aware of the presence of another in the room. I felt it strongly even before I turned around. Oh, please go on. It's beautiful. Suited to a night like this. Please. I'm sorry, but I don't... Oh, don't be sorry. I'm the one who owes you an apology for my intrusion. I'm Paul Wilde. I'm spending my vacation at the Truesdales who live down the road a ways. Oh, yes. They told me there was a princess living at Blue Acres. But they didn't do you justice, young lady. No princess was ever quite so fair or lovely as you. Please, Mr. Wilde. The Tuesdales also added that a dragon named Terence Lane guards the Princess Marlene with his life. That was very unjust. Really? Well, then, if you're not zealously guarded, how about taking a stroll with me? The night is wonderful. And if you're good... I'll reach up and pick you a necklace of stars to wear. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilde. You won't go? It's late. And Papa would object? No. Well, then, with your kind permission, I'll call tomorrow afternoon to gain his consent for a date tomorrow night. Do I have your permission? Well, yes. Fine. Then do something for me now, will you? If I can. Play something for me as I walk away. Shall we have something light and joyous this time? Something more in tune with the happiness in store for you and me. I'll be listening for our theme song. Paul, Paul Wilde. Only those deeply in love can understand what I mean when I say it was adoration on sight. I knew that from that second until eternity, there would be none other for me than Paul. And true to his word, he was at Blue Acres the next afternoon, asking Father's consent for an evening with me. I didn't hear their conversation, but I did hear from Papa later. My dear, I'm an old man, wise in the ways of the world. I've spent my entire life Protecting you from the vulgar of this world. The worthless. Had I protected your mother more carefully, there never would have been the scandal in this house caused by her treacherous act. But Papa... I have already called into the city. This Paul Wilde is nothing but a simple clerk with poor wages. Is there never to be anyone for me? Of course, when the time comes. But this is not the time. never disobeyed my father, but I did so that night. I sent Paul a note, and we met at midnight in the gardens of Blue Acres. My Marlene. Say it again, Paul. It sounds so wonderful. I've never had anyone but Papa speak my name with love. My Marlene. I have a lifetime of love to give you. A heart bursting with love for you. Do you love me, my darling? Oh, yes, Pa. Say it. I love you. Oh, I love you. And now say this. I love you enough to leave Blue Acres and marry you, Pa. I love you enough to leave. Oh, Pa, I can't. 
I can't do that to Papa. Must you give up your life to him? No, but to leave him as Mother did. Then will you let me go out of your life? No. No. There were other surreptitious meetings. There were arguments, persuasions, protestations. But in the end, love won out. Paul and I ran away and were married. I will never forget the following day when Paul and I returned to Faith's father. What is done cannot be undone. Papa, you forgive me. Yes, I forgive you. Oh, Papa. Paul, isn't he wonderful? You are the love of my life. And if Paul realizes this, he will not keep you absent from me for any long periods of time. Of course not, Papa. Blue Acres will continue to be our home. But I hadn't reckoned with Paul when I made this statement. He would not quit work and live at Blue Acres off Papa's bounty, as he called it. So for the time being, we'd been spending weekends at Blue Acres. At this moment, I felt a little resentful that Paul had taken me away from Papa. We arrived at Blue Acres and Mrs. Eaton opened the door to us, just as dawn was breaking over Blue Acres. Oh, at last you've arrived. Come in. Papa... Your father's a very sick man. What is it, Mrs. Eaton? I think, Miss Marlene, you should let Dr. Laurie explain. Oh, here. I'll take the luggage upstairs. I'll go to father. You'll find him in his study. Doctor had a bed set up in there where it's easier for me to care for him. Besides, he seems more content there. Hasn't Dr. Laurie gotten a nurse for Papa? We tried it, but he wouldn't have one. We'd better knock on the door. Doctor's in there with him now. Come in. Papa... I ran across the room to my father's bed. I looked down at him, and then in dismay at Dr. Laurie. For my father's face was a horrible sight, twisted and pulled out of shape. And his eyes, his burning eyes, they were staring at me wildly. I reached out for his hand and cried out to him, Papa! I... I... What is it, Dr. Laurie? Stroke. I... Oh, Papa, don't worry. Dr. Lloyd will get you well again. Can you hear my voice? I'm not quite sure this morning, but I think so. He does know who you are. Uh, come outside with me, Marlene. I want to talk to you. I'm going in the drawing room, Papa, to talk to Dr. Lloyd. I'll be right back, and then I won't leave. I won't leave until you're well again. Come in the drawing room, Doctor. I should never have left him. Fiddlesticks. You did the right thing. But my marriage has brought this on. He loved me so, and I love him. He's been lost with me, gone. Marlene, I, uh... Dr. Lorry, his eyes... Yes, my dear. I was just about to talk to you of this. What is it? I wish I knew. Your father is suffering from some terrible fear that I'm inclined to think is nothing to do with his fear of dying. Has he said anything about it? He can't speak. Only the guttural sound you heard. He can't write. He can't lift his hands. Oh, how dreadful. What that fear is, I don't know. I've watched with him nights, and it appears that whatever causes his wild fear is worse then. Poor Papa. As soon as office hours are over this evening, I'll drive out here to Blue Acres. Perhaps between the two of us, we'll be able to discover what causes his distress and be able to help him. <laughs> My heart was sorrow to see my father suffering such pain and discomfort. And the look in his eyes, the mad, wild look, was almost more than I could bear. At last, night came. I rejoiced when I heard Mrs. Eaton usher Dr. Laurie in. He and I sat by father's bed while the heavy minutes ticked past. But as night wore on and it was fast reaching midnight, there was a change in his eyes. The fear in them was so marked that I trembled from it. Dr. Laurie said... Do you see? His eyes. Yes. 
It's as if he sees something we don't see. Yes. It was so. His eyes seemed to be riveted on the door to his study. And it was then that I thought I heard a low moan. What was that? I don't know. It didn't come from Father. No. But look at him now. Now Father's eyes were trained in closer to his bed. <laughs> he was struggling, attempting to lift his hand. <laughs> it was very plain to me, and I cried out. <laughs> Doctor, there's some unseen thing standing over Papa's bed. That is the way I diagnose it. There is. Something unseen to us, but clearly seen by your father. <laughs> and look, the bedclothes are moving, but he's not touching them. What is it? Dr. Lorry, what is it? An unseen spirit, eh? Witnessed only by the die. What does Lawrence Terrence Lane see, eh? What causes him to fear so mightily? The hermit will tell you before the night is done. <laughs> and now the hermit will continue. <laughs> Only a few minutes have passed. But Marlene, in her anxiety to aid her father in his terrible fear, only makes matters more difficult. Now it appears that the dying man wishes his beloved daughter out of the room, too. I... <sighs> and so Paul, the husband of Marlene, with his arms about her, leads her from the room, guides her into the music room where she sinks into a chair, sobbing softly. Listen. <laughs> Darling, if you get overwrought, ill, you won't be able to help your father. Oh, Paul, it's, it's so dreadful. I tell you, Papa sees things there in his room. Some vision that frightened him. I saw the bedclothes move and Papa wasn't touching them. Please, dear, try to control your nerves. Shall I have Mrs. Eaton make you some tea? It'll help soothe you. I'll be right back, darling. Only take a second. I sat trying to get a hold of myself. It was only a few minutes after he'd left the room. Once again, I was aware of the same sound I had heard in Father's room. The sound that had made his eyes turn mad with the terror of it. Was I, too, losing my mind? What was the answer to this strange phenomenon? A sound that to my ears was exactly like that of a woman moaning. At first it was close to me in the music room. And then it grew fainter, but still distinct. And though it's difficult to believe, there was a second when I felt as if something had brushed past my chair, had touched my shoulder. I cried out for Paul. Paul! Paul! What is it? I'm right here. Paul, listen. Do you hear a strange sound? What sort of a sound? A sound like a woman moaning. No. I heard it distinctly. You listen. Hey, you drink this tea and forget about such things. Please, Paul, quiet. Now, do you hear? By George. You do hear it? Some unusual sound. Where is it coming from? I don't know. There it is again. Yeah. So it seems to be coming from these walls of the music room. That's it. Or from out on the terrace. Oh, it's nearer than that. Here. In this wall behind the piano. Yes. <laughs> Hmm. Why are you feeling the wall? This panel here. Look. It's... Why, it's a panel that opens. I've lived here all my life and I never knew of it before. And in a room in here. And you can hear the moaning from here much closer. Marlene, get the candle from the piano. I'm going to look around in here. Yes. Here, Paul. Yeah, this passage in here must lead to another room in the house. I'm coming with you. And the moaning we heard was from someone in the adjoining room from here. 
Paul, we... Here, look. What is it? This enormous chair. Listen. Quick, there's someone inside this chair. I believe you're right. Hurry, they'll smother to death. Now yeah, it's locked. Locked? Someone's been pushed into this chest, and it's been locked against them. Hurry, can't you break it open? I'm going to try. <coughs> that, that'll lock his giving now. <coughs> One skeleton, Paul. Two. Two. I'm going to take this chest into Terence Lane's room. When I question him and show him what we've found in his secret hiding place, no doubt we'll have the answer to our tragedy and our riddle. When confronted with the chest and the skeletons of human beings found in it, when asked questions by Dr. Lorry that Papa could answer by a nod of his head, we found the solution to the mystery of Blue Acre. Yes, the skeletons were those of Philip Court and my mother. My father had killed them before they ever got away from the house the night mother intended to leave him. Dr. Lorry filled in many blank spaces in the life of my mother and father. Your father was an insanely jealous man, Marlene. He would allow her no friends. He even went to the city alone and bought her gowns for her. He would allow no one to look upon her. He hated me because I attended her at your birth. Oh. I was surprised when he allowed you to get away from him and marry Paul. But I figure that out now. What do you mean, Doctor? I found a large quantity of arsenic in his desk. Great heaven. I'm sure it was his intention to do away with you, Paul. Then, once again, he could have Marlene to himself. Take me away, Paul. next morning. Terence Lane, my father, is still living. Mrs. Eaton cares for him. I haven't been out since that horrible night when the moaning of my mother's spirit led me to her grave. But we will go out this weekend if he's still living. Paul says I can never be happy unless I forgive him. Besides, the eyes of my father show madness in the evening after darkness gathers. And so we know he is tortured enough. Each night he must see the spirit of my mother standing over his bed, accusing him of his crime of double murder. to those who stand beside him. And in the night time, a vision of a woman appears before him. The vision of one whom he murdered because of his insane jealousy. Yes. Terence Lane has learned during these last hours the blackness, the awful blackness of terror. Turn on your lights. Turn them on. <laughs> I'll be back. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> mentioned in the hermit's cave are fictitious, and similarity to persons, places, or occurrences is purely accidental. Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries.
Good evening, friends of the Inner Sanctum. This is your host to welcome you through the squeaking door. Draw up a tombstone and sit down. Don't mind the fact that we've carved your name on it. <laughs> well, it's rather lonesome around here tonight, isn't it? Yes, most of the folks who haunt the place are out tonight with their sleds. If it snowed near your house, you may find them ghosting down here. But, Mr. Host, ghosts don't go sledding, do they? Well, of course, Mary. Especially the ghosts of gangsters. They're used to being taken for a sleigh ride. Well, now, why don't you take your sled and join your friends and let me have a word with our Lipton listeners? Folks, have you ever noticed how often we all use the words good, better, and best? We're always comparing things, because comparisons help us decide what the best things in life are. For example, the perfect way to prove how really flavorful Lipton tea is, is to compare Lipton's to any other tea and taste the difference. Lipton's flavor is brisk, never flat or wishy-washy. It gives you all the flavor, tastes just the way you like tea best. No other tea gives you more bright, mellow goodness, because that superb flavor of Lipton's is extra rich, extra satisfying. Yes, friends, just compare Lipton's to any other tea. You'll find Lipton's gives you brisk flavor, and you'll find Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor gives you more contentment in every cup. All right, Mary. Now you go and touch yourself on that teapot over there and get ready to hear about The Dark Chamber. It's an original radio play by Robert Newman, who witnessed the story while peeking through a keyhole. Yes, and our star tonight is Kenneth Lynch, who plays the role of Joel. Our story tonight is about death. Violent death. And also about something which is even more terrifying. The unknown. You don't believe that anything can be more frightening than death. Then you've never experienced the ultimate in fear. But you will within the next few minutes. If you'll put out the lights, pull your chair up close and listen to the dark chamber. Police headquarters, Ryan speaking. Hello, police. Listen, you've got to help me. You've got to. I don't know how you can, but... My name is Watson, Joe Watson. I'm a driver for the Acme Sanitary Hand Laundry. Address? Where I am, I... I don't know. That's part of the trouble. Now, look. Hey, wait, listen. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. Check the laundry. Check the veterans. I'm an ex-GI. They'll tell you I'm straight. It... Well, I'm in a room someplace. I don't know where it is or how I got here or what I'm here for. I don't even know how long I've been here. It's a big room, but it's funny. No doors, no windows that I can see. It's just a couple of chairs and a table with this phone on it. I'm scared. What do you expect us to do? Find me. Find out what this is all about and get me out of here. I, I don't know. Oh, I... Listen, this isn't a gag. Can't you tell? You don't know what it's like just sitting here waiting, not knowing where or why or what's going to happen. Can't you trace this call or something? Well, okay. Hang on. Oh, thank heaven. I was afraid... Listen, I hear something. Someone's coming. I better hang up. I'll, I'll call you back later if I can. How do you do? Who are you? My name's Helming. Dr. John Helming. And your name? I don't have to tell you anything. That's very true. Although I didn't think you were aware of it. I think I already know everything about you that I'm interested in knowing. Like what? Name? Joseph Watson, age 26, occupation, employee of the Acme Laundry, honorably discharged from the army six months ago with the Brown Star and the Purple Heart. What the... So you cased me. Went through my pockets, huh? Well, if you know that much, you know I haven't got any dough. Money? I'm not interested in money. Well, what do you want, then? Where is this place? The last thing I remember is making a delivery on Spruce Street, noticing that the lights were out in the hall and hearing a noise behind me. You or somebody slugged me. That's right. Well, will you stop grinning like that and tell me what this is all about? Of course. I brought you here because I need your help in an experiment. An experiment whose details I've already worked out with mice and rabbits and cats and other animals. What kind of an experiment? An experiment in fear. Fair. Yes. You fought in the war. You were wounded. That means you've probably known fear. 
And still, you won the Bronze Star, which means you overcame it. Now, the question is, can you overcome your present fears? What are you talking about? You're afraid. Nothing has happened to you yet, absolutely nothing, and yet you are afraid, aren't you? You're afraid because you're face to face with the unknown. Because you don't know what I want and what I'm planning to do. Um, which is as it should be. And uh, that's the way we'll leave it. For the moment. Hey, wait a minute. Come back here. Come back. You can't. Hello, police. This is Joe Watson again. Listen, I got a little more dope. I don't know if it'll help, but there was a guy in here just now. Said his name was Helming, John Helming. That's probably a phony. He's about 50, tall, over six foot, white hair and gray eyes. No, I still don't know what it's all about or what he's after, but have you been able to trace this number yet? Well, how long will it take? Okay, I'll hang on, but... What? The lights just went out. The room's pitch dark and somebody's coming in again. I better stop. But for Pete's sake, Hurry! Who? Who's that? Who just came in? Who are you? A girl. Keep away from me. Keep away, do you hear? Keep away? What's the angle now? Angle? Why did you bring me here? Wait a minute. You mean he put the snatch on you, too? When I was on my way home, chloroform or something. And the next thing I knew... Why are you pretending? You're in on it, too. You must be. It's a trap. It's a trap, all right. But I'm not in on it. I'm in it, along with you. My name is Watson. Joe Watson. I'm Betty Grant. You swear? I swear. What would I lie about it for? I wonder why he put you in here. Put us together. Who is he? What's he going to do? I don't know. He said something about an experiment. An experiment in fear, but... Hey, listen, we've got to get out of here somehow, some way. He might be listening. Very astute, my dear. Of course I'm listening. What the... Where are you? Right here in the dark. I've been here all the time. Why are you... No, Joe, don't. He must want you to go for him. He's probably got a gun. Right again, my dear. Not that I'll need it. This is stage two of the experiment. A new stimulus to action has been introduced. Man against the unknown has become man and woman against the unknown. Look, let's get down to brass tacks. Be sensible about this. Thank you, Joe. That's why I won't need my gun. This new uh, stimulus has been negated by an increased sense of responsibility. Responsibility towards the girl and therefore... By uh, increased fear. Blast you, gun or no gun, if I get my hands on you, where are you? Where are you? Outside now, so you can relax. That was the final stimulus in this stage. Injured pride. The discovery that I could read your innermost thoughts and knew exactly what you were going to do. But you mustn't let that bother you. I already know everything you're going to do from now on. Till the end. Listen, you... Helming! Helming! He's gone. Joe. I know. Hold on, baby. Don't let it get you. There must be a way, some way. I suppose he's still listening? It's hard to say. But I'm going to take a chance. There's one thing he didn't figure on. A telephone. Here? Yes. If I can find it again in the dark... It's over on the... Here it is. I put through two calls already to the police. Told them what was happening and asked them to get me out of here. I had to hang up both times before they could trace the call and get this number, but this time... Hello. Hello, operator. What? No, this isn't the operator. You're on a busy wire. It doesn't matter. Thank heaven I got somebody. I've been trying for about ten minutes now. Look, get off the line, will you? I've got to get through to the police. It's terribly important. But you've got to help me. You've got to. My name's Ben Lazari, and I'm a prisoner someplace. I don't know where. You what? I don't... It's true. Strange house somewhere. 
The doctor who says his name is Helmy. What? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Joe, what is it? What is it? I haven't got headquarters. I've got a guy that... I'm sorry, Ben. It's no use. What do you mean? We're in the same boat you are. A girl named Betty Grant and myself. Helming's got us locked up, too. You, too? Yeah. He said he knew everything we were thinking. Everything we were going to do. I did get through to the police before, but I guess he caught wise. We're talking to each other over an inside line. Uh, yeah. We're through. No. Joe, don't say that. Don't even think it. Look. Ask him exactly where he is. Just where are you, Ben? Do you know? It's hard to say. I was out cold when he brought me here. It's a kind of a hall, a passageway. Cement floor, ceiling, stone walls. There doesn't seem to be any door or opening or anything like that. That's what I thought here, too. But there must be one, or how would he have gotten you in there? Hey, listen, start looking. See if you can find it. That's true. I never thought of that. If I do find the door and it opens into where you are... That's right. Three of us together. We'll surely be able to figure something out then. Hold on. I'll start pounding on the walls. You see if you hear anything. Go ahead. What's he doing? He's going to knock on the walls to see if he's anywhere near us. And if he is, if he can find a door, we can get together. Hear anything? I'm not sure. Maybe. I'm not sure either. Sounds awful far away, is it? There, listen. That wall right there. Hello. Hello, Ben. Yes? We heard you. You're right next to us. Now, Ben, you listen and Betty will knock back. Go ahead, Betty. That way, Ben, you'll be able to tell just which wall it is. Okay. Right. I hear it. I know where it is. Now to find the door, if there is one. Hold on. He's got it. He's going to see if there's a door. There must be one. There must be. Ben. And... Ben. Ben. Hello. What is it? I don't know. I thought I heard some... a moan. Joe. Look. There is a door. It's opening. It's open. Joe. Dr. Helming. Why, yes. Were you expecting someone? <laughs> If you mention it, Doctor, there was someone we've been expecting and waiting for since we first heard about that cozy little place of yours. I think he's finally arrived. He's a tall, rather striking gentleman with a skull for a face, and his name is Death. Mr. Host, that Dr. Helming is insane. <sighs> he gives me the chills. Oh, maybe it's just because it's so cold tonight, Mary. You know, it's getting so nippy these days that some of my friends are having fur collars put on their shrouds. <laughs> well, my okay. friends are smarter. They know that the way to warm up in cold weather is with a hot cup of fragrant, delicious Lipton tea. A cup of tea in front of the fireplace just hits the sop these chilly days. But make it Lipton's and your pleasure's complete. You brew up a pot of Lipton's, throw another log on the fire, and summer tiptoes right into the room. Let the wind blow and the snow pile up on the roof. There's all the magic of June in a cup of Lipton's, in its deep amber color, its tantalizing fragrance, and its rich, hearty flavor. Mmm, and what flavor that is. Never wishy-washy, always brisk and full and satisfying. Try it, folks. You can let winter do its worst when you've got Lipton's in your cup. That's right, Mary. But I think it's time now for something a little more cold-blooded. Such as a cold-blooded murder. We're having a juicy one here tonight. Tale of gore galore. So let's see what's happening in the dark chamber. It's just a moment later now. Standing in the darkness of the strange room, Joe and Betty stare at the tall figure of Dr. Helming, silhouetted against the dim light from outside. I asked you whether you were expecting someone. Then it was just a trick. It was you on the phone all the time. Now, don't you think I'd know his voice? Where, where is he? Our friend, Mr. Lazari, right outside. What did you do to him? Answer me, what did you do to him? Don't you know? Sure, I know. You killed him. You Did you kill him? 
Quite a state you've gotten yourself into. Why? Is it because you finally tried to do something about your predicament and failed? Or is it because you weren't sure whether I would kill or not, and because you still don't know? You're mad. Really mad. You'll be interested to know. You have not done, nor will you do, one thing that I did not foresee. Every move you made, every emotion you felt, was charted, outlined, and... What's that? That, I think, is probably the police. The police? Yes. I know that you're very anxious to talk to them, and I'll see that you get a chance to. Soon. Good evening, officer. I'm looking for a guy named Helming. Uh, Dr. Helming. I'm Dr. Helming. Come in, won't you? Okay. Thanks. Uh, this is uh, kind of a funny business. It's about a phone call we got a while ago. Finally traced here. A guy who said he was a prisoner or something. That must have been Watson. Yeah, yeah, that's his name. Joe Watson. Do you know him? Of course. I can't tell you how sorry I am. It was really very careless of me, and I'll see that it doesn't happen again. What do you mean? If you did any investigating, which I'm sure you did... Then you know that I, um, well, I don't run a sanitarium exactly, but I do take a few patients, mental cases, for treatment. Ah, so that's it. A nurse, eh? I, I wish you wouldn't say that. Watson's case is particularly interesting. A 4F who wasn't able to enlist, and he developed a persecution mania. Thinks that everyone is down to me. Not everyone, exactly. His present fantasy is that he's an ex-GI and that I'm keeping him prisoner. Sure sounds plenty tough. Well... I guess I'll run along. I... I'm sorry I bothered you. Don't you, you want to see them first, officer? Talk to them? Ah, oh, there's no need of that, doctor. We, we get calls from cranks every day. We, we always investigate the cause. But I insist. After all, you only have my word for it. Uh, there's, um... Well, there's just one thing I'd like to caution you about. Sure, sure, I know. I'll play along. Humor them. Splendid. Right in here. Hmm. It's quite a room. Joe! Look! It, it's a cop, and that means... Then you did get my message. Uh, sure, sure, Joe. Took a little time to trace a call, but uh, everything's okay. Man. Oh, thank heaven. It was such a screwy story, I was afraid that... Hey, wait a minute. Then why is he standing there like that? Why haven't you got the bracelets on him? After the me? No need for any rough stuff. He said he'd come along quietly. What? You're but... lying. I don't know why, but... There's something wrong here. Something... I know. You think we made the whole thing up. But we're crazy. I know, no, no. It's true. He told you we were and you believed him. Of course not. Look, I... I... Stop it, will you? Stop saying that. Well, if I could only prove it somehow, I'll show you. I know. Lazari. Joe. Murder. That'll open your eyes. Somewhere in that wall is a door. Make him open it. Show you what's behind it. I think maybe I'd better be going, Doc. But there is a door there, officer. Just a second. I'll open it for you. Here we are. Joe. Body. It's gone. <laughs> These doctors are always hiding the bodies. But turns up again later. Give us another ring, huh? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Hey, can I go out this way, Doc? Down to the end of the corridor, then to your right. I, I'm sorry I gave you all this trouble. It'll be all right. Thank you for being so understanding. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Doc. Well, children? Don't look that way, Joe. Don't. I know what you're thinking, and it's not true. We're not crazy. There was a body there. Of course. You hid it when you went out to let the cop in. And the telephone. You left that here purposely. Wanted me to use it. Get the police here. Obviously. I told you that this was to be an experiment in fear. What I didn't tell you was that, in a sense, I was one of the subjects, too. It was important for me to learn how I would function under pressure. And speaking objectively, I think I did rather well. Don't Why? you? Why are you doing all this? What are you after? There's no reason why I shouldn't tell you. If anyone truly understands the nature of fear, is able accurately to forecast the actions and reactions of an individual, then he can use fear as a weapon. Society will react as the individual reacts. You see, 
Society doesn't want to believe that anything can menace it. Doesn't want to take action to protect itself any more than the individual does. This was something that Hitler and Mussolini understood intuitively. I understand it scientifically. They failed, but I shall succeed. You... You mean that you... I'm afraid that's all I have time for. As far as you two are concerned, the experiment is finished. Completely finished. I have a few arrangements to take care of, and then, uh... Well, make the best of these last few minutes, uh, for they will be your last. <laughs> Joe, do you hear anything? Is he coming back? Not yet. He's going to kill us, isn't he? Just the way he killed Lazari. He's going to try to. Why are you sitting there like that, looking at me? Hmm? I guess because it's the first chance I've had to look at you. How do you mean? <laughs> when he first put you in here, it was all dark. So many things happened after that. <laughs> it's funny. What is? The things that you can tell about a person even in the dark. I kind of thought you were little, and... I knew you were awful nice and had a lot of nerve, but... I didn't think you'd be so pretty. I'm not so pretty, Joe. I'm not very brave either. I'm scared. I'm awful scared. And I don't want to die. Don't worry about it, baby. Don't think about it. Just sitting here like this, waiting. And there's nothing we can do. Every time we did try to do something, it was something he knew about. He was expecting us to do. Please, baby. Joe, something happened to you. You were scared before, too, but now... It was not knowing that was scary. Not knowing what was going to happen or why or what you could do about it. But once you do know, once you make up your mind, then you've got to forget about it. Forget about everything. Make up your mind about what? This is going to sound kind of funny, especially now, but... Well, do you have anyone special? A fellow, I mean, that... Why... Oh, I know. That's good. I mean... Well, gee, it's a shame we never met before. If we had, we wouldn't be here now. I... I mean, we probably would have been out together someplace, and... What time do you get through work, usually? About six. The store closes at 5.30, but... Me, I... too. I could have picked you up at about six. Joe. Or... I hear something. He's coming. Yeah. Okay, get up. Over in the corner of the room so that he'll see you as soon as he opens the door. What about you? I'll be waiting over here, behind the door. Joe, you, you, you're not yeah. going to... I know I haven't got much of a chance, but... Well, wish me luck. And it'll be quick anyway. Oh, no. Joe, please. All right, my young friend. Time. All my arrangements have been completed, and I'm... Where's Watson? Right here. Joe, look at it! It's okay, baby. Didn't get me. I got the barrel of the gun. And... Good Lord. Got him. In the chest. Bed. You couldn't have done that. You couldn't have. Outside, Betty. See if you can find another phone. Call the police again. And this time, tell them to bring an ambulance. But you couldn't have done it. It was all plotted. Graphed and worked out in detail. I knew just what you were going to do. How you would react. By this time, you were to be in a state of complete frustration. Resigned. Ready to die. Why did you do it? Why? I don't know. Now, just take it easy. I've got to know. 
You've got to tell me. Was it because of the girl? Out of uh, de desperation? Because you <coughs> knew you were going to die anyway? I tell you, I don't know. I just know that... Well, a guy will take just so much pushing around. <laughs> pushing around, eh? Well, it sounds to me as if one of our characters is going to get a lot of pushing around. At the end of a pitchfork and in a very warm climate... Yes, good old Helming's finished. He's got to be if we're to have at least two corpses, the inner sanctum minimum. Oh, you think that's a little arbitrary? Not at all. We've got to have at least two corpses to play our theme song, When a Body Meets a Body. <laughs> theme song? I didn't know we had one. Oh, Mary, we've got lots of them. Didn't you ever hear our skeleton song, I Ain't Got No Body? Hmm? Mr. Host, <laughs> let's be serious for a moment, because I want to talk about one of the most serious things in life, our health. For instance, the war may eventually lead to an increase in tuberculosis, and that's why the makers of Lipton tea and Lipton soup have asked me to remind you of the annual sale of Christmas seals. Funds raised by this sale support tuberculosis control programs, x-rays, health education, and medical research. Remember, over a half million people in the United States and Canada suffer from this disease. So buy as many Christmas seals as you can. No one is safe from tuberculosis until everyone is safe. And Christmas seals can save lives. <laughs> And now, friends, here's a word of wholesome advice. If you've had any murderous thoughts lately, give them up. It uh, just doesn't pay. Well, I know a lady who killed off her husband, and you know, it just ruined her marriage. Yes, he grew very cold to her. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Fearful Passage by H.C. Branson. Yes, in next week's Inner Sanctum story, directed by Hyman Brown and brought to you by Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup, next week's story is about a vampire. He's a very stingy fellow. That's when you go out with him, the drinks are always on you. <laughs> Naturally, we're going to try to make you feel at home here, so uh, I just ordered a good supply of bats with green eyes, a coffin for him to sleep in, and a wooden stake to drive through his heart. I wouldn't stake my life on it, friends, but he may visit you before next Tuesday. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> Easy to make and easy to take. That's Lipton's Noodle Soup. The perfect opening dish for your cold weather menus. Lipton's Noodle Soup has that real chickeny flavor your family likes so much. And it has that wonderful fresh cooked homemade goodness. You can prepare Lipton's Noodle Soup in a jiffy too. And it's oh so kind to your budget. Costs less and makes more than canned soups. So don't forget to serve Lipton's Noodle Soup. And don't forget to tune in next Tuesday night for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lights out, everybody. It is later than you think. This is our
Arch Obler bringing you another in our series of stories of the unusual. And once again, we caution you, these Lights Out stories are definitely not for the timid soul. So we tell you calmly and very sincerely, if you frighten easily, turn off your radio now. You, out there, listen to me. I'm dead. No, don't twist your face in that foolish smirk. I tell you, I'm dead. You say the dead don't talk. Don't be a fool. They're all around you, but you won't listen to them. You hear me now. Listen. You a match? Yes, a match. Take it out. Strike it. Look at the flame. Beautiful flame, isn't it? Beautiful flame. Throw it away. Throw it away. I say horrible flame. It cost me my life. Please listen to me, you out there. I want to tell you just what happened. My name was Arnie Douglas. And I was a very happy man. A very happy man. Arnie? Yes, Sam? You know what I've been thinking about? Sitting here in front of the fire? No, Samuel, my friend. I haven't the slightest idea what you were thinking about, blonde or redhead. <laughs> no, honey, I'm serious. <laughs> I was thinking that you ought to be just about the happiest man in the world. <laughs> and what made you come to that brilliant deduction? Well, if happiness is based on satisfactions, you have the satisfaction of knowing you have a fine career, all the money you can use. Now, Barbara. Barbara. Yeah. You know, in spite of the fact that she's my sister, I think she's the loveliest girl in town. In the world, Sam. In the world. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the fire. It agrees with you. <laughs> or disagrees. Say, talking of fire reminds me. What? When are you going to grow up? Uh-oh, I think I know what's coming. I should think you would. I don't mind you risking your own neck, but think of Barbara. You look pretty funny coming to your own wedding dressed in a plaster cast. Yeah, what does Emily Post say about that? White tie with plaster cast or black tie? Now, let's get serious, Arnie. Chasing fire engines is a kid's trick. Well, fires have always fascinated me, Sam. Always. So what? Fire fascinates most of us. But that doesn't mean we have to jeopardize our lives chasing them all the time. Yes, I suppose it does look foolish, fire chasing. But look here, Sam. Don't flames get you... What do you mean? Uh, look in the fireplace. Look at those flames curling around the log. Well? Orange and red, like small living things reaching out for life. Ah. Now look, Sam, that new flame that sprung up right there in the center of the log. Higher, higher. It sings with the joy of living. It's alive, Sam. It's alive. Oh, I... Stop it. What's the matter, Sam? Did, did I scare you? Oh, but you were talking like a fool. Was I? When the world's full of fools. Other men have said that same thing that I said. What are you raving about now? I said the flame's alive. Others have said that. Whole generations of men. They worship the flame as a living thing. A godlike thing. Can you say that we're any wiser than they? Arnie Douglas, are you out of your mind? I'm talking facts. That flame there. How can you or I or anyone else say that it isn't alive? How do we know it isn't alive? Well, because it's... It's a flame. A flame. Do you know the encyclopedia definition of life? It says life is a living thing moving about. It says it not only moves by itself, but it feeds by itself on other matter. So what? There, that flame. Isn't it moving about by itself? Isn't it feeding on that log? Yes, but a flame... Well, then I've proved my point. That flame there fills every requirement of a living thing. Listen, when a man chokes to death, why does he die? Because... Well, because his air supply is cut off. Exactly. That's just how you kill a flame, by stopping its air supply. Sam, I tell you, I've sat here for hours watching these flames in that fireplace. The more I think about it, the more I'm positive that a flame is a living, breathing entity. Yeah. The more I sit here, the more I realize that you're talking out of your head. Now, come on, get your hat and let's go out and buy a drink. No, no, wait, Sam. There's something I want to show you. A book I just got. Huh? Well, while you're getting it, do you mind if I throw another piece of wood on this living entity of yours? It's getting chilly in no, here. No, no, don't touch that fire. I want it just the way it is. Arnie, there is something wrong with you. No. No, I'm all right, Sam. Just because a man's curious about the ways of life, must you think there's something wrong with him? Look, Sam, look at this book. Well... 
What is it? It tells of a race of fire worshippers who lived in medieval times. Uh, people who believed that every flame held its own godlike being to be worshipped by us mortals. I still want that drink. Um, in here is a prayer with which these fire worshippers called up the spirit of the flame. It's a beautiful prayer, Sam. Let me read it to you. Wait a minute, Arnie. They did what with that prayer? Conjured up the spirit of the flame so that they could see it and kneel before it and worship it. You mean to say they'd recite some hocus-pocus and have something in the flame pop out at them? Yes. And if I knew just how to read this prayer to that fire in the fireplace, just what inflections to use, I would be able to see the spirit of the flame, Sam. If such a thing exists. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing you add if such a thing exists. By George, I'd have put in a hurry call for a straitjacket. Come on, honey. This is getting a little too morbid for me. Let's get out of here and go places. No, thanks, Sam. I, I'm not going out tonight. Uh. Okay. Go right ahead. Sit here and stew in your metaphysical juice. But don't let anyone who isn't a friend of yours hear all that nonsense about flame spirits and fire worshippers. By golly, you'll find yourself in front of a lunacy commission. Well, here's my hat. What's my hurry? Good night. Uh, um... Arnie. Yeah? All this nonsense you were talking. You were just kidding me along, weren't you? After all, you're going to marry my sister, and I... Well, you know how it is. You you didn't mean it, did you, Arnie? No. No, Sam, of course not. <laughs> good fella. Joke's a joke, huh? <laughs> well, good night, old boy. Uh... No, no, don't bother getting up. I know my way to the door by this time. I'll see you tomorrow. All right, Sam. Good night. Uh, Thick-headed fool. Beautiful flame. Book. I wonder where... Oh, yes. And I humbly give unto thee this sacrifice. Sacrifice. Barbara's ring. I had it here. Oh, yes. And I humbly give unto thee this sacrifice, great almost... And I beseech thee to reveal to me the life within life. The life within fire. As I repeat the sacred word. Ador. What? Ador. 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 You. Who are you? Who are you? The flame. <clears throat> yes? Arnie, what's the matter? It's Barbara. Barbara. Oh, Arnie, what is it? Aren't you going to let me in? Darling, are you ill? You can't come in, Barbara. You've got to go away, please. You are ill. Stand aside, Arnie. No, no, please, but I'm don't. coming in and you can't. Stop no, no, Barbara, me. go away. Please go away. You can't be here. Arnie, what's the matter with you? What's going on here? Nothing. I'll explain it to you sometime. Just go. Go, dearest. Please. Absolutely not. There's something wrong here, and <laughs> I'm not leaving until you tell me what it is. Arnie, your hands. They're, they're all right. Really, they are. Bandages. Burns. Just a few burns. They're all right. I, I'm so cold in this room, and you're ill. I'll light the fire. No, no. Not fire. As you love me, no fire. Oh, Arnie, Arnie, darling, what's happened to Mama, you? Mama, listen to me. If you love me, you'll go away. You'll get out of here, and you'll never come back. What? You've got to listen to me. This that has happened to me is mine. My horror. Can't hurt you. I won't let it. Oh. Arnie, what are you looking at? She cannot see me. Only you can see me. Arnie, the air is getting so warm in Barbara, here. Barbara, go away quickly. It's too late. I touch her and she never looks upon you again. Arnie, that horrible odor of burning. Oh, I'm, I'm frightened, Arnie. You think. What are you going to do? Jealous of her eyes. I shall have them. Arnie, who are you talking to? Huh? Who are you talking to? I'll bargain with you, love. Do as I ask, and I will let her live. 
Yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. Anything. Get her out of here. Or she dies. Barbara, come on. Oh, no, oh, honey, please. I won't go. Darling, you're please hurting go. my arm. Oh, no, no, don't, don't struggle. You're not coming. I won't go. go. He said anything. Anything. <laughs> All right, Jim. It's, it's your move. Okay, Mac. I'll move when I'm good and ready. Well, what's the use of sitting there staring at the checkers? You've lost anyway. Oh, yeah? Well, now, what do you say to this, you old foghorn? <sighs> oh, so you think you're smart, you? Well, now, watch this. Well, for the lover... <laughs> so you thought you'd beat me here. Well, you'll have to be in the apartment a longer time to do that, me buckle. How long have you been a farmer, Grogan? Gone on 20 years. Well, if this is all there is to it, it's sure a monotonous job. For we haven't had a run out of this station in two weeks. Now, don't talk like that, Jim. It's bad luck. Oh, what's bad luck about it? You think I joined the department to sit on my tail playing checkers and talking ball scores? I want to do oh, things. I... What? Shut up. It's a goal. It's a school. <laughs> We must do something. But, Mr. Mayor, what can I do? I've got every piece of fire apparatus within a hundred miles of the city. Well, uh, 50 alarms in the last hour. I tell you there's more than one maniac setting those fires. It's a dozen. It's a hundred of them. Yes. Yes, it's a plot. That's what it is. A plot, a revolutionary plot. I'll call up the governor. We'll get the militia out. It's a plot. <laughs> I'm not a word since yesterday. You know, I, I can't believe it yet. You're saying he threw you out of the house. Oh, well, he, he didn't exactly throw me out, but he... Oh, Sam, what can be the matter? You should have told me sooner. Oh, I, I didn't want to. I, I mean, I didn't know what to think. Oh, Sam, what could possibly be wrong? Uh, don't ask me, Barb. I... Huh. There goes another fire engine. Those terrible fires. It's as if the whole world were coming to an end. It's going to be all right. I heard over the radio. The governor is sending the militia into town. That'll stop those fire bugs. Schools and hospitals and hotels. Well, this is it. Yes. Now, Bob, wait for me. All right, but hurry, Sam. After what you told me, I, I think I'd better stay right with you. Oh, my poor Arnie. Careful, dear. Steps. Oh, Sam, he's not home. There's not a light in the house. Well, let's try anyway. Huh. Where's that blasted bell? Oh, it was out of order when I was here. I had to knock. Oh. Wait, Sam. What? The door. By George, it's open. Something is wrong in here. Oh, Sam, I'm frightened. Arnie! Arnie! Are you in there, Arnie? Oh, he is, Sam. I know he is. Why doesn't he answer? Arnie! It's Sam and Barbara. Arnie, are you home? He's sick, Sam. Let's go in quickly. No, no. You wait out here. No, no. I'm going with you. 
All right. Not so dark. I haven't even got a match. Oh, the light switch. I think it was somewhere along this wall. I got it. Wow. There's this room a mess. Oh, Sam, he must be sick. Oh, and he's always so neat. Quickly, the bedroom. All right, all right. Don't get so excited. But he might be dying. Don't talk nonsense. I'll bet he isn't even here. There. What did I tell you? He isn't even home. Oh. What's the matter? Walls. Why the... They're charred. Sam, there's been a fire in here. Oh, no. Well, that's impossible. Oh, Arnie, Arnie, where are you? What's happened to what you? The... This is unbelievable. He's... These walls were terribly burned. Come on, Bob. Where? We'll go to the police. Sam. What? The burnt walls. Maybe maybe the same people who are setting fires all over the city did something to Arnie. Hey, maybe you're right. That's it. They started to set fire to this place and Arnie caught them at it. And he tried to stop them and... No, I didn't want to. I think I didn't. Arnie. Arnie. Where did you come from? No, what? no, 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 I didn't. I didn't want to. She made me. She did it. Arnie, what's happened? Good heavens, man. Where have you been? Your face, your clothes. Here. Here, sit down. No, no, there's no time, no time. She, she's following me, my promise. Arnie, what are you talking about? What's the matter, you? No, no, Sam, let me. Arnie, lift your face. Uh, what is it? Who's following you? Those children this morning screaming, trapped up there. No one to help them. What? That man, his wife, his children. He went back into that burning hell. He went back. He couldn't have a chance. He went back. <laughs> God of heaven, what have I done? What have I done? Father, the fires. Arnie's been watching them gone to his mind. Oh, my poor darling. I'll get a doctor. He needs it. She did it. She not I, not I. They can't blame me. You, the dead kid. She killed you. Not Arnie, I in heaven's name, it. control yourself. I, I did it. You hear me, Bob? Right. What, Arnie? I did it. All those fires, those people dying. I did Arnie, it. Arnie, in heaven's name, what are you saying? I did it, Sam. I did it. If not for me, she wouldn't have had life. She wouldn't have had power to throw me. Through me, the fire's got life. Me. He lost his mind. Arnie. No, no, I'm telling you Arnie. the truth. I did it. I. Look, these papers, plans, every building I burned, she made me do it every step of the way. Oh, no. Arnie. You believe. You believe. Well, why did you do it? Why did you do it? Both of you listen to me. There isn't much time. She'll be here. She'll keep. <clears throat> Arnie. Arnie, what is it? I'll do it. I'll do anything you say. I'll do it. Let them alone. Let them alone. Arnie, come back here. Sam, where's he going? Where's he running? I don't know. It's as if someone was chasing him. Sam, look. On the floor. What? Right where where Arnie was standing. Footprints. Burned right into the wood. Oh, Father in heaven. What is this? I tell you, Mr. Mayor, I'm telling the truth. Every word I've told you is the truth. idea, young man. The story's preposterous. How about it, Commissioner? Could any one man be responsible for all these fires? Absolutely not. A physical impossibility. But I tell you, he's confessed. Arnie's my friend. He wouldn't lie to me. I tell you, the man was driven to it by some horrible thing. What are you talking about? If I told you, you wouldn't believe me. But believe this much. As sure as we're all in this room... Arnie Douglas had something to do with those terrible fires. But you heard what the commissioner said. I don't care what the commissioner said. While you're just sitting here, more fires are being started. More lives are in danger. In the name of humanity, please listen to me and send out a general alarm to have the police pick up Arnie Douglas. I'll give you his description. I'll tell you just what he was wearing. You've got to catch him. You've got... man is suspected of being the pyromaniac responsible for the fire terror. Repeat, general alarm... Be on the lookout for a man by the name of Arnie Douglas, height 5 feet 10, weighed 175 pounds, light hair, blue eyes. When last seen was wearing gray suit, white shirt, no tie, no hat. This man suspected of being the pyromaniac. Please, Barbara, that won't help any. What will they do to him? Oh, tell me, Sam. Nobody's blaming Arnie. It was some kind of madness, that's all. Those horrible burning footprints. No, no. Don't talk about them. We never saw them. We just imagined it, that's all. Where have they got Arnie? What are they doing to him? He's in the mayor's office with the fire chief and about a dozen others. They're questioning him. I don't believe that he himself could have set all those fires. I want to see him. I want to talk to him. 
Oh, it's a horrible dream that never happened. Wait. The mayor wants to see you in his office right away. All right. Come on, dear. All right. Well, uh, come right in, folks. Mayor Halstead, where's Arnie? Where is he? What have you done with now, him? Now, young woman, sit right here. Everything's going to be all right. Mr. Mayor, what's happened? Where's Arnie Douglas? Safe and sound, locked up in the next room. What did he say? Why don't you tell us? Oh, he confessed setting the fires all right. Didn't he, Commissioner? Oh. Yeah, there was the signed confession. But if you ask me, he didn't mean a thing. Oh, a young fellow like that will never could or would set fire to as many places as burned down. I tell you, I don't believe he had a thing to do with it. But somebody is. Somebody is. You can't hear them talking in the other room, Arnie, my love. But I can. <laughs> One of them is saying that he doesn't believe you did it, my love. But you did do it, didn't you? Mercy. Have mercy. Yes, my love. I will have mercy. Confessions. You signed confessions. Yes. They'll want to lock you away behind iron bars. <laughs> They'll never do that, my love. Mm. I'm taking you with me to be part of me. Always. No. No. Come close to me, beloved. No. Close. No. Stay away from me. Stay away from me! Stay away! What's that? I don't know. Honey! It's Honey! Look, look, under that door. Smoke, Mother in Heaven. There's something burning in there. That young fella. He's locked up in there. Honey! Let me in. Let me in. The key, quick. Here's the key. Good. Quickly, quickly, quickly. There's... There's no, no one in here. Only a flame. A little red flame. Presented by Camel Cigarettes. of this court that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And may God have mercy on your soul. No, I, I neither expect nor solicit belief for this wild story. I, I would be mad to expect it yet. Mad I'm not, and very surely I do not dream, but... But while there is still time, I, I don't know why. I, I feel compelled to report a series of, of mere household events in their consequences. These events have terrified, have tortured, have destroyed me. Perhaps some are more calm, more, more logical, but certainly far less excitable than I will be able to explain them. I, I cannot. I, I can only tell you the facts, and that I have to do today because tomorrow I die. Each week at this time, Camel Cigarettes bring you Peter Lorre in the excitement of the great stories of the strange and unusual, of dark and compelling masterpieces 
culled from the four corners of world literature. Tonight, Edgar Allan Poe's immortal American classic, The Black Cat. Mystery in the Air, starring Peter Lorre. Brought to you by Camel Cigarettes. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel. Let your own experience tell you why more people are smoking camels than ever before. Give your T-Zone the experience of enjoying a camel. And see if you don't join the millions of other smokers who say, Camels suit my T-Zone to a T. Your T-Zone, that's T for taste and T for throat, is your true proving ground for any cigarette. See if Camel's rich, full flavor isn't a delightful experience for your taste. If Camel's cool mildness isn't more than welcome to your throat, try a Camel. <laughs> no, believe me, there, there was nothing, absolutely nothing in my childhood which which forecast the terrible events that were to come. No, as a child, I, I was very gentle. I, I got along well with everyone, but, but most I liked animals, yes. <laughs> All kinds of animals. And, and then I married quite young, and I, I was very happy to find that my wife shared my feelings. <laughs> very soon, we, we had quite a collection. Oh, we had, we had birds and goldfish. We had a dog and some rabbits, and we had a cat. I'll never forget the day my wife brought it home. <laughs> hello, hello. Get home so early. Look, Charles, look. Look what I brought. Oh, oh, look at it. Oh, the little kid. <laughs> Where did you get it, darling? Oh, the poor little thing. Some dogs were chasing it, and oh, I just rescued it in time. Yes, it hello. was so frightened. Yes, but it isn't frightened anymore. Oh, it seems to love you, Charles. <laughs> then that's not strange. All animals do. Yes, yes, yes. Nobody's going to hurt your kitty kitty gnome. How about some milk, huh? <laughs> Yes. There, you see. <laughs> oh, you must have been very hungry. Yes. Hey, what's your name, huh? I don't suppose he has a name. He is so young. I don't think he belongs to anybody. Well, then, then we have to give him a name. You mean we can keep him? Keep him? What are you talking about? He has no home. We can't turn him out in the streets, can oh, we? Oh, Charles, I was hoping you'd let him stay. Of course, but he, he must have a name. Yes, let's see. Oh, yes, black. Yes, all oh, black. Beautiful. Not a single white mark. Oh, oh, I have him. <laughs> He's as black as the devil. Let's call him Pluto. Huh? <laughs> yes, we'll call you Pluto. Well, Pluto grew up to be a remarkably beautiful cat, and of all the animals in our house... He became my favorite and my playmate, yes, and until it all changed, yes, and as the years went on, my, my character suffered a radical change, and everything changed. Huh? Why? Well, I, I'm ashamed, I, I hate to admit it, it, it through, uh, through, through intemperance, yes, through intemperance, and then as, uh, as drink became more and more necessary to me, I... I became more and more moody and irritable. Charles, where are you going? I don't have to tell you where I'm going. Oh, Charles, what's happening What to do you me? mean, what's happening to me? Well, you never used to go out every night to those vile oh, please places. Stop that. You stop it. I go out because I can't stand listening to you. Nag, nag, nag all day long. I don't know what's come over you. There. Uh, see? Why don't you learn from Pluto? It's only a cat. He, he doesn't ask me where I'm going. Yeah, that's right. You never do, no. Come here, Pluto. <laughs> yes, I like it. Come here. Be careful, Charles. Don't pick him up uh, like that. Don't. You're hurting, hurting him. him. Yeah, I'm never you... hurting him. Ouch! He, he bit me. He bit me. You. You did what? I'll show you. Don't, don't you. Don't. Don't. Ah! No! Yes, I, 
I hate to admit it, but I was so furious I kicked Pluto and I kicked him again and hard and... Well, the next morning I... I saw that his ear was torn and... I was filled with remorse for what I'd done. From then on, <laughs> Pluto ran away in terror whenever I approached and... And that in turn made me more and more irritated and... And in the end it... It was sheer perverseness, nothing else, yes. Sheer and unexplainable perverseness that, that made me do what I did, yeah. I, I blush to admit it, but uh, one morning I, I strangled the poor animal. Yeah, I, I killed it only because I knew that, that it had loved me and, and because, because it had given me no reason for offense. No, I, I'm offering no excuse, I... I'm only recounting what happened. Well, in, in the evening, I I went to the inn as usual, and I came home very late, and I fell fast asleep with my clothes on. Then I was awakened suddenly. What? 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 Charles! Charles, wake up! Charles! What's the matter? There must be a fire. Yes, sir. I smell smoke. <laughs> Good heavens, it's... Look at... It, it's our house. Oh. Our house is burning. Come on, darling. Come. We'll be trapped. Come on, hurry up. <laughs> Quick. Oh. The stairs are on fire. There we go. I can't. I... Don't talk. Don't talk, sweetheart. Perhaps I... Perhaps I... I can get you through the flames. <sighs> don't breathe, darling. Here. 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 Here's the front door. Here. Uh. <laughs> we made it. We're safe. Oh, Charles. Look, our house. Hey, anybody else in there? No. Nobody else. Ah, uh, just as well. Never could get them out now. Are you the owner? Yes. That was our house. Well, you haven't got much left then. We can't save it now. Stand back! Stand back! Everybody in the room's gonna fall in! Stand back! Well, it's down now. Funny, nothing is left but that one wall in the middle. Look at it. Well, what about it? Well, look at it on the wall. Hey, that is strange. Ah, uh, what are you talking about? What's strange? Well, there, there on the wall. It's still standing. Oh, wow. Marks on the plaster. Marks? Huh? What marks? Well, what's the matter? You blind? Right up there on the wall, that black figure. Oh, oh, wow. yeah. It looks like a cat. Yeah, it does. It yeah. yeah. smoke must have done it, but it certainly does look like a cat. What looks like a cat? There, and it's got one floppy ear. Who's oh, got a floppy ear? That's really funny. Funny, 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 huh? It's not funny. It is not funny at all, you hear? I know what it is. You know who it is? Yes, it's Pluto. I, I recognize him. I, yes, there, see? His ear is torn, huh? Oh, you, you beast. That hideous beast. It's, it's come back to, to haunt me. Leave me alone. You hear? I can't stand it. I, I can't. I can't. Get some water, somebody. This man's fainted. <laughs> Mr. Peter Lorre will bring us the climax of tonight's mystery in the air when camels present Act Two of The Black Cat. Ask a champion the secret of his success, and no doubt you'll get the same answer every time. Experience is the best teacher. Take Rose Gould, for instance. Featured area list of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Miss Gould says it took experience to teach her that famous 75-foot dive into space. Mildred O'Donnell, diving champion, thanks experience for her crown. Yes, they all learn from experience. Just as smokers everywhere learn from experience about cigarettes. Back in the days of the wartime cigarette shortage, millions of smokers tried brand after brand, smoked whatever they could get. And that experience made people experts in judging the differences in cigarette quality. 
That was when so many people discovered that camels suit their tea zones to a T. That camels give them the rich, full flavor and the cool mildness they've always wanted. As a result, more people are smoking camels than ever before. Experience is the best teacher. Try a camel yourself. The black cat is dead, killed by its master. The house is burned to the ground, with everything in it completely destroyed. Now the scene is the almost deserted, candle-lit taproom of a local inn. Don't you think you'd better go on home, sir? Hmm? It's getting late. <laughs> home, huh? <laughs> you should see the terrible place where, where we're living now. Yeah. Yeah, I heard you. Lost everything in that fire. Lost everything, yes. I, I lost everything. I, I lost my house. I lost everything. Well, uh... How about that black cat of yours you used to talk about all the time? Huh? Uh, what was his name? What was his name? Pluto. Oh, yeah. Yes, Pluto's gone, too. Boy, oh, I, I tell you, I miss him. I, I miss him very much. Huh. And if you miss him that much, why don't you get another cat? Give me a drink. Uh, it's getting pretty late, sir. I mean, well, won't your wife be expecting you? Give me a drink. Yes, sir. I'll have to fetch another bottle. Why don't I get another cat, huh? That's what he said. Uh, well, why don't I? No reason I shouldn't. There's no reason to be in the deeps of despair just, just because of a cat. Uh, if I get another cat, uh, maybe... Maybe I'll be able to forget her. What's that? Oh, it is a cat now. Yes, it's sitting on top of the table. Black <laughs> cat, huh? That's strange. I've been staring at that table for five minutes. I could swear there was no cat on it. Anyway, where did you come from, huh? Oh, you... Yeah. What a beautiful cat, yes. You, <laughs> you're just as black as Pluto. Yeah, yeah I accept you. you got a splotch of white on your chest. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Oh, yes, come. Come sit on my lap, huh? Oh, yeah. Kitty, kitty, yes, you're a nice kitty. Yeah. You're a nice cat. Yeah. I like there you are, sir. Where did this cat come from? Cat? Oh, oh yeah. A yeah, big one, isn't he? I don't know where it came from. Or how it got in, either, for that matter. Never seen it around here before. Don't know who it belongs to? No. No, as far as I'm concerned, it belongs to you, if you hmm. want it. Can't keep it here. My wife doesn't like cats. Especially black ones. Doesn't like cats, huh? <laughs> how stupid. Yeah. Say, I want it. Yes, sir. I want it very much, huh? I'll take it home with me right now. Charles, hmm? this is such a wonderful cat. Just since last week, it's made itself so much at home. Oh, you think it had lived here always? Yes, yes, I've noticed that. It reminds me so much of Pluto. Yes, but this one has a patch of white on its chest. Don't forget that. Yes, that's right, dear. But I can't help wondering. I wonder what ever became of Pluto. He disappeared the day of the fire. I know, I know he disappeared. And <laughs> Well, maybe he, he knew the house was going to burn down. Oh, see how it loves you. It's rubbing against your leg, just the way Pluto used to. Pluto, Pluto! Stop talking about Pluto! Darling, I didn't mean anything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry dear. I always talk about how much this new cat resembles Pluto. It, it just makes me even nervous. I, look, actually, there, there's hardly any resemblance at all, really. And, except that, except that they're both black. This one has a white patch on its chest. And oh, the poor thing. 
Charles, look, his ear is torn. Hmm? See? What? Here under the fur. Oh, I never noticed that before. Neither did I. Why, it's just the way Pluto's... I mean... Go ahead, say it, say it, say it. It's torn, it's torn, yes. Just the way Pluto's ear was torn when I kicked him, huh? That's it, isn't it? Well, he must have been in a fight or something. Uh, but it's curious we didn't notice Curious, it. huh? You have no idea how curious it is. <laughs> no idea. Get that cat out of my sight. Charles, you're mad. Get it out of How can you act that way about a poor dumb animal? Take Especially it out one that loved you so much. Oh, now, you're Take frightened, it dear. Get away from me, you hear me? The way you talk, anybody think you don't even like the poor like cat. Like it, huh? Like it. I, I hate it. I tell you, I hate it. I, I hate it. I, I hate it. Yes, in, in a short time, the cat had been with us. I, I had come to look upon it with unutterable loathing. Why, why I don't know yet. The more I hated it, the more affectionate it acted toward me. Wherever I went, it followed. Whenever I sat down, it, it would spring upon my knees and, and cover me with its loathsome caresses. It, as if this were not enough to the white patch on its chest, which originally it, it had been very indefinite in shape, but, but gradually it assumed a, a very definite outline, yes, the, the unmistakable and, and ghastly shape of the gallows, a terrible engine of horror, of agony, and of death. I, I longed to destroy the beast, but... I was prevented by an absolute unreasonable dread. I, I was sure I was losing my mind. Charles, are you going out again? Yes, I'm going out. Uh, I don't know when I'll be back. Oh. Before you go, do you suppose you... Why, what is it? Will you help me bring up some wood from the cellar? Why do you always want more wood? The house is cold. You know I haven't been feeling well. I'm not strong enough to carry not it myself. Strong enough. All right, come on, I'll help you. You might have thought of this before. Look out! What? Oh, oh that's cat. That's that beast again. It's always under my feet. It tried to trip me on the stairs. Oh, I'll... no, I'm yeah. sure it didn't. I'll get rid of that beast. Once and for all, I'll be... Charles, put down that crowbar. Get out of my way. No, no, stop. I'll say get out of my way. Let, no. let go of my arm. Please, Charles, you Let go of doing. my arm. Are you going to let go? Oh, please. I said let go. Wow. Why didn't you let me go? Yes, she, she had fallen dead without a groan. My blind rage, my rage against the cat, I, I'd struck my wife and killed her. Well, <laughs> nothing I can do about it now. All I could do was, was to sit myself to the task of concealing the body. Yes, I, I thought and I deliberated and, and then it occurred to me that Yes, in the Middle Ages, they used to wall up their victims, and I determined to do the same thing. Yes, behind the wall in the cellar. I managed to dislodge a section of bricks near the chimney, and, and in a hole behind them, I propped the body. Then I carefully laid the bricks back in their original position, and, and when I had finished, no one, no one could have told that the wall had been disturbed at all. Well, I, I could say to myself triumphantly, here at least, my labor has not been in vain. My next step then was, was to look for the beast that had been a cause of so much misery, but, but then I became aware that, that it had completely disappeared. <laughs> Three days passed and, and still my tormentor did not appear. Oh, well. It's impossible to describe or, or to imagine the deep sense of my relief. For the first time in months, I, I slept, yes. I, 
Oh, I slept. Even with a burden of murder on my soul. <laughs> yes, yeah, some few inquiries were made about my wife's whereabouts, and a search of the house was conducted, but, but nothing was discovered. Oh, uh, I finally could look upon my future secure. <laughs> Good day, sir. Sorry to disturb you again, sir. Oh, <laughs> it's you, Sergeant. <laughs> Is there anything I can do for you? Well, they're still puzzled about your wife's disappearance. Puzzled, huh? <laughs> well, so am I. Well, some of her friends have been around at the police station. What's that got to do with me, huh? You've already searched us twice. What do you want? Oh, I know, sir, but... Well, the captain sent me and the constable here to yes. look around just once more. To be sure there's no clues been overlooked... Mm. This will be the last time, sir. Only a matter of routine. Routine. We won't bother you again. All right. Come in. Thank you, sir. Come on, Joe. Right. What would you like to look first? Well, we might as well begin with the cellar. Cellar? All right, yes. Right down these steps. I'll come with you. Yes, I always say searching a house is like getting ahead in the world. You start at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see. Uh, it's very funny. Well, come on, Constable. Get to work. Right. While he searched, I folded my arms and watched. As before, they discovered nothing, nothing but... As they were about to depart, the glee, my heart, was too strong to be restrained. I burned to say but one word, yes, just one word, but by way of triumph. And, and as they started up the steps, I said, uh, See, have you noticed uh, this is a very well-constructed house, you know? Hey, gentlemen, you're not going, are you? Yes, it's a... Uh, it's an excellently well-constructed house. <laughs> You've never seen such a well-constructed house in a, in a frenzy of my bravado upon that very portion of the brickwork behind which stood the corpse of my wife. I, I rapped with my cane. <laughs> Let me heaven deliver me from the arch fiend. What was that? that? Wind, probably. Wind? That's not the wind. It came when you hit this wall here. Whatever it is, it's behind these bricks, Sarge. Yeah. Here, take this crowbar and knock no, that no. wall down. Right. Wait a minute, you... Keep quiet, you... can't do this. Wait a minute. Where are you going? Upstairs. You stay right here. Hey, this is new plaster. It hasn't even had time to set yet. Ah, pull it down. All right. Here she comes. Look out. Oh. There's what we're looking for, all right. His wife's body. What's that horrible-looking thing sitting on our head? It's a cat! How did that cat get in there? Huh? I know how it got in there. Yes, I know. I, I must have walled it up in a tomb. I never knew it, no. Look at that red mouse. Those burning eyes. You, you hideous. You beast, you monster. You, you are the devil. You made me a murderer. Now for three days you've been in there. Waiting, waiting. You sent me to the gallows. Well, the hangman will get me. Yes, I... I hope... I hope you're satisfied. I hope you're satisfied. Each week, the makers of Camel cigarettes and free Camels to servicemen's hospitals from coast to coast. 
This week, the camels go to Veterans Hospital, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, U.S. Army McCornack General Hospital, Pasadena, California, U.S. Naval Hospital, Houston, Texas, U.S. Marine Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland, and Veterans Hospital, Dayton, Ohio. When three leading independent research organizations asked 113,597 doctors, doctors living in every state of the Union, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand named most was Camel. According to a nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Next week, Mystery in the Air, starring Mr. Peter Lorre, brings you an adaptation of one of our star's greatest motion pictures, Crime and Punishment, based on the book by Fyodor Dostoevsky, with a special musical score composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Mr. Pipe Smoker, here's proof for you. Proof that Prince Albert is a satisfying smoke. More pipes smoke Prince Albert than any other tobacco, naturally. Prince Albert is a mellow, mild tobacco with a rich, full flavor. Choice tobacco, specially made for smoking pleasure. Specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Crimp cut to burn slow, smoke cool. See if one pipe full of PA doesn't convince you that Prince Albert is your favorite, too. Beginning two weeks from tonight, Thursday, October 2nd, Camel's comedy quiz, The Bob Hawk Show, will be heard at this time over these same NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. In the main lounge of Bartley Sheridan's luxurious yacht, the Sinbad, moored at the Borden Dock, a beautiful and defiant woman, Melanie Cabot, rises to shock a strange ship's company with her news. To shock them and to enjoy the sensation she's about to create. Quiet, everybody, for just two minutes. What's all this about, Melanie? Put the guitar down for a minute. Can't you find out? All right. That's me, Lisa, Danny, all of you. Uh, Melanie, honey, uh, wouldn't it be better Pardon if we kind me, of... darling, this is my announcement, and not even you can keep me from making it my own way. You all may have wondered why Bob asked you here for dinner on the yacht tonight. He did it because I asked him to. And I wanted each of you for a particular reason. I'm not sure any of you will be pleased at my news, and some of you may... Well, you can judge for yourselves. But I felt that each of you had a right to hear this directly. Get to it, Melanie. What's up? It's very simple, Danny. I'm very proud and happy to announce that Bartley Sheridan and I are to be married. What? Married? You're clowning, Melanie. You say? You, you've been having some laughs with Bartley here, and nobody can kick on that, but if you're trying to tell us... You're Not gonna... trying, Danny. I've told you. And you, Lisa, and Betsy, and Kurt. Bart and I are to be married before the month is out. Isn't anyone going to congratulate us? Uh -oh. The lights. Who turned the lights off? Well, they've all blown. It must be a fuse. Oh, boy, darling, I'm scared. It's pitch black in here. Easy, everybody. We got some flashlights in the locker oh, here. All right. Anyone. Remember that can of gas that was filled? Boy, where are you, darling? I... <laughs> Melanie, honey, what is it? Where are you? Boss. There's something wrong. Terribly wrong. Melanie fainted or there's something. Yeah, Skipper? There's your lights coming back on. Something out of the blue fuse, but... Well, here you are. All lighted up again. All right, thanks, Adam. <laughs> Betsy, what in the world? Look! What? Crumbled up there by the table! Oh. It's Melanie. With a knife driven into her throat. Inspector Saber. Yes, this is Mark Saber. Inspector, it's Tim. Tim Maloney. Sorry to be after bothering you at this hour, but... Yeah, it's all right, Tim. What is it? Well... I'm down at the office, and we've just had this flash from Borton. Homicide? Oh, with bells on. Melanie Cabot on Bartley Sheridan's yacht. Melanie Cabot? When? Well, not half an hour ago. A knife in her throat. Tim. Yes, Inspector. Pick me up in a squad car, and you can fill me in on the way down. And, Tim. Yes, sir. Ask Borton to freeze on to it till we can get there. <laughs> Tim, mind your footing there. This ladder's slippery. Oh, don't fear, Inspector. I'm climbing with the care of a mountain goat. Can I give you a hand up, sir? No, thanks. Ah. Yeah, well, here we are. Inspector Saber? That's right, and this is Sergeant Maloney. How do you do? I'm Myers from the boarding force here. 
glad you could get down so soon. Say, take a look at the brasswork, Inspector. If this isn't the fanciest yacht this side of... It's the people on the yacht we are interested in, Tim. I understand you've held all the witnesses here, Myers. Witnesses and crew. They're in the main lounge now, waiting for you. Had your medical report yet? Preliminary. Death by stabbing. The body's been taken ashore, but we've got pictures, first statements, and all Miss Cabot's effects. If you'll follow me, sir, I'll be glad to... Just a moment, Myers. As I understand it, you've held five passengers aboard. That's right, sir. The five that were there when this thing happened. Bartley Sheridan, his sister, Lisa, uh, Miss Betty Taggart, a smoothie named Gert DeLessing, and the gentleman you may have heard of, Danny Coles. Danny Coles? Not Big Danny! Big Danny Coles, Mr. Rackets himself. Uh Uh-oh, Inspector, we've really stepped into one. Melody Cabot's big enough news by herself. When she gets knocked off on a millionaire's yacht with Big Danny Coles mixed up in it... Our job isn't to write the headlines, Tim. It's still to find out who put this knife into Miss Cabot's throat. Myers. I think I'd rather examine the lounge on my own before seeing these five. Would there be cabins available where they could wait till I'm ready for them? I'd like to have as much space in my own house, Inspector. (laughs) Sure, we can salt them away until you call for them. Yeah, thanks. I'll probably take them... A knife that could have been used by any one of five persons... A woman who couldn't have been murdered by anyone but one of these five. You've ruled out the skipper and the yacht's crew, Inspector. I have to, Tim. After hearing the accounts of these five, it's clear that no outsider would have had time to get in and get out during the minute or so of darkness. The knife that was there at hand from this weapons collection that Melanie herself had asked to see. With fingerprints wiped clean. Uh And, And a short circuit that could have been rigged by any of them. How do we get a handhold on this one, Inspector? Well, our murder is still aboard, Tim. That's the starting point, thanks to the local men. You were pretty easy on this crowd the first time around, Inspector. Can we get going on Danny Coles again? Mm, in a moment, in a moment. I'll, I'll see Lisa Sheridan again first. Oh, Myers. Yes, sir. Could you ask Miss Sheridan to step in again? Have her in a second, Inspector. Uh-oh. Here we go for the chills again. This Sheridan girl isn't liking any part of this, Inspector. We're not trying to endear ourselves to anyone, Tim. We're here to find a murderer. You asked to see me again, Inspector. If you'll be good enough to sit down. (sighs) Miss Sheridan, may I ask when you first began to hate Melanie Cabin? I beg your pardon, Inspector. Well, if you prefer, we'll say dislike. I first met Melanie on this yacht a little over two years ago. I'm to take it your dislike dated from that first meeting. I'd never pretended to like her. The whole world knows what Melanie Cabot was. Mm, A sweeping statement, Miss Sheridan. She was notorious, Inspector. Twice married, in scandal after scandal. As I understand it, Miss Sheridan, your brother inherited the greater part of his money from his first wife, Joan Barrington. After nearly dying to save her, Inspector, did they remember to tell you that? Oh, I've seen records of the tragedy. The first Mrs. Sheridan was lost overboard from this yacht in a storm. Your brother Bartley dived over recklessly after her and was rescued himself only by the narrowest of margins. The yacht's rudder was damaged, Inspector. Bartley went in after Joan without waiting for a boat or a life preserver. And he spent eight hours swimming in the darkness before a coast guard kind of picked him up the morning after. Do you think Melanie Cabot could ever have understood... Let's see, all of her husbands, I believe that includes Court de Lessing. Yes, he was the last one. Divorced about a year ago. But possibly still in love with her. I can't answer for what court the Lessing uses for emotions. Four months ago, he let it be known that he and Melanie were planning to be remarried. When you heard that surprise announcement tonight, Miss Sheridan, was your greatest resentment at the disgrace to the Sheridan name or the possible diversion of Bartley's money? Inspector, if you're trying to establish that I hated Melanie Cabot, consider it established. Thank you. I did hate her, and all she stood for. But I didn't kill her, if that's what you're really asking. Well, of course, that's what I'm actually asking. Well, you have your answer, then. I hope I have, Miss Sheridan. I hope I have. My sister never really understood Melanie Inspector. Melanie had made her mistakes, as we all have, but underneath, she could be as decent and generous and loyal as... Well, I... I would have been proud of her as my wife. I even think... Yes, Bartley? You even think what? Well, I... I think even Lisa could have learned to like and respect Melanie if, 
She's been able to forget the gossip and pull off her own social blinders long enough to give Melanie half a chance. You knew yourself that Melanie, as Mrs. Bartley Sheridan, might draw social disapproval. However, unfairly... Wait a minute, Inspector. I love Melanie. I didn't stop to weigh out how my sister or anyone else would take it. I loved her, and I wanted to marry her. And now... I'm sorry, Bartley, if you'd rather wait till... I want Melanie's killer discovered and punished, Inspector Saber. Whatever I can do to help you on that... You may be able to help us a great deal. I've written a request on this sheet of paper. Now, if you concur on it, would you be good enough to take this to Officer Myers and your Captain Adams? Well, of course, but what... Thank you, Bartley. For the moment, the request is confidential. When the lights went out, Bartley is the only one I could rule out with any certainty, Inspector. And your own position, Mr. DeLessing? Very naturally, I stood still and relaxed. There's always someone to rush around and correct such trifles as a blown fuse. But not Court DeLessing, naturally. (laughs) You say you've been invited on this yacht before? But of course. I've known Bartley for some years. I'm connected with one of his companies. I can't say that you look like a businessman. A technical specialist. The firm deals in women's handbags, gloves, and imported accessories. And you're an expert on... On women, Inspector. I give the company my best judgment as to what might attract my attention. I see. As I'm told, you hope to remarry Melanie yourself up to a few months ago. Melanie was unpredictable, Inspector. And I happen to be a man of the world. When she made clear that she was in love with Bartley, I very naturally stepped aside. With no ill will? Of course, with no ill will. As I told you, I am a man of the world. You, uh, doubt me, Inspector? That's putting it mildly, DeLessing. But we'll talk again. to ask me that, Inspector. Miss Taggart, you're in no way obliged to answer. It would help me if I could know. I can only tell you that. All right, I'm not ashamed of it. Yes, I love Bartley. I guess I always have, ever since we were children together. So that you as well couldn't have been too pleased by Melanie's announcement tonight. The announcement that, that led to her death? Well, let's say that preceded her death. Mr. Saber... I think Melanie made her announcement to exactly the four people in the world who'd, who'd least want to hear it. The four. Yes. Now, it's Court de Lessing, Lisa Sheridan, yourself... And this gangster they call Danny Coles. The only man Melanie had ever been in love with. How's that again, oh, Betsy? Betsy? We didn't call for you yet, Danny. I don't wait to be called, copper. Not when I know there's a fast one on. What are you trying to pull, Saber? We're looking for a murderer, Danny. Do you have to kidnap your witnesses to hang this on somebody? Kidnap? No. Oh. Well, how did you learn of the orders I gave Captain Adams? Listen for yourself. That ain't a dishwasher machine they're warming up down below. The ship's engines? Well, is that what you asked Captain Adams to do, Inspector? Take this yacht out to sea? The murderer's aboard, Tim. I think we'll see that he or she stays aboard till we can name the one who stabbed Melanie Cabot. Now, you don't object, Danny, if the Sinbad puts out to sea? Take you to the South Sea Islands if you want. You can waste the time. I guess I can. And you, Miss Taggart? I'm not afraid of your investigation either, Inspector. We seem to have ample food and supplies aboard, and the others have already made clear that they have no objections to the plan. Now, wait a minute, Inspector. What about my objections? Yours, Tim. Well, not mine, but my wife's. What's Maggie going to think if she hears they've taken off on a fancy cruise to nowhere? The board and men have phoned Mrs. Maloney already, Tim. They have? How'd Maggie take it? She had just one wifely word of warning. Tim, you're to keep your feet dry. My feet dry? Why, of all the... Hey... We're starting to move. For a cruise to what Tim calls nowhere, Danny Coles. And what would you call it, Inspector Sable? One person aboard knows the destination, Miss Taggart. In California here, we call it the gas chamber. Inspector! Inspector, look at those waves out there. We've got a storm coming up. Storms inside and out, Tim. Right. Inside and out. On the after deck of the yacht, 
Sergeant Tim Maloney finds Inspector Saber examining a square-shaped canvas-wrapped object he has just taken from one of the ship's lockers. Do you know what this is, Tim? Well, by the looks of it, it could be a life preserver. Here, let me have a heft of it. No. No, it's too heavy. The thing must be solid rubber. It's a self-inflating life raft, Tim. Navy airmen never fly without them. Watch. Now, I'll slip it out of this cover and touch it off. There's a cylinder of compressed air here. Hey, now, that is something. The thing's blown up to make a regular little boat. But, but Inspector, how do you ever get it squeezed down again to fit back in that cover? I won't try, Tim. They've got five more there in case of emergency. It was this cover I'm interested in. Do you notice that it's different from the others there in the locker? Well, it's a shade off in color, but not enough to... It's off in color, and I think we'll find a different date of issue. Well, now, begging your pardon, Inspector, and of course I'm glad to be learning about life at sea, but what's all this got to do with finding the twister who knifed poor Melanie Cabot? Poor Melanie Cabot? Well, since she's dead, rest her soul, we'll leave her to account for herself for what she was. But for the life of me, I don't see us any nearer her murderer. <laughs> you think we're at sea in more ways than one, Tim. It's, it's like trying to drive nails into a fog, Inspector. We've got four people who could have done it as easy as snuffing out a match. The knife there for anyone to grab. The wire in that could have been blown by any one of them. And not a match nor a lighter could be lit because... Because a can of gasoline had been tripped over by a steward in the lounge not an hour before. A can of gasoline that could have been placed there by any of them. Oh, Inspector, we've got too many who could have done it. And we've got too many with motives for doing it. Take big Danny Coles. Melanie's been his girl for years, whatever the husband she had. But here she was moving up to a league where she'd never need Danny again. And throw in that smack in his face. You know, while you're at it, Tim, take Lisa Sheridan. You hurt her? I'm not sure she wouldn't rather see Bartley himself dead than married to Melanie. And Betsy Taggart? Oh, now that girl's been in love with Bartley all her life. The first marriage was hard enough for her to take. And here was Melanie going to slam the door on her for keeps. Court de Lessing. You heard him say he couldn't care less whether Melanie married Bartley or not. Now, look, Inspector, you wouldn't be after believing a word that I'm meant... afraid I share your prejudice against him, Tim. But at the moment, Court de Lessing's the one member of this ship's company I'm most interested in seeing again. Well, Meyer says he's down in his cabin, plunking away in that guitar of his. You want me to rub him out for you? No, no, I've got just two or three points of facts I'd like to clear up with Lisa first, and then I'll go find a lesson myself. Yeah, mind your hat, Tim. The wind's picking up again. Well, well, hello. Come on in. I thought it was one of those cops again for more of that grilling. Uh, just a second. I got a bottle stuck away in this upper berth here. I think we can still find some ice in that bucket. Well, it's up here someplace. I put it... Well, I've been right out here on the deck, Inspector Sabre. I can't think why you didn't see me before. If you say you looked out here. You're leaning against the rail quietly enough now, Miss Sheridan, but you seem to be suffering from shortness of breath. May I ask if you've just been running... Since you ask, Inspector, perhaps I have been moving around a little. To avoid me? If I possibly could. That's frank enough, Lisa. May I ask why? Isn't there an old shipboard rule, never pick up with strangers on the first night out? Or inspectors of the homicide division. I've answered all your questions, Inspector. And distinguished looking as you are, I'm certainly not in the mood for small talk. Or... Whatever else you had in mind. It wasn't shipboard romance, Lisa. I have some new questions, and I'd appreciate straight answers. You say you first met Melanie aboard this yacht? Yes, that's straight enough. It is? Can you remember the exact date? The newspapers could tell you. 
as the night Bartley's first wife was lost overboard. Was Court de Lessing with her? Of course. They were still married then. And you and Betsy Taggart were on the cruise. You couldn't really call it a cruise. It was meant to be no more than a few hours' sail. For dinner, done. Until the storm came up and damaged the rudder and swept Joan Sheridan overboard. Oh, may I ask why you keep returning to... Could me? that have been more than an accident, Lisa? Could oh. Joan have been shoved over by Court or Melanie? Inspector Saber, I'm sure you're on the wrong track. Court and Melanie saw Bartley go over because he cried out to them. But... Bartley himself could tell you much more about all Inspector, that than I can. Inspector, could you come over here, please? Oh, excuse me, please, sir. Yes, what is it, Tim? Myers just went down to get Kurt DeLessing for you. And he didn't find him down in his cabin. Myers found him, all right, with a knife in his back. No. Dead? Still warm, but dead. Oh, but Tim DeLessing was no child. He couldn't have been stabbed without some kind of struggle or an outcry. Our murderer is no child either, Inspector. On this one, DeLessing was blackjacked first. Then the knife to finish him. It could have been a man or a woman. The cabin's down this way. We've taken chances enough, Tim. Lisa, get to the lounge and stay there. Tim, go with her and get Miles to collect the rest. There's one I'll go for myself, Inspector. Big Danny Cole. You're to stick there in the lounge, Tim, and see that no one gets near the lights or wiring. I'll have a look at DeLessing and then get Coles myself. <laughs> Coles, open up in there. Coles, I want you up in the lounge with the rest. If you don't open up in there and come I'm out... I'm the party without me, Saber. I'm not coming out. Open up, Danny, or I'll shoot out the lock. I'll come out when this tub gets back to port, Saber, not before. Stand away from the line of fire, Danny. Here goes your lock. That's far enough in, copper. I've got a thirty-eight cover in the back of your neck. No, don't try to turn around. Just drop that gun of yours. You're making a mistake, Danny. A bad one. Just taking precautions, copper. Drop your gun. You were searched when we came aboard. Think I didn't expect that after Melanie got it? I parked this thirty-eight caliber insurance up in one of the lifeboats. I told you to drop your gun, Saber. Drop yours, Danny. I'm turning around. I'm warning you, Saber. I'm warning you, Danny. I'm turning around. Even if you fire, I'll get off shots before I go down, and they'll be right in your belt. All right, so you turned. Don't come any nearer or I'm blasting off, cop or no cop. Well, you are scared, Danny. Really scared. Look, I'm not getting pulled out of here. If that killer could get two, Danny Coles isn't going to be number three. I'll have that gun now. Huh? Okay, you've got my gun. But if that killer has got me on the list, I... Panic me out here without your private army, Danny. Or is all this... Look, Saber, I didn't get Melanie and I didn't have... I know that. You know I'm in the clear on this. This gun is what you rely on, Danny. You're not a knife man. What if you'd have told me that when I had you covered? I would. I, I don't bargain with criminals, Danny. Even when they're in the clear. Oh, but I can count on. Get how... going up to the lounge. We've got a murderer there who may be getting restless again. Lisa, Betsy, and Danny Coles with Mr. Sheridan here and Myers to help keep them under control. Myers. Yes, Inspector. Take Danny Coles forward and ask Captain Adams to turn back for sure. You're right? sure of your murderer now, Inspector Saber? I think I am, Bartley. Myers. Yes. After you've told Captain Adams, hold Coles in that first starboard cabin. I'll be sending others to you in a moment. Right. The ones you still suspect, Inspector. The ones I'm clearing, Tim. Danny Coles had no part in our two murders. All right, Myers. You can cut along to Captain Adams and let Danny stick close to you. His nerves are showing. Yes, sir. Lisa and Betsy. Now, if it comes down to these two... Betsy... Inspector, I couldn't have killed Kurt DeLessing. I didn't like him, but can I Can you find your way him. alone to that starboard cabin, Betsy? I may be needing Tim here. <laughs> oh, you, you mean I... You're clear, Betsy. You've been in love with Bartley for a long time, but I doubt that you'd know where or how to put a man out with a blackjack. But then, you mean that Lisa... Run along, Betsy. And stick with Officer Myers when you get there. You think it is down to me, Inspector? That I do know how to use a blackjack or a knife. You're strong enough, Lisa. You've played tournament tennis for years. I'm glad Melanie Cabot's dead. I've admitted that, but I Now, wait a minute, Miss any... Sheridan. The Inspector will tell you you don't have to go making it any worse for yourself than it stands. If making a clean breast of it eases your mind, out with it and have done with the lies. But if you want to wait till you can see a lawyer, it's your... Um, yes, Inspector. Well said, but Miss Sheridan won't be needing an attorney. But... If you're after sending the other two out, is cleared, Bartley, 
Uh, would you rather I sent Lisa off with the others or let her stay to hear this? <coughs> no, no, try for the deck. This is one night you can't swim your way along. It's coming to you. Tim, 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 I've got his wrist. Knock that knife loose. I I got it, Inspector. And if this is our double murderer, I got him too. You can let go now. Our triple murderer, Tim. Bartley Sheridan started by blackjacking his first wife and pushing her overboard. You can't prove that, Saber. Now with the the witness is gone. True enough, Bartley. Thanks to you and their own greed, we don't have Melanie and Kurt to tell us how you shoved your wife overboard and then played the hero by going in after her. But we do know the insurance you took out that night. The insurance, Inspector? The inflatable life raft he threw over before diving, Tim. Our hero didn't risk staying alive by swimming. He used the missing life raft from that locker on the deck and didn't sink it till he sighted the Coast Guard cutter the following morning and knew he could be picked up. I've got the cover of your replacement raft, Bartley. It's close to the other five, but not close enough. A missing life raft isn't enough to prove murder. We may not have to try on that one, Bartley. You'll be convicted for your two murders tonight. But, Inspector, for a man to murder the girl he was in love with... Bartley was never in love with Melanie. Whatever he's done, Inspector, I'd swear to that. You'd swear correctly, Lisa. Melanie blackmailed your brother into the marriage plans. And court was in on it, as Bartley learned only after he thought he'd finished with Melanie. The man of the world wasn't looking to avenge Melanie just to collect double for the new situation. How much did he ask, Bartley? More than he got. And I'd kill him again if I had to. Put that in your notebook if you want, Sergeant. Inspector, I... Do you mind if I go out on deck? The investigation's over, Lisa. Go out and get all the clean, fresh air you can. There won't be enough. After what I've learned of my brother... There won't be enough in all the winds of the Pacific. Good night, Inspector Sid. Good night, Lisa. of magnesia and Bayer aspirin have just brought you Inspector Mark Saber in the case of the canceled bride on Mystery Theater. This. is the time to tell of the unaccountable, of apparitions by night and phantoms in shadow. Time to tell strange tales of fantasy and the supernatural. Mystery Theater presents The Hitchhiker by Alan King. The stretch of road between Bainville and Bowden is about 15 miles. I used to drive over it about once a month. By Alan King. The stretch of road between Bainville and Bowden is about 15 miles. I used to drive over it about once a month with George Kirby. George was supervisor for the J.K. Land and Land Company, and we used to make a monthly inspection trip over his territory. We usually worked it so that we ran into Bowden at night... It isn't a big town, but there's a good hotel there, and we could always make it back to our hometown before dark the next day. We would take turns driving. When George was driving, sometimes I'd sit with him. If I was pretty tired, maybe I'd move into the back seat and sleep for a while. This particular night, about six months ago, he was driving and I was sitting in the front. It was a poor sort of night. It had been raining and there were patches of mist that came at you when you least expected them. I'd been telling George about a farmer I'd met. (laughs) This will kill you. The guy looks me right in the eye and says, Boy, you won't sell me one of those things. I invented one myself ten years ago. (laughs) Did you see it work? (laughs) Sure, he showed me. (laughs) You should have heard the noise. Sounded more like a young threshing machine. (laughs) You gotta hand it to those farmers. You know, those guys can make anything and fix anything. Well, I remember one once in Indiana someplace. George, look out. There's someone in the... Where? Come on, quick. Where is he? He must be underneath. I hit him, I know that. Yeah, he's underneath. Looks like he's wedged under the crankcase. 
Well, is he alive? Are you... Are you hurt badly? Can you move? Must be knocked out. Wait, I see. His legs are clear. I think we can get him up. Tell you what, son. Get in. Put the car below him. Ease her forward when I tell you. Okay, George. But easy, son. Go very, very slow. <laughs> We got him out. I'm not sure if he was alive. His face was all mucked up with gravel and oil. But he was dead when we got to Bowden. We talked to the police. There was an inquest later. George wasn't held. It was an accident. George Kirby and I went about our business. I'm uh, Larry Mason. I'm a salesman. I drive that stretch of road between Bainville and Bowden once a week. In one place, you come to a curve where there's a sort of ravine on one side and quite a drop on the other. It's not dangerous. There's a good, strong guardrail, clearly marked. The locals just call it the gap. Uh, this night, oh, a few weeks ago, I was driving alone, just coming to the gap, when I saw somebody ahead of me at the side of the road. It was a man giving me the thumb. I pulled up and opened the door. On a lift? Thank you. Come on in. Going down to Bowden? Yes. Be there in ten minutes. Uh, don't often see anybody around here at night. Cigarette? No. Try to. Think I'll have one. Don't blow that light out, huh? Hold it there a moment. Well, what's the matter? Why are you looking at me like that? It's all right. You can put it out now. Well, thanks. What is your name? Larry Mason. Why? You're not the man. I'm not what man? I'll know him when I see him. Well, who, who is this man? Uh, what do you want him for? He killed someone. Killed someone? It was here. On this road. He ran him down and killed him. Oh, an accident. He said he wasn't to blame, but he was driving the car. The man was just standing there, hitching a ride, just as I hitched a ride with you. Well, maybe it was foggy or something. A driver should be careful in a mist. Look, uh, suppose you find this guy. Uh, what are you going to do? Kill him. Oh, wait a minute. You, you can't go around killing people like that. They, they said it wasn't his fault, didn't they? Yes, but I know better. I will find him. I didn't like it. I was sure the guy was batty. Anyway, he didn't say any more then. He seemed to shrink back in his seat, almost as if he wasn't there. I stepped on it. The sooner I got to Bowden, the better I'd like it. And just as we were pulling up, I spoke to him again. Look, about this guy you say you're looking for. Yes. You're not really going to kill him, are you? Yes, I am. But why? Because he killed me. What? I'm the man he ran over in his car and killed. Whether the door on his side opened or not, I haven't any idea. But I do know that suddenly he was gone. I just sat there. I lit a cigarette and kept telling myself the guy hadn't been in the car. He hadn't talked to me. And all the time I knew I... I didn't know what I knew. I threw the cigarette away and went in for a coffee. Biddy Kirk was behind the counter with the usual grin all over her fat face. Hiya, Larry. Hi, Biddy. Coffee? Yeah. And what else? We got some nice... Hey, what's the matter with you? 
It looks like you want something stronger than coffee. Uh, coffee will do. Nothing to eat. Are you sick or something? No. Well, I'm not sick. Okay. Here you are. Here's your coffee. Thanks. Look, are you sure you're okay? You don't look very good. I'm okay. Say, uh, Biddy. Yeah? Do you remember about... Oh, I guess it must have been a few months ago. There, there was a... Bat- Hi, Biddy. Jack. Larry. Hi. How's the coffee tonight, Biddy? Strong enough for you. Swell. Coming up. Anything to eat? I don't know. I'll drink the coffee first. Okay. Here. Well, call me if you want something. Gotta get back in the kitchen and get some sandwiches made. You just drive in from Bainville? Yeah. Why? Well, I, I just wondered. What's on your mind? It was a big order or something? No, I... Well, I, I gave a guy a lift down here. So what? So did I. I do it all the time. What's new about that? There's something funny about the guy. I picked him up just the other side of the gap. Gave me the creeps. Wait a minute. What'd this guy look like? Oh, uh, pale sort of hair. Dead-looking, grayish sort of face. Yeah? Go on. We, uh, he talked about an accident. I lit a cigarette, and he, he sort of peered into my face when I struck the match. And then he said, I wasn't the guy he was looking for, or something like that. Where did you drop him? I brought him right into Bowden. Stopped the car, and he was gone, just like that. Larry, I picked up that guy myself. Just the other side of the gap. I shouted at him. It wasn't the same man. He was kidding me. It wasn't possible. It... But the description tallied. The only difference was he'd only ridden a couple of miles with Chuck and hadn't said anything about the accident. Accident? What accident? I'll tell you in a minute. First of all, when I would brought him into Bowden, how did he get back to the other side of the gap in time for you to pick him up? You were right behind me. He couldn't. Not unless he's got a twin brother. Or unless he's a ghost who likes hitching rides. Yeah. That's about the only explanation. <laughs> hey, what is this? You were trying to tell me you believe... Uh, just a minute, chum. Biddy? Yeah? Getting hungry out there? Can you come out a minute? Sure. Uh, what'll it be? Corn beef on rye? Biddy, uh, I-, I want you to tell me something. Can you remember an accident between here and Bainville? Oh, I can remember plenty of them. Oh, yes, I know, but this one... Well, I, I, I don't know the name of the man who was driving. I, I don't even know when it was, but he hit a hitchhiker. A hitchhiker? Can you remember it, Biddy? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that was George Kirby. He was driving not very long ago. And Sam Henderson was with him. Yeah, they had the inquest up in Bainville. Yeah... It was a misty night, I remember. George said at the inquest he couldn't see very well, and he hit this guy before he even saw him. Who was the guy he hit? Do you know? Oh, he lived up by the gap. I know, I didn't really know him. I'd seen him in here a couple of times. He was a writer or something. But what's all this about? Well, what did he look like? Ooh, pale sort of guy. Looked like he needed a good meal. Kind of mousy colored hair. That sounds like... What sort of a voice had he? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah, kind of quiet and slow, I think. That's what I wanted to know. Okay, thanks, Biddy. Anything to oblige. I guess I'll go back to my sandwiches. Give me a shot when you're hungry. Okay. Come on, Larry, what is all this? Chuck, the guy you and I picked up is the guy George Kirby ran over and killed. Are you out of your mind, Larry? He's dead. Dead or not, the guy I picked up looked right into my face and said he was after the guy who ran him down and killed him. And uh, when, you're making this up. And when he found this man, he was going to kill him. I don't know how long we sat there arguing it out. In the end, we didn't know whether we were sane or crazy. We had all the facts. They'd only fit into one pattern. And that pattern was impossible. In the end, we did come to one conclusion. It seems to me, whatever way you look at it, this George Kirby may be in danger. Yeah, but from what? Or from whom? Somebody's threatening him. Or trying to scare him. Somebody pretending to be a ghost. 
It must be two people pretending to be a ghost. There's one thing certain. The man you picked up tonight can't be the same man I picked up. It's not physically possible. Chuck, I don't believe in ghosts any more than you do. But what happened tonight can't be explained. It can. It must be. Well... Maybe these two men we picked up were twins. Triplets. The third one was the guy who was killed. Well, that's fantastic. Is a ghost any less fantastic? No, but... Well, anyway, we got to warn this guy, Kirby, that someone's after him. We don't even know him. Oh, we can leave a message with Biddy. Uh, give her a shout. I want something to eat anyway. Oh, well, Biddy, uh, how about a sandwich? Ah, I'm getting hungry now, eh? Yeah, uh... Give me a corned beef and rye and a dill, and uh, another cup of coffee. Now, how about you, Larry? Uh, that'll do for me, too, I guess. And, uh, Biddy? Yeah? Will you be seeing this, uh, George Kirby sometime? Don't guess so. He comes in pretty regular. Could you give him a message? Sure, sure. What is it? Well, just tell him that... Well, we found out that somebody's threatening him, see? Threatening him? Who is? Well, we, uh, we don't quite know. Tell him not to pick up anybody between here and Bainville. I don't get it. It's all right, Biddy. He's in danger. And we don't know him, so the only thing we can do is leave the message with you. Well, I'll tell him. But he'll probably laugh in my face. Well, maybe he will. But tell him anyway, see? What's the matter with you, Biddy? Something on your mind? Yeah, I, uh, I got a message for you, George. Message? <laughs> Too bad you weren't in a week ago. The guys could have told you themselves. What guys? Oh, Larry Mason and Chuck Reynolds. I've never heard of them. Well, they left this message anyways. Said to tell you somebody's threatening you. Threatening me? Yeah. And to not pick anybody up between here and Bainville. <laughs> What's this, a gag? Well, I don't know. I tell you, George, I don't know what it's all about. Well, who was threatening me? Well, I didn't hear much because I was back in the kitchen. But they did ask me about that accident. You had asked a lot of questions well, about it. Well, it was an accident. They said so at the inquest. Yeah, yeah, George, I know that. Nobody's got any right to rake that up and threaten me. Sure, George. It wasn't your fault. We know. It wasn't, dear. It, it wasn't my fault. Who's this, this Larry Mason and, and Chuck, whatever his name is anyway? I don't know. Then what right have they got to now, come around? don't get excited. They wasn't threatening you. They said somebody else was. Yeah? Well, I'll bet they're trying to put a scare into me or something. Well, you can tell them from me. They can keep their trap shut or there'll be trouble. Next time I saw Biddy, I heard how George Kirby had taken the warning. That's what you get for trying to help somebody. Anyway, I'd done what I could. And as the days went by, I began to feel as though I'd dreamed the whole thing. It was all too fantastic. Then one day I met George Kirby face to face. I'd gone to Indianapolis for a sales meeting. I was sitting in the hotel lobby after dinner when a big man came up to me, looking full of fight. Are you Larry Mason? Yes. I'm George Kirby. I want to talk to you. George Kirby? Yeah. I just want to tell you, I don't like being threatened. Now, look, I wasn't... I got your message. I don't like that sort of thing. Don't be a fool. I'm not threatening you. Sounds like it to me. Listen. I picked up a guy between Bainville and Bowdoin. He looked me over carefully, asked my name and then said I wasn't the guy he was looking for. But then he said he was looking for the man who killed somebody in an accident on that road not long before. Go on. He said when he found that man, he was going to kill him. Is that all? I figured he was a kind of a nut. He tried to make out he was the man who was killed. I'm supposed to believe all this? I don't care whether you believe it or not. But I'll tell you this. That same night, a friend of mine picked up the same man. And we both talked it over and decided the least we could do was to warn you. Thanks. Well, we figured maybe the man you killed had a, a brother who maybe thought you'd got off easy. David Quinn hasn't any brothers. I found that out. Well, anyway, that's what happened. Now you know about it, you can do what you like. <laughs> he treated me, I didn't care what happened to George Kirby. But whether I cared or not, I was to be there when it did happen. And because I was there, I found myself giving evidence before a coroner's jury. 
A jury inquiring into the death of George Kirby. Now, Mr. Mason, will you tell us what you saw on the night in question? Well, I was driving from Bainville to Bowden. I, I guess I left Bainville about 11 p.m. Did you see the Kirby car? Well, there was a car ahead of me. I, I could see its taillights. Uh, but I didn't know then whose it was. Yes, go on. As a matter of fact, it passed me. I could see it for a while, and then it went around a curve, and I lost sight of it. But when did you see it again? A few minutes later. I came around a curve myself, and there was this car picking up the hitchhiker. Before I caught up to it, it was on its way again. You're certain that someone got into the car? Yes, yes, quite certain. In fact, you will swear to it? Well, I... Yes, I will. Is there some doubt in your mind? No, no, someone did get into that car. I see. And then what happened? It, uh, it drew ahead of me again. Then I came to the place on the road they call The Gap, and there was a car piled up against a rock on the south side. The car you've been telling us about? Yes. When you say it was piled up against a rock, is there not a sort of cliff at that point with guardrails protecting motorists? Yes, although there are a couple of places where there are big rocks. You mean the guardrail runs a certain distance and then there is a rock and then the guardrail continues past it? That's right. And this car was piled up against one of these rocks? Yes. What did you do? Well, I stopped and ran over to the car. It must have turned over at least once. The top was all smashed in and so was the front. Kirby was behind the wheel. He seemed to be crushed and there was another man in the back who didn't seem too badly hurt. That was Samuel Henderson. Yes, I, I got him out of the car. And then I tried to get at Kirby, but I couldn't move him. So uh, all I could do was watch for a car passing, which I did. I flagged it and sent Henderson down to Bowden for the police and some kind of a tow truck. And you waited there until they came? Yes. Was there anyone in the front passenger seat of the Kirby car? No. Are you quite certain? Quite certain, and there couldn't have been. Why do you say that? Well, because the front was so badly crushed, he would still have been there. But you told us a moment ago that you saw the Kirby car stop and pick up a hitchhiker. Do you still say that? Yes. Then how do you account for the fact that there was no one else in the car when you found it? I can't account for it. Well, maybe he was in the back seat and got out before I arrived. Perhaps. We shall see about that. I may wish to examine you further on this point. You may step down now. Mr. Henderson, you were riding with George Kirby on this trip? <clears throat> yes, sir. Will you tell us what happened after you left Bainville? Well, I was dozing in the back seat. We take turns driving. I was asleep, I guess, till, till something woke me up. What was that? The car stopping. I sort of opened my eyes and saw George lean over and open the other front door and a man got in. No doubt about that. None at all. I didn't see him very clearly. I... I didn't really want to wake up. I, I was tired. Did you, in fact, stay awake? More or less. George was talking to this hitchhiker, but the man said almost nothing. That is, until just before the accident. What did he say then? He said, uh, you are George Kirby. And George said, yes. Then the man said, you killed David Quinn. That woke me up. David Quinn was the man Kirby had killed in an accident some months before? That's right, sir. I was, I was startled. George looked at him and said, so what? Then the man said, I have been waiting for you. George started to say something, and then suddenly the man said, look out, there's something, there's someone ahead. And he seemed to reach over and grab the wheel. The car swerved, and we crashed. I don't remember much else till Mr. Mason pulled me out. Mr. Henderson, you realize that all you have told us is on oath. I realize that. But it's true, every word of it. Was there any person sitting beside George Kirby in the front seat when you recovered consciousness? No. Yet you insist that there was someone there till the moment of the crash. I do. I have said that on my oath, and it's true. How do you account for the fact that there was no one there afterwards? I can't account for it. I only know that's how it was. Very well. You may step down, but do not leave the court. <laughs> You are a trooper with state police? Yes, sir, I am. I understand you were called to the scene of the accident in question between 11 and 12 at night. Yes, sir. What did you find on arrival? 
I found the Kirby car piled against a rock on the south side of the road. It had hit the guardrail and bounced off it and then turned over. Mr. Mason was waiting for me. I found George Kirby pinned behind the steering wheel, apparently unconscious. I had brought up a truck from the police garage, and we had to use tools to get the door off on the driver's side so we could get Kirby out. How badly was he injured? He was dead when we got him out. What did you do then? I took a statement from Mason, and then I went back and examined the marks of the car on the road. I saw that it had apparently swerved right over to the guardrail. How do you come to that conclusion? Uh, By the skid marks. Kirby must have applied the brakes, and they left marks. Did you examine carefully the front of the car and the roof? Yes, sir. The whole front and top had been smashed. In your opinion, if anyone had been riding in the front passenger seat, could he have gotten out? He could not. I will swear to that. You have heard the evidence of Mr. Mason and Mr. Henderson to the effect that Kirby did pick up a passenger. Yes, sir. All I can say is he must have got out before the crash. But Mr. Henderson says he did not. I don't know about that, but I will swear that no person was in that front seat at the time of the crash. It couldn't be. They had Henderson and me back on the stand, and they made monkeys out of us. It wasn't so bad for me... A hitchhiker could have got out of that car without my seeing him. But Henderson wouldn't budge an inch from his story. Uh, In the end, we both slunk out of the inquest with everyone convinced we'd both committed perjury. Henderson took me over to the hotel to have a drink in his room. I sure needed it. Who was he, Mason? Who was he? You know, don't you? Yes. Yes, I know, and yet... And yet it couldn't have been. You imagined it. And I imagined I gave him a lift three or four weeks back. I imagined he said he was going to kill George Kirby. And Chuck Reynolds imagined he gave him a lift, too. I imagined him. And I'll never forget him. Neither will I. Neither will I, because he... Oh, don't say it, Henderson. Henderson. After all, we don't believe in ghosts, do we? I believe in what I see, Mason. Then you didn't see anything. Mind if I help myself? I need it. Now, please go ahead. Thanks. There's just one other thing I didn't tell him at the inquest. What was that? Where the hitchhiker grabbed the wheel and swerved the car. Well... It was precisely at the spot where David Quinn was killed. The Hitchhiker by Alan King was item three in a four-part series of Tales of the Supernatural written for and presented by The Mystery Theater with John Vernon as Sam Henderson Cease Linder as George Kirby Frank Perry as Larry Mason and Hugh Watson as Old Quinn Beth Lockerbie was heard as Biddy Tom Harvey as Chuck Jack Creeley as the coroner and Alan DeRamus as the state trooper Sound effects were by Alex Sheridan. Technical operation by John Skillen. This is Bill Lawrence speaking. on the wall tells us that it's that time again. Time for some mystery and murder, suspense and terror. Time for Nightfall Mystery Theater. This week's play is entitled The Devil's Backbone. It's written by Silver Donald Cameron and set somewhere along the fog and shrouded coast of Nova Scotia. Down beneath the waves there's an old wreck laden with gold. And there's nothing to stop a man from making a killing. See the 
diver. Like a drifting spaceman in his red wetsuit, mask, scuba gear. He tilts forward slowly, reaches out a mittened hand. Hidden among the swaying brown weeds, covered with a thin purple layer of coral, is a Spanish biscuit, an ingot of solid gold, the end of the rainbow. But before the diver can touch it, the water turns black around him, black as oblivion. He thrashes in the water, blind as disoriented. Some thing seizes him by the leg and pulls him down, down into the silt, the mud, the slimy weed. Something heavy and deliberate strikes him in the face and knocks away the demand regulator, a delicate chrome-plated marble which allows him to breathe 50 feet underwater. He gropes for it frantically. Without air, he's dead. Dead on the devil's backbone. God, God. Eric, Eric, what happened? We're dead. Don't know. What happened, Eric? Look, down there. The water's black. It nearly got me. What nearly got you? Whatever it is. Gotta go back. Find Dan. No, no. Got you. No. Dan. He's coming up. Look, I see him. Where? Over there. Look, isn't that him? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Oh, thank God. Yes. Yes, for God's sake, it's all right. Eric. Eric. It's, a, it's all right, Dad. God Almighty. Get aboard, both of you. We're heading in. Eric. Eric, what's that? What? On your leg. Your suit's all torn. Oh, my God. Claw marks. Claw marks? Yeah. But what's got claws like that? I remember the winter evening when the venture began. When Eric and Joyce walked into my apartment in Halifax. They were grinning from ear to ear. Daz, tell me. What would you do if you were rich? Well, I'd hire Joyce here to give me a couple of weeks of physical education in the Bahamas. <laughs> Volleyball and swimming? That's what I teach. Well, maybe we could enlarge your job description just a little bit. Oh. I might have something to say about that. Yeah, not if I was rich enough. Uh, well, it's all very flattering, but I'm not up for auction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, what's all this about? I think we've got a chance to get rich next summer. Yeah? How? Diving. Oh, not another of those futile treasure hunts. Come on, you're brighter than that. Oh, no, this is a good one. You remember that little book I did on privateers in Nova Scotia? Yeah. Well, a guy called me up from Lockport down the South Shore, and he'd read it. He said his great-great-grandfather or somebody had been a privateer. Mm -hmm. And there might be some information in the family papers up in the attic. <laughs> so I went down to have a look. I wasn't expecting anything. But you wouldn't believe the papers in that attic. They'd been quite a prominent merchant family at one time, and I don't think they ever threw away a bill of sale or receipt or anything. Mm. I plowed around in there for a couple of days, and in the end, I found this. Hmm. The log of the private ship of war, Wasp. I don't think anyone's looked at that log since 1757. The Wasp belonged to the first notable member of the family, a fellow named Ezekiel Hobson. Now, he's the guy that established the family fortune. Mm-hmm. They made a cruise in 1757 and loaded the ship with plunder. They just about made it home when a French privateer from Lewisburg forced them onto the coast. The wasp struck a reef called the Devil's Backbone and smashed herself to pieces. Daz, nobody ever salvaged her. We don't think anyone knows she's there. So you want to have a crack at it? We want all three of us to have a crack at it. We need two divers and someone in the boat. And you're Eric's diving partner. Oh, Joyce, will you come to the Bahamas with me? <sighs> Well, if it's the only way to get you signed on. <laughs> oh, the things you have to do to get a guy to accept the chance of a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Fine morning. Pretty nice. Ah, 
Doing a little diving, are you? Yeah, thought we might find some scallops. Oh, our lobsters? I mean, if we did, we wouldn't tell you. Ah, oh, that's poaching, you know. We had some trouble with that. We're not after lobsters. Ah. Huh. Well, so where'd you plan on going? Devil's backbone, I suppose. Possibly. Is uh, that a good place for scallops? <laughs> scallops. Something else on that reef? Well, yeah. Or so they say. What? Treasure. And a curse. Oh. What kind of curse? Ah, likely all foolishness anyway. But they do say a pirate ship went down on that reef. And the skipper put a wish on it. Put a wish? That whoever goes after that treasure, he don't come back. (laughs) Anybody try it? Oh, the odd diver's gone out there. Never found nothing, I don't believe. Oh, well, but they came back. I guess so. Nobody never went searching for them anyways. Come on, let's go. See you later, friend. Bye. You be careful now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. What do you make of all that? That's what they call local knowledge. He makes me nervous. It's interesting, eh? Someone was here before. Local people always have some idea what's there. A pirate ship loaded with treasure? That's pretty close. You know, if anyone was going to curse the place, Ezekiel Hobson would be the man. Remember what he did to that fisherman, Eric? Yeah. What's that? Well, he wanted to find out if there were any Spanish ships around, and he captured a fisherman. The fisherman wouldn't say. So Hobson lopped off one of his fingers with an axe. He told him he'd have all the rest before the day was out. The fellow talked. Well, it's still like that. The strong man takes. We're a little more civilized than that, Des. Yeah. On the surface. Acting happens to be my trade, but most of us are pros at acting civilized. And yeah, we're getting close. What are the marks? We got those two points of land over there in line. Then we go along that line till the big white rock at the harbor mouth bears 273 degrees. You're telling me those points haven't eroded in 200 years? Eh, likely they have, but not much at this distance. And the magnetic variation? I worked it out. 273 it should be today. Hey, you think of everything, don't you? That's the way he lives his life. A little further out, Joyce. No, a little further. How's this? Okay, that's it. Now, your left... More. Okay. Easy. Okay. Dancing. Get the anchor over fast before she drifts. Yeah. Good. Ah, it's nice out here. Well, Des, let's get those suits on. You don't want me to move the boat at all? Not unless one of us surfaces and calls for help. But you'll likely come up a long way from the boat. No, no more than a couple of hundred feet. We're just going to do overlapping circles on centers about 40 feet apart. Oh, okay. How many do you think we can do on a tank of air, Des? Four or five, no more. So, 200 feet at most. I don't know how you can wear that clumsy backpack. You look like a turtle in a fiberglass shell. (laughs) I don't know how you can wear all those belts, one on top of the other. Weight belt, buoyancy vest, backpack. Turn on my ear, will you? Is the reserve valve shut? Uh, yeah, it's shut. Okay. Yeah, it looks good. Well, let's make some bubbles. Nothing like it. That split second when you leave your own element and plunge into another. Suddenly your body is weightless. Your movements slow and graceful. As we swam, I knew how much I wanted to be rich. No more crab from third-rate Hitchcocks. I'd go south, buy a big boat and a pile of diving gear. Just pick and choose from all those little secretaries that go down for two weeks on package tours looking for romance. Chivas Regal with lobster tails and the best dope going. See the diver. Like a drifting spaceman in his red wetsuit. He tilts forward slowly, reaches out a mittened hand. Hidden among the swaying weeds, covered with coral, is a Spanish biscuit. An ingot of solid gold. The end of the rainbow. That's when it happened. Black fog. Black water. Something seemed...
seizing Eric's leg. Terror and panic. Something struck him. I couldn't see him. Couldn't see anything. Scuffling and banging, then roaring up to the surface. Pain in my leg, and then daylight, air, and a voice screaming. My voice. I'm out of it. I'm not going out there again. Look, Daz, we found it. But intelligently, we can each have a hundred thousand a year for life. Maybe more. Yeah, or we can get killed tomorrow. It's not worth it. Look, I was scared down there, but... Scared? I'm bloody paralyzed. Okay, paralyzed. But I don't believe in spooks. Doesn't have to be spooks, Eric. Could be something that lives down there. Giant squid or something. Well, if it's a giant squid, we can chase it away. Or kill it. Oh, Eric, you can't be serious. Do you know what you're talking about, Eric? Tentacles, 30 feet long. Suction discs like saucers. Claws, as well. Shooting around the bottom on jets of water. Making black clouds of ink so you can't even see it. And those two big eyes and that parrot beak. God. Yeah, but there aren't many that big. How come you're such a daredevil all of a sudden, Eric? It's the biggest chance in my lifetime. What's wrong with your life as it is? Money means you've got choices. No money, no choices. All right, but how much will you sacrifice? I'm not saying we have to recover that cargo at all costs. I'm just not quitting without another look. Now, how are we going to feel if someone else gets it? Jealous, but alive. What's happened to you, Dez? You're not usually that jittery. Yeah, well, maybe I got... Scared worse than you did. It didn't grab you. Didn't knock out your regulator. When I think of going down there again, my stomach turns over. I can't do it. Leave him alone, Eric. Don't keep pushing him. Never mind, Joyce. I'm going to my room. What the hell's the story on him? What's the matter with you? I just want to finish what we started. No, no, no. That's not it. You want the money. You can practically taste it. Oh, can't you? Oh, yes, of course, but I don't like what it's doing to you. Wanting the gold so much. It's making you a monster. Can't you see? Dez is terrified. Come on, I wasn't that hard on him. Oh, weren't you? Well, maybe I was. What are we supposed to do, quit? You won't get anywhere trying to force him. Well, maybe you could talk to him. Maybe he'd listen to you. to Des? Mm-hmm. How'd it go? All right. He'll die tomorrow. He will? How did you do that? He's scared, Eric. But he'll do it. Going out again, are you? Hmm? Yeah. How did you fare out yesterday? I saw some interesting places. Caves on the reef and stuff. Ah. On the devil's backbone? Didn't see no sign of that treasure, eh? If there is treasure. Well, we won't know it's there till somebody finds it, will we? <laughs> That's an Irish way of looking at it. Come on, let's go. We'll, uh, we'll bring you back a gold coin, maybe. You do that. You surely do that. Cold. The water's cold. My spirit's cold. The marker didn't move. We swim down the line to the bottom, going to the exact spot we left yesterday, into the milky green light of the depths. Long, curving ropes stretch down into obscurity. Again, Eric's red wetsuit goggled and finned, stroking smoothly down beside me, checking me anxiously to see how I'm bearing up. I'm okay, Eric, I'm okay. But I'm cold as ice, clear through. There's the marker below us. 
we settle on our knees beside it, stirring up little puffs of silt. Perfect calm. Nothing sinister. But the bottom is littered with wheat-encrusted bars and globes and boxes. The cargo of the wasp. Spilled from her torn bottom two centuries ago. Wealth just for the picking. Eric reaches for a Spanish biscuit, picks it up, passes it to me. We gaze at the ingot, then at each other. He reaches for one more. Then, something black and rubbery swells up from the ocean bottom, growing like an insane black tumor. It pushes us, then the water goes inky black. I can't see Eric. Something pushes against me, tries to press me against the bottom, and I feel a sharp point biting into my calf as I struggle to find the surface. As the ink thins, the sharp point jabs my leg again. As I swim away from the swelling, monstrous thing below me, I see red filaments trailing in the water, thin lines of blood from my leg. And now Eric's right beside me, still clutching the second Spanish biscuit. There's a scarlet flow from his right side, from five parallel gashes under the arm of his jacket. Terrified, we race upwards, break away to the surface, then burst into the air. Blessed air! <laughs> Start the engine, Joyce. Get us out of here. Go. Go. Was it the same thing again? Worse. Worse. Oh, my God. from Devil's Backbone, are we? Not very far, no. That's where we're going. Dead. Really, you don't mean it. Well, you're not concerned about the curse, are you? No, no, I am not going back there. Not for anything. The curse has been lifted, you know. I lifted it. It's not really a good subject for jokes, Des. I'm not joking. I did lift a curse. It wasn't hard. After all, I put it on in the first place. What are you talking about? I got everything into that bulky backpack Eric used to talk about. India ink, big weather balloon with a CO2 cartridge. What? Piece of wood with five sharpened nails driven through it. <laughs> a little fast work in the blackness, and uh, there's your curse. But you were hurt, too. Well, that's to make it convincing. I am a good actor, you know. You bastard. <laughs> hey, now, now. You remember old Ezekiel Hobson? thing he used to do when he wanted information? The strong take what they want. And you wanted all the treasure. In a way, I wanted it, and I wanted you. I didn't need Eric. And now we're going to go and get that treasure. Hmm? Just the, the two of us. Yeah. And then what? First we have to sell the stuff. Under the counter. Uh -huh, because of Eric. Eric and the law. I mean, there are legal complications. Yes, you know. yes. And then? Well, yeah, whatever we want. Take a world tour, go down south, lie in the sun mm. forever. <laughs> Buy a private plane. I don't know, you name it. Mm -hmm. Together? Um, yeah. Yeah. You bastard. <laughs> I'd be one more discard, huh? Just like Eric. <laughs> now, Joyce, you know, you're an exceptional woman. You're very much to my taste, but uh, I need a certain amount of variety. I won't do it. Do what? I'm not having any part of this. Goodbye, Des. You can't make sure from here in a dinghy. Joyce, for God's sake. Damn. I would have had to kill her anyway. I guess. One word to the wrong person, I'd lose everything. I didn't think she'd get sucked under the boat and mangled by the propeller after I ran to dinghy. I thought I had her. Didn't think she'd dare object. A woman like that who likes to be hurt and degraded. Damn her anyway. 
once the air leaves her lungs, she follows me down easily. When I get her to the bottom, I'll tie her hands and feet to rocks. Nobody's ever going to find her. They wouldn't know where to begin looking. Oh, it's lovely down here. It's a few slight and hazy shadows. Down. Down. Through the colder layers of water. Towing what's left of her. She was good, though. Oh, she was really good. I knew what she was like. That first night I took her back in the motel. Eric never reached her. Never made her shriek like that. He doesn't know much about women. No man either. A strong man takes what he wants. <laughs> An old bed spring lying on the bottom. That's perfect. I'm tired to it. The wrists. Yeah, now the ankles. Now I'll pile some stones on the bed spring. Bed like this is forever. It's all good for anyway. <laughs> the cargo can't be far away. I glide like a bird, easing through weed and boulders. And there it is. There it is. The heap of ingots and bars and stuff. I want to laugh. I pick up an ingot and drop it into my bag. And then another and another. found that boat on the beach, mister. There weren't a sign of life. Just one of them queer diving suits you fellas wear. And a tank. But the engine was still warm. It wasn't there in the morning? No, no. It weren't there till after dinner. Uh -huh. Will you run me out to the devil's backbone? Run you out to the devil's backbone? What for? I want to dive. What? You think they... I think they might have gone diving out there and got into trouble. Now... Look here. That place got a wish on it, for sure. If two of them got into trouble, you'll need four to go looking for them. Not just one man alone. I've got my suit and tank in the car. Yeah? Up to you, I suppose. You want to go? I'll take you. Okay. I'll be right with you. Damn fool. Well... Yeah. I'll run you out there. But I'll be some surprised if I run you back. Silver Donald Cameron, starring Neil Daynard as Eric, Linda Sorensen as Joyce, 
and Neil Monroe as Dez. The technician was John Jessup, and the sound effects were by Bill Robinson. The series' story editor is Earl Toppings. This edition of Nightfall Mystery Theater was produced and directed by Paul Mills. National's Friday Night was produced this week by Matthew Baird with studio technician Ray Folzik. The Arts National program team includes Philip Coulter, Neil Crory, Barbara McKenzie, Srul Irving Glick, and Lori Lockhart. Our executive producer is Keith Horner.
The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book, in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book... I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly the great book opens. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a scientist who delved into the unknown with frightening results. A tale titled, Beware of Tomorrow. It is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins as Sheriff Ramsey brings his car to a stop in front of an old mansion in a desolate section of New England. A young man gets out of the car and speaks to the sheriff. Thanks very much, Sheriff, for bringing me out here. That's quite all right, young fellow. Uh, say, um, do you know Professor Clark? The man that lives in this old mansion? Why, yes. I was Professor Clark's laboratory assistant back in college. Why? Well, there's been some talk in town of running him and that man of his, that Barton fellow, right out of the county. But what has anybody got against the professor? Well, there isn't a milder man in the world. Well, maybe so. But folks has got wind of what happened at the state penitentiary over in Hillvale last year. Sure, if you're talking in riddles. What did happen? The professor went over there when they hanged Richards, that hold-up killer. And the warden gave the professor the murderer's brain. So what? Folks think he's keeping that brain in a big glass jar and making it grow. (laughs) Oh, that's perfectly ridiculous. Well, I'm not saying I ever believed it. But it'd be a good idea if the professor would give folks a notion of what he's really doing in that laboratory of his with that Barton fellow to help him. Then maybe the talk would die down. I understand. All right, Sheriff, I'll mention it to him. Well, then I'll be getting on. Good night, young fellow. Good night. A few moments after Dr. Richard Dale had knocked on the door of the ancient mansion, a frail, white-haired old man answered the door. An old man who could hardly speak in his joy as he gripped Richard Dale's hand. He led the way down a long hall to a great room where strange equipment took up almost every inch of space. Retorts and electric furnaces, generators, batteries, great glass vats. Dr. Dale stared around him in intense curiosity as Professor Clark helped him off with his hat and coat. There. Now sit down, Dick. Sit down and let me get a look at you. I got your letter, and it made me so curious, I took the first train. You promised me a surprise. Is this it, this amazing laboratory? (laughs) No, no, my boy. We'll come to that in a moment. After you've met Barton, my assistant. 
Oh, uh, Barton. Yes, Professor? Dr. Dale has arrived. I want you to meet him. Why, of course. How do you do, Dr. Dale? How do you do? We've both of us been looking forward to your visit. Yes, the professor's letter made me so curious I couldn't stay away. Uh, Barton, is Alpha making some coffee? Yes, he started it when we heard the car. Alpha? Who's he? Our general man of all work. A truly amazing fellow. Yeah, here he comes now. What in the world? Shall Alpha serve coffee? Good heavens. I said you'd be surprised, Dick. He's not human. He's a machine, a robot. Yes, my boy. An artificial man made from metal and synthetic brain tissue. A machine man. But walking and then talking. He's not very pretty, but then the professor was mostly interested in making sure he'd work. Well, he must weigh a ton. No, only about 300 pounds. You see, Alpha is mostly aluminum and other light alloys. Inside his aluminum plates are some new batteries I've devised, together with miles of fine silver wire and a dozen electric motors, to give you only the highlights. Shall Alpha serve coffee now? Yes, Alpha. Put it on this table here and pour a cup for Dr. Dale. Alpha, do so. I still can't make myself believe it. Alpha for coffee. Go on, Dick. Take it. Oh, oh yes, of course. Thank you. Well, he looks clumsy, but he poured the coffee as well as a man could. Yes, my boy. Alpha has capabilities you'd never suspect to look at him. Uh, we won't need you anymore tonight, Alpha. You can go back to your room now. Alpha go. Be sure to switch off your batteries. They're going to need recharging tomorrow. Alpha, understand. Boy, that's the most incredible thing I ever saw. You see, Dick, like any machine, he's completely inactive when his batteries have been switched off. But his brain continues to function. It's an artificial protoplasm that I spent eight years creating. It's the only thing that makes him different from any other machine. But it means that Alpha can think. Think like a man. A machine that can walk and talk and, and think. But Alpha isn't the only surprise I have for you, Dick. He's not? No. I have another one, even more astonishing. But you'll have to wait until morning to learn what that is. Uh, Barton will show you to your room, Dick. Of course, Professor. I'll see you in the morning, then. Yes. We'll have a long talk tomorrow. Good night. Good night, Professor Clark. Oh, Dr. Dale. Yes, Barton? Could we talk for a minute before I show you to your room? Why, yes, of course. It occurs to me that the professor forgot to tell you why he asked you here. It was his hope that you'd stay indefinitely and help us carry forward the work we've been doing here. Stay indefinitely? Why? Oh, I have my own work. Now, yes. don't say no yet. Just think, Dr. Dale. Alpha is stronger and more rugged than a man. He needs no rest, no food, yet he can do the work of three men. He can plow, reap, run machinery, think how much drudgery a million like him could lift from mankind's shoulders. Yes. Yes, that's true. And already Alpha is technically old-fashioned. Professor Clark has blueprints for a new machine man, as superior to Alpha as an aeroplane is to a bicycle. We want you to help us build them. Well, I'm certainly tempted to stay... Perhaps I could arrange it. Good. Then I'll show you to your room now, if you wish. Yes, I... I am sleepy. If you'll just come this way. His mind in a whirl of amazement, Dr. Dale retired and finally fell into an uneasy sleep. How long he had slept, he did not know, when abruptly he woke with a scream ringing in his ears. The cry came from downstairs. Dr. Dale leaped from his bed and raced down to the lower hall. In the lower hall, he found Barton hammering on the heavy door of the laboratory. Professor Clark! Professor Clark, what's wrong? Barton, what's happened? Professor Clark, I heard him call for help. 
The door is locked. We've got to break it down. Yes, come put your shoulder beside mine. Right. Are you ready? Ready. Then shove. Oh, once again. All right, once more. Professor Clark, where are you? Professor Clark. He's not here. Yes. Yes, he's here. Lying on the floor beside the window. He's been murdered. It was Alpha. It must have been. No one else could have done it. Where is Alpha? The window, it's open. He went out that way. We've got to go after him. I'm afraid it's hopeless. At night in these woods, we couldn't possibly find him. No. No, you're right, of course. It'll be morning soon. Then I think he'll come back. He knows that he can only go for a few more hours before his batteries must be recharged. But, Barton, why did he kill the man who created him? The professor has been thinking of destroying Alpha because he's now technically out of date. Perhaps that's the reason Alpha killed him. Poor Professor Clark. We'll have to notify the police. That is only the sheriff. In any case, I think we should wait until morning and then report the professor's death as an accident. An accident? Yes. If the authorities learn the truth, our research may be stopped. And when Professor Clark has achieved so much, can we let it go for nothing? Why, no. No, of course not. Dr. Hale, we must carry on his work for him. Yes, that's what he would want. Then you will help me to continue it? You'll stay? Yes. Yes, I'll stay. To continue the story, beware of tomorrow, as it is written in the sealed book. Greatly upset by Professor Clark's tragic death, Dr. Dale returned to bed, and at last fell again into an uneasy sleep, a sleep in which he was haunted by dreams of Alpha, the metal monster Professor Clark had created. When he awoke, the sun was shining, and he could hear Barton moving about downstairs. He dressed and went down to find Barton getting breakfast ready. Ah, good morning, Dr. Dale. Good morning, Barton. Any sign of Alpha? Not yet. I thought that while you ate, I might outline some of the problems facing us. Yes, that's a good idea. You see, though Alpha's brain is of synthetic protoplasm, it is not completely artificial. I was wondering about that. Sheriff Ramsey mentioned that the professor had secured a human brain from... From an executed killer, yes. The professor found that to give life to his artificial brain tissue, it was necessary to add a small amount of tissue from a real brain. I see. The real tissue gave life to the rest, of course. Yes, but in this instance, it may have tainted Alpha's brain with a murderous impulse of a killer. Mm, That sounds perfectly plausible. So our first problem will be to obtain untainted brain tissues to blend with the artificial tissues we will make according to the professor's formula. Mm, Well, that should give us no trouble. I can get what we need through the research laboratories with which I'm connected. Then that solves our worst problem. The rest will be matters of detail. Fortunately, there is enough equipment here to build a dozen or so robots. Like Alpha, you mean? No, indeed. The far more advanced type Professor Clark was perfecting. 
Oh, uh, if you finished your breakfast, I have something to show you. Yes, I'm through. I, I don't feel much like eating after last night. Then come with me to the laboratory, and I'll show you the second surprise that Professor Clark had in store for you. Now, what I'm going to show you is in this box. Not a second mechanical man the professor built a few months ago. This one, though, was a failure. You mean it wouldn't work? It worked too well. I don't follow you. It was too intelligent. Professor Clark called it Beta, and Beta's brain power was greater than that of any human scientist who ever lived. But Beta was insane. Good heavens. He represented, however, a tremendous technical advance. Look. Well, it looks exactly like a human being. Yes. Professor Clark used me for a model when he built Beta. It's an excellent likeness. Touch the face, Doctor. All right. It feels smooth and rubbery with a hard surface underneath. The surface is a new plastic Professor Clark developed with which he could imitate exactly the appearance of human skin. Underneath is an aluminum body on which the plastic was baked. I see. Beta's hair, eyes, and teeth are all artificial too, but he walked and talked and acted so much like a human being that no man alive would have guessed his secret. No, he would have fooled me completely. Did you say he was insane? From the human viewpoint, yes. He considered himself superior to the human race. With his enormous brain power, he intended to make himself ruler of the world. Oh, you're joking. Not in the least. That was why Professor Clark destroyed him just in time. He had made plans to take over this laboratory and construct dozens of mechanical men like himself. And then, with their help, he was going to enslave all mankind. But if that could happen once, it might happen again. I don't believe we should continue Professor Clark's work after all. Oh, there's no danger now, Doctor. You see, Beta also had a brain which contained tissues taken from that of the condemned murderer. But we will select the brain tissues we use from the highest types that are available. Well, in any case, we must proceed with the utmost caution. Of course, Doctor. Listen. Someone's come into the house. It's Alpha. He's come back. Alpha. We may need a weapon, but No, I can control him. Alpha. Alpha, come here. Alpha, come. Alpha, you killed Professor Clark. Why did you do it? Professor said he would destroy Alpha. And you killed him because of that? Alpha not want to be destroyed. But you... You're just a machine. What difference does it make to you? Alpha is machine that lives. Alpha stronger than you. Alpha better than you. Alpha, be quiet. We want to know where you've been. Did anyone see you? Two men saw Alpha. What do you mean? Two men driving automobiles saw him. And what did they do? They tried hit Alpha with automobile. And then what happened? Alpha Stopped automobile. Alpha killed one man. Killed him? Other man ran into woods. Alpha not find him. Alpha come back. We can't keep this a secret. No matter what happens, we must notify the authorities at once. Wait, let me think. We can't... Uh, the bell. You stay here. But what about Alpha? I'll switch off his batteries, and then he can't move. There. And now I'll see who's at the door.
And now to continue the story, Beware of Tomorrow, as it is written in the sealed book. Dr. Dale waited tensely as Barton went to answer the doorbell. He heard the door open and recognized the excited voice of Sheriff Ramsey speaking. Then a moment later, Barton came back into the laboratory, followed by the sheriff, who held a revolver in his hand. But, Sheriff, if you'd only let me explain... Never mind that. You're coming with me, both of you. The professor, too. Where is he? Professor Clark is dead, Sheriff. Dead? He was killed last night when an experiment he was engaged in went wrong. An experiment, eh? I suppose it was an experiment that crushed the life out of Jed Thompson an hour ago down the road and scared Fred Jennings so bad all he can do is jabber about monsters. It's true. The thing that killed both the professor and Thompson is an experiment. It's standing there behind you. Behind me? Go! Here. Man made out of machinery. Don't be alarmed, Sheriff. It's perfectly harmless now. It is a machine man with Professor Clark built. Unfortunately, it got out of control. I don't believe it. I don't blame you, Sheriff, but that's the truth. I think I can convince you. What are you doing? Stand still or I'll shoot. I'm simply going to switch out on. There. Now he can move and speak as well as you or me. That thing talk? You're lying. You're up to something. Alpha. Will you tell the sheriff that it was you who killed Mr. Thompson? Alpha killed man. What? Man tried hit Alpha with car. Uh, so, so that's what the professor was doing all this time. Building that thing. Now, sheriff, surely you realize that we are not murderers. Well, maybe not. But you're coming to jail just the same. You're partly responsible anyhow. But, Sheriff... Anyway, it's for your own protection. There's a mob on the way out here, and they're going to burn this place down. i got to put you in jail for your own safety. That mob's ready to lynch you right now. Burn the place down. That's what I said. So turn that machine thing off and come along. We ain't got much time. No. All this equipment, machinery, the professor's notes, they must not be destroyed. We must stop them. Yes, Sheriff. The loss to science. Never mind science. You got your own skins to worry about. That mob means business, so let's get started. I'm afraid we can't do that, Sheriff. I've got a stick shooter here that says different. We have no choice, Boyd. Oh, yes, we have. Alpha, take the gun away from this man. Alpha will do. What are you doing? Stop him. You stop him or out. No. No. Go of me! Oh, stop him! Stop him! Too late, Dr. Dale. Oh, I was crushed him. Yes, Dr. Dale. The sheriff is dead. Now you are a murderer. In a good cause. The life of one man or of a dozen men cannot stand in my way. You don't expect me to keep silent about this, do you? I think you will. Alpha? Alpha? He doesn't answer. His batteries have gone dead. The last burst of energy must have drained them dry. But it makes no difference. I think it does. A big difference. There. See this? Sheriff Ramsey's revolver. With three bullets still in it. Put your hands up. I must explain something to you, Doctor. You can talk. But if you move, I shall shoot. I only want to say that nothing is going to interfere with my plan to build more of the improved form of robot that Professor Clark perfected before his death. Robots who look and act so much like men, no one can detect them. They'll never be built. I intend to destroy all of Professor Clark's notes. They will be built. By me. I shall build ten, a hundred, a thousand. Then I shall lead them with their superior intelligence to the mastery of the world. You're mad. Of course I should have guessed it. No, Doctor, that's not the answer. I shall tell you the truth. And then you must die. Stand still or I'll tell you. You remember last night when the professor said he had another surprise for you? An even greater surprise than Alpha? Yes. That surprise, Doctor, was Beta, the second robot. So perfect it looked like a man, but so intelligent that human beings were his children in comparison. But Beta was destroyed. No, Doctor. Beta was not destroyed. But you must be destroyed. Stand back. Stand back, I say. All right, then, I shall shoot. And now, Doctor, your bullets are gone. You... 
You won't even hurt. Bullets cannot harm me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Beta, the second robot, was not destroyed. But I saw him. What you saw was only an initial attempt that failed. The real Beta still exists. You see, Doctor, I am Beta. You? Yes. I, too, am what you would call a mechanical man. And now, you must die. No. No. Stay away from me. Stay away. No! And so ends the tale. Beware of tomorrow. As it is written in the sealed book. Shortly after Dr. Dale's murder, a fire swept through the old mansion, turning it to the ground. To this day, the ruins are avoided by the natives. For cursed is the ground where evil has dwelt. punishment for a murder he committed, only to find that justice has a strange way of working itself out. The tale is titled, Murder Must Be Paid For. sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from the sealed book the sealed book written by bob arthur and david cogan is produced and directed by jock mcgregor met in this cave by the restless sea to reveal the horror in man's mind. Listen to the weird circle. Listen to the waves. Listen closely, for you will hear the crying of lost souls. Our story discloses the horror in man's mind. This is a tale of the house and the brain. Come with me to London, through the heavy fog of the city to a large house in the suburbs. A young couple enter the portals of that house to attend an art auction. Oh, that's strange. Very wonderful. Well, hello, Jim. We've been looking all over for you. We've got quite a crowd here today. Paul Whitney, Sandra. I'm glad you've come. I thought you two were refugees from this sort of thing. Well, frankly, Jim, I've suddenly conceived a passion for good oil paintings, and I'm going to buy this fabulous painting of the ancient cutthroat. Well, to tell you the truth, Jim, she suddenly conceived a passion for cutthroats, ancient or otherwise. Oh, <laughs> my husband abuses me. I'm too nice to her, or she'd never be interested in any other man. But, darling, the man in the portrait's been dead 400 years. Dead or living, he's not beyond your charm. <laughs> but my husband loves me, Jim. 
It must be my fatal fascination. <laughs> but I didn't come here to talk with you, even if it is fun. I came here to see that oil painting. Oh, it's quite a painting. Yes, yeah, so we've heard. It's in my study. Come and take a look before the auction starts. Hmm? Now, don't fall in love with it, Sandy. No matter how you feel about 15th century reprobates, I'm not going to spend a fortune buying useless pictures. <laughs> well, there's the picture. What do you think? He has a face you'll never forget. And a reputation. Yes, sir, he lived a full life. You know, he was supposed to have been fabulously wealthy. But when he died, his fortune disappeared. Oh, my dumpling aunt. He looks like the kind of man who sticks pins in people for the devil of it. Sandra. The strangest thing about the picture is the man's eyes. You get the feeling that the eyes are alive. Yes, very definitely. Clever work. Paul. What's the matter with you, Sandra? I could have sworn I've... I've seen that man in London recently. What man? The one in the picture. What? <laughs> He's been dead 400 years. Stop snickering at me, Jim. I know what I've seen. Impossible. The only thing left of the Honorable Cutthroat Richards is the house on Orchard Street. He built it 450 years ago, and it's never been really habitable since. Why? Well, this is your chance to laugh at me. It's haunted. Haunted? Oh, not really. Really? Oh, Jim, Jim, I've never met a ghost. And you never will, Sandra. Jim, oh, Jim, please, please, oh, please, imagine a really, truly ghost. <laughs> Wonderful, Jim, take us over. Or, better yet, I'll rent the place for a week. I've heard a lot about ghosts, but I've never been able to pin one down. You know, I've been a student of the occult for a long time. Jim, 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 please. Oh, Sandra, I'm serious. It's dangerous business, this ghost hunting. Uh, please, fella, anything to get Sandra's mind off buying that picture. Very well, but you'll find some very real ghosts over there. The housekeeper, Mrs. Browning, will rent you a room if you want one. But she's the only person who's ever been able to stay in the old house. <laughs> Thanks, old man. Come along, Sandra. But the picture. Hang the picture, my sweet. I've got a genuine ghost for you. The door's open all by itself. There's no one there. Doors aren't supposed to open by themselves, Paul. Well, what do you expect? The house is haunted, isn't it? Hmm. Door slammed by itself, too. Woo! Tricky place, isn't it? You frightened? Not in the least. And it isn't my knees that are shaking, pet. It's yours. Wonder where the housekeeper is. Her name's Mrs. Browning. Call her and see what happens. All right. Mrs. Browning! <gasps> Don't poke me, Paul. I didn't poke you. Well, I didn't poke myself. Oh, hey. I wonder if we're alone. Look behind me, Paul. If it's a ghost, I don't want to meet it quite yet. Silly, it's broad daylight. Anybody knows ghosts never appear until nightfall. Paul, Paul, look. It's the child's footprint right there in front of me, a wet footprint. Great heavens. No, another one. Looks like the footprint of a child who's taken a bath. Oh, my chubby ass. Listen. The footprints lead upstairs. Shall we follow? Well, it's the obvious thing to do. Ghastly cold in here, Sandy, isn't it? Ghostly cold at any rate. <laughs> You're not quite up to form, old girl. You sure you want to go through with this? No, I'm positive. Oh, almost anyway. Sandy, the footprints, they disappear. <laughs> maybe, it's, maybe it's all done with mirrors. Good afternoon. Do come in the sitting room. Oh, you must be Mrs. Browning. I'm Sandra Whitney, and this is my husband. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Danvers told me you were coming. Won't you be seated? Thank you, Mrs. Browning. I hope my stepdaughter didn't frighten you. Your stepdaughter? Well, I didn't see anyone. Naturally. She's dead. You mean the footprints we saw? Yes, of course. Uh, you didn't see or hear anything else? Uh, no. Expecting anyone? Yes. They're coming for me shortly. My time is up, and I must die in the way they've planned it. They? Those who live in this house, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, God, Mrs. Browning, you don't really believe ghosts actually live here. Believe it? I know it. You see, Mr. Whitney, when I was first married 40 years ago, my husband, my stepdaughter, and myself moved into this house. They were here then. Why didn't you move out? Oh, we became used to them. Then my stepdaughter died. My husband had an unfortunate accident, and I was left alone. You've lived here alone ever since? Yes. Waiting for them to take me. Mrs. Browning, how much will you charge my wife and myself for an apartment here by the week? Charge? Nothing. Nothing at all. 
Anybody who has the courage to stay here is most welcome. But I advise you against it. Listen. What is it? Souls crying for release. Release from him. Oh, come, Mrs. Browning. You don't believe me? <laughs> you will when you move in. When can I expect you? Tonight at eight. How about it, Paul? That sounds jolly. You'll use the east wing. I'll have a fire lit for you. But let me warn you once again. They'll be waiting for you. Day and night. <laughs> Sandra, all back. Of course, Paul. Down, Blackie. Down, I say. Oh, if you keep squirming, I'll never get you on a leash. I'd better take some pistols along with us. Well, I'm not at all sure you can shoot a ghost, Paul. I'm not at all sure it is a ghost. Something awfully phony about all that. Oh, no. My intuition says there were ghosts in that house, darling, and I've a very perceptive intuition. Sandra, you're not going to take Blackie with you. I am. He's a watchdog, isn't he? But a dog. Now, darling, remember how nicely he caught pheasant last year. But pheasant aren't the same thing as ghosts at all. Stuff and nonsense. You ready? All ready. Here's your coat, dear. Oh, look out the window, Paul. So peaceful out there. You've always been partial to twilight. Oh, reminds me of the time you courted me. <laughs> it was such a nice time. Paul, that man, the one on the street. What man? The one standing right out there. Look at him. That's the same man whose portrait we saw at Jim Danvers' house today. Sandra, Sandra, where are you going? To talk to him, Pat, of course. <laughs> Mr. Richard! Mr. Richard! Oh, dear. Mr. Richard! Oh, my chubby aunt. It is him. Oh. Excuse me, sir. I couldn't help noticing you, and... You noticed me? You are Mr. Richards, aren't you? I've been known to many, by many names. Oh, dear, please pardon me if I'm rude, but... Well, how in the devil did you manage to stay alive for 400 years? You will notice my eyes. Look deep. Deep. Oh, let me go. Let me go. Deeply into my eyes. You've never seen me before. You don't know me. You can never remember me again. Walking, Sandra. I hope you're properly ashamed of yourself, approaching strange men and asking them silly questions. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. It was stupid of me, but anybody can be wrong. Well, of course they can, but on the face of it, it was silly. Expecting a man who was alive 400 years ago to be roaming around loose. It wasn't a matter of looseness, Pet. It was a matter of liveness. Now, now come on, stop being a husband and hold my arm. I ought to tear it off and beat you over the head with it. Mm, he's so virile. But I love him. <laughs> well, come along, Sandy. There's your haunted house ahead. We don't want to keep Mrs. Browning waiting. Or the ghost. <laughs> that door again. Insidious feeling doors opening and slamming. Mrs. Browning! Mrs. Browning! I'm in the east wing, Mr. Whitney, just lighting the fire. You better go on up. This hall's drafty. Hey, Paul, it's more than cold in here. It's almost as if something or somebody is draining your body of all warmth. That's a pleasant thought, Sandy. Now that you've scared yourself stiff, move. Well, I was just getting in the mood for golf. Where's the east wing? This way, Mrs. Whitney. Oh, hello, Mrs. Browning. Well, this room looks cheerful. It's as gay as my mood. Nice fire, nice candles. 
Quiet, quiet, Blackie. You scare somebody. <laughs> A dog scare somebody? Not tonight. They came tonight. What came tonight? You see. Better make yourselves at home while you can. Blackie, sit down. Over here, Blackie. Look at him, Paul. The hairs on his head are standing on end. Be quiet, Blackie. Blackie! Look! I told you they were here. A luminous mass. A blue mass. Sandy, be careful. It's materializing. It's coming for me. I knew it. Coming for me. Oh, Mrs. Browning, Paul. Fingers are choking her. Good heavens. Mrs. Browning. Oh, Paul, oh, stop this horrible Cutting. thing. Cutting. 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 It's horrible. It's all right, Sandy. It's all right, darling. Oh, it's, it's gone, hasn't it? Yes. It's gone. But Mrs. Browning, she's... Construct the scene of the crime. Nobody tells Detective Hodges that a flesh and blood woman gets bumped off by a goat. But I saw it myself. Oh, be quiet, Blackie. If you'd only relax, Detective Hodges, and go away, we'd catch the ghost for you. Quiet! I'm only trying to help, but I... Blackie, stop! Sandra, you're only confusing the issue. Paul's right, Sandra. Sit down over here. Jim Danvers, if you side with Paul, I'll never speak to you. Now, Mr. Whitney, if you don't mind... We'll go over the details again. What happened? Well, Mrs. Whitney and I were here in this room with Mrs. Browning when a blue mass suddenly floated in the door. The lights in the fireplace dimmed, the candles were extinguished, and Mrs. Browning began to scream. Why? Because she saw a ghost. It's really all so simple. Sandra, my dear. And then what happened? The mass suddenly materialized, at least sufficiently, for us to see two hands. Two hands without a body. The hands reached out, grasped Mrs. Browning by the throat, and... That was that. Thank you, Mrs. Whitney. I suppose you expect me to believe that story? There's no reason for you to doubt Mr. Whitney's word, Detective Hodge. I'm not saying there is. But there was only three people in this room, and one of them is dead. Everybody's under arrest. Everybody, do you hear? Oh, Paul, it's here again. Look, Detective Hodge. Uh... Paul, Sandra. Oh, Paul, for heaven's sake. Uh, well, what is it? An axe murderer in ectoplasm. Sandra, don't be funny. Let's get out of this house before it gets all of us. It's gone. Yes, it's gone. Now, do you believe us, Detective Hodge? Yes. Yes, I, I believe you. I'll have Mrs. Browning's body removed to the morgue right away. Paul, if you insist on staying in this house overnight, I'll not be responsible for what happens. But, Jim, I'm convinced that there are no such things as ghosts. Now, now please, Jim, take Sandra back home and leave me. I'm not budging without you, oh, Pat. Sandra, don't be foolish. Well, no matter what you two do, I'm not staying here. Oh, go, old fuzzy beard. Take thy tired body and deliver it to a safe, warm bed. Poor Jim. Scared of a little ghost. <laughs> it's 11 p.m. already. Well, good night, Paul, Sandra. Nighty night, Jim. What was that? You mean the footfalls? Yes, what is it? The housekeeper's dead stepdaughter. You see? It's all so simple. Good grief. Good night. <laughs> oh, we've been all through the house, Paul, and I'm dead tired. Come on, let's go to bed. You go to bed. I'll sit up and read these letters we found in the attic. Here, 
here, Blackie. Come here. Come here. Now lie down next to me. There, poor Blackie. Poor doggie. You don't like the ghosties, do you, Pat? Poor, poor Blackie. Yeah, hey, this letter's interesting. What is it? Evidently a letter from the housekeeper to her husband. A love letter. She talks about her brother's child. It seems her brother left his money to his daughter and she handled the estate for the child. Hmm, that's jolly. Maybe that's the child she calls her stepdaughter. Hmm. Uh, let's see what it says. Listen. Since we have managed the child's end, you and I are more than lovers. We are partners in many things. Sounds as if they murdered the child. Yes, it does. Sandra, I wonder if my theory's right. If people felt strong passions, and if those passions linger in a house after the people have gone, couldn't that create a heavy psychic atmosphere? Well, those fingers that murdered Mrs. Browning were more than heavily psychic. Unhook the collar of my dress, Paul. Where will I put the letters down on the dressing table here? Just a top hook. Oh, better keep these pistols handy just in case. Something about a gun that gives me courage. Funny. Oh, it's midnight. I'm tired and nothing's funny. You know Mrs. Browning's sitting room? It seems to be an extra addition to this house. It, it juts out from the rest of the building like a sleeping porch. What's funny about that? Well, that horrible cold and the footfalls all seem to emanate from that room. Oh, you and your logical mind. Oh. What's the matter, Sandy? Oh, look. The fire's dimming. Oh. Just, oh. Just like a great black shadow standing in front of it. Give me my gun. Here, dear. <laughs> shh, shh, Blackie, shh. Look, Sandy. A hand reaching out from the wall. The letters. It's got the letters. Great, Scott. Oh, my chubby aunt. Watch it. It's the hand of, of the housekeeper. How do you know? It's got the same ring on she had on this afternoon. If that's not a ghost, I've never seen one. The fire's going out, Sandra. Ah! Sandra! It's all around him! Sandra! Sandra! Ah! can't get your will against mine. My will is greater. No. Succumb, succumb. My will is greater. No, you're a shadow. And you are a mere mortal who knows no secrets beyond the veil. I control the world of shadows. Succumb, fool, succumb. No, no, go away. You're nothing but an image. You will die by my command in this house. You will die before morning. Admit my will. No, no, I will not admit your will. You're safe now on your own island. Just by still downing and drinking. Oh, Paul. I was a fool to allow you to stay in that accursed place last night. I ought to have my head examined. I came over as soon as I got your message, Paul. Oh, come on in, Jim. Sandra's recovering from a bit of a shock. Yes, I heard about it. I warned you, Paul, that house is definitely haunted. I'm going to board it up. It's completely useless. No, that's not the answer, Jim. It isn't ghosts. At least, not in the real sense of the word. Why, Paul, after what you went through, you say that? It's too malignant for a ghost. Do you believe in the power of hypnotism? Well, I've heard some amazing theories about it anyway. Well, I believe some power controls that house. Well, that's still ghosts. No, because the brain that controls the house is still alive. I'm convinced of it. Well, where do you think this man who controls the house is? He might be thousands of miles away. Remember you said that the eyes in the picture of the fabulous Richards seems alive? Oh, that's ridiculous. Not at all. In some crazy, mad manner, Richards has kept himself alive all these 400 years. In some hypnotic way, he controls that house. Well, if your theory is right, how can we break his control? Well, I'm certain that his control emanates from the little sitting room which once belonged to Mrs. Browning. Yes. Now, if you'll let me... I'd like to hire workmen and tear that room off the rest of the house. Oh, but Paul, The that's... room is only an extra addition, Jim. It can't do any harm to try. Okay, pull up more of that flooring. Did you hurt yourself climbing that petition, Sandra? No. Oh, imagine a secret room down here, Paul, right beneath the sitting room. You see, Jim, Paul was right. Why, it's like finding a box with a false bottom. That's all for now, boys. Uh, careful of your head, Sandra. This room isn't very big. But it's as cold as cold storage. Well, now you know how a hunk of beef feels in an icebox. That's gay. <laughs> a musty old room. 
bed and four walls. And two drawers built into the wall over there. All modern conveniences. Uh, try to open them. They look rusty. Just pull. All right. Uh, there. The drawer's open. Oh, nothing but a lot of musty old clothes. Listen, Paul. Nothing unusual, Jim. Just the same footfalls we've been hearing all along. I'm beginning to become quite fond of them. Look. Here. Why, it's a miniature painting. Yes, a painting of Mr. Richards. Look at it. The same face as that painting in my house. Look at the eyes in the miniature. Paul, they're alive. Great heavens. They're moving. You better put that portrait down, Paul. Yes, they are alive. Living matter in a painting. Oh, Paul, it's getting colder in here all the time. I feel faint. Faint and... Is this something unearthly? He's moving around. Open the next drawer, Paul. Hurry, I don't like this growing cold at all. Uh, it won't budge. No, the blasted thing. <laughs> oh, there it is. Why, Paul, there's a thin china saucer full of crystal liquid with a compass floating on it. That's a strange thing. Hmm. There's an inscription written in the drawer. What's it say? As this compass moves... So my will dominates everything within these four walls. Everything dead or alive. Accursed be the house and restless the dwellers therein. What's it mean? This is the brain, Sandra. Oh. Richards controls this instrument through hypnotism. He can control a piece of paper or a chair or even the souls of the dead. Then this house is haunted. Yes, haunted by a malicious, malignant will. It keeps a man's spirit roving restlessly after death. Paul! Paul, look! Look in that corner! Mr. Richards, you... you are alive. Yes, alive. Quite alive. Because I've will to live. Very clever deduction, Mr. Whitney. Deduction? Yes, I heard your keen analysis of my activities. You are a hypnotist, then. I have been powerful for 400 years. Your blind stumbling onto my secret will not stop me now. I can will anything... I will the specters of the past to re-enter this room. In heaven's name, man, stop this. Oh, that black shadow. It's here with us, closing in. Yes, oh. closing in. All those who have died in this house are my slaves, as you will be my slaves in a very few brief seconds. You are not the brain controlling this house. You gave that power to this compass. You transferred your power to this moving needle. Am I right, Mr. Richards? Put that compass down. Oh, no, I'll destroy it, Mr. Richards. No, you're completely powerless to harm us. Watch out, Paul. This partition's going to crumble. Paul! Sandra! Gosh, Paul, it's good to be back in our own home. What happened to Mr. Richards when the partition collapsed, Jim? Well, the workmen searched the debris around the house for Mr. Richards' body, but no trace of him was found. I'm afraid that he escaped. Oh, no. You mean he's still alive and free, Jim? Yes, indeed. That's just what I mean. Well, he won't be for long, Sandra. People everywhere will be warned, and every corner of this earth will be looking for him. Even his will can't defy the world, Sandra. No one man can ever fight the world. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have recalled the house and the brain. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. Ha, ha, ha. 
Hunter and eleven year old I be today. Yes, sir. Hunter and eleven year old. Well, Satan, this be a nice dark night to tell folks one of our pretty little yarns. <laughs> you folks shout out your lights so we can listen to our tale as we set it amongst the shadows. That's the way to hear our bedtime stories. Now draw up to the fire and gaze into them, birds. Gaze into them deep. And soon you'll see the hands of time turn back to Hunter Year. Back to the days of pirates, stolen gold, and sudden death. Soon you'll see a crossroads by a little bay, a crossroads where a gallows stands from which two corpses hangs in creaking chains. Below it, men are covering up a hole which looks like a new-made grave. Through the darkness of the night, offshore shines the light of a pirate ship. While men are singing. Here and there, so begins our story of share and share alike. <laughs> share and share alike. <laughs> <laughs> the fools on our ship out there are roaring drunk. I made sure they would be. With a cask of rum, I gave them leave to open their way left. They're not apt to be curious about their captain's whereabouts. You're the slick one, Dandy. Uh, soon we must return to them. They're happy now, but in another hour, they'll cut each other's throats. We should be unfortunate. But when we stay at daylight, we shall want a crew. I and all of them. If we'd overhaul the English brigantine. The news we have be true, that should be within the week. And she's loaded with bullion, Dandy, bullion. And when we see her, our crew can divide the cargo while you and me, their captains, take the gold. Sad to that which Ling and Frankie bury now beneath the gibbet. Think you're safe there? No safe. For there we are ever assured of guardians for our treasure. <laughs> you mean our bony friends who squeak so in their chains as they dance upon the wind? <laughs> Aye. If one suspected that beneath their dead and dangling feet lay something worth the taking, he would still hesitate to argue its possession with such ghostly bankers. Well, but we should have come here alone, just you and me, to hide this stuff. My dear Jack, with pistol and cutlass you have your points, but you'll never make a gentleman. What do you mean? You forget that they're turning, a uh, pirate. I had what is sometimes called breeding. Think you I would soil my hands by digging in the earth with a filthy spade as our comrades there are doing? And I would have done it alone if you must protect your lily hands and keep dirt from your fine clothes. And back to the ship you would have gone looking like one who had been digging. I hadn't thought of that. There are times, my dear Jack, when I don't believe your brains were made for thinking. Oh, I'm thinking now that we let these two dig for us into our secrets. Oh, I trust Ling and Frenchy absolutely. They'll never breathe a word. What's come over you? You trust no one. It's finished, Captain Burgess. Ah, the last bad boy. Have you tamped it down so there's no sign of fresh turned earth? Say for yourself, Jack Orr. If they had not watched it being done, even those artists who dance above would not suspect. You have done very well, my good boys. Now back to the ship where warm rum awaits. And mind you, not a word of this or I'll cut your gullet. Oh, no, Jack, please. I trust these good boys. Hey, go ahead with your spades, Ling and Frenchy. We shall follow. Aye. Aye. Oh! <laughs> Dandy, you shot them. And my aim was amiss. One had time to scream. Mm, both dead. You didn't tell me it was your plan to kill these men. I told you they would bear no tales. You were a devil, Dandy Burgess. And you were a fool. Too soft-hearted for our profession. I may be a fool. But I'll never turn my back to you, as those two did. <laughs> you fear me. 
You whose huge hands could crush my puny bones to jelly. I, when I'm sober, as an Indian, they fear the cobra snake. You flatter me. Look, you. You are as full of greed as I. Yonder in the ground lies a king's ransom. It's whereabouts unknown to all alive, but just we two. I had three pistols in my belt. Here on the ground, I throw the one still loaded. And there, my cutlass. I'm disarmed if you would have the secret to yourself. As if I had wished your death, it could now be mine alone. Take, take back your weapons, Dandy. Oh, you're truly my friend, as I've always thought. Oh, yes, you big idiot. I don't know why. Perhaps it's because you're such a lout, a child, my opposite. Because you amuse me and... And admire me. Dandy, will you always be my friend, my brother? Will you swear it? If it will make you feel any better, what shall we swear by? We who do not fear the devil and have broken all the laws of God. I had not thought of that. No, you wouldn't. Oh, wait, wait. We'll swear by justice, the thing we both fear most. Justice is a silly word for schoolboys. <laughs> but since you wish it very well... We'll swear by justice, which for you and I means death upon this gallows tree. Aye, with our hands upon the chains in which dangle those bleached out. Uh, better yet, with our hands upon the corpses, we will swear. <laughs> Brother of the stretched neck, excuse the liberty. I grasp what was formerly your foot. I touched the body, too. By justice, by the gallows tree, by death we swear to be brothers, friends, inseparable, to share and share the life on earth, or down in hell. I swear now you. <gasps> oh, oh, I swear. Now, now let's come away. The odor of our dancing friends is scarcely that of flowers. You must put our good boys, Ling and Frenchie, in the small boat, Jack. When we strike deep water, you can toss their bodies out. No one will see them in this darkness. Nay, a day like we sail. The English merchantmen and gold. Which we'll share and share alike. Which we'll share and share alike. Jack, you're getting drunk. Sure, I'm drunk, what of it? Nothing except that rum is apt to cloud your usually excellent judgment. Oh, another drink, everybody, another song. Give them the Amsterdam mate. Jack, go. Up and go, you blasted swine. I dare you call me simple, Jack. I am master here as well as Dandy Burgess. <laughs> now I know you're drunk, Jack. Oh, what's that? Well, Hyde, bung up that cast. Oh, what do you mean? We do no more drinking this night. Keep away from that cask, Will Hyde. I said we do no more drinking this night. Jack Gore's master here as well as you, Dandy Burgess. Jack said more wrong. Yes, don't, don't stop that silence. I and this pistol say no more. Did you hear me? Uh, uh, Uncock the pistol, Captain Burgess. Go to your post. Uh, All of you. The English merchant and run should be along tonight. She's armed, and in this fog we must have our wits about us. Take your men to the guns, Dick Howell. Aye, sir. You, Hans Schwartz, say the grappling hooks are ready. Yeah. Say, sir, when you speak to me. Yeah, sir. Well, get out on deck, all of you. <laughs> Captain Gore is giving his orders. Obey them, please. Mm, it's me can handle those villains, Dandy. Oh, now they're gone. You and me will have a drink alone, huh? I'll have one. You've gone your limit. What do you mean? Rum makes you overbold. Oh. <laughs> ah, very excellent, this rum. You will not look too longing if I have another, Jack. Thank you. Huh. <clears throat> Ah, but liquor is emptiness and song is folly. Until the duet becomes a trio with fair women. Women. Or even, uh, woman. How your eyes shine, Jack. Candy, think you will be women on this merchant, wouldn't we hope to see? Yeah. Mayhap, if the uh, devil looks after his own. Mm, women. And for all your 
fine clothes and gentlemen's ways. I'll get the same as you. You've sworn we'll share and share alike. Mm, uh, with women, that might be inconvenient. You've sworn. Do not try to cheat me. Uh, don't worry, only we better cross that bridge when we come to it. No, we'll cross it now. I know you. You'll take him from me with your handsome fist. We'll cut these cards and see who gets first choice. <laughs> oh, very well. I'll shuffle them. I'll shuffle them. I wronged you greatly when I called you drunk. One cut, high cut. The one who gets first choice to the women on that break. Very well. Uh, cut. I've drawn a ten. I've drawn a knave. I win. You shuffle. The choice is mine, the women on that break. Here, Benny, and we cite it. Captain Burgess, the English merchantman. Go ahead. Yeah. The park's just lifted. She's lying hard aport. Then she sighted us. It's all right, you fool. Our master's flying the flag of Holland. Tell Dick Howell not to break out the guns. If she remains unsuspicious, we can drift close enough to grapple with a hook. I sir, then we'll bottle with a cutlass hand to hand. That's what I love. To fight, to kill. And when we have prisoners to torment, the sport begins for me. Come on, I'm back. Here, cut car. Breaking out a gun. She suspects us, huh? Give her a fire. Give her back a broadside. Take down that flag of Holland and hoist the Jolly Roger. Hey, cutlass. Hey, prisoners from me, from the yard down to beyond, break our teeth and the dance upon the wind. Hey, prisoners from me, the torture! <laughs> the torture! Don't torture me anymore. I told you no women are aboard the ship. I'm afraid you have forgotten, Captain. Uh, to improve your memory, once more we'll try this red-hot poker on your naked foot. Not again. <laughs> For God's sake, no! <laughs> uh, it's too bad. He's fainted again. Stop oh, it, Dandy. He couldn't tell his lies on a pain like that. Sit down and drink your rum. When we captured this brig, you had your fun at killing now, I have my sport by making the survivors pray for death. Well, yeah, but can't you kill this man now and have it over with? We've got the gold. He showed us where it was when you strung his mates up in the yard. Oh. But the minuet they danced. <laughs> yes, he's given us the gold, but he's yet to show us where the women hide. I don't believe there are any women. Ah, yes, there are. I found a woman's glove upon the deck. A woman's glove? The woman must be on the ship. Uh, how astute you are. And I thought that liquor clogged your brain. Ah, our friend is coming to again. Women, they're all women. <laughs> well, Captain, the poker has had time to heat once more. Is your memory better now? Don't use it again. Don't. I'll tell you what you want to know. There are two, two women hid back of my cabin. A panel there. To you, the secret door. Two oh, women. women oh. Thank you, Captain, very much. That last job shot. Hey, my aim's improved. He never murmured like poor Frenchy. Come, two women find the panel in his cabin, and I have my choice. I come, but uh, leave your bottle here, friend Jack. <laughs> the ladies might not like a uh, drinking man. <laughs> One more blow and I'll burst the panel. Oh, no, 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 wait. Hey. Now, you fool. The women hear your act. Cower inside the wall. In fear of what they know is coming. Go oh, wait, dear Jack, and let them fear the long. Hey, I want my price. I want a woman. Hey, you clog. Have you no delight in that deadly terror? I have delight of a woman in my arms. And die of her tears. And back. Ah, ah, back the screams. Mm. Ah. Good evening, gentlemen. Uh, but one. It's not you who screams. I'm not the kind who screams. My companion is there behind that curtain. Dead. A dagger in her breast. She was afraid of you, gentlemen. She preferred to die. And you preferred to live. With the spirit you have, my pretty one. How I shall delight to tame you. Not so yes? fast, Dandy. <laughs> this woman is mine. I have the choice. Yeah, but the other is dead. And I chose the living. Hey, don't be a fool, Jack. 
We are brothers. We've sworn to share and share alike. With women, you said that would be inconvenient. Stand aside. I want this woman, and what I want, I take. Now, this time, my pistol is pointed back. You're drunk. You don't know what you're doing. Oh, yes, I do. This woman goes to me. Come on, my beauty. Wait! I go with the master. And that's me. You! Keep back. I'm not so drunk, Dandy Burgess. You see, as we go through this door, I do not turn my back to you. <laughs> Little man, you're too amusing. Be careful. You think to frighten me? The week I've spent aboard this ship has quite accustomed me to pirates, even the fearsome kind like Captain Gore. Of course, cabin boys like you. You'll drive me too far. Listen, wench. I tell you that until the night we took you from that English brig, Jack Gore was my dog, my slave. That I was master here alone. Possession of you has turned his head. So that now he tries to rule here in my place. If you will be master once again, why do you not take me from him? Ah. I go with the master. So you shall. And the master will be me. Hi, Dandy Burgess. Captain Burgess, you dog. <laughs> so you say. Captain Gore says to keep away from his woman. You, mistress, he bids come to his cabin. His cabin, the swine. Where is it? Always facing the door with pistol cups and ready. He seems unwilling to ever turn his back to you, uh, Captain Burgess. <laughs> Laugh. Laugh as you go to him, you. Always facing me. When tomorrow we enter Nassau Bay, I shall teach him to face always. Yet. See me not. <laughs> and you, Mistress Kate, will find I am the master. <laughs> so you, Captain Burgess, will deliver to me with evidence of their piracy for the high seas. Your former comrade? Yes, Governor Rogers. I will deliver them here in Nassau Bay and with evidence in plenty. For myself, I claim amnesty under His Majesty's wise pardon for those who repent their wrong and inform against the sinful. That I must grant you. It is the law. I hope you ask no other reward for putting these men within our grasp. Yeah, but I do. And make it part of our bargain. Ah, rest easy. It will not affect your treasury. There is a woman aboard that ship out there. I would place her in my care. And in her company, attend the hanging. You would attend the execution of the comrades you condemn? Not all of them. Only that of Captain Gore, my uh, particular friend. As the wind turns his body in its gallows chains, I would watch him face always and see me nowhere. And the court of accordingly past sentence that you, the said Jack Gore, be carried to prison from whence you came and from thence to the place of execution where you are to be hanged by the neck till you shall be dead. 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 And God have mercy on your soul. Dandy, you swore to be my friend, my brother. Come, Kate. Let's get out of here. Breathe the air. I go with the master. We are nearly at the crossroads where you say your buried treasure lies. I see the gibbet there. Aye, 
How stark and alone it stands by night. Our friend Jack, who was hanged upon it yesterday, will be grateful for our company. Hear the creaking chains he swings in. He seems to cry well. Now, wait, wait. Why do you stop? Now, let's go back. It's such dirty work to ply a spade. It goes against my grain to soil my hands. You want no one else in the secret of the treasure that you and he buried here so long ago? Oh, nay, but to dig for it at night in dark, it... The unaccustomed work, I cannot see. <laughs> I did not know my master's courage. I would think he was afraid. Oh, what have I to fear? Not man, surely. When in your pocket lies a pardon from the king. Nay, and I do not fear the dead. The air is very still. How plainly we can hear those rusty chains. It is like that other night. The night on which you swore by the gallows tree and death. And justice. For the brothers, confirming it inseparables. Share and share alike on earth and down in hell. I meant it when I swore that oath. I meant it though I laughed and mocked. It was all your fault I did this thing. <laughs> Ere he and I met you, we were his brothers. Jack was such a fool, a lout. My opposite, he... He amused me and... And admired me. My fearful master. A sentimental pipe. Scum! Can other men have feelings? In the lowest beast, can I not be one tiny bit of. God? I. I have not to do with God. Who are you who have sapped my strength and made me weak? My name is Kate. As I told you long ago. If that's all you've told me, what came you, woman? From the cabin of an English brig, some wicked pirate took a trap. Ye insolent wench, turn not your back on me and walk away. Did I turn my back? I forgot who I was with. You! How loud those chains grow now as the weight they bear swims in the wind. We are underneath his corpse. I did not realize we walked so fast. It seems to sense your presence. See his body begin to turn. You're so fearful to leave it back. It's no, don't say such things. Jack, Jack, go. Stop moving like that. You've done your bidding. He's your slave again. Your dog. Kate, in those eyeless sockets plucked by crows, I see a light. There may no light in dead men's eyes. No, 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 no. I know, but... Kate, there's a movement of that drooping jaw, as though it prepared itself for speech. There can be no speech from dead men's lips. I know that too, but... Kate, whence comes that singing? I think I do, dear son. The favorite song of the comrades he betrayed. Nay, 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 that cannot be. Kate, the chains that hold this corpse are stretching. Jack, that feet are on the ground. He's coming for me with dead arms outstretched. Jack, Jack Gore, for God's sake, keep away. Ah! Don't touch me with your cold, dead hands. Kate, Kate, help. He binds his chains about my neck. Don't let him lift me to that gallows. Don't let him lift me to that gallows. Ah! Fear and share alike. On earth. Or down in hell. Ah! Kate, but for this she brought me here. For death, I... I know who ye are now. Hear what I swore by. You... are... justice. had a notion that ideals sometimes walk the earth in human form. So maybe that girl was justice. And now, Satan, if these folks will just sit still, we'll be back in a minute 
and tell him about the 30 yards we're saving for him next week. <laughs> we'll say to him, instead of telling folks what we're going to let him see next week, just a little bit of them for themselves. Gaze into the embers of our fire. Gaze into the embers deep and listen. Robert, I hear footsteps. There's something in this room. No, 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 no. They can't be, Susie. You and me's alone here. No, we're not alone. Look at those shadows. Good Lord! It's a man without a head. Oh! <laughs> That's part of our yarn about Rockabye Baby. <laughs> Rockabye Baby. <laughs> G. Marshall. One of the perpetual mysteries in life is explored in a game of solitaire. During moments of reflection, haven't you sometimes wondered, what if I hadn't been there at that particular moment? Or what if I had been? What would have happened if I'd been there with someone else? Or if no one was there to help me? Would the same thing have happened under different circumstances? Or would everything be changed if... This is a game that is played in our mystery drama. Goodbye, Dave. Boy, am I glad to see you open your eyes. You mean hello, don't you? No. I heard what they said. What who said? I don't know. Those voices. They said I didn't have a prayer. <laughs> you dreamed it, my friend. You've been unconscious for hours. Where are we? In the base hospital. I'm going to die. Sure. We're all going to die someday. But not this time around. You just lie still, old buddy. You can tell me later how it feels to have my blood in your veins. mystery drama, Fateful Reunion, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elizabeth Kennel and stars Robert Dryden and Jennifer Harmon. Our opening scene took place more than 30 years ago when two very young draftees as members of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, were forcibly thrown together in the landing on that beach at Normandy. Since then, their bonds of friendship have never been broken. Now, middle-aged men, they have gone their separate ways. But over the years, one solemn promise has always been kept. No matter what's going on in their lives or where they are, they meet for a reunion on June 6th, D-Day. I thought I was a goner that time for sure. You saved my life, David. Blood saved your life. If it hadn't been mine, it would have been someone else's. Oh, but you were my buddy. Damn right I was. After you'd saved my life, hanging upside down with my parachute all tangled up in that tree, <laughs> I must have looked pretty funny. <laughs> you did. I thought you'd never find your pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> Raise the glass. Happy 31st reunion. Ah, Good Lord, Dave, what's happened to time? Can you believe that many years have gone by? In some ways, I can. An awful lot has happened. How things been going with you in this past year, Gary? Oh, can't complain. Lucy's a jewel, as always. Although I realize I won't have her much longer. <laughs> Nonsense. She and Doug will be living here in New York, won't they? Oh, speaking of New York, 
It was darn nice of you to make the trip here this year. Great for me, too. Chance to visit the big city, see my son. Hi, gentlemen. And your charming daughter. Uncle David. How good to see you. <laughs> oh, don't I get one, too? Of course, Dad. <laughs> Guess I'm supposed to say Happy D-Day, but I'm not going to. Oh, what's wrong with a couple of old army pals getting together? Everything. Now, don't knock it, Lucy. Without our yearly get-togethers, you, my dear daughter, would never have met a certain young man who happens to be my best friend's oh, son. I give up. Incidentally, where is my son? Oh, I meant to tell you. He's working late. I'm going to meet him at the office, and while you two are having your own party, we're going to one. But not in honor of D-Day. Well, I suppose other things did happen on this date. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like last year when Doug and I got engaged. But please stay right where you are while I get dressed. Before you take off, I want to use you as guinea pigs. <laughs> Lucy, what in the world are you doing in that weird get-up? <laughs> Can you guess what I'm supposed to be? Well, the headgear and all those... Beads make you look like a gypsy. Right. And what do you think I have under this striped scarf? Well, if you're a gypsy, it must be a crystal ball. Right again. <laughs> Voila! Why, oh, that's no crystal ball. It's a computer. Also correct. The 21st century's answer to the all-seeing eye of past, present, and future. Yeah, I'll bet. No, really. It's fabulous. Doug's been working on this for a long time. Well, I know he works on computers, but why all the gypsy stuff? Well, we're going to a fundraising thing where I'm supposed to tell fortunes. And believe me, our booth is going to bring in a million dollars. Well, I'll admit your costume is startling, but... Uh... Not the costume, Dad. This gadget. You've never seen anything like it. Looks like most calculators are small computers to me. Oh, but it's not. This is a truth machine. Oh, I see it has a tape. That's handy. Show us how it works. Well, I'll have to put on the big act. Ah, mighty computer. It is Madame Lucy who calls you. Reach into your fabulous brain and tell us true whatever we want to know. <laughs> Get a load of that phony act. Yes. <laughs> The gentleman to my right. Tell us his first name, color of his eyes, and the color of his hair. Take a look at that. Uh, uh, name, David. Mm -hmm. Eyes blue-green, color of hair gray. Uh, well, that's amazing. Uh, let's see that tape. <laughs> the gentleman to my left, first name color of eyes and color of hair, if you please. I'll be darned. Name, Gary. Color of eyes, Hazel. Hair, question mark? <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask that again. Color of his hair, if you please. <laughs> it's got your number, Gary. The tape says, the man is bald. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very funny. The whole thing's a frame-up. Obviously, Lucy's fed data into this machine. Honestly, Dad, I have no idea how it works. It just always comes up with the right answer. All right. Ask it where my home is, uh, what I do for a living. Oh, I know. My wife's name. I'll bet it can't answer that. The gentleman named David. Tell us, oh mighty one, what is his occupation? Where does he live? And what is the name of his wife? There you are. Mr. David is a bank president in Des Moines, Iowa. His wife's name is Jean. I'll be darned. It's quite a trick. Oh, I don't think there's any trick to it, Uncle David. This is different. It's your turn, Dad. Just try to stump it. Okay. Here's something that machine would never know. 
Ask it the license plate number of my car. What is the license plate number of my father's car? Uh, the tape says 892NYX. Is that right, Gary? Yeah, of course it's right. Now I know this is a frame-up. You and Douglas got together and fed it answers to all the usual questions any fool would ask. It'll be great at your party if you know everybody there. It isn't like that, Dad. Truly it isn't. Why, this computer can actually predict. Uh, no, not predict, but actually tell what will happen in the future. Uh-huh. All right, let's test its brain power on that score. Ask where our reunion will be held next year. Yeah, that's a good one. Mighty computer, where will Gary and David meet for their next D-Day reunion? Here, I'll tear off the tape. And you read it, Dave. What does it say? It says... There will be no reunion next year. Now I know it's a hoax. I don't understand. How can you say that? Well, I'm beginning to agree with you, Gary. Lucy, if you and Doug really didn't feed that computer bank, ask it why there will be no reunion next year. I will. What's the matter, Pat? Oh, it, well, it's come out all gibberish. The, the, the machine must have jammed or something. I'll, I'll have to ask Doug to unscramble it. Sounds mighty suspicious. I'll take that computer business up with my son tomorrow. Right now, can we drop you off in our cab? Uh, no, thanks. Uh, Doug won't be through for another hour. Oh, give me a big hug, both of you. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs> Well, you certainly have a complicated lock on that door. Oh, just security measures. We close up tight at 5.30. How are you, love? Miserable. Oh, what's that? Come on in for a minute. I don't want to go through with any more of that computer thing tonight. Honey, wait a minute. What's wrong? First of all, open the bag and take out the computer. All right. I hate that black devil. What? You hate this revolutionary piece of equipment which may have the potential of changing the course of the whole world? I don't think anyone should look into the future. You can't change something that's destined to happen. Well, the, who's talking about predestination? You put those answers into that box, didn't you, Doug? I helped put it together, if that's what you mean, but this particular computer is brand new. It goes way beyond anything I, I've ever worked on. But you do know how it works. Well, not exactly, no. That's why we're so excited. The damn thing actually seems to have a mind of its own. Doug, you must stop experimenting with this monstrous thing. Never. Lucy, I simply don't understand what's gotten into you. I... Hey, we've always been honest with one another, haven't we? I always thought so, up till now. Well, what's so different about now? Oh, I don't pretend to know anything about computers, but... I do know they can't think for themselves. No, not exactly. This computer was programmed to give certain answers, wasn't it? It was fed thousands of facts and figures by a team of researchers, but we have no control over the choices its mechanical mind will make. Don't you see how dangerous that is? No, I don't. Well, fortunately, our fathers both thought it was a hoax. Oh. Something happened when you used the computer today, didn't it? Didn't it? Oh, Doug... They wanted to know the answer to the question, where will they hold their reunion next year? <laughs> oh, those old soldiers, wouldn't they just... Don't laugh, Doug. You ask it that question. Go ahead, ask it. Okay, okay. Where will my dad and Lucy's dad hold their usual reunion next year? Go ahead, Doug. Read what it says. There will be no reunion next year. Huh. What do you know? Don't you see? They said it was a frame-up. They accused us of collusion to try and keep them from having a D-Day meeting. 
Did you do it, Doc? Lucy, I swear I had nothing to do with it. I... Oh, come on. There's nothing to get so upset about. Only there is. Because they asked one more question. And I got an answer which I refused to accept. All right. What was the question? You ask it. Go ahead. Ask the machine why there will be no reunion. Okay. Right. Please, God. The answer won't be the same as it was the last time. All right, all right, let's see. Oh, no. Oh, no. The tape says, because one of them will be dead. So now you know why Lucy was so upset when she crumpled the tape and pretended it was nothing but gibberish. Well, perhaps that's all it really was. Computers have been known to get things mixed up just the way people do. On the other hand, this computer may be right. One big difference between computers and people is the psychological effect an idea can have when it is implanted in the human brain. We'll learn more about that when I come back very soon with Act Two. A computer can be a very useful tool if you're trying to balance the books or solve an abstract problem. And the idea of a computer which could figure out human problems seemed like an innovation to be highly desired. But right now, a young technologist is confronted with a whole new aspect of the mechanical brain. It is unsettling to be told by a doctor, a, a fortune teller, or even by a robot that someone dear to you is going to die. You don't believe that, do you, Doug? I, uh, I, I, I don't want to believe it. Well, somebody must want to frighten us. Somebody who fed data into that machine. Honey, I keep telling you, this computer doesn't work like that. It has freedom of choice. Well, so do I. And I will not accept the word of a, a thinking machine. Our fathers are still young. It isn't as though one of them were ill or, or is in any kind of danger. Wait a minute. You're sure that neither your dad or mine saw what was on that tape? They saw the tape about no reunion. But I tore up the other one. Ah. The tape that said one of them would be dead... And, and pretended that there was no answer. But there was an answer. And that means now we have to ask another question. I don't want to hear anymore. Lucy, we have to. We must find out so maybe we can prevent it from happening. What question do you propose to ask? I have to ask the computer to tell us which one will die. I don't want to know. Well, I do. And I'm going to find out. Don't tell me. Please don't tell me. Well, look at that, will you? It's never done this before. Honey, please take your hands away from your ears and listen. It was all a mistake, wasn't it? I don't know. The tape says, I cannot tell you. There, you see. It is a hoax. No, 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 no. This computer is programmed to respond. I'll make it tell me. Come on, come on. Which one will it be? Which one? <laughs> Angry. No, I'm the one who's angry, and it better tell me this time. I, I guess you better tell me what it says. Huh. At least it apologized. Come on, Doug. Computers don't... The tape says, sorry, but I cannot answer your question. Well, then, if it can't answer that one, it can't answer anything. Uh-uh, that's not so. It's always given straight answers before you know it has. Sure. Or when it was fun and game. All right, maybe we're taking this too seriously. I could be wrong, you know, about what a computer can do. Oh, good Lord, look how late it is. We promised to raise some money for a good cause. Do you think I can still go through with it? Sure. I mean, just sidestep any serious questions. You know what I mean? Pretend it is just a trick if you have to. There may be a lot more to this machine than... than anyone has dreamed of. <laughs> Taxi? 
Taxi. You did say we're going to that place where the boots are good. I hope it's still good. Haven't been there for years. Hey, cab. Get in, Gary. Thanks. Hey, where to? Hey, you know the uh, restaurant Monsieur Henry's? Sure, a fancy French place, otherwise known as Mr. Henry's. Old times, coming back. He reminded me of someone. Yeah, who? Oh. That little French nurse. One with the big brown eyes. <laughs> Whatever made you think of her. Wait wait a minute. We're going in the wrong direction. He's taking us uptown. Can't prove it by me. I never know north from south in New York. Driver, where are you going? Well, you said Monsieur Henry's, didn't you? Yes, it's on 52nd Street. I never heard of it being there. The only one I know is on East 86th Street. Well, that's not where we want to go. Go back to 52nd between 5th and 6th. Well, you should have told me sooner, mister, but there's a two-way street coming up. Maybe I can uh, still make the light. Watch out for that truck! Well, we lived through another close one. Cheers. Cheers. (laughs) I think. If that trailer truck had been going any faster... Well, you were sitting on the bad side. Eh, could have been me, could have been you, or both of us. Yeah. You know, I got to thinking about that computer thing. So die. Could have been telling us there'd be no reunion this year. Well, here we are, though. So let's eat and count our blessings before this lucky day is over. <laughs> Madam Lucy, you were sensational. Uh, Not much thanks to your marvelous computer. When the tapes came out blank, I had to make up the answer. Well, you're a born fortune teller, that crazy computer. Almost as if it refused to operate because I'd insulted it. Okay, tomorrow, back to the drawing board. (laughs) Hey, I have an idea. Let's pick up our dads. They've had enough time to hash over the old war stuff. All right, do you know where they are? Turn here. They used to go to that French restaurant. Oh, what's the name? I think it's in the next block. Oh. You mean up there where all that crowd is? Why, yes. That's where it used to be. Oh, honey, I don't want to get mixed up in all that mess. I mean, it looks like police cars and and an ambulance. Oh, Doug. I have a terrible feeling. Drive up there. Well, honey, I I can't. Look at it. The block is jammed. That's their restaurant. And something's happened. Now, Luce, baby, take it easy. Can't you get any closer? With all those cars in front of us? The ambulance is pulling away. And there go the police cars. Look, Lucy, I think you picked the wrong block. That's no French restaurant. I know it. It says Club Shannon Door. Well, then, let's go on to your apartment, okay? No, Doug, we've got to find them. But if you don't remember where that restaurant is... I do remember. It was right here. The name's been changed, but this is the same place. We've got to go in and see if they're in there. It's all right, folks. Excitement's over. Enjoy your supper. Have a round of drinks on the house. Music for dancing until three. Ah, yes, sir. Table for two? Actually, we were just looking for some people. Lucy, I don't think they'd be in a place like this. Well, it's not the way it used to be, but you know how they are for going back to their old home. Okay, okay. There's another room out this way. And if you find your friends, we'll be glad to give you a big table. All right, thanks. This doesn't look like their kind of crowd, but uh, what if... Honey, look, let's get out of here, all right? Wait, that ambulance. What if it had something to do with them? Your imagination is running wild. Now, come on, let's go. Not yet. Uh, maybe you folks would like to stop at the bar? No, 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 thank you. But if you haven't been to the Club Shannon door before... Uh, you... What happened here before we came in? Oh, don't worry, lady. We were in a nice place here. It was just an unfortunate accident. It could have happened anywhere. Well, there was an ambulance. Someone must have been sick or, or had an accident. That was just his tough luck. Whose tough luck? A man got hurt. Uh, wait a minute. For you, lady. Somebody from the press? No, but I have to know who was hurt and where they've taken him. Well, how should I know? Come on, Lucy, let's go. No, it's important. We just want to make sure it had nothing to do with our, um, our friends, you know? Well, there were these two young fellows at a table over there. And I tell you the truth, I didn't like the looks of them from the time they come in. Well, see, now you can relax, Lucy. They were young fellows. Now, let's go over to the bar. Not till I find out some more. Lady, you must be an ambulance chaser. What a dreadful thing to say. I hate violence. Well, these two characters got violent. You mean they had a fight? They got in an argument. 
none of my business to know what it was about, but one of them picked up a steak knife. I guess I don't want to hear any more. Of course, I'm not sure he would have used it. That is, if the old guy hadn't interfered. What old guy? Oh, uh, well, maybe not old, but there were these two middle-aged men sitting at the next table. What did they look like? Oh, conservative-looking gentlemen. Nice, quiet customers. Go on. Well, Go you, on. You understand, I, I wasn't right there. I, I didn't see what actually took place. Not till somebody yelled, they were stabbed. Well, it seems these two older guys got very upset when they saw the young man waving a knife. So one of them jumped up and tried to stop him. Oh, no. Maybe it was a brave thing to do, but to my mind, it was pretty stupid. Well, wouldn't you have tried to stop him if you'd been standing there? No, I wouldn't have tried to knock the knife out of his hand the way that man did. Oh. But which one got hurt? And the young fella just sort of automatically slashed out at the older guy. Was he... Was he killed? No, he wasn't dead when they took him away, if that's what you want to know. Where have they taken him? Well, to a hospital, of course. Oh, I, w- I wouldn't know which one. And, and, and the other man? I mean, the one who was with him, where's he? The other older fellow went out with his friend. Oh. And the two young punks were hauled off by the police. Well, you must have the names of these people. Look, if you're not the police or the press, get off my back. You can read all about it tomorrow morning. Please, we just want to know for sure. Lady, I only work here. The proprietor's gone with the police to make a report. I tell you, I never saw any of these guys before. None of them are regulars. This man who was slashed, surely you know what he looked like. Sort of heavy set and bald. My father. We have to drive straight to the hospital. Honey, how can we? We don't know which hospital. Well, where's the nearest one? I haven't the slightest idea. Besides, that doesn't mean anything in New York. In emergencies, they go anywhere. Well, then, drive to the police station. I don't know where that is. Find it and hurry. Lucy, please. You've gone off the deep end. Well, how would you feel if it was your father? Oh, what an idiot thing to say. They're both so close to me, I'd be undone if anything happened to either one of them. But something has happened, Doug. I know it. Oh, honey, you've jumped to a big and frightening conclusion without any proof. Two men? One of them bald? Yes. There could be thousands out on the town. Where are you going? Oh, there's nothing we can do except get to a telephone and wait. Lucy seems so certain that something has happened to her father. Of course, she's been influenced by a suggestion of disaster, further enhanced by an evening of fortune-telling. It is true, as Doug said, that Lucy was jumping to a hasty conclusion. But when two old soldiers are commemorating D-Day, might they not be the first to come to the defense of someone who appeared about to become a victim of battle? We have another premonition to be shared with you presently when I return with Act Three. Many a mathematician has taken delight in relating our actions to the movements of pawns in a game of chess. The game we are playing might be compared to the thoughts of a wakeful chess player who, after spending an evening at the board, is tossing and turning as he replays the moves to himself and speculates, what if I had done this? Or what if I would moved in that direction? And right now, it's our turn to make the next move into the final act of our mystery drama. Oh, Doug... I hope we're doing the right thing. I can't bear to think... Give me your key, will you? Look, you will call the police right away, won't you? Just take it easy, Lucy. The way I see it, it was just a technical maneuver. Hey! Not at all. If you have a piece of paper, I'll draw a map and I'll show you. Dad! Uncle David! (laughs) Well... Good heavens, who'd you expect? Hi, Dad, Uncle Gary. Wow, are we glad to see you. (laughs) Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. Well, you... You're all right, aren't you, both of you? Well, of course we're all right. But how did you know about our accident? What? Accident? I'd call it more than that. The knife. Oh, 
Dad, why did you do it? What knife? Why did I do what? Well, the man in the restaurant said that they... What's the matter with you two kids? They told us at the Club Shenandoah. Club Shenandoah? Well, where's that? Gary, that's the place we didn't go to. Oh, the terrible-looking spot that used to be Monsieur Henry. Yes. Yes, weren't you there? That honky-tonk? We took one look and then found a nice quiet spot over on Madison Avenue. But, Dad, Uncle Gary did say something about an accident. Oh, a minor skirmish in a taxi cab. You weren't hurt. Well, I had a bloody nose. And I got a crick in my neck. But what's that to a couple of old war horses? Now, come on, you long-faced characters. This is an evening for celebration. It certainly is. <laughs> I think I'll hang these bells on that branch up there. Oh, I do love Christmas. And, Doug, when we have our own house... Ah, that's exactly what I was thinking, Lucy. And when is that going to be? Soon. But I had to be with Dad these past months with Mother gone, and especially at Christmas. I know, I know. You could have gone home. And it was nice of you to stay. Pop appreciates it. I wouldn't want to be anywhere except with you. Oh, let's set a date, Doug. Now you're talking. Got any specific date in mind? What else but June 6th? (laughs) How can we have a wedding on the one day our dads go off for their private reunion? Who said anything about a wedding? You mean you'll do it my way? No fanfare, just just a justice of the peace? Exactly. We'll make it our day, not theirs. Oh, honey, you are terrific. (laughs) Hello? Yes? Yes? Oh, no, where? Oh, but why shouldn't I be worried? Uh, of course, uh, of course, I'll be right there. Hey, what was that all about? It's Dad. He's in the hospital. But who were you talking to? What happened? Well, that was Dr. Daniels. He said not to worry, but Dad, he, he's had a heart attack and he's in St. John's Hospital. Oh, honey. He's going to die, Doug. I know he's going to die. Now, Lucy, stop that. I'm taking you to the hospital. Let's go. Now, promise you will sound cheerful, Lucy. You heard Dr. Daniels. I can't get it out of my mind. Now, forget your premonitions. Dr. Daniels said your dad is in better shape than either one of us, and that if he takes it easy, he can live to be a hundred. Okay. Dad? Well, come in, sweetie. I'm sorry to pull a stupid stunt like this on Christmas Eve. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Oh, Dad, how can you say that? Well, I guess I've just been working too hard. Doc says after a few days rest, I'll be back in top form. I'm going to stay here with you. Nonsense. From the looks of the nurses around here, I'm going to have a ball. Uh, Uncle Gary, I'm going to call my folks for Christmas. Shall I tell Dad that you're in the hospital? You tell him just one thing, my boy, that I'll see him on D-Day. Lucy. Lucy, where's your dad? Why, he's at work, of course. What are you doing here this time of day? I thought he might have heard the news before I did. Have you had the radio on? No, I've been vacuuming, doing my spring cleaning. I tried at every payphone along the way, but the lines were all tied up. Uh, let me use your phone, huh? Calm oh. down, Doug. What's the matter? A bomb. A bomb. They said it went off in the executive offices. What executive offices? What are you talking about? Oh, busy signals. Again, it's no use. I was out on the road. The report came through on the car radio. A bomb in Des Moines in Dad's bank. Not your father. Yes. Yes, I'm afraid so. But you don't know. What was the rest of the report? Oh, oh, look, I'll turn on the radio. No, please don't. I want to get it straight from the source. I tried the bank and the paper and the police. Didn't you call your home? How? How could I do that to Mother? Well, you must call her, Doug. Dial her direct right now. No, wait a minute. I've got another idea. Hello? Hello? Dad. Well, well, yes, on the car radio. I was out of the office. I've been trying desperately to reach you. Are you all right? Oh, thank God. Well, yes. 
yes, as long as you're okay. That's that's all that matters. Give him all my love. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Lucy sends love. Right, right. Okay, Dad, goodbye. Oh, boy. You see, you should have taken the advice you gave me. Don't jump to conclusions. Well, I know, but this was such a near thing, honey. He has a cold. Mom made him stay home today. He'd been trying to reach me to tell us not to worry. And he said to tell your dad he'd see him on D-Day. Well, old buddy, it's the 15th of May. And time for us to make some plans. You bet, Gary. (laughs) Where'll it be this time? Well, I'm for keeping the destination a secret. You mean from our ever-loving families? Mm Mm-hmm. Don't you agree? Sure do. How about getting away from all civilization? Oh, it suits me. Any ideas? Yep. I got a dandy. What about up at the lake? That Wisconsin fishing lodge where we went one summer. Hey, that's beautiful. But it's pretty inaccessible without a private plane. We'll get one. You still flaunting that pilot's license? You better believe. If you'll come more than halfway, we can rent a plane in Chicago. That's great. We better meet on the 5th, if you can get away. Nothing's going to stop me. I'll see you at the airport in Chicago about 10 o'clock that morning. Doug, you're just in time for lunch. One whole week of glorious vacation. And you know, I didn't tell a soul that we're getting married tomorrow. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody. At least of all our dads. Oh, Doug, I'll be so relieved when tomorrow's over. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, honey, I don't mean us. It's just that, well, once this reunion has passed, there'll be nothing to worry about. If you mean the computer, I've got plenty to worry about when I get back to the office. They're accusing me of breaking the darn thing. I hope it never works again. Uh, Lucy, love. Computers are the way I earn my, uh, our living. Not by turning them into fortune telling. No, not fortune telling, but a chance to open up the whole future so we'll know which way to go. Not if the future only lives... Uh, uh, Don't say it, Lucy. I'll admit the machine must have had some bugs in it. But ever since that day, the tape has come out blank. You were tampering, Doug. Trying to turn it into a human brain. Superhuman, you mean. That's what's so eerie. Some kinds of medicine are too strong to take. Honey, how can a computer know that? It can't, silly. This one did. It behaved as though we'd gone one step too far. Look, I'd like to forget it. Oh, so would I, at least for the next seven days. It's our time to celebrate. So, cheers. Oh, you sound like our dad. (laughs) Did your old man get off on schedule? Yes, early this morning before I was up. And still the big secret about where he was going? Yes, but I happen to know he had an airplane ticket to Chicago. Uh Uh-oh, you cheated. No one was supposed to know. But Chicago, I don't know. That seems like an odd place for them to have a reunion. Especially since he asked me to help him find his fishing rod. Well, lunch is ready. Come on. How about a little background music, huh? I'll turn on the radio. that you can always get a station with music. Well, all I ever get is... We bring you a special news bulletin. Uh Uh-oh. Shall I try again? No, leave it on. Let's eat. A report has just come in of the crash of a private plane in an Illinois wheat field. Details are not available at the moment, except that a farmer allegedly saw a small green plane flying low. Later heard an explosion. And now a fire is spreading rapidly over a section of his property... Out of control. Mm. Hey, this is it good, is Lucy. How'd you fix this chicken? Oh, it's a new Whether recipe. There are it's good, isn't it? Oh, it's great. I have just been handed an update on that plane crash. Checking with the Chicago airport, we have been told that a small green Cessna took off from there this morning. Yeah, you know, Dad used to have a green Cessna. A oh, but he hasn't had an airplane in years. Well, I know, but he's still flying. Lucy, to the scene of the accident this report is coming from Chicago. Oh, it couldn't. And here is still no, a report on the tragedy. We do not know the names of the victims, 
but it has been established that the plane had two occupants. Oh. The pilot, who was known to airport officials as the flying banker from Des Moines, oh. and a male passenger. Oh, Lucy. Repeat. Oh, the pilot, course. who was known to airport they officials were going to as that the flying banker from Des Moines, in Wisconsin. and a male passenger. We will bring you further developments as received by the newsroom. It is assumed that both men have perished. Dear God. Oh, no, this time it really happened. There can't possibly be any doubt. And absolutely no way that we can help them. That damn computer. It knew. It knew, you see. It knew there would be no reunion. But I'm glad it was wrong. Now will you believe that computers don't know everything? It was right, Lucy. It said... It that... said one of them would die. But both of them? It's... It's better this way. Better? Well, they were closer than brothers. And after all they went through together over the years. Yes. Yes, I suppose... I suppose if they'd had their choice, it's... Is what they would have wanted. We interrupt again to bring you further information on that plane crash in Illinois. Names will not be released until after the next of kin have been notified. But our report goes on to say that incredible as it seems, there is one survivor. <gasps> Which one? Ah, but that is not our story. Two men met in a moment of violence when either could have died, but both were spared that time until finally, for one, came the inevitable. Why is an accident fatal to this person while that one is spared? Some say predestination. But how many times it seems that a whim of fate makes a split-second change of direction if... Tragedy? No. But mystery? Yes. The mystery of the universe. I'll be back in a moment. Here's why experienced drivers feel so much better with State Farm. When you're into your 50s or 60s, you've been driving long enough, been in enough tough spots. You know just what you want from a car insurance company. You want an agent who's there to give you plenty of personal service. When you run into trouble, you want claims people who handle things fast and fair. You want a sense of security. That's why you came to State Farm. That's why you're going to stay. And like a good neighbor, State Farm. What happens when you compress 48 hours of real life into one explosive hour of television? Are you crazy? He's a crack I will kill you. The hurricane name. I've got nothing. This is unbelievable. We sold her America. I hit my mother. You don't treat a human being like that. What will the next 48 hours be like? Find out. Watch 48 Hours, Thursdays at 8, 7 Central and Mountain on the CBS Television Network. You always know when it's CBS News. If you have not yet prepared your will, please listen carefully. Without a will, the laws of the state and not you will determine who receives your property and in what amounts. Who manages the affairs of your estate? Your choice as guardian of your minor children may never be known. Your loved ones could face unnecessary legal costs and needless court delays. Now, for only $12.95, you can make your own will quickly and safely with the American Will Kit. You'll receive simple fill-in-the-blank will forms with easy-to-follow directions. The forms were prepared by lawyers to be valid in all 50 states. Order now, and you'll also receive, free of charge, our easy-reading personal protection guide, giving you important tips and special information that can save you money. Now is the time to take advantage of this special mail order opportunity. To order, call toll-free 1-800-542-1212. Only $12.95 plus shipping. That's 1-800-542-1212. Money back if not satisfied. Call now, 1-800-542-1212. Some 
some predictions turn out to be true. But it has never been proved that this is anything but happenstance. So I urge you to refrain from looking into a clouded crystal ball and look forward to a long and happy life. For no one, not even a scientifically programmed computer, can cope in advance with an unanswerable question. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Jennifer Harmon, Ken Harvey, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Howdy, this is Steve Allen. How would you feel if you found out you had colon cancer? Depressed? Scared? Well, I'll tell you how I felt. I was really annoyed. Honestly, I felt, I, I'm too busy. I don't have time to have colon cancer. But I was lucky. It was detected early. And when colon cancer is treated early, it's 90% curable. Believe me, I wouldn't be here now if that weren't true. Unfortunately, over 60,000 men and women die each year because sometimes there are no outward symptoms. And by the time there are, it can be too late. So if you're over 40, ask your doctor for a routine colon cancer exam. And please call the American Cancer Society for more information at 1-800-ACS-2345. 1-800-ACS-2345. Make the time to do it. Because getting colon cancer may be annoying, but dying, oh, that'll really make you mad. A public service message of the Ad Council and the American Cancer Society. All news. All the time. News Radio 95. WWJ, Detroit. CBS News. I'm Mike Pulsifer. One person is missing after a government helicopter crashed in the Atlantic off Florida while chasing a boat suspected of hauling drugs. Four customs agents and two Bahamian police officers were on board the chopper. Five of them are accounted for and reportedly have no serious injuries. One of the customs agents is the object of a search, and a customs spokesman in Miami says searchers are optimistic the man will be found. The Senate has voted in favor of a measure that could lead to restoration of former National Security Council aide Oliver North's military pension. The vote was on a bill that would end a provision of a law against destroying federal documents. That element of the law was the basis for... Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is the haunting hour. In the dark. Midnight. Midnight in the metropolis. Town of a thousand moods and contrasts. Of wealth and lightness and laughter of poverty, heartbreak, and tears, of shadowy people and dark, dark things. Big city, hard-boiled and tender, weak and mean and cheap without dignity, and great and proud and powerful. And the metropolis at midnight, filled with the high spirits of joy-seekers, Revelers who give way to the goodness of living or try to forget the badness of living. Midnight that is brooding, sinister. The sounds of the big city at midnight, the squeaks and roars of taxicabs, the rumble of trucks, the moan of river boats, and underground, the subway, and under and above, the sounds of the people. Shrill, ribald, 
futile. But there is quiet, too, in the teeming city at midnight. The quiet that is broken by the wail of a child, the rattle of a snore, or, as in the home of Earl Breton, a private detective, and his partner, Owen Bailey, called the professor, the telephone rings, and the professor answers it. Hello? Earl Breton? No, this is Mr. Bailey, Breton's partner. Who's calling? This is Bill Henderson. Is Earl there? Uh, just a moment. It's Bill Henderson, Earl. Do you want to talk to him? Bill Henderson? What does that crooked politician want? Sounds very anxious. Well, that's too bad. Tell him I'm very busy. I got to go to sleep. Hello, Mr. Henderson. Yeah? I'm sorry, but Mr. Breton is not in... Bailey. If Earl doesn't talk to me, he may be responsible for my death. I can't possibly see how that... Let me have the phone, Professor. Hello, Henderson. Is you, Earl? Yeah, what's on your mind? I got to see you right away, Earl. Can you meet me down at your office? Office hours are from 10 to 2, Henderson. You know that. I'll see you tomorrow. No, wait, Earl, wait. I tell you, you got to see me tonight. Now, look, I can't wait until tomorrow. Because I may never get there tomorrow. How do you figure? I can't explain it on the phone. But I know what I'm talking about. i got to see you tonight. Got it. Uh, where are you now? I'm at my house. Okay. Give me a few minutes to get a cup of something warm. I'll meet you down at the office. Oh, thanks a million, Earl. Never mind the thanks. Bring some money with you. Don't worry about that, Earl. This is worth anything to me. Goodbye. What seems to be his trouble, Earl? Well, he's probably swindled one guy too many. Good. What do you mean, good? I mean, he picked a good time for it. We can very well use the money, you know. Well, you can start drawing the bill now, Professor. And remember, after office hours, it's triple usual. Here comes the elevator now, Earl. If we ever make enough dough, Professor, remind me to move out of this broken-down building. All buildings are pretty much alike at this hour of night. How do they expect one old guy to take care of this whole thing by himself? He manages if you don't rush him. Yeah. The devil has got his finger on it. Uh, It's you, Mr. Britton. Faith, you'll never be known as a patient man. I hate waiting for elevators, old-timer. Good evening, Mr. Bailey. Good evening. You've got lots to do around here, haven't you? Sure, sure. I've got to make the rounds, you know. How's business? Oh, very slow, Mr. Britton. You're the only two people I've seen all night. Hey, it's pitch black out here, isn't it? Uh, you want me to put the hall lights on? Don't bother, old timer. We'll make it. It might help if you throw your flashlight beam down the hall. Oh, sure thing. Yeah. Uh, how's this? That's fine. Here. I've got the key, Earl. Right. Ah, uh, thanks, old timer. We're okay now. Uh, I'll be seeing you on the way down. Now, if I can just find the switch. Uh, oh, here. What's the matter with the light? Looks like the switch don't work. It's working all right when I left this evening. Where to find the desk lamp? Find it, Earl? Yeah, yeah. You didn't take the bulb out of this lamp, did you, Professor? Of course not. I've got an idea, Professor, that we have company. You're a very smart chap, Breton. Who's that? Just stay where you are, both of you, and don't ask any questions. Mr. Breton knows that those lights are not out by accident, but if either of you makes a false move, there could be one. What are you looking for? Information. And why keep us in the dark? There's enough light for me from that street lamp shining in your window. I can see you both. What do you want to know? I understand, Breton, that you got some new dope on the Kennedy murder. Am I right? Kennedy murder? Why, the police gave Kennedy up as a suicide five years ago. But would I be... Stay where you are, Breton. I told you I can see. Yeah, yeah, sure. Seems kind of... Yeah, I guess our visit is a little touchy, Professor. You didn't believe that I could see you. Next time, I won't miss. Now, give it to me straight. I told you I don't like the smell of a body that's been buried five years, and I ain't digging it up. Now, what else do you want? Mr. Breton, are you in there? Don't make a move. Mr. Breton, 
Hey, Mr. Bailey, uh, whatever happened to you? <laughs> okay, I hope you get a big kick out of beating up a helpless old guy. That was very tough. Very. Duck, Professor, I better... What happened, Earl? Where are you? Right over here where that voice was coming from, and he's not here. Maybe he moved over to another corner of the room. Duck behind something, Professor. I'm going to light a match. <laughs> Careful now, Earl. Well, I'll be there's nobody here. Who, who's that lying in the doorway? Wait a minute. Looks like the old timer. Here's his flashlight. I'll turn it on. Hmm. Put him in this chair, Earl. Ah, uh, no, it's too late, Professor. He's dead. Dead? That dirty rat killing a sweet, harmless old man. Hmm. Wait, well, what's this here on the floor? Let me see. Hotel it. key. Uh, Hotel Markham, room 517. Think that fell out of the old man's pocket? No, no, that's a mobster's hotel. It's full of gamblers and racket men. Then that means if we go to room 517, we ought to be able to find out the man who did this. You don't find anybody in that hotel. You smoke them out. Besides, that key might have been stolen just so somebody could plant it here. Don't you see that? Then how are we going to know? The voice, Professor. I'll never forget that voice. I'm promising the old man now that I'll find it. Well... What do we do, Oil? You go find Henderson and tell him we won't be able to see him tonight. I'm going to the Hotel Markham. Meet me there as soon as you're through. In front of the hotel. And what about the old man? On our way out, we'll ring the night alarm. That'll bring the police. But aren't we going to tell them what happened? Right now, Professor, we don't know any more than they do. Come on, let's go. <laughs> can do? Oh. Hello, Breton. How's the hotel business? Oh, we don't complain. Uh-huh. And uh, who's up in room 517? I want to know. I understand there's a game going on. So? So, I'd like to get in. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Sparrow ran to the room. Maybe you know him. That's all I wanted to hear. You can tell my good friend, Mr. Sparrow, I'm coming right up. Don't worry. I will. Oh. Now, by the way, I hear there's a shortage of keys. Do you still lose many of them? Certainly we do. Every day. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, look who's here, fellas. My old pal, Earl Breton. How are you, Sparrow? Fine, fine. Come on in. How's the game? Pretty good. You want to take a hand? Yeah, maybe. How long you been playing? Oh, about 12 hours. Now, meet the boys. All right, fellas. This is Dan Huber. He's new in this town. Yeah? Didn't take you long to find this place, did it, Dan? Me? I got a nose for this stuff. <laughs> yes. And you know Harry Jackson, Earl, don't you? Sure, I know Harry. How are you, Harry? Fine. What did you say, Harry? I said I'm fine. That's what I said. Uh huh. Sure. Now this is Willie Garvin, and over oh, here. That's a funny name, Willie. What's funny about it? How do you spell it? G a r b i n. Why? Does it sound familiar? Uh, no, uh, Willie, no. And I don't have to introduce you to my partner, Joe Murray, huh? Hello, Joe. Hello. Funny to find you and Sparrow in the same game, Joe. What's funny about that? <laughs> Well, after all, you and Sparrow are partners, aren't you? Know what he said for you, Breton, and if you don't like what goes on here, you can shove off. Come Get on, it? Earl. When are you going to stop burning up Joe? <laughs> Anyhow, he just came in a few minutes ago. So we really just started playing together. Oh, just came in a few minutes ago. Where were you, Joe? Since when do I report to you? <laughs> well, I'm just curious, that's all. I told you before, Breton, I don't like coppers, and that still goes. Now, let's get the game going. Well, Earl, you taking a hand? Sure, sure, but... Uh... First, I gotta get the professor. He's got my dough. I'll be back in a few Wait minutes. a minute, Breton. What are you trying to pull? Why didn't you bring your dough in the first place? I just wanted to see who was in the game. Oh, sure, Joe. He's got a right to know. Go ahead, Earl. Get your dough. Oh, but uh, don't forget to come back, huh? Otherwise, it wouldn't look so good, huh? Sure, don't worry. I'll be back. <laughs> You've been waiting, Professor. I just got here. Did you find out anything? No, not a thing. I listened to every voice up there. Not one of them was the right one. How about you? Did you see Henderson? Yeah, that is, I didn't see him, but I found out about him. 
What do you mean, found out about him? Well, when I got there, Earl, there were a lot of people outside the house, and the police were there. Police? What happened? Anderson was murdered. <laughs> It was midnight when the phone rang in the home of Earl Breton, a private detective. A man named Henderson was calling. Henderson, a crooked politician who insisted he was in danger of being killed and that he had to see Breton immediately. Earl agreed to meet him in his office. But when he and his partner, the professor, arrived a few minutes later, they were faced with a peculiar situation. The lights in the office wouldn't work. And before they could investigate, a voice challenged them from the darkness. Their unknown visitor fired at them, purposely missing, in order to warn them that he meant business. The sound of the gun attracted the attention of the night watchman. He came to investigate and was killed by the intruder, who disappeared, leaving Earl with the old man's body and a clue. The key to room 517 at the Hotel Markham. They rang the police alarm and Earl sent the professor to intercept Henderson to break the appointment they had with him. Then he went to the hotel to room 517, where he expected to find the killer. He interrupted a card game, but Spiro, the gangster who was registered in 517, invited Earl to sit in, much to the displeasure of his partner, Joe Murray. Breton accepted, promising to return soon. He went down to the street where the professor was waiting. The professor had news for him. Henderson had been murdered. How did you find out he was murdered, Professor? I overheard two policemen talking to one another. Did the cops know you were there? Oh, no. We wouldn't want them to know we was interested, would we? Good for you, Professor. But now that I think of it, Earl, shouldn't we tell the police what we know? Well, that's a good idea, except that we don't know anything. They can't find out for themselves. But they don't know that Henderson called us to meet him at the office. And then when we got there, we met somebody else. And it was that somebody else who killed the night watchman. I know there's some connection between those two things, Professor. In fact, if I didn't know Henderson's voice so well... You'd say that it was the man at the office who imitated it? Sure, that's an old trick. A man disguises his voice to sound like... Hey, just a minute, Professor. Why couldn't it be... You mean you actually think that the man we met in the office was the one who called us earlier and he imitated Henderson's voice? No, no, no. That'd be too obvious. The killer's much cleverer than that. But you do think he had something to do with both of the murders? Certainly. If he didn't, how would he know that we were coming down to the office at midnight? He was expecting us. So he must have been with Henderson at the time Henderson called us. If you don't mind my saying so, Earl, it doesn't make sense. Why should this man have bothered to come down to our office just to ask us about some murder case that was over and forgotten five years ago? That's just it, Professor. He didn't want that information at all. That was just to throw us off the track. That was why he left the key there when he slugged the old man and disappeared. You mean he actually wanted us to follow him here to the Hotel Markham? Don't you see he was trying to establish the alibi that he was playing cards in this hotel at the time of the murder? And he could force us to testify as police witnesses that we saw him here. Then why don't we tell that to the police? Oh, Professor, you're slipping. You know the police don't want ideas. They've got their own. Besides, if we don't know whose voice we heard, what can we tell them? Well, at least we can tell them that it was somebody who's up in that hotel room now. Sure, sure. But can we prove it? Mm, I guess not. Well, then what can we do? we got to go upstairs and find out who that phony voice belongs to. But our life can be very short in a place like this. I mean, I'm not thinking about me. I know, Professor, I know. But I made a promise to that old watchman that I'd find the guy who killed him, and I like to keep a promise. But, uh, we ain't got enough money to play cards with those people. They don't know that. Well, I don't think it should take them more than one hand to find out. All right, then you'll have to stall. Now, one of those guys up there has a phony... British voice. So? Uh, listen. Stay where you are, Breton. I told you, I can see. How's that? If I wasn't looking at you, I'd swear it was the guy in the room. Good, good. That's all I wanted to know. I knew you'd keep your promise to come back, Earl. Oh, why not? 
This is my night, Sparrow. Well, come on, take a chair. I think I'll let the professor play for me. I do much better when I'm looking over his shoulder. Suit yourself. Let's get going. You're holding up the game. How many chips, Professor? Oh, well, uh, uh, that's up to Earl. Chips? Why, um, uh, what do you say we start off with $10 worth, Professor? I got a hunch. I, um, I guess that's all right. Wait a minute. Who are you kidding, Breton? Since when do you figure you can get in on this game for 10 bucks? That's just a starter, Joe. I always like to play hunches. But you've got more than that, haven't you, Earl? <laughs> you know better than to ask me that, Sparrow. Yeah? Let's see. Okay, deal him out. Joe, if I didn't know that you just came into this game a little while ago, I'd figure that you were losing plenty. Why? Ah, oh, you're so touchy. I open. Five bucks. Uh, raise your ten. I'm out. Well, playing it safe, Professor. I'd rather not explain my game. Maybe if Joe played it safer, he wouldn't be so worried all the time. Oh, Joe. Joe's got lots on his mind. I don't know, Sparrow. You're Joe's partner. You never seem to worry like he does. What do you mean, worry? Who says I'm worried? I'm just careful, it's all. I don't trust nobody, see? Nobody? You mean not even Sparrow, your own partner? I said nobody. Oh, Joe thinks maybe I talk too much. That's right. I didn't hear you say anything out of place, Sparrow. <laughs> he thinks I made a mistake telling you he, he just came into the game a little while ago. I told you to shut up, Sparrow. Oh, come on, Joe. You don't have to be afraid of Earl Breton. He's a cop, and I told you don't have to know nothing. He wouldn't repeat anything he heard up here, would you, Earl? I always play it safe. <laughs> I think you're all right, Earl. Ah, uh, mind if I stand up? Where are you going? I just want to walk around a little bit, stretch my legs. Uh, just don't go looking at any hands. Okay. I'll stand over here by the wall. You're going to let the professor play by himself? Sure. Hey, this is a very interesting electric light switch. You guys don't cut the chatter, I'll blow this game off. Hey, hey wait a minute. Who put those lights out? Put the lights on. What are you getting so crazy about, Joe? You act as if you just murdered someone. Put up the lights, I said quick. I'm sorry, Joe. That was my mistake. I didn't know the light switched off this way. Shut up. And you, Sparrow. What was the idea saying I murdered someone? What are you talking about, Joe? I didn't say anything. Don't give me that stuff. I heard you. You can't fool me with that phony voice you put on. I told you. I didn't say anything. Oh, yeah? Well, I happen to know that nobody else but you talks that way. Why did you dope? Did you know that wasn't my voice? Sparrow, if you're trying to pull anything... Okay, okay, Joe. Sparrow's right. Now, don't get sore. It was my fault. I didn't know. That ain't the point, Breton. I want to know what he's trying to pull. And it ain't none of your business, copper. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry. It was my voice you heard, Joe. What? Are you? All right, what's the game, Brett? No game, Joe. Just a joke, that's all. Sure, Joe, just a joke. Very funny, too. Can't you take a joke, Joe? Ah, uh, nuts. All right, Breton. If you want to stay in this game, get up some real dough or beat it. Okay, okay, I'll come clean with you. That's all the dough we got with us right now. If you let me go in the next room and make a call, I'll get some sent up here right away. Why, sure, sure. You want to use the phone, huh? Yes, it's right in the next room. Thanks, Sparrow. This is the desk. Hello. Get me Spring 73100. Spring 73100? Right. Who are you kidding? That's police headquarters. Say, have you got any complaints to make? Hold on there. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What goes on here? It's one of your keys. Oh, hello, Sparrow. I, um, uh, I can't say much for your phone service. No? What's the matter with it? They, um, they wouldn't get a number for me. I see. Who you're calling is so important. The police. I, I, uh, I guess I can wait. Well... Yeah. Say, I'm glad you came in here, Breton. I uh, wanted to have a little talk with you alone. You wouldn't use that revolver right here in this room, would you? Wouldn't I? You know, I can do pretty much as I want to in this hotel. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But if you killed me now, wouldn't you have to tell Joe why you did it? Well, what do you mean? I mean, wouldn't you have to tell him that you were tired of being partners with him and Henderson? That you wanted the whole racket for yourself? So that you killed Henderson, trying to make it look as though Joe did it so he could take the rap? <laughs> uh, if you're trying to talk loud so Joe will hear you, I might as well tell you, he just left. Ah. Well, at least I found out it was you who slugged the night watchman in my building tonight. So what? 
trust that you killed him, that's all. Mm, he shouldn't have gotten away. Then you're admitting that you killed Henderson and the watchman. Only to you, Breton. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to make sure that you'll never be able to tell it to the cops. See? I don't have to tell them, Sparrow. They know about it already. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you gave them all this information before you came up here. No, I didn't tell them. You did. You know something, Breton? I'm beginning to think you're a little bit nuts. I suppose you wouldn't believe me if I told you the police are listening to you right now? They heard you admit all this to me? Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me you hid them in my closet. No, no. But they're right outside in that room where we were just playing cards. You're crazy. Why don't you take a look? Because I ain't dumb enough to turn my back on you. Then that makes it easy for them to come in. Drop the gun, Sparrow. Give it here. What? It is the cops. But We heard the whole thing outside, Benton. Pretty smart. But how did you get the cops up here? I didn't get them, Sparrow. You did. Cut it out, Breton. It's true. You know the best way to bring the police is to leave a hotel key next to a dead man, and that's what you did. Yeah, but you picked it up. Not me. I just made a mental note of it, that's all. What puzzles me, Earl, is how you know the police were out here when you made Sparrow talk. Ah, that was easy. When I tried to put through a call before, I heard a voice at the switchboard asking about a key. And I just played a hunch. Now, I'm glad we got here in time. Come along, Sparrow. Well, Professor, let's go home. Yes, sir. Oh, and look, if our phone rings again tonight, mm -hmm. don't answer it. Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Threshold. I can't get this bloody door open. Even we got lost. I know perfectly well where we are. Here's another match, dear. Can you see them, Doctor? Yes, I can see them, lost. The key just doesn't fit. From Vancouver, welcome to the Mystery Theater. I guess I broke the lock. Oh, oh well, it's only the back door lock. Oh, no. Oh, no, Philly, stop it. Put me down. You're such an idiot. Well, I thought you wanted to be carried over the threshold. Well, not now when I'm all soggy. Oh, I thought you'd never get that door open. Here we are. Oh, well, it's good to be inside anyway. Welcome to your new home. Oh, thanks loads, but I can't see a thing. Mr. Lightning, what a nice kitchen. Hey, what did you do with those matches? In my pocket. Well, we'll get some lights on and maybe I can get a fire going in the fireplace. Here they are. Where are you? Oh, I'm longing to see everything. Here's the light switch. Nothing. Oh, how disappointing. They surely wouldn't have taken out the light bulb. Angelica! Just a minute, darling. What's this door here? Mm. Oh, I don't know. The handle's sort of stuck. It won't. It won't. 
What do you mean you don't know? Well, I mean I don't remember. Here, let me see. Philip, I'm oh. beginning to think you bought this house without even oh. looking at it. Well, there are things all over the shop. And... Tell me honestly, you're not up to anything, are you? There, oh. oh, at last. What do you mean up to anything? You seem somehow guilty. Well, now, look here, Angelica. I thought I went over every inch, but I... Well, I guess I must have missed this room. Oh. Can't seem to find the light switch. Dark. Even when the lightning flashes, the shutters must be drawn. Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> oh, Philip! They've forgotten to take the furnishings. I don't believe it. What do you mean you don't believe it? You can see the furniture, can't you? Oh, it's simply lovely. Oh, what I mean is people don't move out of a place and leave a room with everything just as it was. Well, like this. Well, maybe they had professional movers come and pack everything, and like me, they somehow didn't notice this room. Angie, what are you doing? Nothing. Why yell? I just wanted to open the window and let some air in. No. But it's so musty. Don't touch. Look, darling, we're not children anymore, you know. Let me remind you that we're grown up and married now. And this is our home which we're going to live in and I'll touch anything I damn well please. Come on out. Why? Because they've left all this stuff in here, that's why. But well, that's not my fault. Angie. Oh, all right, I'm coming. I think you're a pig. Look. You see this writing desk? Oh, isn't it exquisite? Yes, but you see. With about three inches of dust on it. Oh, Philip, it's... Well, it's weird, isn't it? It looks as if nobody's been here for ages. Well, somebody has been in here, and rather recently, too. Look, there, in the dust of the carpet. You see? Well, your heels go across to the window. Uh-huh. Now, look. Going to the bed, you see? Oh, yes. Oh, with large feet, you have, Grandfather. <laughs> well, anyway, the bed can't be dusty with the curtains drawn. Yes, and you see here? Footsteps go back to the door, but they're not nearly so noticeable. Yeah, what are you doing? I'm just drawing back the curtains. <laughs> Whatever's the matter with you? Oh, what are you laughing at? You brute. Philip, that wasn't funny. Oh, I shall never speak to you again if you deliberately set up this whole show just to terrify me. You've always had a grisly sense of humor, even as a child. <laughs> Stop laughing. Well, I'm not laughing. I'm giggling nervously. There's a vast difference. The fact is, this whole thing's beginning to get on my nerves. You've no idea how funny you looked. One instant, your head's poked in behind the curtain, and the next instant, you're halfway across the room. Now, look here, old girl. You better sit down. Now, you feel fed. Are you, are you trying to tell me that, that you didn't plant the... The mannequin or doll or wax work in it or scare me? Oh, of course not. Now, look here, Angelica. Just because I once put an extremely small baby octopus in your bed when you were very young, an absolute pest, I might add, there's no reason why you should go... What mannequin? Look for yourself. Hmm? Oh, my God. Oh, well, it is a bit of a shock, isn't it? Let's get out of this stupid room and go and phone the ghouls who used to own this place and tell them to come and get the remains out of here. Oh, we can also offer to sue them. I could have died of shock. Mains is right. This isn't a mannequin. It's a very nicely prepared for viewing corpse. False eyelashes and all. You, you, you mean it's a, a, a body? A person? What? Dead woman! Oh, oh, oh. Don't clutch me like that. What have we done? What have we got to do? Why did we ever buy this place? Why didn't you notice this stupid room? Obviously, because I wasn't meant to notice it. Oh. Now pull yourself together. Oh. Oh. Where's that phone? Eh? Oh, come on. Oh. We're calling the police and getting to the bottom of this. Now hurry up. Very well, but don't be posh. Oh. oh, did you have to bang the door? Where are you going? The library's this way. Oh, really, Philip, you don't know. You it. told me to check the basement for dampness, the plaster for cracks, and the floor for creaks. Well, you didn't say a word about secret rooms and corpses. Sorry. Hmm. 
Operator? Here, get me the police. Is that our car in the driveway? What do you mean? Of course our car's in the driveway. No, no listen. I mean that, that... That motor going in the driveway. Oh, uh, hello, please. Yes, this is uh, Philip Scott of number 12 Reading Place. What? Yes, I know, but I... I... Yes, yes, we, we bought number 12 Reading Place. Well, I think they took off rather suddenly for Australia. I bought the place from them, and uh, we want... Philip, Philip, hmm? there's a car I've just driven up to the front. What are we going to do? Look, officer, I want to report a dead body on the premises and to ask you to please come out here as quickly as you can. Philip, Philip, someone's coming very stealthily up to the front door. I peeked out and saw them. Well, don't attract attention. We don't want anyone coming in now. Just lie low. Well... Yes, officer, hmm? Well, if you could send someone to investigate it. Yes, it would appear to be foul play. Well, well I guess not really, but it's very strange to say the least. Helen, it is. Unlock the front door and walk right in. Yes, officer, we'll be here. Give me that phone. Oh. Officer, officer, this is Mrs. Scott. I wish you would hurry. Two very horrible-looking men have just broken into our house without a buy or leave. And... Oh, they're coming in here. Oh, please come quickly. I'd like to know where they got a key that fits. Oh, I certainly didn't. Now, Philip, stay perfectly still. Maybe they'll just go away. Not on your life. This is my home, even if I haven't moved in yet. And I don't mean to have someone bust in like that. Well, I don't like the look of them, Philip. There's all the more reason why I should ask them to leave. Now, where are they? I can see a beam of light coming from the kitchen. Oh, Chief, the master switch is back at the stove. Oh, is that where the hell it is? Chief... The back door's ajar. Well, get it closed, man. Keep your light down. What's that car doing out there, beast? Oh, I didn't notice it, sir. It's pitch black out there. Beast, in that lightning flash, I made out a 68 cream Lotus Elan hardtop convertible with disappearing headlights. Left and right fog lamps, red upholstery, breakaway steering, and green and red sports stripes. License number QT-77198. White wall tires, and oh yes, there's a slight scratch under the left door handle, Beast. He spotted our car. Did you hear what he called him? Beast. I don't give a damn what he called him. A man's home is his castle. Philip, are you mad? Don't go near. What the hell do you think you're doing, breaking into my house like this? Breaking into your house? Is that your car out there? Yes, it is. Beast, pull the master switch. But don't turn on any of the lights. I want it dark, 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 Beast. Ah. Somebody's turned on every light in the house. We're lit up like a Christmas tree. Get it off. Get it off. You want to power up everything? Take it easy, Chief. There, there. Sit down. It's nice and dark now. Or make a thorough check of the place and make sure that doesn't happen again. But first, Beast, check the room. I'll have to use me lights, uh, sorry. Ah, oh, madam. Oh. The lie of the bones fascinates me. Oh, you have beautiful mandibles. Yes. How dare you? Yes, how dare you? Get out of here, oh. both of you. My wife's mandibles are nothing to you. Surely a professional interest, I assure you, You sir. must forgive him, madam. Beast is an ex-undertaker. Good bone structure is, you might say, a hobby. Beast, the room. Yes, Chief. Oh, how horrible. May I ask, madam, how long you've been here? An hour. Five minutes. Uh, an hour and five minutes, I think. No. No, no. Uh, he means, it, it seems like an hour. We had a bit of difficulty finding the powers, but you know, and, uh, um, well, well, you see, we bought the property, uh, sight unseen. Well, not exactly. Uh, you didn't see uh, it before today, Angelica, uh, but I certainly yes, did. Yes, my husband inspected the garden, and, yes. uh, now, well, if you'll excuse us, we'll be on our way. Come uh, on, Philip. Now, uh, now, see here, Angelica. I'm not leaving here without an explanation. We paid a great deal of money for this house, and I'm not going out of here, leaving perfect strangers rattling around with a key to the front door that works when we were forced to break in the back way. Now, who are you and what are you doing here? Hold on. Hold on. You say you've bought this property. What name? Scott. My name's Scott. And yours? And I presume this is Mrs. Scott? Yes. Now, who the hell are you? Mr. Scott and madam. You've heard the old saying that the murderer always returns to the scene of the crime. Oh, dear. Oh, yes, yes. Is that why you two are here? Exactly. Oh, dear. Yes. 
Now, the point is, why are you here? I've already told Be you. Be careful, Phil. You've told me that you are the owner of this property. And that is most unfortunate. <gasps> why are you lying to me, I wonder? Lying? Now, look here. Here's the sales agreement. Sales mm -hmm. agreement. The deed. The deed. And the title. Hmm. The title. Hmm. Number 12, Reading Place. I see. Well, Mr. Scott, this property isn't at Reading Place. What? Reading Place, Mr. Scott, is the road that runs north of here, on the other side of the ravine. This is Reading River Road, number 11. Oh, you mean to say that? I oh. mean it's a piece of rotten cow luck. How simple and easy. If I dared to believe you, you were as unaware of a certain murder as you make out. We're innocent bystanders, I assure you. Innocent of what? Standing by what? Well, nothing. I mean, we, we don't know a thing. Uh, well, for sure, that is. Don't shut we... up, Philip. I'm inclined to believe you. Perhaps because I dearly love to be rid of you. Be rid of us? Yes. Oh. You complicate the situation. There is too much at stake. You are in our way, madam. Oh, uh, well, um, oh, well, you might as well let us go then, because we don't know a thing. Goodbye. We're sorry to have troubled you. My husband just made a perfectly understandable mistake in... Oh, oh, don't pop in like that. Forgive me, madam. Well, beast. Somebody's been in the room. Uh -huh. The shutters have been disturbed. The shutters? Damn. We're too late then. The whole setup's been for nothing. Blast. No, chief. It was these two who were in there. I'd swear to it. Just as I suspected. Now, I must ask you to be perfectly frank with me. Beast, get their car under cover. Meanwhile, you two, come along with me. Here are the keys, Beast. You must show me exactly what you were up to in there. Oh, no. My keys. How did you get my keys? You... You stole them in cold blood. Oh, the chief is as slick as they come. Get on with it, Beef. No, not my car. Listen, we'll never get away with this. The police will be here at any moment. I warn you, they know about that back room. What do they know about that back room? I'm afraid I'll have to trouble you to step along the hall and show me. Uh, well, um, well, we felt they should be notified that the former owners had left the belongings behind that door. You don't have to go in there again, Angelica. After you, madam. Uh, better do what he says, Philip. I'm sure he's got a gun and he'll send the police to number 12, Reading Place, remember? Ah, yes. No fear of them bungling round here at a crucial moment. Excellent. Cheer up, madam. Because... You've sent the locals to a wrong address. I have every reason to believe we have nothing to fear from you but your presence. Oh, oh you're perfectly right. Although it doesn't sound too terribly complimentary somehow. Go in, please. The light. It's working now. I'm sorry, reflex action. Leave it. Your suffers are tightly closed. Now, if you'll show me what you did in there, I'm sure I'll be able to let you go. Ah, uh, Scott Free, if you'll pardon the uh, liberty. Oh, 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 oh. I don't see what there's to laugh about. I made a joke, madam. A pun. Oh, oh well, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm afraid I have absolutely no sense of humor. That's Philip's department. Philip? Philip, you might have laughed. Sorry. Oh, what exactly do you want to know? Where you went. And what you did? Oh, well, well, uh, it was quite dark, you see, and I, uh, I, I walked to the bed and to the shutters and opened them and uh, back to the door and out. When you were at the bed, you had a lighted match with you, did you not, Mrs. Scott? Uh, and you opened the curtains like this and... Oh, my God. Oh, for pity's sake, I don't believe it. What in heaven's name has that idiot done? <laughs> You mean you didn't know? Certainly not. That poor, wretched woman. How utterly horrible. I could cry. What is it, Chief? Beast, you are a swine. Sir? How could you do that to policewoman Dodds? Sir? Paint her up like that. Marcel her hair. You fool. You've destroyed the illusion. Bring her to and get that stuff off her. Shut <laughs> up, Angelica. <sighs> I couldn't help it. She's, she's, she's sitting up. 
Oh, oh where am I? Who screamed? Are you all right, Dodd? Oh, yes, sir. Good. Have you caught the murderer? Not yet, Dodd. But you were picked because you resembled the dead woman. Uh, At least you did. Until... Believe me, sir, I didn't know that. This ghoul of a beast practiced his burial arts on you, and you look like a chorus girl. Clean her face. Yes, Chief. Oh, first, do let me see. Uh, oh, here's my pocket mirror. Oh, Harry. You've made me beautiful. That'll do, Dodge. Turn towards me so I can uh, cold cream you off. Nobody'd ever believe she was dead with all that colour on her face. Get every last vestige off. Yes, sir. Blithering idiot. Can't you ever forget you were once an undertaker? It won't take a moment, sir. Just get this eyelid. Ow! There we are. Uh, and now... Ow! Now, sir. How's that? Plain as they come, sir. Very well. Put her under again, beast. Oh, must he, sir? Of course, Dodds. It's oh. all in the line of duty, Dodds. We must act quickly, Dodds. Get on with it, beast. Gladys, oh. just relax now. Oh, how do you do it, Harry? I'm putty in your hands. Fact is, you're easy, Gladys. Oh. Now, watch the watch. Watch the watch. Watch the watch. Watch the watch. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Scott, off with you as quickly as possible. And no word of what has transpired here tonight. But I don't understand. Oh, come on, Philip. Just shut this door. It's quite simple. You see, one of the suspects of a murder which took place in this room recently bought this house. And we have every reason to believe that that murderer will be returning in the next few minutes to wander through these empty rooms reliving the crime. We believe when confronted with that bedroom exactly as it was when last seen, we can expect a confession. Our beast, got their car keys there? Yes, here they are, sir. She's off, sir. Good. Oh, not that way, Philly. Oh, well, after all, I've never been here before, you know. Just let me make sure that that door's shut properly after you. Well, then, uh, then your police officers. Oh, yes. My card. Oh, well, uh... <laughs> well, good night, Inspector. Yes. Yes, and good luck. Goodbye, Mr. Beast. Oh, I'm sorry I got cross about my mandibles. Thank you, ma'am. The garage is along there to the right. You've certainly made a mess of this back door lock. Oh, well, naturally, none of my husband's keys worked. <laughs> Philip, oh, oh, he's already at the car. Thank goodness the rain stopped. Watch your step, Mrs. Scott. Good night. Well, thank you for escorting me so ceremoniously to the car. Hop in and let's go. I want to get you away from here before they start shooting up the place. Besides, we need a stiff drink and a good dinner. Oh, what an extraordinary experience, Philip. Will you ever forget it? Heaven. Nonsense. It was a perfectly oh. natural mistake. Could have happened to anyone. Oh, I suppose. Oh, Philip, look out! <laughs> What the blithering... What are you doing, muddling out in the middle of the roadway like that? Don't you know you can get killed that way? Philip, don't be cross. The poor old thing. Poor old thing, my... Give yeah, you a bit of a start, I'm afraid. <laughs> Never mind, young man. You live through it. <laughs> Hello. Does he belong to you? In a manner of speaking. Oh. Well, I stopped your car because I'm lost. I'm trying to find number 11 Reading River Road. And the cab took me to another empty house on Reading Place. And there were policemen there. And they asked the cab driver where the body was. <laughs> and he was so scared he took off. Oh, he was guilty. Guilty, guilty, you can tell that. He should never have done it. But he did. 
And he left me to my fate at the wrong address. Oh, but the police was very kind. They always are, you know. And they brought me to the right road. And suddenly, the storm passed over. Oh, I was sorry to see him go. But I told them to just let me find the house myself. It's, you know, it's not fair to take up their time when they should be keeping law and order. <laughs> but it's so dark. And it's so long since I was around here last. Do you know where number 11 is, eh? Yes, it's right here, but I don't think you should go in there now. Oh, you see, uh, Philip. Hmm? Well, you think she should? I mean, they're expecting her. Really? Uh, oh, there's no one expecting me, dearie. <laughs> the house is vacated, except for one room. <laughs> I call it Bluebeard's room. <laughs> Ta-ta, my dears. <laughs> I won't be in the dark once I'm inside. It's just a matter of pulling the switch. <laughs> Pulling a switch. I think they'd pull a switch on you, you old witch. Angelica. Come on, let's go. Uh, you, uh, you don't think she killed policewoman Dodds, do you? What do you think? Oh, she was such a darling. I think that would be an absolute crime. <laughs> an absolute crime? <laughs> Philip, how yes. funny. Oh, and I got it. Yes, of course. I think, Philip, I've started to develop a sense of humor. Yeah, that's fine. They hasn't been completely wasted, then. Oh, Philip, it really has been, you know. Oh, never mind. We'll find the right house tomorrow, I expect. And I'll tell you this. It's the last time I buy a house sight unseen. Oh. From Vancouver, you have been listening Pulling to... Pulling the switch. Pulling the switch. Oh, uh, excuse me. Oh, but first I'll take a peek in the Bluebeard's room. <laughs> oh, I'm a suspicious old character. <laughs> Gladys? Gladys, it's your old mom. Mrs. Dobbs. Ah, you didn't expect me, did you? Tut, tut, tut. Tut, 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 Mrs. Dodd. You know very well, Inspector. Our Gladys is on that bed in an hypnotic state and likely to be so all night. Gladys is a girl, sir. Although she's on the force, sir, and although you may fire her, sir, I'll say it, sir. You are a man. What nonsense. Don't deny it, sir. At a time like this, Gladys needs her mum. Mrs. Dodd, I... And duck under the bed, Mrs. Dodds, quick. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, it's dark. There's someone sneaking through the house, sir. Uh-huh. Conceal yourself behind the bed curtain, beast. Right you are, Chief.
Sight Unseen by Dorothy Davies. The part of Philip Scott was played by Peter Haworth. Angelica Scott was played by Judy Armstrong. The Chief by Roy Brinson. The Beast by Douglas Campbell. Policewoman Dodds by Linda Sorensen. And The Little Old Lady by Ray Brown. Mystery Theater was produced this week in the Vancouver studios of the CBC. With sound effects by Lars Easton and technical operations by Gene Lovrock. Direction, Don Mowat. By transcription. Yes, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. Because Roma wines taste better. Taste better because only Roma selects from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines for your pleasure. And now, Roma Wines of Fresno, California, that's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines bring you Suspense. Tonight, from New York, Roma Wines present Miss Eva Legallion, distinguished star of the New York stage in Phobia, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. Now, Roma Wines bring you Eva Legallion in a remarkable tale of suspense. Yes, I'm the Emily Haven whose pictures you saw in the papers. You can tell, of course, by the wheelchair. I thought it was very unkind of them to take full-length pictures. It isn't that I resent the wheelchair, but people have funny ideas about such things. The way they wrote about me being a sweet little lady. <laughs> You'd have thought I was at least a hundred and a helpless invalid. But I can tell you right now, I'm neither. I'm not supposed to have any excitement. But goodness knows we've had enough of that around here with the murder and all. You probably wonder why, with all our money, I don't have one of those new type modern chairs. It's just that I can't stand the feel of metal. No. No metal. It affects me like snakes or spiders do some people. I've always been that way. When I was a child, mother let me use knives and forks with bone handles, and I still use them. I'm certainly glad that the papers didn't find out about that or about race. They almost found out about race, race once and printed large headlines, Police Question Wealthy Woman. You probably don't remember it because they never did learn why she was questioned. That was some time ago. Grace had just returned from shopping. Emily, I'm home. In here, Grace. Did you bring my book? Yes, here you are. And I brought another one I thought you'd like. I'm tired. <laughs> Sit down. We'll have Anna bring some tea. Let's have a look at your loot. What do you mean by that? Why, the, the things you bought, of course. Well, I guess I'm so tired I'm jumpy. Come. There's two gentlemen to see you, Mum. Oh, bring some hot tea, please, Anna. Do you like something to eat, Grace? Not till dinner. Just tea, then, Anna. And show the gentleman in. Yes, Mum. Why don't we let her go and get someone who doesn't answer yes, Mum, to everything? Well, you know we couldn't replace Anna. She knows us too well. Why do you say that? Well, you are jumpy. I only meant that she knows our likes and dislikes and humors us. I suppose you're right. But I don't like the way she watches us. Oh, that's just Anna's way. She doesn't mean anything by it. Uh, <clears throat> Miss Haven. Yes? I, uh, am Henry Lane. I'm, uh, assistant store manager at Bradlock's. Oh, yes, Mr. Lane? One of our store detectives observed your sister's, um, unusual actions today and reported them to Sergeant Cole. Oh, pardon me, this is Sergeant Cole. How do you do? I didn't want to turn it in until I talked to Lane here. Yes. Um, <clears throat> yes, Sergeant Cole wisely came to me, and we are here to, uh, uh rectify the, uh, error. I'm afraid I don't follow you, Mr. Lane. Oh, I'm sure there's a satisfactory explanation to, uh, your sister's behavior. Well, get to the point. What he's trying to say is that I took some things from the store without paying for them. Grace! That's what was reported to me. You admit that you, uh, uh, took these things? I just admitted it. Why, Grace? Impulse, I guess. But you have plenty of money. I know. I think that's what starts the impulse. Uh, you, you, you mean you've, uh, had the impulse before? Is that an official or a social question? Well, don't be flippant. I'm not. The whole thing is a farce. We've always gotten everything we want by signing a check, and we'll continue to do so. Do you think if I were anyone else, we'd be sitting here like this? Miss Haven, I... No, I'd be I... sitting in jail, waiting to be questioned. I'm at a loss. I've to... taken things before and probably will again. Mostly, I don't even want the things. It's a thrill of taking them. You've said enough, Grace. 
Are you going to arrest me now, Sergeant? Arrest you? I, uh... I... Grace, Grace, will you see if Anna's made tea and uh, bring two extra cups? And a checkbook? Grace. I'm sorry. Oh. This comes as a shock to me. Beats anything I ever heard. Believe me, I regret having to trouble you like this. Oh, you've been very considerate. I, I'm sure we can rectify the entire matter. If you'd care to estimate the amount... It sounds like a bribe. No, waiting. no, not at all. Let, let us say uh, retribution. Oh, I don't know. I feel that it's only right that you should receive something for your time and regard, Sergeant. I don't know, lady. I, uh... I don't want to press charges, of And course. in the future, Mr. Lane, if you will assign someone to watch my sister when she's shopping in your store, you may send the bill for the unpaid items to me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there may be a slight uh, fee. Oh, yes, yes, I understand. Now, if you'll hand me my pen and checkbook. Of course. Thank you. Hmm, well, let me see. Um, uh, there you are. Haven, I... I think I hear Anna coming with the tea. With a dreary tea, there were little frosted cakes. Sergeant Cole dropped crumbs all over the rug. And Mr. Lane said, uh, boff, boff, uh, between noisy sips. Grace seemed to enjoy it, though. She sat and watched one and then the other. She has an unusual sense of humor. That was the way Mr. Lane started coming to our house. I don't know how it happened, but eventually we were calling him Henry. He was pleasant enough, and I think we might have been friends if he hadn't learned about me, too, entirely by accident. He'd been bringing up presents from the store, and although I suspected that he'd gotten them in the same manner that Grace did, it was a nice, thoughtful thing to do. One night when he came, he was feeling playful. Well, how are the two lovely ladies tonight? Oh, very well, thank you. Henry? Isn't he gallant tonight? <laughs> it isn't difficult to be uh, uh, gallant with you. Now put your heels together and kiss our hands. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Want to see what I brought for you? Yes, Uncle Henry. Uh, Uncle? Oh, <laughs> you have such a charming way of jesting. Yes, we do have our little jokes. Don't tease, Henry. Show us what you brought. You shall be surprised first. How nice. And I will put it on you. Now, turn around with your back to me. Now, no, no, don't look. Ah. There. A necklace. A silver necklace. Just what I want. It's very attractive on you, Grace. Thank you, Henry. And now for Emily. Oh, don't ask me to turn my back. No, 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 no. Just hold out your hand. Close your eyes and hold out your hand. Oh, that seems so childish, Henry. Play the game. Oh, very well. Are you ready? There. Henry, no! Emily, Emily, what is the matter? It's only a silver compact. It's it's the metal. I I can't stand the feel of of metal. May sound silly and it may be silly, but I do think my phobia saved my life. As you know, we have a large amount of silver in the house. And although I have an aversion to touching it, I like to see it around. Grace is always bringing home some piece. It reminds me, I wonder if she... Oh, no matter. Why? I'm awfully tired. So awfully tired. Would you excuse me a moment? I... I think I'll just have to lie down for a moment. Yes. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Eva Legallion in Phobia. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. <laughs> Presented by Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, those better-tasting California wines that add so much to the daily joy of good living. There's a reason why Roma wines are so much better tasting. The better taste of Roma begins with the lush goodness of choice California grapes, tenderly pressed and guided unhurriedly with the ancient skill of Roma master vintners and America's greatest winemaking resources. Then these Roma wines are placed with mellow Roma wines of years before, 
And from these precious reserves, the world's greatest reserves of fine wines, Roma later brings you those better-tasting Roma wines, America's favorite wines. Tomorrow, add the sparkle of genius to dinner. Delight your family or guests with robust Roma California Burgundy or fragrant Roma Sauterne. Now, at new low prices, Roma table wines are more than ever your best buy in better taste. That's why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now, Roma wines bring back to our New York soundstage Eva Le Gallion as Emily Haven in Phobia, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Well, one night Grace was out for the evening and Anna had gone to bed. I was sitting here in my chair reading. Suddenly I thought I heard someone moving in the hall. I called out, but no one answered. So I thought it was my imagination. And then I heard it again. I sat very still listening and watching the hall door. As I watched, the knobs began to turn. Someone was slowly pulling the door open. Anna! Grace! Anna, is that you? Answer me! What? Who are you? Why do you have your face covered? Keep quiet. I will not keep quiet. What do you have in that case? I said keep quiet. Silver! That's our silver. I don't want no trouble with you. You put that silver back or you'll have trouble. I'll phone the police. I'll call for help. This says you won't. Don't point that gun at me. You can't scare me with that. I haven't long to live anyway. You ain't gonna have long to live if you don't stop that yapping. Stay where you are. Do you hear me? Stay away. Now, look here, sister. I ain't kidding. Now, you look here. You ought to be ashamed, a great big man with a gun robbing a helpless lady in a wheelchair. I warned you. Besides that, you're very rude. Take your hat off in the house. Say, what is this? If you want to come into my house, you learn some manners and then knock on the door. Now, set that silver down and leave the room. Looks like I'm gonna have to tie something over your face so that I can get away. Don't you touch me. Don't touch me. What is it, Mom? A man. A man? What man? What did he do? The gun. The metal. He touched my neck. With his gun. became very excited and called the police. Heaven knows why. The man was gone and he had left the silver. I put her in her place by having her wash all the silverware and put it away. Sergeant Cole was furious when he came. It seems that he wanted to check for fingerprints. He was mollified, however, when he found fingerprints on the silver cabinet. I hadn't thought of that, so Anna had to wash that, too. Sergeant Cole came back to tell us that the fingerprints belonged to a man by the name of Mr. Scorchy Hood. He was wanted by the police because he had escaped from some penitentiary and was what Sergeant Cole called a killer. Mr. Hood was called Scorchy because he always shot people from close range and usually in the neck. Sergeant Cole thought it was very amusing when I said if he was going to kill me, he would have to stand back. I wouldn't have him touch me with that gun. Did you read those uncouth headlines in the papers? Wealthy woman, match for murderer, Haven defeats Hood. <laughs> They made me sound like a pugilist. The papers are so unkind to people's money. One morning, Anna came into the room without knocking, so I said, Anna, I didn't ring. I've got to talk to you, Mom. Very well, Anna, what is it? It's about my brooch, the one my mother gave me. Well, what about your brooch? It's gone, Mom. You mean you lost it? No, I didn't lose it. It was in my room, and now it's gone. Well, you probably mislaid it. No, no, I didn't, Mom. I always keep it pinned to my Sunday dress, and it's not there. I don't see how I can help you. I thought maybe you'd like to replace it. Oh? What kind of pin was it? It was a cameo. But this time I thought I'd... I'd like to have one with some diamonds and little pearls. I don't understand. I've been cleaning Miss Grace's room. You've been snooping, Anna? Just cleaning, Mom. I did kind of look for my brooch. Hmm. I see. Do you want your pen, Miss Emily? Oh, yes, Anna. Hand me my pen. Thank you. Now, let me 
Julia. There you are. You think that will replace the brooch? Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Well, payday in the middle of the month? Yes. I mean, uh, no, just a little... Uh... Token, Miss Grace. Token of what? Let's call it pin money. That will be all, Anna. Thank you, ma'am. Now, ma'am, you tell me what this is all about. It's nothing, Grace, really. When you sign a check, it can't be classified as nothing. It was a pin for Anna. That isn't very funny, Emily. Pin money for a pin? What about a pin? She, uh, lost it. Lost it? Oh, I see. Now, let's not talk about it anymore, Grace. But I want to talk about it. Poor dear, anyone can get money from you. Can't Grace, please. I may have my impulses. <laughs> I've never taken anything from the servants yet. Grace, where are you going? What are you going to do? To collect and deliver. You just purchased a pin. And I'm going to find it and wear it. Grace is so impulsive. She's always been good to me. She brings me nice surprises. Sometimes I get a bill for them. And when I don't, I enjoy them even more. Grace is really very serious-minded, and she worries about trifles like leaving me alone with Henry. Henry never was dull, always full of new ideas. I've never told her that he proposed to me. It came as a complete surprise. We were sitting before the fire. Emily, I need more money. I gave you a check last week, Henry, for your relief fund. It isn't very clear in my mind what relief fund that was for. Well, that doesn't matter now. The point is that I need a great deal more money. What is it for this time? For me, Emily. Oh, Henry, you disappoint me. So much more fun when you try to fool me. Oh, I'm tired of that. I think I'd like to marry into the family. That's out of the question. I'm sure Grace would never consider it. Grace? Well, good heavens, you, you don't mean... Oh, yes. You, Emily. Now, why would you want to marry a woman in a wheelchair? Well, you just gave the reason. You haven't long to live, Emily, after you're gone. As your husband, I'd inherit a I great... think you'd better go, Henry. Go? Not until I've had my answer. What kind of a proposal is that? Will you and your money marry me? Oh, no. You'll have to do better than that. Perhaps I can. Henry, what are you doing with that candlestick? I'm going to persuade you. Oh, you can beat me to death. I won't change my mind. You misunderstand, Emily. I'm not going to beat you. I'm going to caress you with it. Henry, your hands, you wouldn't. Your arms, your throat, your back, perhaps. No, Henry. No, no. No, no. Now, listen to me. Let's talk. I don't want to talk. I want to caress you. No, keep away. Don't touch me. Keep away. I, I, I will. I, uh, uh, put, the, put the candlestick down. Very well. I don't like to excite you like this. It isn't good for you. I, how, how soon do you want to be married, Henry? Immediately. How about tomorrow? So soon. When you make up your mind to do something, why wait? I suppose you're right. Oh, I, I would like some tea. Henry, would you... Shall I ring for Anna? Well, she's asleep by now. Why don't you get it? Yes, leave it to me. Just leave everything to me. I was annoyed at Henry for his crassness. It was very tiresome of him to be so crude. I wheeled my chair about the room. I have a habit of doing that when I'm disturbed. Presently, I heard Henry returning with the tea. The door opened a little. And then there was that deafening explosion of a gun. The house was filled with echoes. The door stood motionless for a moment. Then slammed shut. I was too stunned to move. I just sat and looked at the door. I tried once to open it, but it wouldn't budge. I was still sitting there when the police came. It wasn't Sergeant Cole. It was a new man called Inspector Wells. I think there was a man with him, but I'm a little confused about that night. Henry had been shot and was lying against the door. That was why the door wouldn't open gun was on the floor beside him. The inspector asked a lot of questions and everyone talked at once. I'll tell you like I told him. After the shot, I don't remember hearing footsteps or the door outside close. It may have happened, but I was too excited to remember. Anna tried to make the inspector believe that Grace had killed Henry. She told him about the gun. Anna has spells of being difficult. I think it's because of the pin. She doesn't like Grace to wear it. They took Henry away and we went to bed. 
The hall was a mess. We had to have the carpet clean, and there are still some tea stains on the walls. The next morning I made a discovery that I thought would interest the inspector, so I phoned him. He came right up. Morning, Miss Haven. Oh, come in, Inspector. You say you found a brooch in the hall? Yes, this one. Under a chair, Inspector. Do you know who it belongs to? To our maid, Anna. Kind of fancy for a maid, isn't it? Diamonds and small pearls. Emily bought it for her. It's quite a gift. We like to keep our help uh, satisfied. I'd like to talk to her. I'll call her. Who killed Henry, Inspector? Don't know yet. We're having the gun checked for fingerprints. <laughs> Is that all the police do? Check fingerprints. You ring, Mum. Yes, Anna, come in. The inspector wants to ask you some questions. Yes, Mum. Did you see Henry Lane last night? You mean while he was alive? Yes. Did you see him before he was shot? Only for a minute. When was that? I heard a noise in the kitchen and I looked in to see who it was. That was when he went for the tea. <laughs> Trust Anna to look in. Did you speak to him? Maybe a few words. Did you like Mr. Lane? Like him? I did not. He was no gentleman. Why do you say that, Anna? He used to say unkind things to me. Is this your pin? Why, yes. Where'd you get it? It was found under a chair in the hall. It couldn't have been. I didn't have it on last night. You mean you weren't wearing it when you shot him? Shot him? Oh, my goodness, you don't think I shot him. Right now, we suspect everyone. Oh, I didn't kill him. Honest, I didn't. Oh, please, tell him I didn't, Mom. You tell him. Oh, uh, Inspector, it's just occurred to me. I, I've made a horrible mistake. I, I remember now that I saw Anna wearing that pin when she served breakfast this morning. So? She couldn't have dropped it last night. Oh, thank you, Mum. Thank you. I don't think the Inspector was convinced when he left. He didn't say he wasn't. He looked unconvinced was kind of a fib, but it was worth it. Anna has been an angel ever since. She cleans Gracie's room and never sees a thing. She even returns some things that Grace didn't know were missing. I gave Anna the pin and she put it back on her Sunday dress. The inspector phoned around noon. He was very excited. He said the blurred fingerprints on the gun belonged to Mr. Scorchy Hood and that we should be very careful as he hadn't been caught and he was dangerous. I asked him how we should go about being careful. He said to lock the doors and windows and they would send a man to watch the house. I didn't think we needed to worry, but somehow I couldn't believe Mr. Scorchy Hood wanted to hear me scream again. But about ten o'clock, Grace and I were sitting here discussing Humphrey Bogart when the whole hall door opened. Don't move. I've no intention of moving. What do you want? Shut up, sister. Don't call me sister. My name is Emily. And this is my sister, Grace. How do you do? This ain't no social call. Well, I'm glad to see you've uncovered your face. I don't know why you should cover it. It really isn't an unpleasant face at all. Don't start. I won't do you no good. Did you come to kill us? You guessed it, sister. Grace. Grace. Hey, what are you doing to me? Trying to confuse me? Why should you want to kill us, Mr. Hood? Because you made people laugh at me. The papers made fun of me. I can't stand that. Well, it seems to me you brought it on yourself. You came uninvited in the first place. What kind of talk is that? Sure I did, and I come the same way this time. If you're going to kill me, you'll have to stand away from me. You see, I have a phobia. A what? A phobia. It's something I can't help. Uh. Why don't you stand over there? Why? On account of my phobia. It'd be better if you stood there. Here? Eh? No, no. A, a little farther. Now? Yes, I think that's better. Oh, Grace, uh, will you straighten the rug? Never mind. It worked. I guess he's unconscious. I'll call the man across the street. Oh, Grace, look what you've done. When he hit his head on the table, he spilled the flowers. Now that water will make white spots on the varnish. <laughs> Way it happened. You know the rest, how Mr. Hood was wanted for several murders, so they executed him. I'm rather sorry it's all over. It seems dull around here now, but I did so want to enjoy my last days. The doctor says I've only six months at the most. I haven't told Grace my time is so short. It would cause her to fret. Grace worries, so. That's why I didn't tell her that I took the gun and shot Henry as he opened the door and then tossed the gun into the hall before he slumped against the door and pushed it shut. I hadn't even told...
told her that Mr. Scorchy Hood dropped his gun that time when I screamed. You see, I didn't handle the gun with my shawl to save his fingerprints. It's just that I... I can't stand the feel of metal. Can't stand the feel of metal. They've been so kind, everybody. Here, I mean, in the prison hospital. Oh, you must excuse me, I... I'm so drowsy. Uh, they've let me have my own bed even from home. I couldn't lie on the prison cot they have, you know. With the metal and all. Suspense. Tonight, Romo Wines have brought you Miss Eva Legallion in Phobia, a suspense play written by Joel Hunt. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Mr. Alan Baxter as star of Suspense. Produced for Shanley by William Spear. In the coming weeks, Suspense will present such stars as Alan Baxter, Gloria Swanson, and others. Make it a point to listen each Thursday to Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills.